Hi, I'm Michael Worthington. And my name is Roman Jaster. Welcome to the UI UX specialization developed by the California Institute of the Arts on the Coursera platform. User interface and user experience design is a high demand field. The skills and knowledge you will learn in this specialization are applicable to a wide variety of careers, from marketing to web design to human computer interaction. The specialization offers practical, skill based instruction that is centered around a visual communications perspective rather than one focused on marketing or programming. This specialization will provide you with a palette of specific skills and will show you how to combine those individual chunks of knowledge into the multifaceted practice of UI UX design. These courses will give you a roadmap to walk you through all the stages in the process of developing UI UX, from ideation to visualization to producing a working prototype. The broad base of knowledge offered in these classes can be applied to interface design for multiple platforms and for different screen sizes. Through the specialization, you'll experience the UI UX development process from start to finish through a series of projects, both large and small, visual and non-visual. I'll be leading you through the first two courses, where we'll focus on the fundamental skills and knowledge of UI and UX design. We'll define what a user interface is and look at various examples, discover how content is organized and structured on screen, and define what role the designer plays in creating and shaping the user's experience. You'll have the opportunity to design your own static interface and create a clickable mock-up for an app of your own design. In the third and fourth courses, you'll further hone your UX skill set by delving into user research and understanding your target audience, setting goals and defining strategy, establishing scope and structure, and finally developing a compelling look and feel. You'll apply these skills to a single large-scale project, developing a comprehensive plan for a responsive website. We'll also take a look at the relationship between design and programming, and I invited a few guests, practicing designers who are going to share tips and insights about user experience design. When combined, these four courses offer a skill set that will allow you to work as a UI UX designer, whether that's developing your own personal website or apps, or working with a group of people in a larger commercial context, you can apply these skills in a range of different ways. No matter your personal or professional goals, we think you'll find the specialization to be an informative and rewarding learning experience. Hi, I'm Michael Worthington. Welcome to Visual Elements of User Interface Design. I've taught at CalArts for over 20 years, and I taught the very first interface design, motion design, and web design classes in the graphic design program. Back when I first started, the web was just beginning, and we were designing interfaces for CD-ROMs. It was very different from today. Interface design has now become a ubiquitous part of our everyday lives, through the web, apps, and mobile devices. I've continued to teach screen-based design over the years, and while it's become much more sophisticated, one consistent aspect has been a design-first approach to interface design. In other words, using the formal and communication strategies of graphic design as the foundation for a way of designing in the screen-based world. With that in mind, this course focuses on the visual elements of interface design, and we'll be looking at user interface design through the lens of graphic design and visual form. We'll start out by examining the broader question of what an interface actually is and discussing the relationship between UI and UX. We'll be separating the UI from the UX, the interface from the experience, in order to examine the interface in more detail. Likewise, we'll be taking the user interface apart in order to examine each of the individual components. We'll figure out how each element of the interface works and how a designer can create those elements. Through a series of lectures and connected visual exercises, you'll build a palette of UI skills and knowledge, and I'll be helping you combine these individual blocks of knowledge that together make up the skill set of an interface designer. And along the way, you'll learn the vocabulary and the processes needed to design a user interface from start to finish. At the end of this course, you'll be able to demonstrate a working knowledge of the visual components and principles of UI design. You'll be able to understand how to best apply your formal skills using color, typography, and imagery to create a visually driven user interface. This course is really about 
how to create the visual material of the interface. And when combined with the UX skills you'll learn in the other courses in this specialization, you'll have a really powerful foundation for working in the field of UI UX design. Why peer review is important to a creative practice. Design is rarely a solitary practice. As a designer, you might be working with clients or have a boss you need to report to. You might also be part of a design team or even managing a team of your own. You might be asked to present a project to stakeholders at a company or pitch your services to a new client. Ultimately, your design needs to stand alone, but in the process of making design, you should be testing out your ideas with an audience, getting feedback, and developing your design accordingly. Design is very intertwined with communication, and to be a successful designer, you need to be able to talk about your work, to explain it, and show that you understand how it's working. In different situations, it may be necessary to explain your own work and other people's work in a clear and constructive way. So in this course, you'll be engaging in peer review to evaluate the work of your peers as well as get feedback on your own work. If you're serious about working as a designer or improving your design skills, consider peer review as excellent practice. In peer review, you'll be asked to observe and openly reflect on what is working and not working in a peer's graphic design submission. The goal of this exercise is to help your fellow designers move their work forward and for you to get that same advice in turn. Additionally, it's for you to practice a working vocabulary and discourse around making graphic design, all of which will help you with your future path as a designer. The next video will give you some specific tips for completing peer review within the specialization. Peer review tips. Critique and feedback are essential parts of the design process. They're an essential way to see if your design is communicating what you intended to an audience. So in this video, I'm going to outline a few tips for completing peer review assignments successfully in this class. Participation in peer review thoughtfully and meaningfully will help you practice these indispensable skills. Submitting assignments. Read the instructions carefully. Make sure you take a look at the review criteria so you know how your assignment will be assessed. Review any examples your instructor may have provided and upload exactly what you are asked to do. If something in the instructions isn't clear, post your question in the course forums so staff can assist you. Make it your best work. This is your creation and your creativity and should be an exercise that demonstrates what you can do. Practice assignments should be opportunities to fail, but a final assignment should be something worthy of your professional portfolio. Ask for specific feedback. Clarify what you need from your peers in your review. Where applicable, use the designated comment field to ask for specific feedback on your submission. Submit on time. Refer to the due date for submitting your assignment on the grades page within the course. If you're too early or too late, the peer review process may not work as intended. Reviewing submissions. Take your time with reviewing. Don't rush this. Look at each part of your peer's submission carefully and compare what has been submitted to the expectations set out in the rubric. Be objective. When reviewing, consider your role as a viewer or reader of the work. Focus only on what the rubric asks you to evaluate and try to limit your personal opinions about the work in your comments. Be clear and informative. Generic feedback such as good or okay are unhelpful comments for peer reviews because they don't give a your peer any specific information about what was working in their submission. Likewise, it doesn't help to say it doesn't work or I don't like it because it doesn't give your peer enough information to help them reassess their designs. Try to articulate a detailed response that helps to affirm your peer's choices in their submission or guides your peer towards the goal of an assignment if it appears that they are off track. 
Be constructive. Your feedback should motivate your peer to make adjustments and work towards improvement. If there's a need to correct your peer, be honest, but it's more helpful to include specific recommendations or strategies to help the learner improve. Be generous. Recognize that everyone comes to this course with a different level of experience as well as a different approach to making work. Honor and value these differences. Bad grammar and spelling shouldn't contribute to a bad grade. Please be generous. Likewise, please don't penalize students for small mistakes. Flag plagiarism and dishonest behavior. These violate Coursera's honor code. If you're asked to review an assignment and it appears to be plagiarized, you can flag it so Coursera learner support are notified. Complete your reviews on time. Refer to the due date for completing the minimum number of peer reviews on the grades page within the course. If you're too early or too late, the peer review process may not work as intended. Consider reviewing more than the minimum number of peers for a given assignment. Not only is this helpful for your fellow peers, but it's also instructive for you to see a greater range of submissions to inform your own work. And the more you practice critique, the better you will get at it, and ultimately the better your own work will be as you integrate your critical abilities into your own design process. How to apply feedback to your assignment. So, your assignment's graded and you have peer feedback. Now what? Remember, the goal of peer review is to help you improve your work as a maker and viewer. Try not to see the feedback you receive as either being positive or negative, or an affirmation that you're doing something absolutely right or wrong. Through peer review, you're inviting other perspectives on your work to see and comment on things that you might not see. By engaging in peer review, you're practicing the skill you'll need in your creative and professional life. It's important to understand how an audience will react to your work. Peer feedback should never feel like a personal attack. If you're discouraged by some feedback, then step back and consider why a peer would react that way to your work. Are you seeing patterns or common themes in the feedback you receive? Is there something you need to address in the work? If you receive peer feedback that isn't constructive to your work, that's okay. It's not ideal, but don't let it discourage you. Remember, the goal of feedback is to help you improve. If you need additional feedback, you can resubmit. At the end of the day, remember, both positive and negative feedback can be useful. Positive feedback can let you know what is working, what to keep as is or alter only slightly in your assignment. Negative feedback might let you know what needs to be changed, developed, or reconsidered. As the designer, you might disagree with the feedback, but it's always worth examining someone else's point of view. An outside perspective can be very useful, especially because designers often get too close to their own work and sometimes can't see when parts of it aren't working or communicating properly. If you receive a low grade, consider why your peers gave you that grade. Have they justified their grading in the comments? Consider their perspectives and try incorporating their suggestions into the assignment and resubmit. In this first week, we're going to look at some broader issues concerning interfaces and the relationship between UI and UX. We'll look at some historical models for interaction, both screen-based and analog, and we'll try to answer the question, what is a user interface? We'll examine the relationship between the audience and the content, and we'll discuss how an interface can change or shape that experience. We'll map out the various roles in the UI UX development process, and you can see where you might fit in. And we'll also talk about interface conventions, functionality, and aesthetics. So while this week isn't heavy on making, it is full of all the background knowledge you're going to need in order to make a successful user interface. So here we are in our first class of user interface design, 
And perhaps the first thing we should ask ourselves is what is a user interface anyway? We get all our information from screens nowadays, whether it's a desktop or a laptop or a tablet or a phone. We're constantly looking at screens and learning how to do things and how to interact with the world through the screen. And there are certain conventions to the interface of the screen that we're used to, whether those are buttons or menus, we understand how we access the information through a screen, through the interface. And these conventions are things that we've become used to, but within those conventions there are levels of flexibility that can shape the experience the user has with the content. We know we always have to scroll down to get content on a website, or swipe from side to side on a phone, but what is the actual user interface itself and how does it work? The key components are the user and the interface. The user is the viewer or the person interacting with the content and the interface is the way that the user gets to that content, how they access that content. So in a lot of ways you could think about the interface as being a bridge between the user and the content, but that bridge is not totally passive. That bridge can shape the way the user experiences the content and there are lots of models in the real world for how interfaces work. If you think about a book, for instance, that's an interface in itself. It's an interface between the reader and the story. The book is just type on paper, but what the reader receives or experiences is the novel or the story itself. You could look at something like road signs, where the driver is the user and what's being conveyed are the rules of the road through a graphic medium of a road sign. Nowadays, everyone receives pretty much everything through a screen. And that screen can act as a mediating device. And what that means is the screen can change the experience. If you think about something like a news event, for instance, that news event could be perceived in different ways, depending on how the story is told, upon how the story is mediated. So if the basic story is that self-driving cars have been approved, on the one hand, you might think that that's good news, but depending on how it's reported, how it's mediated, you might think that that's bad news. Marshall McLuhan famously said that the medium is the message. But with interface design, I think it's more of a case of the medium affects the message. The medium can shape the message, and that medium is the interface. So the interface shapes the experience. So if everything everyone experiences is through the screen, through the interface, then the interface designer has a lot of power because the interface designer is shaping every experience that everyone has. And this gets at the heart of what we're going to look at next. The interface shapes the experience. And the interface is the UI part, the user interface design. And the experience is the UX part, the user experience design. And you put those two together and you've pretty much got control over how everybody experiences every kind of content. In this segment, we're going to look at the relationship between UI and UX. We often conflate these two terms, but to begin with, we're going to pull them apart in order to examine them separately so we can understand the differences between the two. UI is often a term that's used to talk about the interface itself. It's about how it looks. It's about visual design and how we access the digital content. UX is a little bit more about how that digital content feels what the experience of it is, and that is often rooted much more in a non-visual design practice. It's important to understand these two practices as being different because they often appeal to different kinds of people who do different kinds of jobs. Visual design is much more rooted in graphic design, for example, and non-visual design might involve much more research and planning and testing. So the UI designer is really looking at the interface itself and the UX designer is often focusing much more on the experience of the user. If we break these roles down further, we can see how they might suit different kinds of people doing different kinds of work. A user interface designer might be focusing more on form and aesthetics, on the look and feel and the organization of the information, whereas a UX designer might concentrate much more also on how the interface feels but on the navigation and the structure and the story of the whole site or app. In a lot of ways, the UI's designer is looking at the surface or visual identity, and that's often design-driven. 
so it suits someone that often has more graphic design or visual skills, whereas the UX designer is looking at content, how to get the user engaged with that content, and this work is often driven by the user's experience and by feedback from the user. So UX can be seen as being much more user-driven and UI being much more design-driven. But of course, these two things overlap. We talk about a UI UX designer as somebody who does both of these things. But in truth, a UI designer tends to focus more on UI with a little bit of UX, and a UX designer tends to focus more on UX with a little bit of UI. A simple way to think about this is that UI is design-driven and UX is user-driven. And while there are some people that can work at both of these things equally well and occupy this space in the middle and be a UI UX designer, this is a little bit less common. As we mentioned, UI deals with visual design and that's very tangible and physical. You're often making an actual interface using digital tools like Photoshop and Illustrator, whereas the UX designer is quite often making something more propositional. They're trying to create an experience that often doesn't really exist, so they have to map and plan and figure out what that experience is without it being tangible. So when we look at this diagram, we can see that UI and UX are really separate professions, but we've put them together into one profession. And you could think about this diagram as being useful to think about where do you fit into this diagram. Do you work as a UI or a UX designer? Are you primarily focusing on the interface and design skills? Or are you more interested in how you get feedback from a user and how you might use that to shape the experience of a website or an app, for instance? If you think about where you sit within this diagram, you can think about whether your focus is to be a visual designer or whether it's more to do with a subject like social science. And if you can figure out what your strengths are, you can figure out where you fit within this diagram and what kind of designer you want to be, whether you're going to be more design-driven or more audience-driven. For the sake of this beginning class, we're going to look much more at a design-driven approach to UI. And what this means is we're not really going to focus so much on research and on feedback. We're going to take a form-first approach to design. What that does is it puts the designer in the driving seat. It means that the designer makes all of those initial decisions about what the interface looks like, about what the interface, how the interface works, before they've even got feedback from the user. And one of the reasons we're doing this is because the user sees the form first. When you go to an app or a website, you actually experience the form before you even get to the content. You're visually seeing what the thing is before you're actually interacting and experiencing it. If we put ourselves in the position of the designer rather than the user, our initial experience of an interface is somewhat different. The designer actually experiences the content before the form, because when a designer is given material to work with to turn into a website or an app, it doesn't actually have any form to begin with. The designer is the person that develops content-specific form by looking at that content and figuring out what is the best form, what is the best structure, what is the best interface for that particular content and for that particular idea that I want to communicate to a user. In this segment, we're going to look at the different roles involved in producing UI UX. A simple division would be to look at it in terms of a front end and a back end of the process. The front end is much more visible to the user and involves interface design. It's the thing that the user is going to see on the screen, whereas the back end is much more invisible and it's hidden from the user, and that involves the programming, the coding, the functionality of the site. Outside of these two main areas are another two that are very important. Ideation deals with coming up with an idea, figuring out how your website is going to work, what its goals are, and testing deals with getting feedback from an audience at an early stage, which might shape both the programming and the interface design, as well as the ideation. These four areas together provide the core for developing UI UX. Front-end design could easily be equated to UI design, where you're really dealing with graphic elements and looking at the interface itself, building design assets. The back end could be looked at as coding or programming, which obviously involves a totally different skill set. Testing might be the area more where UX is involved, where you're planning, 
mapping things out and getting feedback from a user. But the truth is that this compartmentalization of these four different areas isn't a realistic representation of how they really work. In truth, they have a great deal more exchange between each other. Even especially at the early stages of development, especially at the early stages of thinking about what a website or what an app might be, these four key areas bounce ideas around between each other as things get developed and defined. So there's a process of testing that goes on between coding something, coming up with ideas, building the visual interface itself, and trying it out with a user. These four areas can be key in developing a digital experience, but then once it's developed, it's going to need to be further tested with an exterior audience in a finished state. But it's also going to need some kind of marketing and promotion. So these are other areas that are connected to the process of building UI UX. And while they sit outside these core areas, they're also very important. Another two areas that sit outside the core are the, are the areas of production and content development. And these normally happen in the middle stages of the process of developing a website or an app, for instance, where you need to get assets and you need to maybe produce hundreds of different screens or hundreds of different pieces of artwork. And even when all of these, thing, all of these jobs are put together and you've actually made an app or a website that's out in the world and functioning, there's also an, a certain amount of upkeep and updates that it might involve all of these different people every time something has to change on a site or an app. So we talked about these areas not really being compartmentalized, but interacting with each other and informing each other. You could also think about where do you want to fit? What kind of role do you want to have in the UI UX process in developing web or developing apps, for example? You might decide you could decide that as a UX designer, you're really interested in mapping and planning and figuring out the interaction of a piece of content of a website, for instance. But you might also really enjoy working with an audience and testing it, getting feedback and implementing that feedback. Or you could decide that you're much more interested in coming up with ideas for a website or an app. And those ideas might all be based around coding, for example. They might be driven by technical skills. So you can see how these two areas don't have to operate separately. You don't have to be pigeonholed into just one of these. You can actually work in two or three of them at the same time. And what that does is it starts to play to whatever your strongest skill set is. So you might decide that, you're, that you like doing UI design based much more in coding, which would be slightly different than just working with coming up with ideas that are based in coding. You'd have to have graphic design skills and programming skills. Some people manage to do all of these things. And that's quite rare these days, especially as websites and apps have accelerated to the point of needing immediate, a lot of upkeep and updates, having to have immediate response to problems. When the web first started, for instance, one person could do all of these roles. In the mid-1990s, for instance, I might be designing a website where I would be writing the content, taking the photographs, designing the interface, doing all of the programming and all of the testing, as well as perhaps even hosting the site on my own server. Nowadays, that's a little more rare, mostly because of the scale of a lot of commercial enterprises to do with web and apps where you might be working. They have a much larger audience and everything has to happen much faster. So it's very difficult for just one person to do that. In this first course, we're really going to focus on UI design and the role that that plays within this larger set of jobs. And you might decide that you're a UI designer that also wants to focus on one of these other areas or perhaps two or three of these other areas and combine them. But for the sake of this course, we're really going to focus on UI design to begin with. And even though we're going to touch on some of these other areas because they're ultimately all connected to each other, we're mostly going to look at the interface itself and the design problems associated with that interface. In previous segments, we've looked at the relationship between the user and content, and we've seen how the interface can act as a bridge between those two. We've looked at some historical models of what that interface can be, and now we're going to look at a few more, but these models are all going to be screen-based. Starting in the 1970s, with the advent of the calculator, 
we can see from this list how various different screen-based activities have permeated our society and basically become more and more popular and more ever-present in our lives. And these screens have become multifunctional as they've advanced. The pocket calculator had very limited functionality, for example. And video games or arcade games existed in one physical space you had to go and visit to play one game. An ATM machine had a very specific function, for instance, to get cash, and it existed in a physical site of the bank. And you can see, as we advance through these different screens, through the web, CD-ROMs, into phones and apps, AR and even VR, we're looking at how these screens can do many, many more things. They've gone from having a single use to having a multiple use. In a lot of ways, those early screen-based experiences were rooted in the real world. They were very fixed. You had to physically have the calculator in your hand and it had very limited functionality with buttons that you pressed. And the interface itself was not even a digital one, it was a physical button. These fixed experiences exist in the real world and they were very limited. Whereas nowadays we're looking much more at what you might call a transfixed experience. We're looking at multiple things that you can do in the digital world. You can carry a phone or a laptop or an iPad from wherever you want to go in the world. You carry them around with you. But what all of these early models have in common is that they're all based around a screen. They're all connecting a user to an experience or an outcome through the screen. So if we take something simple like the ATM, for example, it clearly connects a customer with getting money from the ATM machine. And we could look at something like this as a very simple way to look at interaction and look at the stages that might happen at an ATM. And these could be four very simple stages. You have a card, you need to enter a PIN, you get a certain amount of money, and then you get the card and the money back. And we could map that out as quite a simple interaction. But once we try to think about it in graphic design terms, in terms of what the actual user interface might be, it becomes a little more tricky than you might think, even for such a simple interaction. To begin with, we'd need to have a series of numbers so that we can enter a PIN, and also so we can enter an amount of money we might, we might want to obtain. So you could think about the keypad itself, its physical arrangement, and how that might have a connection to the human hand. And if we put these numbers in, we can think about these could be buttons that you could press, but wait a minute, if you press them, nothing really happens. How do you know if you've actually done anything by pressing the button? So straight away, we can understand that when we interact with an interface, we need to have some kind of feedback, some kind of result. Otherwise, how do we know if the interface is working? How can we trust that interface? So even in this very simple model, there has to be some feedback. So if we press a key, for example, we want to see on a separate screen that those numbers appear so that we know that our interaction has actually worked. But what happens if we do something wrong? What happens if we press the wrong number? Well, we're going to need an extra key, I think. We're going to need a cancel key, for example, in case we make a mistake. And we might also need an OK key for when we press the right number. So even from this very simple idea of looking at how a keypad works, we figured out some very important principles for interactivity. The fact that we need to have feedback as a user, the fact that if we make a mistake we need to be able to correct it, and the fact that we need to say that things are okay when we've done them right. In this segment we're going to look at interface conventions. And an easy way to do this is to take a very basic interface, for instance our keypad, and try and use that to examine something more complicated. Because even this simple keypad, the interactions with it are a lot more complex than they seem. From these basic interactions, we can pull out a set of rules or ideas about how a user interface should work. And a lot of UI UX designers online will have their top 10 tips for things that UI designers should look at. So here are some of mine. We're going to take this list and examine them one at a time and see how they work when applied to even a very simple interface like the keypad. But we could take those ideas and also think about how they might work with something much more complicated. So first of all, let's look at real-world knowledge. Real-world knowledge is based on analog models. Early interfaces were clearly based on these real-world models, where they were simulations of physical things and objects that existed in the real world. 
It's less so with contemporary interfaces, but some of that vocabulary still lingers on. We still talk about buttons and menus, for example, that are physical things. With our keypad, for instance, we recognize digital buttons because we've experienced buttons in the real world, so we have an idea about how they're going to work. And this brings us on to our next topic, which is learned behavior or conventions. Because we already know how interface elements work, for instance, the button, even though this is a flat representation on a screen rather than being physical, we draw a correlation between how the button works in the real world and then knowing how the button is going to work in the digital world. Cause and effect looks at action and reaction. When we press a button, we know that something is going to happen. We have an expectation already about how it works. Often the thing that happens is going to happen somewhere else, but if that button is combined with words or numbers or symbols that are associated with it, then we have an expectation of what the button is going to do, of what's actually going to happen when we press it. Consistency looks at a logical or systematic approach to design. If our buttons look the same, then they should act in a similar or systematic way. If you press one button and you learn how it works, then you have a pretty good idea about how the next button is going to work. Buttons shouldn't look the same, but then work in a different way. We're really trying to figure out a consistent system. So if we know we press this button that is a 1, when we press the 8 button, we know that the 8 is going to work in the same way. Interaction should be seamless. It should be fast, and it should be easy. There should be as few steps as possible when you're asking a user to interact with something. When you interact with an interface, you want immediate results without delay. You want whatever you want to happen, and you want it to happen now. There's nothing worse than clicking or tapping and nothing happening. It breeds frustration in the user and leads to dissatisfaction with the interface. Immediate intuition. In other words, a few interactions can teach a lot. Once a user's learned how a button works, they can intuitively know how a whole set of buttons work. By extension, they might also know how similar digital buttons work, even if they're going to look and function in a different way. So once you've figured out a way of interacting, that way can be applied to a lot of different forms. In other words, if you know how this button works, then you know how all buttons work. And of course, this is very useful because those kind of things build into interface conventions that are consistent across a lot of platforms. So if we know how to swipe in one app, for instance, we know how to swipe in all apps, no matter what kind of thing we're doing with the swiping, whether we're shopping or going on a date or ordering food. The swipe is always still the same. We only need to learn how to do that once, regardless of content or context. Fulfillment. In other words, payoff or results. If we take the time to press a button to interact with an interface, we expect something to happen. We expect a small sense of gratification or fulfillment. We want to believe that a screen-based digital interaction has real value. If we take the time to press the button, we expect something in return. As a user, it gives us a sense of value with the interface that we're interacting with. It gives us a sense that we're important, that whatever we do, we're going to get something back from the interface itself for our investment. Undo, redo. The user wants to feel safe. To know that if they make a mistake, they can nearly always undo or redo it in the digital world. It's a key thing that we love about the digital world, as opposed to the real world. In the digital world, we have an ability to undo our actions. If we broke something in a digital experience, we could hit Command-Z and undo it, and it wouldn't be broken anymore. But if we break something in the real world, in the analog world, it's broken for good. So we like to know that if we press a button, nothing bad is going to happen. We like to feel safe in that digital environment. It's really important to understand these basic concepts of how interaction works, because they're a foundation to understanding that the blank screen that we start with when we design an interface is not necessarily a blank slate. There are pre-existing modes of interacting and pre-existing interface conventions that we need to consider. We need to think about what does the user bring to the interface in terms of what the user already knows about how interfaces work, how interaction works. You can't present a user 
with a totally alien interface every time they're interacting with a different content, where they have to learn how to interact in totally different and new ways. But at the same time, you don't want to give them such a conventional interface that there's nothing interesting or engaging or original about that experience. In this section, we're going to look at interface conventions, and we're going to break it down into two different categories. The first category is going to be the interface and how it relates to us as users, as physical human beings. There are certain conventions here to do with the arrangement and positioning of information on the screen. If we take our basic keypad again and think about how that works, there's a set of numbers, keys to push, a screen where we see the results. But if we just take those elements without thinking about the design of the elements and reconfigure them, the keypad becomes very dysfunctional. We're not really sure how to use it anymore, and we're not really sure we recognize it as a keypad anymore. And there's a couple of reasons for this. One is because we're used to seeing keypads arranged in a certain way. We're used to seeing a calculator, for example, and we used to seeing that look in a certain format. And that format was, came from a physical calculator that came out of the 1970s and the 1980s. Although if we look at a digital calculator on, say, the iPhone, for instance, the design of it is actually exactly the same. It's not the graphic elements that are changing. The buttons are still the same. Some of the shapes might change, the colors might change, but it's really the arrangement that is causing disorientation for the user because it changes how we physically interact with the keypad. And this is a very important thing for us to look at in terms of thinking about interface conventions, physical interface conventions, that is. It's to do with the size of the screen that we have in relationship with the human form. And our basic human interactions and human ergonomics have had a strong impact on what kinds of things can actually happen in the interface on the screen. Because we've rearranged the elements, we've made it quite dysfunctional. If we put it back to how it was, we can look and see what happens when we as human beings press a key. Straight away, we need to be able to think about the key in relationship to the size of our fingers, as well as the keypad in relationship to the size of our hand. So the size and shape of the buttons might actually have some relationship to the human body, to the human hand. If we think about how we interact with this keypad to press numbers, the human hand gets in the way of a lot of the numbers when we're pressing them, particularly the numbers at the top. Then we can't see the ones at the bottom. They're hidden by the hand. So straight away we realize that we have to have the screen showing the result of our interaction above the keypad. Otherwise, the hand is going to be hiding the screen and we won't be able to see what we're pressing. So there's a very simple relationship between our physicality as human beings and the machinery, the screens that we interact with. You could think about the keypad, the scale of it, in relationship to the scale of the human hand. If a calculator, for instance, fits in a hand in a comfortable way, then it's going to make our interactions much more easy. It's going to feel comfortable to interact with. This becomes relevant when we think about how the scale of the calculator, for instance, in relationship to the human body, also relates to the scale of your phone currently, for instance. Both devices are held in the hand at a comfortable distance, and we're able to interact with the screen or the interface with our fingers to get the information we want in the easiest way possible. When we interact with a handheld device, we're really just using our fingers. We're not really using any other parts of our body to interact with it. But when we have different sized screens, we start to interact with them in different ways. When we hold these screens at different distances from our body, so they fill our visual feel in different ways as well. We hold and look at a phone very differently from how we hold and look at and interact with an iPad, for instance. If we look at another screen, if we increase the size of that screen even more, then we can see how our interaction changes even more. So for instance, with a laptop, our hands are much more active in a different way. We're not touching the screen anymore. Now we're touching a keypad. So we've got a different kind of physical movement. We're also not holding the computer anymore in the way that we hold an iPad or a phone, for instance. Now it's resting, and we've got two hands to interact with the keyboard now. And these different kinds of interactions with physical devices explains a little bit why we like to have different size screens for different kinds of functions and different kinds of interactions. Some are more portable than others, 
but the ones that are not portable allow us to have a much larger screen and perhaps allow us to do much more robust kinds of work in a fixed situation. The physical size of the computer has a relationship to our bodies. If we think about a desktop computer, it's more removed than even the laptop is because now the keypad is a separate item, our screen is even bigger, and it's definitely much less mobile. The phone you can take everywhere, but a desktop computer stays in one place. These physical conventions all have a relationship to the human body and how we interact with different sizes of screens and how we have different tasks that we complete on those different screens. Those screens are based on a relationship to our whole human body and being able to carry screens around. But our interaction with the screens takes place mainly through the hand and through the eye. And these are both conduits to our thinking device, our CPU, in other words, our brain. The eye lets us see what we've done, and the hand lets us interact with the computer. It's important to know about these physical conventions because these lead into the digital conventions. Over the years, interface designers have taken into account a user's physicality to develop the best solutions of how interfaces should work. And these digital conventions have become standardized to the point of interface invisibility. We never really think anymore why our navigation menus are at the top of our screen. We just take it for granted that that's where they're going to live. It's become such a convention that it's become invisible to us. So our navigation choices normally go at the top of the computer. If we want to see a long menu when we click on these, it needs to have space for the menu to fall down. So being at the top seems a logical place for it to be. It's also a convenient place to put something where you can ignore it if you want to. We're very used to a certain arrangement and hierarchy of information in the interface. Our branding or identity might be very visible, sitting under the menu choices at the top of the screen. And then we probably have an area uh, taking up most of the rest of the screen that shows variable content or whatever specialized things that particular website can do. And then down at the bottom, quite often there's secondary information, all the things you need to find when there's a problem with the website menu items that are at a lower hierarchical level than the ones at the top. So even just by putting these four things together, we have something that looks like a fairly generic and familiar website. We could shrink our menu down to make it have a better relationship to the size of the screen, and we could introduce another convention. How do we search the information on our website? How do we find something? So if we have a live text entry box with a search icon, even the icon itself is a convention. We know what the icon of the magnifying glass means. We know it's not actually for a magnifying glass. We know it's for looking or searching for something. So it's another digital convention. In this segment, we're going to look at two different approaches to user interface design. One which is much more template-based and working with conventions versus one that is more content-based. If we go back to our generic web structure, we can see that in many ways, the template equals a distilled version of conventions. This can be useful because of its familiarity and its ubiquity, but it can also be a little bit boring and sometimes predictable due to the same factors. The template doesn't take content into account. The template is content agnostic. And while this offers a level of functionality, it also offers a level of predictability. And sometimes that experience means it's not that exciting. It doesn't matter what kind of content you flow into a generic structure, the framework never changes. If we're making a website about the shapes of animals, for instance, it might vary little if our content was how to bake a cake or how to buy a t-shirt. But adversely, the generic interface does have some great advantages. First of all, it's fast and it's easy and it offers some flexibility, so even though it's generic, it can still be customized. It's good for repetitive, similar kinds of content. For instance, here's a website built using Squarespace, which has standardized templates. This is a website for an artist, where you can see it's easy to categorize the information into certain bodies of work, and it's easy to navigate them and choose which body of work you want to look at. It's very clean and functional. It's not confusing, it's very clear. So there are other conventions we can see here. There are thumbnails of work that you can click on. You can scroll through images from top to bottom. So thinking about what kind of areas a template might be successful in, something like this website where the content is visually complex but needs to be organized in an easy to understand and accessible way might be good for a template. 
there's also not a lot of user interaction here, apart from looking at pictures of things. So here again, a template would work very well for that. We can see similarities with how that might be a structure that also works for something like our Animal Shapes website, where the content is very, very similar, so it makes sense for it to be organized in a flat way. But let's see what's happened when we change that content into something that has a little more variation. For instance, here's some publications that I've designed, and I might decide I want to make a website of my book designs. These are very three-dimensional, and they have different kinds of formats, so suddenly it's a lot harder for me to arrange these. I'm not working with regular squares as part of my interface elements. I'm working with irregular objects, so the generic interface starts to work a little bit less. But I can take this idea of a fairly generic functional website, and I can start to customize it. I can add color to my website, for instance. I can create a division between the navigation and the content area. I can choose the color of my typography. All of these things are options that might be available in a template. And I might be able to choose something where there's much less of a visible grid in the structure, for instance, that creates a different kind of experience. But it still feels like a relatively generic solution when we're working within the constraints of the template. Even my aesthetic design decisions are still contained under the umbrella of what the template can do. So here's what that website actually looks like when it might be made. It's taking some of the ideas of the template in terms of structure, accessibility, and logic, but it's creating something that has a little more visual interest by creating a user interface that is a little more specific to this particular kind of content. Here are the same kind of books, but they're structured in a way where there's a different color coding system and the typography works in a more visually interesting way, but the logic and structure of the site is still very much based on how a template works, where you can peruse different sections and zoom into them and look at details. But it's actually the details of the design and the interface design that make the difference to this experience. It makes it more rich. It makes it a more idiosyncratic experience than if a user was looking at a purely generic website. But at the same time, it retains some of the functionality and familiarity, the ease of use that you want to have from a generic or functional website. And that's something that the generic website can offer. It's essential to remember that in this way, one size does not fit all. A template can be very useful in terms of its functionality, but it has to be modified in order to take certain kinds of content into account. Or on the other hand, the template could be ignored entirely, and we could take some of those conventions and turn them into a much more content-specific design. And what we mean by this is really looking at what you're building an app, a website, or an interface for, and trying to think about what is the best kind of interface possible for this kind of content. And we often call this context-specific design because it's taking into account other things as well as just the content. Context-specific design has a relationship to specific content. In other words, the way that a visual experience looks has a direct correlation to what the content is or what the message of that experience is. But the interface is also shaped by other factors. There might be a certain user group that is specific to this particular digital experience, and that might change how the interface looks and how the interface feels. For instance, if I knew that my user group with purely people that listened only to heavy metal music, that might dictate the kind of typography or the kind of imagery that I might want to use. But if I knew that it was for people that liked all different kinds of music, I'd have to create something that had a more general feeling to it and a less specific feeling. The design can also be tempered by the digital experience having certain goals or outcomes that are desired. And this might drive how the user interface works and also how it looks. And these external factors can be different for each different website. So it makes us think about when to use a template and when not to use a template. When the content is strong or has a specific user group or specific goals, a template might not always be the best solution. We're looking at a balance between the functionality of generic design and interface conventions and the specificity of different kinds of content or experiences that we want a user to have. A lot of interface designers strive to have an invisible experience, for the interface to be invisible. 
What this means is they don't want the interface to get in the way of the content. And that invisible experience really equates to prioritizing the functionality above all. But the danger of the invisible experience is that it can become a generic experience. Another way to think about it is that the specificity of any digital experience comes through the aesthetics of that experience, whereas the functionality is coming from the interface conventions or the utility. When you combine the aesthetics and the functionality together, you end up with the complete digital experience where you feel like you have something idiosyncratic and personal, but you also have something that is functional. In this segment, we're going to look at aesthetics and functionality, and this correlates quite strongly to some of the things we've already looked at. Internet conventions, which are really about functionality of the user interface, and aesthetics, which are about the formal resolution of how something looks, which is often connected to the content. We can think about this in a very simple way when building a user interface, in terms of how it looks and how it works. And a user interface designer tends to work with both of these things together. So we're going to pull these things apart to look at them separately. So if we think about how to turn this into a button, for instance, we could make some design moves that are purely aesthetic to make this happen. We might create a background shape behind the type, so we've got a physical area that we know is interactive. We might add some text so we know what the button is going to do. We might decide we want the button to look three-dimensional to make it look physical. We could change the typography. We could change the color of the typography as well. All of these things might make part of our interface look a certain way, but it might not necessarily change how it works. If we look at how it works, we could take the same shape, but the how it works part might be more about changing the states of the button. So if a mouse hovers over it, it might change color. And when it's clicked, it might change color again. So how it works and how it looks are not mutually exclusive. If we look at a more contemporary example of that, and we take a much more reduced version of an interface, a more minimal interface, we could look at the difference between how things look and how things work with a much more minimal language. Here, how it looks is actually very similar to how it works. We don't need to try and create something that physically looks like a button because we already understand that everything on the screen is going to be interactive due to interface conventions that we're already familiar with. So how it looks and how it works become fused into one thing. The aesthetics and the functionality become merged together as one interface element. And in contemporary interface design, this is a good way to think about when something is successful, when both the aesthetics and the functionality are working together in a very harmonious way to form the interface. To use some of the same language we've already looked at, the aesthetic part of the interface design is about giving the interface a sense of individuality, whereas the functional part of the interface design is about giving it some familiarity, some ease of use. And when you put these two things together, it can be very powerful. So the aesthetics are creating an individual feeling, but the functionality of the interface, the familiarity of it, is making it easy to use as well. So you have both functionality and visual interest. And putting these things together is really the key to making a successful user interface. Welcome to the second week of Visual Elements of Interface Design. This week, we're going to examine the various formal elements that make up an interface. We'll start out with the larger questions of content, context, and audience that frame any UI UX project. In other words, what is it? Who is it for? And where does it live? We'll look at the big picture of overall design direction, what's often referred to as look and feel. From there, we'll go into detail of how the components of visual design work in the context of interface design. Language, shape, color, imagery, typography, and icons. These areas will be the formal building blocks you'll use to create the more complex visual structure of a user interface. We spent the first week talking about design and not really making anything. So I know what you're thinking. Enough talking, let's start making. But before you can make anything, you need to know what is it that you're making. Most design projects have a brief, and a brief outlines or describes the project 
before you even begin designing. And the brief itself is kind of a design project in its own way. So it's interesting to look at this idea of what's in a brief. A brief often describes what the project is, what its goals are, and how it's going to work. So this involves looking at content, context, and audience. And I know that I promised that we were going to stop talking and start making, but we need to define what it is that we're going to make first of all. What is it? Who is it for? And where does it live? Without this clear articulation of these goals, you could be making something for weeks or months without it really achieving what you want it to achieve. So let's look at how these three questions might work in a brief and let's look at some examples. For instance, if we thought about what is it, let's come up with an idea. Perhaps I want to make a guitar tuner. That's something that could be quite interesting to exist on a digital platform. I could also think about who is it for. Let's say that it's for beginning guitarists. It's not for master guitarists that might already know how to tune their guitar. It's really for novices, people that are just starting out and might need some help. I could also think about where does it live. It would be logical for this to live on a phone app so that it could be portable, it could be easy to carry around, and something that I could use hands-free when I'm tuning my guitar. So when you put these things together, you've got an accurate description. It's a phone app to tune your guitar for beginning guitarists. And this is entirely non-visual. But I've already started to give some shape to my idea. I've already started to describe it with words. And this is pre-design. It's really design that outlines or defines what the project is before you've even made anything. So let's try it again. But let's think of a different subject this time. How about a digital microscope? That sounds like something that could be quite interesting to make as an app and that could utilize a lot of what a phone can do. So who is it for? In this case, it's going to be for amateur scientists. So again, it's not for the novice, but it's also not for the expert. A proven scientist might need something much more technical. Where would it live? It would seem again that this would work as a phone app best of all, so it could utilize what a phone is good at. It could use the camera in the phone, and it could use the screen of the phone to look at what you're magnifying. If we put these things together, we'd have an accurate description of what the project is, who it's for, and where it's going to live. A digital microscope for amateur scientists on your phone. And again, it's purely non-visual. It really just describes the project using words, We've articulated what it is, so when we start to make something, we've got a clear set of goals. And this is really important to know that our goals, constraints, platform, audience, all of these things are going to shape and inform the design, and quite often the designer doesn't get to decide these things. These things are determined by the client, and often they're determined by the client in the brief, before the designer even gets a chance to think about them or work with them. So if you want to be a good designer, you're going to need what the goals are, what the constraints are, what kind of platform your project is going to live on, and who the audience is. Because these things will inform your design. What this means is you really need to know your project. You need to understand every aspect of it so you can make the best possible visual solution for it. More than anything, you need to be the expert no matter what kind of content you're going to be working with. You should be the expert as a designer, but also be the expert in terms of the content that you're working with. Now that we've got a design brief, our project described in words, we can begin to think about making some design. We can begin to think about the broadest sense of how design works in a UI project, the look and feel of the project. Another way to think about it is to think about the style and the mood of a project. So if you look at it in terms of Style frames, for instance, you could think about what would it be like if a single slice of this project was to be finished. And that's often done in motion projects. In print projects, there's also a thing called a mood board where you try and paint a broad picture of research and the look and feel of a project. What all of these things are trying to do, and they're fairly interchangeable expressions, is that they're trying to envision the overall design direction. And this is still part of pre-design. We're not really working with words now, but we're working with very broad visual strokes. It gets us into a mode of pre-production. 
It's, and it's before we've really produced anything. It's pre-commitment as well. It's before we've really made any design decisions that we have to stick to. And what that means is it's before we've really spent any money. You have to get all the components right before a project goes into production and might cost millions of dollars where thousands of people might be using it and hundreds of people beta testing it. So it's important to get these things right before you go into production. And this gets at the core of what a lot of UI design really is. It's about envisioning the design. It's about imagining that design, trying to give it a visual form even though it doesn't really exist. In a lot of ways, UI designer is trying to visualize the invisible. And this is one of the most important skills that UI designers have. One of the easiest ways to start to do that is to start to look at style boards. So if we go back to our original idea of a digital microscope for amateur scientists to operate on your phone, we could start to think about what that might look like. So to begin with, we could do some visual research, which is easy to do nowadays, where you can go online, you can find copyright free images, for instance. And we could look at what kind of images might look like they're seen through a digital microscope. We could look at scientific images. We could look at how the phone could be used as a microscope. And this will give us a range of what the imagery might feel like. We could pick a typeface as well that might have a suitable feeling or a suitable style for this particular mood in this particular app. And likewise, we could pick colors so we could have a color palette that we might use. And these are all very, very broad design elements that we're choosing. For instance, here I'm picking a color palette just out of the imagery that I've already found to try and get a relationship between the color palette and the imagery. As you start to put these things together and do research, it means that you're creating a mood and a feeling of imagery, of color, of typography. So if we take those research images that we found, we could actually use those and we could build a single piece of work that has a mood and a tone that tries to reflect what we're trying to get at with our app. So I could take some of the microscopic images, for instance, and blow them up, create some gradations, have them feel very scientific. And because this is for amateur scientists, I might want to depict exactly who it is that the app is for, who's going to use it. I could also use certain kinds of shapes, for instance, perhaps in this case circular shapes that might indicate looking through a microscope and have a visual reference to that. I could show what it's like to actually use the app. So you could see somebody holding a phone, for instance, and looking at a close-up of something through the microscope. So I'm trying to get at what is the visual look and feel of this app, but I'm also trying to get at what is the experience of it, what's going to feel like when it's a finished product, without really doing very much work at all, without making the finished product at all. I'm really just taking a group of images and trying to paint a very broad picture of what it might feel like to use this app without any details at all. So here, for instance, I could also look at some test type, could look at a certain kind of typography, put the color palette back in there again, and really building up a style frame that I could show to somebody and they could look at this and they could have a, an idea of what my intentions were and what the feeling of the app might be. And as I mentioned, it's, it's this apparent way of trying to envision something that is invisible. So we started from one sentence that was described in text and we're trying to end up with something that is purely visual and has a lot of mood and a lot of feeling to it. So let's try doing that again. But this time, let's take a different visual approach. Let's take our same starting sentence. In other words, we're going to use our same prompt, our same brief, but we're going to take it in a different visual direction. So here we're going to use much more vector-based imagery. It's going to look less hardcore scientific. It's going to look a little bit more fun. It might have a slightly younger audience. So already, even just from our initial visual research, it looks very different. So even though we're taking the same visual brief, the same prompt, our visual representation of it is very, very different because we've made design decisions that have changed that. So we're going to put these images together in a very similar way that we put the scientific photographic images together so we can compare the two and see how they feel different. So let's take some of these vector drawings of scientific instruments and we'll blow these up very large. They'll be much more friendly, a little more cartoon based. 
We can have a more cartoon-like avatar to lead us through the project, for instance. And we can look at some color palettes that are perhaps a bit more fun, again, for a more youthful audience. And we could keep the circular motif that worked quite well from before that seems to represent um, the idea of looking through the microscope. And we can build this image in a very similar way, but it has a totally different feeling than the more serious photographic scientific version we had before. This version now feels like it's a lot more fun. It could be for a younger audience, and that might have some implications for how the app might work, what it might do, and how you might use it. We could throw some smaller freeform elements in there as well to fill in some of the gaps. We can pick a different typeface for this one. It's a lot more fun, so let's pick something that's perhaps a bit more contemporary, less scientific. How about something that is a geometric sans serif, for instance, something that is quite neutral, but quite contemporary as well. And we'll do the same exercise where we'll take parts of the um, color palette and we'll use those. So we'll pull that out of the imagery to make a color palette. So you can see if we slot together these two different screens that we'd made, you can see how they feel very different even though they're using a lot of the same compositional elements, they're using a lot of the same ideas in terms of their content. So to reiterate, it's really about the look and the feel, and that has a strong relationship to who might use this kind of app. So we're back to our original questions about what is the app exactly, who is it for, and where does it live? These two screens might take those questions into slightly different places. For instance, the one on the left might be much more scientific and serious, and again, the one on the right much more playful. If we take our two screens, we can analyze those and start to come up with some adjectives to describe them, and that'll help us push that direction that we want to go in even further. So we've made things that exist in a purely visual form, in a very emotive and a very mood-based way, but we could actually turn that on its head and pull it back towards language in order to describe what we've done. In this section, we're going to look at how we use language as a design tool. In other words, how do we work with words? And there's many different ways that we can do this on a variety of different scales within our project. We left our project thinking about what does it look like and what does it feel like? And we've done that so far in a very visual way, using images and using icons, typography, color palette. And now we can think a little bit more about how this might work with words. How we could use words to describe the overall tone and attitude, much in the same way that we had a mood board describe that same thing visually. So if we take our scientific example for the phone microscope, for instance, we could think about what kind of words might we use to describe this if we didn't have the visuals there to do the job for us. So it's definitely scientific, technical, there's a kind of realism to it, but it's a very digital realism, maybe one that we don't always see. It's also quite serious, it's quite practical, so it's quite useful to come up with a set of words, and those words won't apply to every design direction that you have. For instance, here's our second design direction, and even though there's some things in common, it's still scientific, for instance, I think there's other things that are very different about it. Again, about how it looks and feels. It's much less technical and much more playful, for instance. And the images are less about having a reality or a digital feel to them, and much more about being animated or cartoonish. And overall, that gives it a slightly different feeling if we had to describe that with words. It certainly wouldn't be that it's as serious as the other direction. It would be much more friendly, playful, and fun. Overall, we'd have much less of a practical feeling to this app, and maybe it would be much more entertaining and much more fun to use. So we can take these sets of words that we've used to describe our app, and we can think about those as a stepping stone to think about naming and branding. So one good thing to do is to do a bit of linguistic research and to try and play around a little bit with other words that are around the subject matter. So here's a collection of words that feel like they might relate to this app and how we might use it. So we could take inspiration from these words, or we could actually take parts of the words themselves, which is a very easy strategy, and think about how to combine them into a name, maybe something that we recognize or something we don't. So for instance, we could think about a name like C cells, because our app would allow us to see cells, or micro fun, which could be a way of 
having fun looking at small things. But while we're looking at the scientific basis of the language, we're also trying to put it together in a way that seems like it's fun, because that's reflective of our app. You can think about what the words describe, but you can also think about how they sound. Just the word MagnoZoom sounds like it's a lot of fun on its own. If we take our other example that's more serious and scientific, we might come up with a totally different set of words in our research. Even though we'd be looking at similar subject matter, we'd be looking at much more scientific words that obviously have a different kind of structure to them. So this would lead us to different kinds of names and different kinds of branding. But we'd use a similar structure, perhaps, where we can take parts of these expressions and think about how we put them together to either make a new word that we've never heard of before, or to make a word where we understand the parts where it's come from, and we understand that it's making something new as well. So for instance, we might look at the name nanoscope and understand nano meaning small and scope talking about vision or microscope. And the word itself that we make sounds like it's a real thing, even though it probably isn't. So let's compare our two directions that we have and pick names for them. So we're going to call our scientific direction octoscope and we're going to call our more playful direction C cells. So we can think about how we use words in a number of other ways as well as branding. We could think about words as navigation, for instance. So if we were looking at something through our phones in the scientific world, we might be magnifying, but in the fun world, we'd be zooming. Likewise, if we were going to save our image, we might save it to a journal in the scientific world, but a scrapbook in the fun world. And if we wanted to share those images, we'd be publishing them in the scientific world, where we might be doing a show and tell in the much more fun world. So you can see how doing the same thing can be described with a different attitude, with a different mood. And we can use words as content to describe what it is that the whole of our app does as well. And again, the mood and attitude can come across in how we use those words. So our scientific microscope might use a much more academic language in order to describe it, and in order to describe how the user might interact with it and what the user might do. Our fun version of the microscope might use very different language. Here it would be much less academic, much more informal, appealing to a much broader audience, and with a little more of a fun attitude to it. So you can see how we're using language to really describe something in a very different way. We're using it to set mood and to set tone in the same way that we did with our images. So we're really looking at language as a design tool. We're looking at how it can be shaped and how it can be used in a variety of different ways. So language can set the mood and the tone in the same way that our visuals did. And it can do this at every level throughout your app. In this section, we're going to look at how color and shape can work as formal elements of your interface design. So let's start out by looking at color in a little more detail. One of the main ways that color works is by creating an overall mood. And this can be really useful in an app, because again, it can set the tone if you want something to be serious or more fun. You might find a color palette that makes your app more believable. As human beings, we generally respond to colors and we respond to them in a very subjective and emotive way. So let's start out by doing a few exercises and looking at how color works. And let's take our scientific interface and let's take all the color away from it and start out with just black and white. When everything is just black and white, we often have connotations with that of design being very serious. And that stems from cultural connotations of black and white printing, newspapers, early photography. But just by adding a simple color, we can change those connotations. When we put yellow and black together, for instance, we're used to seeing that to represent danger. When we see a bright color, like magenta, we think that that's something that's perhaps going to be fun. So you can see how even just changing one color can create an emotion. If we start to put together a palette where we've got a range of colors working together in harmony, we could have a cool palette that might create a very icy or cold feeling. And when we start to change those colors, we could create other connotations. For me, red, white, and blue represents England. For other people, it might represent a different country. We could take a palette that comes out of nature, for instance, browns or greens, 
and we can build a palette that makes us feel maybe calm or makes us feel a connection to nature. So there are some connotations that come from the real world and some that are fabricated. We see blue things, we might think it's a design for a boy and pink is a design for a girl, but those are just cultural conventions. Color is quite relative in a lot of ways and quite subjective. So we have to figure out how to control that and how to try and control that subjectivity a little bit in order to get it to do what we want it to do for our interface in order to help create an atmosphere and a mood as well as a function. And in terms of function we can use color in many different ways and a primary one is to think about how color works as navigation within our interface. So for instance if you have these three buttons and I ask you to pick one I'm pretty sure you're going to press the green button just because it looks like it's active. We're used to thinking that perhaps green makes it want to be picked but also it's different from the other buttons. And we can use color to both create difference and similarity. So just by changing the other buttons here, the inactive buttons, from gray to a lighter shade of green, we build a different kind of relationship. Now they feel like they have the possibility to all be pressed and turn to the darker shade of green. And basically what we're doing here is creating a system that has differences and similarities. And that can also work in terms of association with other things that we've experienced before, either in interfaces or the real world. We think about green as being go or being active, and red as being stop or being danger. If we use colors that have a similar relationship, they can also build a sense of similar functionality. So here we've got three buttons going from light to dark with a similar hue to them, and they might feel like they do the same thing, but to maybe a different extent. Whereas if we have three different hues, we feel like that these three different buttons are going to have three different functions. We can use color in numerous ways. We could use it to denote something being active. Here, just the green that's different from the blues suggests that something has been turned on or is an active element. And we could take that same idea and take the green button and turn it into a red button to suggest it being inactive. As well as signifying an event or activity, Color also works as part of a system. Here, for instance, we have one of three things selected. If you were to click on a blue button now, would it turn to red? And would the red turn to blue? As well as showing us what's active, color can also show us what's inactive or passive. Here, the element that's different has a more muted color, so we know that it's the thing that is actually not working rather than working. You could also think about how color can be used to show progression. In this case, we've got three possible stages, and it feels like we're two-thirds of the way to completion, because we have two out of a possible three areas lit. We can also look at how color can show absolutely different states, but within the same space. So one button, or one space, can take on different colors to tell us different things. So here, for instance, this button is gray. It's passive or inactive which means the user hasn't interacted with it at all. But once the user goes to interact with it, the button becomes active. Not activated, but active. So this could be in a touch state, or when a mouse is hovering over a button, for instance. And once it's actually been pressed, or clicked, or touched, then it becomes activated. So the same button is telling the user three different things just by changing its color. So now let's look a little bit at shapes and how we use shapes in user interface design. We primarily use shapes in two different ways in interface design. One is as interface elements, the buttons that you click on, the areas of navigation where you need to go, and the other is as design elements, in other words, shapes that are mixed up with images that are there more for look and feel. Our interface elements are primarily functional, so we're talking about shapes that work as part of a system but are also often geometric, simple to understand, easy for the user to access. When we use shapes as design elements, they're often less systematic, much more emotive, and sometimes more ephemeral. They're much more about the look and feel of the interface than they are about the functionality of the interface. And in this way, they often contribute to that look and feel, and not to the navigation itself. 
In many ways, they could be viewed as non-essential elements. But my argument would be that while they're not an essential part of the navigation, they are essential in terms of creating a mood, creating a sense of individuality, and creating a graphic interface. Otherwise, all interfaces would look the same. Picking a certain kind of shape can have a big effect on the interface, whether it's a diagonal, or a square, or a circle, for instance, just as a basic form, might make a difference between having a lot of direction versus a lot of stasis versus feeling very organic. We use shapes for our interface elements because of their functionality, and it's a certain kind of shape that we use, normally ones that are geometric, that are simple, that are systematic, so that they can be fast to understand and they can make a system that's fast for the user to visually learn and to interact with. We often use shapes and motifs that we're familiar with as buttons in the real world, but the key thing here is that they have a relationship to what is pressing the button or the active area. So whether that's the cursor of the mouse or whether it's the finger, we're building a system that relates to the user and how they interact with the content, but we're also making a system that's flexible where we could label these buttons with anything that we wanted to. In this section, we're going to look at how to use imagery in interface design. The most common use of imagery is as content in your app or in your website, but we can also use imagery to create a mood, or we can use imagery as part of our navigation or part of our interface system. So let's start out by looking at imagery as content. We live in an image-based society where we're constantly surrounded by images, but on our screens, most of those images are contained. I mean, if you think about videos or search engines or the images that we look at online, they're nearly always images in boxes. So they're really content that's being shown in a frame here, and that content can be anything. It's really not about being part of the interface, it's being the thing that we're delivering to the audience. So if we're doing a search, for instance, for something that we want to buy, we want to visually see all the different variations that we could possibly have and the fastest way to do that is through imagery and that imagery is contained and organized. When images break out of the box and become their own world they act as immersive imagery and you see this much more often in games sometimes in apps but in animations as well where the imagery creates a whole universe a whole world where things don't have to live in boxes anymore the way we use contained images is much more based on traditional graphic design. It's really based on print layout, where you have a grid and you put things into a box. But in the immersive world, there's a little bit more fluidity. It's based much more on video games and animation and film, and you tend to have more of a correlation between what the interface looks like and what the content looks like. Both contained imagery and immersive imagery come in all different kinds of styles. So there can be illustration, there can be photography, 3D renderings, pretty much any style that you want to make an image in. The benefit of the contained image is that it's very pragmatic. You can put anything into a box and have it sit side by side with anything else. So you could take illustrations and drawings, have them sit next to photographs, and the grid, the boxes that you're putting them in, levels across all the content, so it becomes a very functional comparative structure for you to use in an interface design. So you see it especially when you need to work across a lot of content that needs to be searched or work across a lot of different sized platforms. When imagery isn't there as the content, it's often there to create a mood. You might be designing an interface for an app that doesn't have a service that is image-based. So for instance, Uber doesn't want to show somebody getting in and out of a cab, but they'd rather show a stylish illustration that makes it feel a certain way, feel a little bit upmarket to set a tone for what the service is. You can see images working really hard to create moods if you look at stock photo sites. The whole purpose of the photography here is to actually be non-specific and most of the time to create a feeling or a mood that the audience is going to relate to rather than having a specific content in the image. Sometimes when you look at mock-ups for websites, they're quite often using stock images to try and create the right kind of ambience or mood that's going to appeal to that particular audience or relate to that kind of content.
Due to good old aesthetics, imagery can't just be content. Imagery always has a visual form, and that visual form always has some style or aesthetic attached to it, so thereby it creates a mood. Here's some images from CalArts website, and while they're trying to depict the events that are happening at the school, they're also trying to have a visual form that expresses the energy and exuberance of the school. Color, composition, and visual aesthetics can be really important in creating an image that's going to engage an audience. And that might be done in an overt way, where the image looks very constructed and clearly has a concept behind it, as in this example here. Or it can also be done in a way that's a little more invisible. These images from Apple are very carefully constructed to show the products off in their best light, but to also sell a lifestyle and sell an aesthetic that goes along with the Apple products. So they're selling you both content and mood lifestyle at the same time. Imagery can also be used as a tool for navigation, but most often this happens in a very reduced form, partly because the image has to work at a small size, but it also has to be very recognizable. But imagery can do much more than just being a symbol or an icon. Imagery can be a more integral part of the interface. Images can work really well as buttons as part of your navigation system, and this is partly because they accurately represent exactly what you're going to get when you click on them. There's no ambiguity there. They can also work really well if the thing you're trying to represent is very difficult to describe with words, but easy to show with an image. And as we already talked about, every time you use an image, as well as doing whatever function you've assigned to it, it's also going to have an aesthetic function. There's also going to be mood and tone there. So for instance, a map on Waze looks very different to a map on Google Maps. Waze is trying to create a visual aesthetic that suits its user base, that suits its audience. It's trying to be more youthful, more fun, and perhaps a little bit irreverent. But along with the aesthetics, the map still functions in a pragmatic way. The symbols and the interface all work perfectly. So our imagery is doing multiple things at the same time. It's acting as mood, it's acting as part of the interface, but it's also the content in this case as well, because it's the map itself and the cars and the accidents and everything that we want to see. So you can see that happening here in this interface designed by one of my students, where it's purely an image-based interface. So the content, the navigation, and the aesthetics are all being driven by the same imagery, and that imagery is controlled and aestheticized to make a beautiful interface. So you can have imagery as content, imagery that's there just for mood, or imagery that's there for navigation, but you can never avoid the aesthetics of the image. You can actually never avoid the mood. So even if your content is the only place that you have imagery, it's going to have some implications for what the app or the website looks and feels like, and the same for your navigation. You can't isolate the content and the navigation from the aesthetics and the mood of the imagery. You're always going to have to deal with it in one way or another. And what this is acknowledging is that we're creating visual interfaces here, what used to be called graphical user interfaces. We're not creating just lists of words for our content, or we're not creating just words for our navigation, everything has a form. And because it has a form, it has an aesthetic value. It can create a mood, and there's no way of escaping that. Your content will always have mood, and your navigation or interface design will always have mood as well. So it's really worth thinking about the visual aesthetics and how you use imagery and the quality of the imagery that you have, because you can't escape the fact that it's going to have an effect on the user. In this section, we're going to look at some ideas around the use of typography in the user interface. Type can work in many different ways. As text, it can be the content for your app or your website. It can act as part of the interface in terms of labels and buttons, or it could be part of a branding system to give your app or website an identity. Let's start out by looking at type as content. Why do we even read on screens anymore, when we have video and audio to get our information through? Well, the answer is that text does quite a few things that it's quite good at. It's language made physical. Text is very fast, so it's very accessible. 
it's quite accurate in terms of trying to describe something. It's very economical in terms of how it works on a screen. But most importantly, it can represent what can't be depicted. If we think about how text translates to texting, we can see that the things that text is good at get amplified even more. Texting becomes faster, becomes more economical, it starts to use images, emojis, in with the text itself. On screen, we start to change the very structure of language, as well as changing what we consider to be a typographic character. Far from being eclipsed by video and audio and images, text is becoming one of our prevalent means of communication on the screen, and if anything, it's absorbing imagery into its language. It's also starting to reconfigure itself, to alter itself to work in a new digital realm. Websites, blogs, texts, tweets, they're all fundamentally text-based still, and that text has to have a visual form. It has to have a typographic representation, so it becomes a design problem. It becomes part of an interface design. We don't really think about it so much, but text is still one of the main vehicles that we use for carrying knowledge and for imparting and sharing that knowledge through digital media. So type has an integral role in terms of how it works as content, but it also has an integral role in terms of how it works as part of the interface. And this is because type can do things that images and icons can't. So we can ask ourselves the same questions. Why do we need type as part of an interface? Why don't we just have icons for everything? A lot of the answers to why we have type as part of our interface are the same as why we use text for content. It's language made physical, and it has all the advantages of language. Type's very fast, it's accurate and clear meaning and economical, and also, again, it can represent what can't be depicted. So let's look at some examples. Type is fast to read. When we see a stop sign, for instance, we know exactly what it means straight away. We barely even have to read the type, we recognize the form of the type, and it has a very accurate and clear meaning. There's no confusion there, there's no ambiguity at all. Stop only means one thing, stop, and go only means one thing, go. There's absolutely no gray area there, there's no interpretation. And this can be very useful in terms of designing an interface. Language is very economical in terms of its meaning, not just a single word either. We can take a letter and we can use that to represent something. So we know that this I stands in for information, for instance. But we also know that a P, part of the same alphabetic system, has a totally different meaning and means something else. And there's a level of modularity and flexibility to language. We can add another letter to that P and have the meaning totally change, even though the form itself hasn't changed. In fact, the form of all three of these images is the same, but the meaning is very, very different. So language has a great deal of flexibility in terms of how it works. It can also be useful in terms of interface design because it can work at greatly different scales. Sometimes images don't have that same flexibility and we end up making icons or symbols, often out of type. But most importantly, type can represent what can't be depicted. And it takes a little moment to unpack what this statement really means. But think about, as an example, a word like democracy. How would you represent this word visually? It would actually be quite difficult. There's not really a single iconic image to represent democracy. It's always going to be a little bit more ambiguous as an image than it is when it's represented with language. Even the words surrounding democracy that might describe it, government, voting, elections, politics, when you turn those into the form of imagery, they still, have a, they still have a lot of overlap between how they might be read. So words are great for the accurate representation of complex, non-visual concepts, like democracy, for instance. And this is great for an interface designer, because quite often we'll be trying to show things that are complex, non-visual concepts. And these appear in a lot of different places, in menus, naming, buttons, instructions. In fact, type is everywhere in our interface because it's still the fastest and most accurate way we have to communicate complex and specific ideas. Finally, let's look at type as branding. 
Here, type has a slightly different job to play. It's much less about it being content and about it conveying what it actually says, and it's much more about connotation. In other words, what does the form of the type look like? What kind of things does it suggest? And this can be a way to create a sense of identity or individuality, and this can lead to a visual typographic brand that can be really, really helpful in terms of making your app or your website stand out and look different from everybody else, or it can be a way of making it build sympathy to a certain kind of content. The combination of idiosyncratic or individual form and the right kind of formal connotations can lead to branding typographically, most often expressed as a logotype. So if we look at some examples here, we could take some large companies and see what they look like without any form. Typographic form is a lot like clothes for words. The meaning is still there, but it's dressed up with a different surface, a different form. I'm willing to guess that it's hard for you to look at these words and not think about the intrinsic form that these logotypes are normally seen in. We're used to seeing Adidas look a certain way with its round, repetitive forms. We're used to seeing Nike as both a logo type, a typographic form, and as a mark or a logo. In other words, in this case, the swoosh. And we see those things separately and recognize them, but we also see them together. The logo type and logo work together in harmony to form a single lockup. There are other systems that you can use to think about to create an identity typographically. Some of them could be color dependent. For instance, Netflix we see as being red and black. And when we look at the logo type, and then we look at a smaller version of it, a bug or a button, we can see that it's not the same letter form that's there. It's actually the color that is creating the continuity between the two different versions. And you can take this idea of flexibility or an extended system to an even greater extent and think about a much more modular system that can be applied to a lot of different artifacts or might even be a system where things change depending on the time of day or the time of year. I think Google is a good example of a wider system in terms of how their new identity is applied to a lot of different components, but also how they create a set of sympathetic imagery that's forever changing. The big takeaway here is that type matters. If we turn these logotypes back to a more generic black and white form, we can see how much they lose in terms of being recognizable and in terms of their individual identity. In this section, we're going to look at icons and see how icons work as part of our user interface. We're very familiar with icons. We see thousands of them every day. Every app has to have a visual representation of what that app is in a small and condensed form where the user can recognize it. So every app has an icon or symbol to represent it. And those icons or symbols have to compete with each other and there are thousands of them all vying for your attention, trying to create visual interest and trying to be recognizable. But there's another place where we also see icons and symbols working, and that's in the interface itself. These icons were based on objects in the real world, and it's interesting to see how little they've changed over the last 20 years, where their form has been modified, the essential essence of the icon has stayed the same. One of the things that people often get confused about is the difference between an icon and a symbol. And part of this reason is we tend to use the word icon for both symbols and icons. So let's look at what the difference is between the two of them. Both of them represent other things. An icon does that by showing us a picture of the thing. It shows us a visual representation of it that is relatively realistic compared to what the object is. So in this case, here's a set of headphones and it looks like the headphones. But a symbol doesn't necessarily look like the thing that it represents. So for instance, here's music and it's represented by notes. So the icon is pictorial, whereas the symbol is non-pictorial. It's not an accurate visual representation of the thing that it's representing. And it would be hard to represent something as broad and something as abstract as music with a fixed single visual image. So to sum it up, icons really do look like the thing that they're representing and symbols tend to not look like the thing that they're representing. One is pictorial and the other is non-pictorial. So sometimes you're going to want to 
create an icon to represent your ideas and sometimes you're going to want to create a symbol and it really depends on what the thing is that you want to represent. For instance, a dagger is very easy to show a picture of, but if we're talking about a concept, something as abstract as thought, for instance, it's quite hard for you to think of an image of that. So we have to create a symbol to represent that concept or that idea. It becomes a little confusing when things are ambiguous and can work as icons or symbols. This lightning bolt, for instance, could be an icon because it's a picture of lightning, but it could also be a symbol for electricity, something that doesn't necessarily have a visible form, but needs a symbol to represent it. And often we can assign meaning to things that can make them work as icons and symbols. So as an icon, the magnifying glass looks like a magnifying glass, so it represents that. But as a symbol, it stands in for the idea or concept of searching. And what's interesting about the magnifying glass is we use this as a very common icon for two different things. We use it when we want to zoom in and zoom out, which is its iconic function, but we also use it when we want to type text in to search for something, which is its symbolic function. Our interface elements can work as icons and symbols, but so can our branding elements. Here's something that we instantly recognize, but not so much in its iconic form as Apple the fruit, but in its symbolic form as Apple the company. And that's to do with our particular familiarity with this rendering of the form of an apple. It becomes a symbol that is representative of a company that we've all learned to make a connection to. We don't even see an apple and think of food anymore when we see it drawn in this way. We can only think of the company. So the symbolic representation in this form has totally eclipsed the literal depictive value of it. Some of the best icons or symbols tend to keep hold of their literal value and their learnt value. So let's look a little bit more at how that works. We can have icons that work in a purely iconic way, but they can also overlap and become a symbol. And in the same way, symbols can overlap and become icons as well. And if we can enter this middle ground where we can get the value from both the iconic meaning and the symbolic meaning, it gives us a much richer element to work with. So we're trying to connect the meaning between the icon and the symbol to create this very rich graphic element that we can use in our interface or we can use in our branding. The goal here is to combine what is known, what is visually obvious, with what is learned. In other words, what is associative and might not be visually obvious. Let's look at some other examples of icons and symbols that are commonly used in interfaces. We use a pair of scissors to represent the idea of cutting and pasting, but in the real world, scissors actually function just as devices for cutting and mostly just for paper, not for files or text or other things in the digital world. Likewise, a trash can is the place that we throw files away. We delete our files there, but we're not actually physically throwing anything away. We're dealing with digital files that we're deleting off our computer. But a metaphor from the real world helps us understand how to operate in the digital world. Likewise, if we wanted to send an email, it doesn't actually look anything like a letter. But we're used to seeing this symbol to represent the idea of sending electronic mail. So we use antiquated things from the real world to represent new things in the digital world. Symbolic meanings have to be learned. So when we look at this image of a bird, we don't actually connect it to a bird. We connect it to Twitter, the company. So we know that when we click on this bird, we're going to send a tweet. We're not going to go to a bird watching site, for instance. So there's a connection here between how our interface elements might work and have meaning and how our branding elements work and have meaning. To put it another way, quite often there's a merging between identity and interface. And you can see this with something like Twitter, for instance, if we look at the wide range of visual representations of that particular company in a symbolic form, where any of these things could be buttons, and we'd know exactly what we were going to get if we clicked on them. We're going to get to Twitter. We're not going to get to a page that's about bird songs. In this introductory class, we're only really going to touch on these ideas of creating symbols and icons for both interface and identity. 
And if you were doing this in the real world, this would be a specialization where you'd be really working as an icon designer and doing very little else in part of the UI UX process. So we can look at something like Google and see how much work goes into really extending that system across a number of different icons and creating a really strong visual identity. And a lot of time and effort and precision is put into creating each of these icons or symbols. So again, it becomes quite a specialist job within the UI UX world. So let's look at some simple rules for what might make a good icon. Think about what you want your icon to communicate. It needs an idea and it needs to communicate that through its aesthetics as well. Think about its functionality. It's got to work at different sizes. It's got to be clear and legible. You could think about the audience. It has to be recognizable and it has to be understandable. And lastly, think about visual recognition. This could come from saturation, from seeing your icon everywhere, or it could come from just creating a simple, striking and memorable icon. This week, we're going to take our static interface elements and begin to think about how a user interacts with them. In other words, how to bring these elements a stage closer to having a life on the screen. We'll be looking at navigational conventions, such as menus, buttons, and icons in different states. Our focus will move from what the graphic interface looks like to include how it works, how it responds to the user. By adding interactivity to our static designs, we'll begin to think more deeply about the role the designer plays in shaping a user's interactive experience. This week, we're going to continue to develop the overall style and aesthetics of our interface design, but we're going to look at it from a slightly different perspective. We're going to start to think more about the elements of our interface being active and less about them just being static. We're going to introduce the idea of function to our form, so we're going to have to start to think about what do these elements do as well as what they look like. But we're not going to totally give up on what the interface looks like. We're not going to abandon design as a tool. It's less about what the interface looks like versus how the interface works and much more about how the look of the interface is connected to its function or how it works. At the start of this class, we pulled apart UI and UX. We separated them in order to understand better how they work. But to be honest, they're truly inseparable because the form is always connected to the function in some way. Our UI is always connected to our UX. They have a relationship. And even when we want to focus on the form, we can't because it's connected to the experience. And likewise, we can't focus solely on the experience because it's connected to the form. Experience, function, and form have a triangular relationship where they're all connected to each other. We can focus on any one of these aspects of user interface design, and we can concentrate on that one aspect, but the other two are always going to be there in the background. They're always going to have some kind of input on our design decisions. We spent the last week focusing on form, and the next week we're going to focus more on experience. But for this week, we're going to let function take the driving seat. We're going to look at logic, intuition, and learned behavior, as well as organization and hierarchy within our interface. Let's look at some basic user interface functionality. To begin with, we could ask ourselves the simplest questions. How does an interface work? How do we know how to interact with an interface? How do we know what's interactive and what's not? Is it all just trial and error? Or are there rules or intuitive behavior that inform the way that we interact? Let's take a very basic interface element. If we have these three circles with three different colors, what kind of expectation do we have of what's going to happen when we interact with them? We don't really know until we try. We might have an expectation that we think something red or green or blue is going to happen, but we don't know what that is until we touch or click on that particular button. But once we've interacted and seen the outcome of that interaction, we can predict what the other interactions are going to do. We have an expectation that's quite logical. So if we know that blue made blue, 
then we're pretty sure that green is going to turn the background green and red is going to turn the background red. In this very simple way, we've created a logical system. And the benefit of this logical system is that it's predictable. By just clicking on one button, the blue button, we've already understood how the other two buttons work without even clicking on them. We've made a very economical system for our user. They didn't have to expend a lot of time or energy to understand how the whole system works, as long as we stay logical. Once we break the system and make it illogical, for instance, if the blue dot turned the background pink, we've created a system that is going to take the user a lot longer to learn because the system has stopped being predictable. We can extend our idea of logic and the predictable system a little bit further. If we click on the green dot and it turns the background green, the dot itself could change in response. It now becomes black. So not only does this give us another color to work with, it also lets the user know that their action has had an effect. One of the benefits of having a logical and predictable system as part of your interface is that it can be expandable to the nth degree. So once I know how this button works, I know how any other similar button to this works. So now we're looking at a system that is logical, predictable, and expandable. The next question is, how do we make it economical as well? Let's take our color dot example and give it a little bit more of a real world application. Say, for instance, we wanted to color in an image, and we could pick different colors for different parts of the image. We could change the eye color to blue. If we pick another color, we're pretty sure it's going to change the eyes to whatever color we select, in this case, pink. And we're already being economical in some small way, because one click is changing two items. We could also have it so that each click changes just one of the eyes. Let's say that we want to change other parts of the face as well and color those in different colors. Maybe we want to change the mouth, the eyes, and the hair. One way of doing it would be to color them all ahead of time so we could just simply click on whichever ones we want. But again, while this is visually predictable, it's not necessarily the most economical way of creating an interface. It does make it very clear what the outcome is going to be from each of our interface elements, but it takes up a lot of real estate on the screen. In a lot of ways, we've unpacked all the possibilities of interaction and laid them out for the user to see all of them. What does work here is the visual relationship between the button and the image area. And that's because they're basically the same thing. One is a smaller version of the other. So one way to be economical would be to remove the color from those elements and to give the user a two-step process where they're picking the particular part of the image they want to color and then picking the color that they want. In a lot of ways, we're adding an extra step for the user, but we're giving them many more options because we're working in an exponential manner. Now I can choose any of these colors for any of these elements. I might decide that I want to change the color of the mouth and then I could pick whatever color I wanted. So in this case, I'm gonna decide that I want it to be blue. And what we've basically done here is given the user 18 choices out of nine elements on the screen. So we've basically cut the real estate of our interface in half. And we can continue to try and do more with less in this interface by using visual hierarchy. We don't really need those colors to be that large, for instance, in order for us to understand the differences between the colors. We could also arrange the colors in a more economical way or arrange the elements of the face in a way that they had a better relationship to the main image. And we can keep reducing our on-screen real estate and keep increasing our options for the user by some other means as well. We can shrink our repeated components of the face down so they start to look like icons. And we could easily take the same amount of space for six colors and turn it into a color wheel where we have thousands of choices. All we'd really need to do to get it to work is to change the cursor from an arrow to an eyedropper to let the user know that they can sample any color. And once we've given ourselves permission to change the cursor, we could question whether we even need to have the repeated small icons for the face. Instead, we could use the arrow itself to select those elements on the larger image and then turn the cursor into an eyedropper to select the color. 
In short, we've compacted a lot of the user's options into the tool that they're using. We've empowered the user to give them a multitude of choices, and that's going to feel much better as a user, because you're going to feel like you're in control. And you create a whole system based around intuition. Again, back to our colored dots. Once we figure out how one part of this works, the eyes, the mouth, or the hair, we can figure out how all the parts work. And we could keep going with being economical with our interface. We could condense down and compact the whole color wheel into any of these parts of the image on the right hand side. So the color wheel might only appear when you needed it. So rather than laying out every option for the user to be visible, we're compacting and condensing them into the interface. So let's try and sum up these ideas about how the interface works. It seems like on the one side we have logic, hierarchy, and systems, and on the other side we have intuition, discovery, and learning. And this seems like quite a reasonable way to think about interfaces. As interface designers, we're trying to create a logical system with a hierarchy that's easy for a user to understand, but we also want that user to be able to grow within that system so that you don't have to show the user every single thing that the interface can do in a step-by-step -step manner. You want there to be some intuitive learning on the part of the user. You want your interface to be understandable, but not 100% a generic experience. In a lot of ways, you're turning over the driving seat to the user, and they have to feel like they're in charge. If you go too far towards the functional end of the spectrum, you end up with an interface that's boring or disinteresting to the user. And if you forget about the function, the interface simply doesn't work. So it's about finding a balance of both. In this segment, we're going to look at some ideas surrounding invisible and visible user interfaces. And what we're really looking at here is a notion that by reducing the graphic content of an interface and trimming it down to just its bare essentials, you can create a much faster level of accessibility for the user to get to the content. And this is a strategy that we see in contemporary interface design, and it's fairly ubiquitous at the moment, and for good reason as well. So some of the advantages of having a slimmed down, scaled down interface are first of all that it's very simple and direct. So it's very easy for the user to understand. There's nothing that gets in the way. And while there's nothing that gets in the way visually, there's also nothing that gets in the way in terms of meaning. A high level of clarity creates a low level of user mistakes. A simple interface can also serve many purposes. It can be adoptable by a wide number of people for a wide number of uses. And simplicity and homogeneity can create a familiar and predictable interface across a number of different bodies of content or different kinds of experiences. Above all, simplicity builds logic, which means that pretty much anybody can figure out how to use this interface very, very quickly. So what's against these ideas? What could possibly be bad about them? Well, the bottom line is that they can be a little bit homogenous. They can be a little bit too familiar and too predictable, perhaps too unambiguous and too logical. So the end result can often be that the experience, even when the content is interesting, the experience is boring. I'm not sure if I want all my digital content to look the same way. I'm not sure that buying cool new shoes and getting a root canal should have the same interface. So let's look at the other side of the equation. What happens when we think about a user interface that is more graphic, that is more entertaining, engaging, a much more rewarding experience, a much more idiosyncratic. Where are the benefits in that system and where are the downfalls? The benefits seem mostly to be not in the content itself, but in the experience of accessing that content. So is the experience of getting to that hard information engaging or entertaining more so than with a generic interface? Do I end up with a much more rewarding experience ordering my pair of shoes through an experiential website versus a more generic functional website? And does the value of that experience create something that is more brandable or marketable, something that is idiosyncratic or individual, and might be the difference between me buying my pair of shoes from one website or another? 
The condensed rationale here is that the experience has value. So you might be getting the same product, but the experience is the thing that gives it worth. So what are the downsides of a less generic interface? Well, while that might be entertaining, it can also obstruct content. Sometimes all of those bells and whistles can get in the way of what you actually want to do. And while your interface experience might be very engaging, there are going to be times where you just want to get the thing you want to get. You want to get straight to the content without wasting any time. And that lack of speed and functionality can turn an engaging experience into a frustrating one. And while this interface might offer opportunities for more graphic design and to be more easily brandable, it could also create an aesthetic that can date much more rapidly. So instead of ending up with a cool interface that is unlike anybody else's, you end up with something that's dysfunctional and rather unnecessary. You can end up with an interface that creates frustration for the user because it obstructs them getting to the content that's the whole reason that they're there in the first place. So there are pros and cons to both the hyper-functional interface and the hyper-stylistic interface. And as with many of the aspects of interface design that we look at and examine, it's not a case of one thing versus the other. It's more a case of how do you use these aspects together? So how do you have both speed and style? There are no absolutes here. It's about evaluating your content and seeing what kind of approach is appropriate. There might be times where you want a very functional website with very little aesthetic distraction going on. I don't care so much what my database or search engine looks like. I care about how it works. But there are other instances where this is reversed. If I'm buying clothes or furniture, I might be much more interested in the style and the aesthetics of the site or an app and the experience of it than I am in the functionality. Let's look at a couple of examples that mix function and aesthetics in different ways. This is a project by one of my students that's a bird watching app called Aviary. Due to the content and the audience, it needs to be very, very functional, but that doesn't mean it has to look boring. The overall design is clean and simple. It follows a lot of interface conventions that the user will be very familiar with. So there's no big learning curve when somebody would come to use this app. It feels logical, functional, and familiar all at the same time. But it also has enough design elements in there for it to feel very idiosyncratic and individual, and also to feel quite stylish and upmarket. The color palette and the customized icons really give it its own identity. So while the design is very clean, familiar, and functional, there's enough of an individual voice there to really give it some character. In this second student project, we can see an inversion of that balance between the pragmatic and the poetic. Here, the emphasis is much more on creating a novel interface. Design and aesthetics take the lead here, and any kind of normalized functionality has just gone out of the window. But that doesn't mean that it doesn't work or have its own logic as an interface. What it does mean is that the user might have to spend a little bit more time with it in order to figure it out and how it works. But there's a sense of reward there. The app is about adventurous places to eat with unusual food, so it makes sense for it to have a much more adventurous and unusual interface. This interface works because it has a great relationship with its content. There's a refrain made popular by Golden Krishna that the best interface is no interface at all. And I don't think that's always true. The best interface is the one that has the best relationship to its content, the one that's the most sympathetic. And sometimes that does mean that it's invisible, and sometimes it's not. The bottom line is, the best interface is the best interface. And there is not one solution to that, because an interface has to deal with so many different kinds of content. So the best interface is one that is visible and invisible at the same time, but in the right proportions. And those proportions are going to change, depending on what kind of content they're being an interface for. In this section, we're going to look at some ideas surrounding composition and structure in the user interface. How you arrange the elements of the interface can really shape what kind of experience you want the user to have. Again, we're talking about how to shape content-specific design here. So 
these rules won't apply for every single app or website you design. So let's take a brief look at some of these overarching concerns. We've looked at some issues concerning the individual elements of your user interface, but these overall issues tend to have a trickle-down effect. So it's worth thinking about structure and composition rather than getting lost in the design details of any single element. Let's use a pragmatic example, something with functional content, so it's a little less subjective when we try and analyze how it works. So let's look at how we might build a simple calendar as an app. Since we have functional content, we're probably going to need a functional structure. So the content and the user's priorities are going to drive our composition. We might need a small space for the title, but we're probably going to need a much larger space for the calendar itself, where most of the action is going to happen. But then we'll also need a space where a user can see the events that they're choosing from that calendar, and a small space for menu options at the bottom. So you can see our compositional structure is being totally driven by the content. Let's take one of these sections, say the calendar section, and develop it a little bit more, and we'll see how functionality is really going to drive all of our design decisions. We have a small fixed space to work with, so we want our type to take up as much of the space as possible, but still be very legible. It also has to be at a size where it can easily be touched, and the events have to be easy to read. We probably want to know what time our events are happening, and we'd also want them to be clearly separate from each other, so we don't get confused. So we're already creating a kind of visual hierarchy, even in a very limited way within this functional landscape. And because our design palette is quite limited, any small changes really do make a difference. Small changes in scale or weight or lines can be used to create our hierarchy. We might need something that's visually more dramatic for a larger event, so we could use color, for instance, to show the selected date and extend that visual system a little bit more to show other dates that might have events hidden on them. We could use color in a more subtle way as well. For instance, we could make the days of the week gray in order to push them back, since they're a static element that's always there in the same place. We could use color to build a simple two-color system where the static information is in black and gray and the active information is in green, for instance. Or we could keep extending that system to show more information, for instance, the amount of events that we might have on any given day. And if we needed to create even more hierarchy, we could use a subtle color to show the divisions, the sections that we started out with that divide the title from the calendar from the events. We could also add ancillary icons and symbols to make our app feel a little more believable. It's always useful when you're making mock-ups to try and make the app look like it actually works. So we could add some navigation symbols. We could add down in the bottom some icons that give the app the appearance of functionality. At this stage, we're really looking at the user interface design. We're not thinking about the functionality of this app so much. It's really just a visual exercise. But that exercise can feel a little more real when we put real elements in there. So let's also change the language so that, again, it looks like it's an active working app. We can give it a name and we can add real events to our calendar. So functionality has been driving all of our design decisions for this calendar, but also familiarity, because this calendar doesn't look that different from any other calendar that might appear on your phone, because the basic structure of it has already been figured out. So there's no point us reinventing that. But what we can do is hopefully either improve on it or make our own aesthetic version of it. In this example, the composition and the structure is really being driven by the content. And that content, the filter that we use to temper our design, is really about functionality. So the content is functional, the structure, the hierarchy, everything that we're looking at is really to do with function. So while that affects our larger user interface decisions, it also affects our smaller decisions about design. So when we look at color and typography, icons and symbols, they're also being tempered by the content, by that functionality. And a calendar is quite an extreme example. It's at the functional end of the spectrum entirely. So let's see what happens if we pick a different kind of experience, something that's much less about functionality and much more 
may be about emotion or about experience itself. Rather than building this interface step by step, let's look at a finished example that one of my students made. This is for an app called Sense, where with a hardware extension added to your phone, you can record smells and mix and match those smells to create sensory experiences. Because the content is based around experience and exploration, the interface follows the same direction. It becomes a much more poetic experience for the user rather than a purely functional, pragmatic one. The interface is image-based and somewhat ambiguous. It has to be tried out by the user in order for them to figure it out. It becomes a learned, experiential interface rather than a fixed, functional interface. It's less concerned with looking like an existing operating system and more concerned with creating a strong, idiosyncratic, individual, visual experience. So even when there are functional components to the interface, they don't look the same as what you would expect from the regular operating system. The visual language of this particular app takes over every aspect of the design. A lot of the communication of the interface elements is delivered through imagery, which means that the imagery has to be meticulously controlled and composed. Instead of forefronting functionality, this user interface design prioritizes experience, mood, and tone. In these two different examples, you can see how the overarching design concerns trickle down to really affect every aspect of the user interface design. They affect decisions about content, about composition, and about structure. What they have in common is the UI design solution is related to the content. It's contextually appropriate. It's context-specific design. In the last section, we looked at larger contextual issues, and now we're going to go from macro to micro and look at buttons. These tiny components are one of the most important elements of user interface design. So let's start by asking ourselves, what makes a button a button? Well, pretty much anything can be a button. A button is just a self-contained object that you know is interactive, that you can click on or interact with. But it only works as a button if the user knows that it's a button. In other words, if it's not just a shape. There are various visual signifiers to let the user know that a button is a button and not just a shape. And the benefit of these familiar forms is that the user knows straight away that it's a button. So there's no ambiguity there and there's no time wasted. So familiar forms become fast forms, immediately recognizable as part of the interface. So let's look at what kind of visual traits let us know that a button is a button and not just a shape. Buttons come in many forms. They might not have all of these traits, but they probably have at least one or two of them. But all of these should be considered when you're a user interface designer working with buttons. If you're designing a button, one of the first things to think about is what size it should be. And this relates to how it's going to be used. The button needs to be at a size where it's legible, but it also needs to be at a size where either a finger or a cursor can easily tap or click on it. Buttons that are too big take up too much real estate on screen, and ones that are too small are hard to activate. You should also consider the shape of the button. What's its function? Does it need to have a label on it? What kind of screen is it going to exist on? And what is it going to be touched by? If it's a finger or a cursor, that might mean a different shape. Some shapes are more economical and work better as a set, while other shapes might be better containers for a symbol or an icon that has to sit on them. You could think about how color works with your set of buttons. Is it used as a signifier for a particular function of a button, or is it part of a larger overarching system? A common strategy to let the user know that a button is a button is to give it some kind of dimension, to make it feel like a three-dimensional object that has to be pressed or interacted with. And this is often done through a trompe loyal effect, using shadows and highlights to create fake dimensionality. A key aspect in recognizing buttons in the interface is where they're placed within the screen. They're quite often contained within a certain area, within a window or a bar or a space that we recognize as being interactive or being specifically for navigation. 
So let's take some of these ideas and look at them in a little more detail. Let's start out by looking at the size of our buttons and its relationship to the cursor or the finger. The scale of your button has a relationship to the thing interacting with it. So you could think about a button on your phone having a relationship in size to the tip of your finger and on a computer screen having a relationship to the size of the cursor. The size of the button is also going to have a relationship to the size of the screen and the resolution of the screen. It could also depend on how many other elements you have in your interface. The shape of your button could be informed by a few different considerations. The shape of it could be informed by popular conventions. A rectangle with rounded corners was prevalent at one time, but now circular buttons are much more prevalent, and this reflects a change from prioritizing the computer screen to the handheld device. The button shape might have a relationship to the text that has to sit on it or the icon or image that has to sit on it, but it could also be indicative of a certain kind of functionality. Certain shapes mean certain things, so when we look at this set of symbols, we know what their functionality is without any text labeling. We also recognize the functionality of this set of shapes as a set because we know what they mean. The square here only means stop when it's sitting next to play, pause, fast forward and rewind. So we're not just thinking about the individual shape, we're thinking about how those shapes work as part of a system. And color can work in the same way. It can be an individual signifier of a certain kind of activity, but it can also work as part of a larger system. So for instance, just by coloring the button, even though we don't change the label, we might be able to imply that one button is going to start something, the green button, whereas the red one might stop something. One common convention from the earlier days of interface design is to create a sense of dimensionality for buttons so that they look like they can be physically pressed. And this was a very common strategy because it helped people relate between the digital world and the analog world that they were familiar with. This strategy feels a little outdated or a little antiquated now, and it's been superseded by instead of dimensionality, by using a drop shadow in order to create a button that floats over the surface and draws attention to itself. Where we place our buttons on the screen can also be a signifier that allows us to know that they're part of a navigation system. For instance, when we put these buttons at the outside edges and on their side, they really don't feel like buttons anymore. They also stop working as a set because there's so much distance between them. So almost anything can be a button if the user knows that it's a button. And it's your job as the user interface designer to let the user know that that shape is a button. You have to let them know that without them doing any work. It has to be immediate knowledge for the user. And your design decisions are very important because buttons are often used to create actions. So it's important that you label them clearly because they're going to have some effect. The last thing that you want is an ambiguous button because you could delete, erase, or destroy something quite important to somebody. And since our analog and digital lives are increasingly intertwined, your actions with the interface can often have actions in the real world. So there's quite a lot of responsibility for the user interface designer to create buttons that are totally accurate. Using precise and accurate language to label your buttons can really help, but sometimes words don't work, and you're going to need to use images, symbols, or icons. So part of your job as the UI designer is to let the user know that the button is a button, but also to let them know exactly what that button does. You could think of buttons as signposts. You want to be able to find them easily, you want to be able to get that information very quickly, but you also want to be able to ignore them when you don't need them. In the last segment, we looked at buttons and how to work with buttons, and now we're going to look at all the other things that aren't buttons in our interface. So how else do we navigate through our digital content if we don't use buttons? Well, we have other systems in place. Menus, links, fields, and all of these different systems have to be designed by a UI designer. They're all simple, fast, functional means of interaction. Unlike buttons, they rely on design conventions that we're very familiar with. 
there's no point reinventing all of these. We actually have to work within the conventions that already exist, because those conventions are there for a reason. They're very successful. There's some fundamental principles of graphic design that we can consider in order to keep our simple, fast, functional interface working. We can use shape, scale, contrast, clarity, and economy in order to reinforce and emphasize the goals of speed and function. So let's look at how we might apply some of these design criteria to some simple interface elements. Let's start out by looking at one of the simplest things of all, a text field. On the surface of things, it just looks like a rectangle with some contrast from the background, but it can still have design decisions applied to it, so the shape and the scale of it could change, for instance, and become functional or dysfunctional, depending on what kind of move we make. So as a designer, we can change the functionality of the text field, but we can also change the aesthetics of it as well. By small moves, we can make it feel different and give the user a foreshadowing of the functionality of the field. So by giving it round corners, for instance, we could make it feel much more like it's a window for texting in. And once we introduce that functionality to hold text, we've suddenly got a relationship between the text and the box, and now we really do have to consider our shape and our scale, because the box now has a function. So we could make the text too big, or too small, or we might have to consider how much text does the box have to contain. Is it just for sending a very tiny amount of text, or is it going to have the capacity to send a whole paragraph? So again, function and aesthetics are intertwined. We could also think about whether the field has the ability to change its own shape and respond to the amount of text that's filling it. And as we look at the relationship between the text and the field, we have to now start to think about ideas of clarity and economy. We don't want to waste space, and we also want to have the text to be as legible as possible. So we might alter the size and leading of the type, but we might also alter the shape and proportions of the box. And even when we have a good relationship between the size of the type and the size of the box, we have to decide on the overall size of that element within our interface. Once again, we would need more contextual information about how this is going to work on a screen. How much text is there going to be? What kind of background is it going to have? Is it a single message or part of a conversation? Once we know a little bit more about the function of the design, we can go back to our design criteria, shape, scale, contrast, clarity, and economy, and start to let those things inform the user interface design. Right now, the placement of these speech bubbles isn't very economical. There's too much white space between them. And if there's two people having a conversation, how do we know which person is which? We could use color to show that. We could use other design conventions to accentuate one voice coming from the left and one from the right by adding tails to the rectangles. We turn them into speech bubbles, which is also another convention that we're very familiar with. So even in a design that we're very, very familiar with, you can see how many small decisions there are to be made by the interface designer. And these micro decisions all contribute to the ultimate look and feel of the interface. Let's look at another example of a really basic interface element. Let's say that we have a text field for entering data, where the data is very limited. For instance, entering your first and last name. When I go to enter my name, there's immediately a problem. My first name might fit, but I have quite a long last name, so we're definitely going to need a bigger box. And once more, as the interface designer, we're having to negotiate that balance between aesthetics and functionality. And in this case, we have two pieces of information, one typographic piece acting as a label, and the other acting as the data that we enter. This is not a very economical way for us to build our interface. So we could think about combining those two things into the text field itself. And now we have to think a little bit more about the relationship between the text and the text field because they're sitting on top of each other. Also, the text is now going to have to have a dual function in that it's a label and it's also going to change into editable text. 
and we could create a number of different design directions that look at the relationship between the background, the text field, and the text itself. One of the things you can see here is that we've created different levels of contrast. So in some of these examples, the text really stands out, and in other examples, the text field is the thing that is more visible. It's not that any one of these examples is a better solution than any of the others. It would again be contextual depending on the other components that we had and the kind of content that we were working with. Some of these solutions might work better than others because they're more familiar. They use existing design conventions. And those conventions aren't always the best solution, but sometimes they really are. For instance, if we think about a visual convention from the digital world, we can look at some examples that are very, very successful. So if you think about links, for instance, there's a clear and simple way to show a link. The simplest way is just to underline a piece of text. And this is so prevalent and so ubiquitous and just the simplest way to do something complex that it's become an absolute convention that we all use and understand very, very quickly. So when we're trying to create some of these interface elements, there's no point reinventing the wheel. We don't need to come up with a different language to show a link, for example. It already exists. We don't need to reinvent functionality. But what we can do is change the visual aesthetics, the style of those interface elements. So let's take another example to look at. Let's look at a simple text menu. We take simple text menus for granted because we use them all the time on our computers, but they're actually a very economical and very clever way of getting information to the user. So let's try and analyze what they do that works so well so we can maybe use it for other things. Our text menu allows us to have a drop down type list and we can go through that list and highlight whatever it is that we want to choose from that list. But you can also have nested subcategories so we can compact a lot of information into that menu and make it be visible and invisible whenever we want. So it's a highly economical system. Our text menus always live at the top of our user interface, so we know where to go whenever we need them. And because they're text-based, they can carry any kind of function that can be described by text. It's also a very economical system in terms of space, because we can contain submenus and only make them be visible when we need them. They work on a kind of need-to-know basis. They remain hidden and compact until we decide that we need to access that information. Drop-down text menus are hyper-functional. We can contain a lot of information in them and a wide variety of information, but we can nest that information and keep it hidden until we need it. So you can see it's the main way that we get a lot of our information within the operating systems when we're using them on a computer because it's so functional and so flexible. And that flexibility means they can be used for almost anything, no matter what the content. And all they're really using as graphic devices are words, some muted color, the odd symbol, and a few lines. With this very minimal palette, you can do almost anything. But of course, you might not want your app or website to look exactly the same as the operating system. So you can take some of those same principles of functionality and compactness and redesign them to get them to work with the aesthetic of your app or website. So here's the website for the CalArts poster archive online. It was designed by a couple of my students and it needed to have some drop down menus that fit the aesthetic of the website but also maintain the functionality of regular drop-down menus. So they kept the same kind of interaction, but changed all the graphic elements in the menu. So the typography, the shape of the box, how it appears and disappears are all different from the standard operating system. It's such a simple element of interface design that we often don't think about what we can do with it as a design component. So let's look at what some of the variables are for our drop-down text menu. We could change the shape and the proportions of the box. We could change the scale of the box in relationship to the background elements. We can change the color. We can think about its relationship to the other elements on the page. And while none of these design changes change the functionality, they do change the look 
but they also change the feeling that a user is going to have when they use this menu. We can go into a little more detail and look at some of the micro decisions that might shape the look of our menu. We can think about the typeface, what kind of weight it is, what kind of size, the leading, space between the lines, whether it's upper or lower case, the color of the type, and how we're going to indicate a change of state when the user selects one of the items from the menu. In this case, there's no nested subcategories to think about, but we might want to think about how the category might look when we've exited the drop-down menu. So if you look in the top right-hand corner here, it's showing us what our selection was. So even in something as simple and familiar as a drop-down menu, we've made many design decisions. We've looked at shape, scale, contrast, clarity, and economy. But none of these aspects of design exist on their own. They're all interrelated. You can't just fix one and expect all the other problems to resolve themselves. Shape is related to scale, is related to contrast and clarity, etc., etc. And any one change you make in one of these areas will have effects on the other. You can't change the scale without affecting the clarity, for instance. And what this means is that interface design is a relational activity. All of these different design decisions that you're making are all interconnected. Each design decision works in relationship with every other design decision. So you have to consider them all when you're designing each element of your interface. But then you also have to think about how each of those elements is going to have a relationship to every other element as well to form your complete interface. In this last section, we're going to look at how some of our interface elements can have various different states of existence and how they can change from one state to another. In other words, how they can be both static and interactive elements in our interface. The simplest and most common multi-state object is the button. A button has to have different states so it can convey to the user the fact that it's being interacted with. So first of all, a button can let the user know it's a button by having some kind of state change. So the user knows it's not just a static element, it's an interactive element. And secondly, a button can also change states to acknowledge the user's action. In other words, to let the user know that their tap or click has really worked. So let's look at some of these different states for a simple button and look at different ways that they could be visually represented. The button has a normal state where nothing is happening. If you put your cursor over the button, there should be some kind of state change to let you know that the button is live, and this is called the hover state. Then, when you actually click on the button to activate it, there needs to be another state change to let you know that the button has been pressed. And then the final stage is after you've pressed the button, there needs to be some kind of change from the normal state that it began in, so that you know that the button has been clicked on. Not all buttons have all of these states, and these states can vary as well, depending whether you're using a mouse with a cursor or whether you're using your finger. But for the sake of this exercise, let's keep all four. So if we add some color to try and denote the different stages, we create a hierarchy through the density of the color and through the contrast with the type. So our press state and our normal state feel very different to each other. We can change the background color of the button, but we can also change the color of the typography on the button as well. We can see from this example that the normal state and the press state are the buttons that have the most visibility, the most contrast. The inactive state has the least contrast because we want that state to kind of be ignored. By changing how we use the color in the background, we can emphasize the action, the activity, in this case pressing, and make that be the most important visual aspect of our four buttons. The trick here is to have the buttons look different enough that they can represent different states, but look similar enough so that they can belong to the same family. You also have to consider what kind of background the buttons are going to exist on, and whether they're going to need an outline so that they'll stand out on different backgrounds or not. In general, you want to keep the buttons as simple and as clean as possible. You could think about how much contrast you want to have between each state. You could have a lot of contrast between normal and hover, for instance, or it could be a very subtle change. 
You could also use Tromp Loyal effects to create difference between your states. So here you can see a different amount of drop shadow within the different state changes, as well as a change in the tonality of the button's background color. So there are many different ways to formally represent the different states that a button might have. And it's interesting to look at what kind of purpose these state changes have for the user. To begin with, in the normal state, the user has to know that the button is a button. They have to recognize that it's something that they can click on or touch or activate. So there's a sense of recognition, knowing that the button's a button. In the second stage, the hover stage, it's more about confirmation. If I put my finger over the button, for instance, I know that something could happen, but it doesn't necessarily have to happen until I actually press it and enter the activation stage. And then the last stage, when the button is inactive, could be termed as rejection because we're no longer interested in that button. We could take some of these concepts and try and apply them to different kinds of buttons and see what happens. As I mentioned earlier, not every button has every state and things are a little different between using a mouse and a cursor and using your finger on a touch screen. But we could take the same stages and apply them to a button with a symbol on it or we could apply them to a button with a logo type on it. And there might be a number of different formal ways for us to represent these four stages. And as I said, we might not even use all four of those stages. But this is where the user interface designer gets to decide which is going to work the best. So let's try and see what happens if we take a totally different kind of button, not just different content on the button, but a button that functions in a slightly different way and interacts in a different way. So here's a toggle button, for instance. It only really has an on and an off as its two states. So the hover state might be the same as the normal state. The activated state is clearly different when we've slid the toggle all the way over to the right. And the inactive stage is the same as the normal and the hover stage. But let's try and slow things down and see what happens when the user really interacts with this toggle switch. There's an in-between stage that happens very quickly where the user is sliding the toggle from left to right to activate the switch and sliding it from right to left to make it inactive. So there's these hidden stages that happen very quickly and these take the place of the hover state and the inactive state. If we go to our other set of terminology, we recognize the toggle button because of how it looks our confirmation is that we can actually move it. Our activation is seeing it come up in green and our rejection is being able to turn it back off again by sliding the toggle to the left. And the user here is switching their knowledge of the interface between what they see and what they do. So you see the toggle button, you interact with it to confirm, you see the activation and then you physically interact with it again to turn it back off. The confirmation and rejection require physical activation by the user. There's no real hover state here because we have a finger instead of a cursor for this kind of switch normally. So our hover state is converted into one that requires physical activity. It requires us to actually move the toggle from the left to the right. Our hover state where the cursor was still is now replaced with a motion state where our finger is active. And this is much more common in UI design for mobile devices. In a lot of ways, the motion state has replaced a lot of these conventional state changes. We're much more used to swiping nowadays than we are to clicking. So if the click has been replaced by the swipe, it follows logically that the mouse has been replaced by the finger. And I think this gives the user more of a connection to the interface because there's no mouse to mediate that experience. You're actually using your finger right on the screen and that creates the necessity for this motion state. And that in turn means that you have to have a much more fluid relationship between those states. You have to start to think about how your interface elements are going to animate. Welcome to the fourth and final week of Visual Elements of Interface Design. 
This week, we're going to take our individual interface components and see what happens when we try to put them together into a more complex structure. We'll be looking at how to get our components to work harmoniously as a family, figuring out how hierarchy works in the interface, and discussing conventions and expectations of contemporary interface design. We'll also be examining how to navigate to different screens and how to build visual relationships between different kinds of content, but within a single site. Finally, we'll be discussing different platforms, how to create variable content for different screen sizes, and looking at how to organize complex bodies of content into user-friendly structures. Over the next week, we're going to look at how to take some of the individual components of the user interface and try and put them together and get them to work in concert with each other. We'll be looking at both conceptual strategies and design strategies and figuring out what kind of information is going to be useful when we try and make a whole interface out of these various pieces that we've been looking at. We're going to start to think about how we might take some of our more conceptual and theoretical knowledge about the user interface and combine it with some more practical knowledge to do with design skills and making the interface. There's a lot of different skills and different components for us to think about. We've looked at some very broad and wide-reaching concepts and while these are great for giving us some background information, we now need to start to try and apply them to some specific interfaces. And in a similar way, we've taken the user interface apart and divided it into many small components or approaches to design. Now we have to think about combining all those individual pieces of knowledge and starting to apply them to a larger and more practical project. But we don't want to do that in a disparate or fragmented kind of way. We want to build connections between all these different skills and we want them to work in harmony with each other. In a lot of ways, the skills that we've been looking at and the way that we've been talking about them have been very general and very generic. And I've left it open like this on purpose. I don't want to dictate a narrow or specific way of working. I'm more interested in you developing a set of skills that you can apply in a number of different ways to different kinds of content. But one thing that would be useful at this stage is figuring out how to tie some of those skills to do with making individual components with the larger theoretical aspects of user interface design that we've looked at, the things that we're calling the overview. If you can build a relationship between these larger theoretical practices and the more practical design skills, you'll have a really great foundation for working as a UI designer. In this section, we're going to look at some larger issues about how we might start to organize our content. We're going to try and create a hierarchy of what's important and what's less important. We're going to begin to think not just about what goes where, but about what goes where and why. So thinking about how our app or website is used is actually going to help us to think of a design structure. We'll be looking at a hierarchy of function and thinking about what's important to the user. What are the things that the user is going to want to do first? And so those things might be more important in our design layout. But we'll also be thinking about what's not important to the user. What are the things that they might not want to do straight away? Or perhaps some people might not want to do those things at all. As well as thinking about what's important to the user, we'll also be thinking about what's important to the client, which in this case might be you, What's the intention of the client? Why might you be making this app or website in the first place? What's it really meant to do? It's important to maintain that hierarchy and keep sight of your goals and your intention in making an app or a website in the first place. As you add functionality and more options to your app or website, you don't want to lose sight of what the goal was in the first place. So we have these two kinds of hierarchies that are going to affect our content and affect our design structure. And ideally, these two things would align perfectly. So the goals of the client are reflected in how our interface is prioritized in terms of the hierarchy of the design and the content. So let's look at how that might work with a real world example. The very first thing you want to do is to set the scene or set the tone. When you first open an app or a website, that first impression is going to be really, really important. 
you have to think about what's the first thing the user sees because it's going to set the tone for the rest of their experience. So the user opens your website or app, they see what's in front of them, they form some kind of impression and opinion about it, and then they act or engage or react to what's in front of them. So very quickly, there's three things that are going on with the user. They're seeing, thinking, and physically reacting. Let's use the CalArts poster website that we looked at earlier and see how a user first interacts with that. When the website first opens, a selection of posters is displayed, and these posters are pre-selected and pulled randomly from a much larger group. So the goal is to show the user some of the best posters, but also have them be different each time the user visits the site. So if we ask ourselves, what's the first thing the user sees when they open this website? The answer would be a collection of really exciting and energetic visual posters. But the design and content of this interface are also going to tell the user some other things as well. So they see all of these posters, but they also can tell by the way that it's laid out that this is some kind of collection or some kind of archive. The site feels like it's more concerned with visual form than textual information, for instance. So we know that it's a very visually driven website. So the user has some kind of expectation about what the rest of their experience on this website is going to be like. In a lot of ways, the initial visual experience that you give the user is a foreshadowing of the rest of the experience that they'll have on your site. Once the user has formed an impression of your site, the user is then going to interact with it somehow. So you could ask yourself, what's the first thing that the user does? I think the first thing would be to click on a poster. Because it's a visually driven site, the user is probably going to get pulled into that visual experience. So they'll either want to see more detail by clicking on a poster or see more posters by scrolling down the screen. So let's follow this through and see what happens when you click on a poster. The poster fills the screen, and what's important here is that it offers a different visual experience than the home screen that we started on. So there's a significant scale difference, we can see much more detail. The visual experience is immediately different. In a simple way, we're offering the user a reward for spending their time clicking. So let's see what happens when the user scrolls down to see more posters. Here, very little changes visually at least. We're not trying to show the user details and reward them with a new experience. Instead, we're trying to show them the volume and breadth of the content that's available on the website. Our goal is still to engage the user, but we're doing it in a different way. So those are our two big moves in terms of interaction in our hierarchy. But we could ask ourselves, what does the user do after that? They start to explore some of the mid to lower level possibilities for interaction. So this means starting to explore the interface a little bit more. There are navigation elements in the interface, such as the timeline or categories or the search field, that are lower down in the visual hierarchy. But they're much higher in their specific functionality. So you're less likely to use them when you first encounter a website and you're just browsing or looking around, and you're much more likely to use them later on when you have a specific intention or a specific goal that you're trying to achieve. Let's look at how these hierarchies of content, function, and design work on a handheld device. Instead of using something where we've already made an interface, let's start from scratch. Let's build it up from nothing and see how these ideas of hierarchy might shape our structure and our interface. So let's pretend we're designing an app to get a cap. Let's look at what our goals might be that might shape the interface. Our goals in terms of content and function could also be termed as being goals for the client and goals for the user. And in this case, those goals would all be exactly the same. We'd want to get a cab as fast as possible. So there's a clear primary singular function that's really going to drive the first thing that the user sees on our screen. If we're going to get a ride as fast as possible, there's several things that the user is gonna to want to see all at the same time. First of all, we're gonna to need to see our own location, where we are on the map. We're going to need to be able to enter our destination, and we're probably going to want to see what cabs are nearby that are gonna be able to pick us up. 
And we need to have all of those three things happening at the same time simultaneously to have a seamless and fast experience. When we're designing an interface like this, the first thing that we're really doing is articulating the problem and figuring out what is a good solution for that. We're not really thinking about any specific visual solutions here. We're looking at the big picture and trying to give a structural shape to our design. We're still trying to answer those larger questions to do with hierarchy and organization. We're looking at what goes where and why. We're trying to figure out what is the best visual solution and what the main design elements are. We're thinking about the hierarchy of those elements, where they're going to go within our interface or within our whole experience. So we're really looking at all of these much bigger moves. We're not getting caught up in any design details yet. In this section, we're going to continue our discussion about hierarchy and composition within the interface. And we're going to look at some ideas concerning conventions and expectations for both the web and apps. Our screens are often divided up in very conventional ways and as user interface designers we have to figure out how to use these conventions but also create some kind of variables within them. In terms of scale and visual attention our content area is normally the most important followed by branding and a couple of levels of navigation or functionality. Before we figure out any details of the design we have to figure out the relationship between these four different areas. And each of these areas is somewhat self-contained, so we could spend a great deal of time working on the elements and components of each of these individual areas. The simplest structural division that we can make is between the content that might change frequently and the elements that might remain stable, such as the branding and navigation, which gives us a familiar and standard relationship between the header and the body of our website. And once we've isolated these larger areas or divisions, we can start to think about how they might be structured in more detail. If we look at the body of this simple website, for instance, we could have a number of different things going on in that one area. It doesn't have to be a single image or a single activity. There could be multiple things happening at the same time. And as soon as we have multiple things happening, our job as an interface designer becomes more complicated. We have to start to think about spacing and structure, organization and hierarchy. Conventions and familiar structures can help us deal with these things quite quickly and easily. The web is often more concerned with the content that's in the structure than the structure itself. That structure quite often just has to be functional and fairly invisible. So it's okay if it's familiar to some extent. Our expectation of the website is that there are multiple things happening on one screen. We have a larger surface area, so it makes sense that there's more going on. But when we start to look at a phone and look at apps on our phone, it's not quite the same. Instead of four things happening on one screen, it's often one thing happening on four screens. And those screens work together to form a sequence of events. So our branding might be on a totally separate screen before we get to our content. And even if we wanted to reiterate our branding, it would have to be done at a smaller scale because we have very little real estate on the screen of the phone. So where everything is laid out in front of us on a web page, for instance, on an app, everything is hidden or condensed or sequential. So quite often, our navigation is invisible until we need it, and any interaction will normally eclipse the previous screen. So the components that make up a web experience in a single page might have to be spread across multiple screens for an app on the phone, which intrinsically means we're traveling from screen to screen on the phone, which is a little more of a fluid experience, which explains why even though a website and an app are both screen-based experiences, they actually feel very different. Even if they have the same content, the app feels much more fluid. So while our content here is divided across a number of different pages, there's definitely going to be some pages where more of the elements are going to need to exist at the same time. And again, there are formal conventions built around functionality that we adhere to. And that could be where our branding appears, how our navigation works with a swipe, or even where our menu bar is, or what's in that menu bar. And these conventions are constantly changing. 
We're moving towards that more fluid immersive experience we talked about, so we want all of our navigation and other elements to be hidden. And if we're going to travel to other screens, we want to do that in a fluid way, not by clicking, but by swiping and scrolling. Our phones act as windows. We can only see a small amount of content on them, but we know there's a much bigger world out there that we can move around in. So while we might only get one piece of information or experience at a time, we know there are thousands more outside the visible realm of our window. And that poetic explanation has some practical implications. We don't want anything to get in the way of our window, to get in the way of our small amount of content we're looking at, our experience. So our menus become hidden, or as invisible as possible. On a website, our five primary options might be laid out on display, but on an app, they're condensed and hidden. They live in a menu that we don't see until we want to. And that menu itself is evolving, again, to be more fluid. So instead of just being a drop-down menu, which feels like a web convention, we're now much more used to having menus come in from the side with a swipe and be much more smooth and fluid. The user interface for our apps are like Swiss Army knives. They have multiple functionality, but everything is packed away until you need that specific tool. And when you need a tool, there's many different things to choose from, and they generally are really good at doing just one thing. But until you need them, they remain packed away. They remain invisible. If the website lets it all hang out on display, the app is much more based on a philosophy of being hidden until needed. Our menus and navigation shouldn't get in the way of the small visual field that is our only place to show content. Even if we wanted to unpack our options, there'd be no room for us to lay them all out on the screen. If we have more than a couple of options, we're going to have to compact them down and create an interface element that can hide them. We want to make sure that our user is focusing on the content on our small screen. And because we have little real estate, it means that we have to feed them tasks one at a time. And because of this, our apps tend to be more focused on being very successful at a very localized and specific task. When we need more real estate for complex tasks, we tend to switch to the computer screen. And this fundamentally affects what kind of content or activity works well on what kind of screen. For the UI designer, it also shapes and structures what we do. There are set conventions related to what works best on these screens that we just can't escape. We have to figure out how to get the most out of those conventions. In this section, we're going to look at structures and grids and how those work in user interface design. Graphic designers are very familiar with using grids. They use them as an invisible way to align elements in order to get them to work together. In the last section, we looked at how the real estate of a mobile device differs greatly from that of a computer screen and how this affects the kind of design and elements that we might have on those screens. For the most part, this meant having a lot of single tasks on multiple screens for a mobile device and a lot of multiple tasks on a single screen for, say, a website on a computer screen. And this is going to have an effect on how we think about structure and what kind of grids we might use for these two different devices. A grid can be used for any size screen and any amount of screens. It's really just a useful way for the user interface designer to organize the elements of their interface on screen and to structure content so that it works for the user. So let's see what kind of organization system and what kind of grid works for these two different screens. Let's start out by looking at a website. And let's say the main place that that's going to live is on a larger computer screen. We've already established we're going to have multiple tasks on a single screen, and that means we're going to have more elements to organize. And of course, we have a larger space to work with. Some basic principles of graphic design composition will really help us. How to use grids, spacing, scale, come up with a system, and be consistent within that system. And all of these tools are very familiar to graphic designers because they're the same tools we've been using for print design for many years. And while these ideas don't translate necessarily directly into the digital space, it's pretty close. They're really fundamental tools for arranging elements within a space. And we're going to stick to this as our design-centric process, where we're really focusing on 
how things look and feel, and letting the visual nature of the interface really drive some of these big decisions that we're making at the start of our design process. Let's take a real world example and try to see how some of these design principles have been applied. Let's go back to CalArts Poster Archive website and let's try and deconstruct it a little bit, take it apart and try and figure out how it was built. It has an overall structure that's very familiar from general web design and from our last class as well, where the two main parts of the interface are divided into the header and the body. And even though there's no clear dividing line between the two, they occupy different spaces for different kinds of content and different kinds of interaction by the user. The header is the place for navigation and the place where the user goes to make decisions about what they want to see and what they want to do. The body is the place where the content lives and the place where the user sees the result of any changes that they've instigated in the navigation area. Basically the controls are at the top of the screen and the results of those controls show up at the bottom. For a site like this we've got a lot of different components to organize and this is quite good because it gives us a chance to really see the grid. We can make it visible quite easily and all the grid really is is a series of lines that obey a certain mathematical structure and these allow you to organize a lot of disparate content together so you can see here that all of the images align at their uppermost edge. You can also see that there's an equal space between all of the images. All the vertical images go from the top to the bottom of the grid space that we've created for them but because they're different proportions they sometimes leave some blank space to the right or to the top and the bottom if it's a horizontal image. But we basically have quite a simple grid for organizing both images and text. The grid can be divided up into certain sections as well. We have rows that run horizontally and these are separated by the captions for each image. We have columns that run vertically and once we've set a fixed value for our columns and our rows it's a system that is very modular so we could use this on a number of different size screens with a number of different columns or a number of different rows. The space in between the columns is left blank and that's called a gutter and the space on the outside edge is called the margins and here I've left that a little wider so that all the content seems to cling together a little bit more. When we combine the grid lines for our rows and our columns we end up with two separate areas. The largest area is our image area and even though that's defined by the grid as being even, our content that fits into it, as you can see here, might not always exactly fit the image area, unless we wanted to enlarge and crop the image, of course. So even though we're creating a modular and mathematical system, there are still a number of variables within that system. So we have to make design decisions and rules about how those variables are going to work. And we can see the same thing in the caption area, the space that we've created underneath the image area where we might have a different amount of text from one caption to another. So this is going to create another set of variables. So in this case you can see it's creating some variation in our grid. The height of the caption areas is not always the same. Let's zoom in a little bit and see how some of these variables work in the image area and in the caption area. When we zoom into our grid we can see that the images in the image area go all the way to the edges and fill the space. And this is great when the proportions are right for the image to do that. But that's not always going to be the case. Every image has a height and a width, and that height and width isn't always going to match the height and the width that we've made with our grid. We have to decide how images with other proportions are going to fit into our image space. And we're going to have to come up with a set of rules to make that consistent. In this case, I'm deciding that images have to either fill the width or the height of our image space. So if I have a square image, it's going to fit the width, but it's going to leave even space at the top and the bottom. But if I have a differently proportioned image, perhaps one that is taller and skinnier, it's going to leave space at the left and the right side. And this is going to visually affect my grid. Because my text aligns to the left, I'm going to decide to align my images to the left as well to try and create a strong visual line and keep my grid intact. 
And while I'm allowing my images some responsiveness to my grid, I'm basically trying to keep everything as even and as systematic as possible. If I can, I want to try and keep all my horizontal and vertical spaces to be even. So the height of the image, the width of the image, and the height and width of the space between the images as well. And this basically creates boxes for me to work within. So I have a box where I'm going to place my images and figure out a system for how the images sit in that box. But I'm also going to have a box for text and I'm going to have to figure out a system for how the text sits in that box. And as soon as we have text, we have to think about typography. And getting typography to look good is really about making a number of micro decisions that collectively contribute to good typography. So the first thing you can ask yourself is what about the typeface? Should I set it in Helvetica or Times or Comic Sans perhaps? Think about what kind of mood you want to have, what connotations you want the typeface to have, but also think about functionality. Which typeface is going to be the most readable at the right size? And we can't decide that until we try out some different sizes. So you can see here, even though the typeface is the same, by changing the size, it changes its relationship to the text box. And also, when the type's bigger, we see the form of the type, so we get more of its character. When it's smaller, it just becomes functional text for reading only. So let's say we choose the medium-sized text. We still have to figure out its relationship to the text box. Where is it going to sit? At the top, in the middle, or at the bottom? And how much space is it going to have around it? All of these small decisions affect what the type looks like, but also how readable the type is. But there's a secondary effect as well. Depending on how we organize the type, we change the amount of negative space that we're creating. And so we build a different relationship in our grid between the text and the image. If you're working on a website that has a lot of content and really needs a grid, it can be quite useful to start out with that grid, even if you're just using it with dummy content. Here's an early wireframe sketch of the CalArts Poster Archive website, for instance. And it's before we even have any images or have any information to plug in there. What we're trying to do here is figure out our grid and our system. We're looking at the scale and proportion of images. We're looking at how our captions are going to work, how our spacing between the images might work. We're also deciding which pieces of information go where. So we're making some content and organizational decisions, as well as making some formal design decisions. And we're doing all this without any real content. So once we've come up with the design that we like, we can actually fill it full of content to see if it's really going to work or not. So just by putting images into our grid and into our design, we can get a much better idea if it's really going to function or not. And remember, this is just a stepping stone towards a final design. We're really just looking at big design decisions here. We're trying to get an idea if we can create a grid, spacing, scale, some kind of consistent system that's going to work for our content. And we can do that without really having the actual content. In this section, we're going to talk a little bit more about size and format of our screens. We've talked previously about the differences in real estate between a handheld mobile device and a computer screen, but we've been ignoring some very important things, like the fact that one is often vertical and the other is always horizontal, but most importantly, that they operate at radically different scales. If I shrink my phone down to the scale of my computer screen, you can see just quite what a difference that is. And while this scale is accurate in terms of physical inches, it's not actually accurate in terms of how we use these devices and how much space they take up in our field of vision. In order to figure that out, we have to take into account viewing distance. How far is the screen away from our eyeballs? I might hold my phone right in front of my face. It might only be 10 inches away. But I might sit much further away from a very large computer screen. That could be as much as 24 inches. So if I adjust the size of these screens to take into account viewing distance, they're not as disparate as you think. Within my field of vision, they're not as wildly different as they first appear. The relative scale of these two screens is much closer than their physical measurements. In order to try and prove this, 
let's take some elements on each screen and put them at the correct size for that screen. Let's figure out what we think the right size is for readable type on our computer screen. And let's also add an estimated size for legible images. And we can also see how many images are going to fit on this screen. Then we can take those same components and estimate what their size would be on a handheld device. The relationship between the image and text size isn't that different, but what you can see, of course, is that we can fit far fewer images within the window of the handheld device. If we look at the grid on both of these screen sizes, we can see that it's not wildly different. It's really just been scaled up a little bit and expanded. And when we compare the screens like this, they don't seem that different in terms of scale. If I use screen grabs from our real-world example of the poster website, you can see that that difference in scale is even less. In terms of how we see things in our field of vision, it's really not that different. As we looked at before, in a lot of ways, the phone is a smaller window on a much larger world. In this case, the larger world is the website itself or the computer screen. Another way to look at it is that both our phone and our computer are windows to content, and they might be looking at the same thing, but at slightly different scales. While there are differences between how we see things with these two sizes of screen, there's also a structural relationship between them. So there are often similarities as well as differences. So then the next question is, which screen size do I design for first? Which size or format is going to be the most important? And the answer is my usual one. Well, it depends on the context. It depends on the content of your app or website. It depends on what you want it to do and how it's going to be used. But it also depends on who's going to use it. You have to ask yourself from the start, who is my audience and what kind of platform are they going to use my app or website on? And increasingly, the answer is that it's going to be used and viewed on a small screen. Increasingly, we design for the handheld mobile device first and for the larger computer screen second. While websites aren't just going to disappear and all be replaced by apps, we're already in a phase where the website has had to adapt to living in a much smaller space. In this last class of our course, we're going to look at the stage in our process where we might be finished with our static designs and handing them over to a programmer. The programmer might cut these pieces up and put them into a working prototype. So far in our classes, we've been thinking about interactivity, but we haven't really been designing interactively. If anything, we've been designing inactively or statically. We've been trying to envision interactivity and represent it in our designs, but they've all been pretty static. And that design first process has been deliberate. We're coming at user interface design from a visual perspective, from a design-centric process and focus. We're really thinking about design first. In many ways, we've prioritized the role of the user interface designer over the user experience designer. And as we saw in our very first week, these two specializations are intrinsically connected to each other and have a lot of overlap. Our methodology in this course is to isolate the UI so that we can focus on it, so that we can spend more time looking at the issues to do with formal design within the UI UX process. But even if we isolate the UI from UX, they have to meet at some point, and now is the time in that process. We're kind of making a connection between our forced division, but that happens in the real world sometimes as well, when a designer has to supply a programmer with a bunch of visual assets for them to make a prototype. So when I'm working with my students on UI projects, we often create as finished a mock-up as we possibly can, and as many screens showing as many different options as we can make as well. I'm trying to have them retain their focus on graphic design and the user interface, but also trying to look at the context of how their app, for instance, is going to be used. So here's an app designed by one of my students that's a tool for analyzing composition. In order to create a realistic representation of their interface design, they have to design 
many screens showing all the different stages of interaction and these designs could go on to be the basis for creating a digital prototype. The point of making so many screens is that we're trying to show interaction and motion and engagement with the user through static means, through a series of static images. As I said before, we're prioritizing the graphic design aspect of the user interface. So let's use this project as a way to recap and revisit some of the things that we've learned about the user interface. Let's take a couple of these screens and make them larger and then we can deconstruct how they work. Our overall division of the screen is quite familiar. At the top of the screen we have an area to reinforce our branding but also to have some navigation elements, some elements that would remain in the same place throughout pretty much any screen of our app. We could refer to these as our global navigation. At the side of our screen, we have a text-based menu, and you could imagine that that appears and disappears as needed. We have an area for content, where our main activity is going to take place, or where we're going to see the results of the choices we make in the menus. And at the bottom of the screen, we have another menu that provides a set of tools that could be specific to whatever content is happening in that area. So you can see that we've already established our main elements here. We've got a grid, a structure, and a set of rules to work with. We've partitioned and organized our interface. And even though we're working with static screens here, we're not designing any kind of motion, we can think about how our interface is going to work. How are our menus going to come in and out of the screen? How are we going to move through content? All of these things can be considered and part of our design plan without necessarily implementing them in these stages. We can figure out what the rules are for our interface. By dividing some of these sample screens, we can get knowledge that we can use almost like a template to create other screens. So any kind of division that we might have in our menu, any kind of composition and spacing arrangement to do with images or content could be consistent through a number of screens in the same way that our movement and our motion in the interface could also be consistent. We can go a little bit deeper in analyzing our interface here. If we take each of our sections, we can look at how the graphic elements in each of those sections works. We have a logo type that exists in our branding area, and that's going to give us several design considerations to think about. Not just the logo type itself, but its size, position, and color. If we look at our typographic menu, again, we have several design decisions to make. First of all, how much space is our menu going to take up? What kind of size should it be? What kind of shape? How are we going to divide that up? What sort of typeface do we use? How do we use color, dividers? There's plenty of design decisions here to give a generic menu a very specific look and feel. In our content areas, most of the visual work is being done by the content itself the thing that is inside the box, inside the frame. But we still have to think about the size, position, color, and spacing of that content. If we go back up top to our navigation and branding bar and think about our navigation, we've got plenty to think about here, even though it's a small area. We have to think about our icons, what color they are, the size and spacing of them. And those considerations are also going to be the same ones in our menu at the bottom, our content-specific menu. And here, because the tasks that we're carrying out are more specific, we might have to design some more specific or custom icons. If we take all the various screens that the student designed for this app and lay them all out at once, we can see that they really work as a set. There's a level of consistency there from screen to screen that's really important. So what we end up with is a really great map of all our user interface elements and all the different ways that they could be used. And at this stage, we might not have figured out all the different ways that the user is going to interact with them and all the different ways that the interface is going to change. We're really still investigating the graphic design and aesthetics of the interface. So the next stages are going to be to think much more about how the menus might move, how buttons or elements might change states, what kind of areas are going to be active, and generally to think about how are we going to bring our designs to life? And we're going to look at that much more in our next course. 
where UI meets UX, and our emphasis changes from being much more on graphic design and the user interface to much more on structure and how the user experiences the interface. But UI and UX will continue to inform each other at every stage of the process. But from now on, our focus is going to shift a little bit more so that user experience becomes the emphasis. And we're not abandoning our design-centric process here, we're just taking it to the next stage, to the next level. And once again, combining your UI and your UX knowledge together is what's going to make you a great UI UX designer. Hi, I'm Michael Williams. Welcome to User Experience Fundamentals. This course provides half the foundation of knowledge you need to work with UI UX, the UX or user experience half of the equation. If you've already taken visual elements of user interface design, the first course in the UI UX specialization offered by CalArts, you'll be able to combine your knowledge from that course with this one. This course focuses on UX, and it's less concerned with the graphic user interface and much more concerned with how the designer shapes the user's interaction and experience. You could think of a UX designer as a tour guide, holding the hand of the user, making their journey easier and pointing things out to them along the way. This course examines how content is organized and structured to create an experience for a user, and we'll use a condensed process as a roadmap for developing UX design from start to finish. We'll begin with a discussion about ideation, moving on to how to map and organize goals, carry out research and development, as well as audience research and user-centered design. We'll examine how to create a sitemap to organize content and use non-visual paper prototyping and user testing. We'll take all of these different areas of information and research and combine them into a wireframe, and finally, into a working on-screen interactive mock-up. When this course is combined with the first course in the specialization, you'll have a basic working knowledge of the components of UI UX, and also a methodology that will allow you to develop an app or website from conception through to digital prototype. In other words, you'll have the many pieces of compartmentalized knowledge and skills you need, but also a way of putting those pieces together into a functional process for UI UX development. Why peer review is important to a creative practice. Design is rarely a solitary practice. As a designer, you might be working with clients or have a boss you need to report to. You might also be part of a design team or even managing a team of your own. You might be asked to present a project to stakeholders at a company or pitch your services to a new client. Ultimately, your design needs to stand alone, but in the process of making design, you should be testing out your ideas with an audience, getting feedback, and developing your design accordingly. Design is very intertwined with communication, and to be a successful designer, you need to be able to talk about your work, to explain it, and show that you understand how it's working. In different situations, it may be necessary to explain your own work and other people's work in a clear and constructive way. So in this course, you'll be engaging in peer review to evaluate the work of your peers as well as get feedback on your own work. If you're serious about working as a designer or improving your design skills, consider peer review as excellent practice. In peer review, you'll be asked to observe and openly reflect on what is working and not working in a peer's graphic design submission. The goal of this exercise is to help your fellow designers move their work forward and for you to get that same advice in turn. Additionally, it's for you to practice a working vocabulary and discourse around making graphic design, all of which will help you with your future path as a designer. The next video will give you some specific tips for completing peer review within the specialization. Peer review tips. Critique and feedback are essential parts of the design process. They're an essential way to see if your design is communicating what you intended to an audience. So in this video, 
I'm going to outline a few tips for completing peer review assignments successfully in this class. Participation in peer review thoughtfully and meaningfully will help you practice these indispensable skills. Submitting assignments. Read the instructions carefully. Make sure you take a look at the review criteria so you know how your assignment will be assessed. Review any examples your instructor may have provided and upload exactly what you were asked to do. If something in the instructions isn't clear, post your question in the course forums so staff can assist you. Make it your best work. This is your creation and your creativity and should be an exercise that demonstrates what you can do. Practice assignments should be opportunities to fail, but a final assignment should be something worthy of your professional portfolio. Ask for specific feedback. Clarify what you need from your peers in your review. Where applicable, use the designated comment field to ask for specific feedback on your submission. Submit on time. Refer to the due date for submitting your assignment on the grades page within the course. If you're too early or too late, the peer review process may not work as intended. Reviewing submissions. Take your time with reviewing. Don't rush this. Look at each part of your peer's submission carefully and compare what has been submitted to the expectations set out in the rubric. Be objective. When reviewing, consider your role as a viewer or reader of the work. Focus only on what the rubric asks you to evaluate and try to limit your personal opinions about the work in your comments. Be clear and informative. Generic feedback such as good or okay are unhelpful comments for peer reviews because they don't give a your peer any specific information about what was working in their submission. Likewise, it doesn't help to say it doesn't work or I don't like it because it doesn't give your peer enough information to help them reassess their designs. Try to articulate a detailed response that helps to affirm your peer's choices in their submission or guides your peer towards the goal of an assignment if it appears that they are off track. Be constructive. Your feedback should motivate your peer to make adjustments and work towards improvement. If there's a need to correct your peer, be honest, but it's more helpful to include specific recommendations or strategies to help the learner improve. Be generous. Recognize that everyone comes to this course with a different level of experience, as well as a different approach to making work. Honor and value these differences. Bad grammar and spelling shouldn't contribute to a bad grade. Please be generous. Likewise, please don't penalize students for small mistakes. Flag plagiarism and dishonest behavior. These violate Coursera's honor code. If you're asked to review an assignment and it appears to be plagiarized, you can flag it so Coursera Learner Support are notified. Complete your reviews on time. Refer to the due date for completing the minimum number of peer reviews on the grades page within the course. If you're too early or too late, the peer review process may not work as intended. Consider reviewing more than the minimum number of peers for a given assignment. Not only is this helpful for your fellow peers, but it's also instructive for you to see a greater range of submissions to inform your own work. And the more you practice critique, the better you will get at it, and ultimately the better your own work will be as you integrate your critical abilities into your own design process. How to apply feedback to your assignment. So, your assignment's graded, and you have peer feedback, now what? Remember, the goal of peer review is to help you improve your work as a maker and viewer. Try not to see the feedback you receive as either being positive or negative, or an affirmation that you're doing something absolutely right or wrong. Through peer review, you're inviting other perspectives on your work to see and comment on things that you might not see. By engaging in peer review, you're practicing the skill you'll need in your creative and professional life. It's important to understand 
how an audience will react to your work. Peer feedback should never feel like a personal attack. If you're discouraged by some feedback, then step back and consider why a peer would react that way to your work. Are you seeing patterns or common themes in the feedback you receive? Is there something you need to address in the work? If you receive peer feedback that isn't constructive to your work, that's okay. It's not ideal, but don't let it discourage you. Remember, the goal of feedback is to help you improve. If you need additional feedback, you can resubmit. At the end of the day, remember, both positive and negative feedback can be useful. Positive feedback can let you know what is working, what to keep as is or alter only slightly in your assignment. Negative feedback might let you know what needs to be changed, developed, or reconsidered. As the designer, you might disagree with the feedback, but it's always worth examining someone else's point of view. An outside perspective can be very useful, especially because designers often get too close to their own work and sometimes can't see when parts of it aren't working or communicating properly. If you receive a low grade, consider why your peers gave you that grade. Have they justified their grading in the comments? Consider their perspectives and try incorporating their suggestions into the assignment and resubmit. In this first week, we're going to look at what happens at the start of the UX development process. We'll look at ideation and how to articulate and structure your ideas and goals for an app. In other words, how to clarify and communicate your ideas. We'll look at preliminary personal research and development and how to use naming and language as an important part of your app's identity. We'll also briefly touch on audience research and user-centered design, but for the most part, it'll be you that's driving the ideas and design of your app. This week is dedicated to the initial stages of developing an app, and you'll be working with this same content and growing this project over the next four weeks. So it's worth spending some time coming up with a good idea. In this first week of UX Design Fundamentals, we're going to look at ideation, articulation, and development. We're going to look at the beginning stages of the UI UX process. In our previous class, we'd focused on the UI aspect of UI UX, the interface design. Now we're going to focus much more on the UX part the experience. And we're going to divide our UX process up into four chronological stages. And these four stages are going to offer you a roadmap for how to progress from ideation all the way through to a finished digital prototype. So our first week we'll look at ideation, articulation and development. In our second week we'll take those ideas and start to map them out, envision them and test them. Once we've got a clearer idea of what goes where in our interface and what the structure of our overall app is, we'll move on to the third stage of creating wireframes and developing our user interface design. And in our final week, we'll take either wireframes or more developed interface designs and turn them into a digital prototype. Before we get started, I want to do a quick recap of some very general information from our first course. That course focused on UI, and in order to look at it in more detail, we divided UI and UX. We described UI as how the digital experience looks and UX as what that experience feels like. So UI is based much more in visual design and UX a little bit more in non-visual design. And we're going to continue this idea of separation in order to examine these disciplines and get more knowledge. With UI, we focused more on form, aesthetics, look and feel and organization more graphic design principles. With UX, we're going to look much more at the intangible aspects of interface design, how things feel, how our navigation works, what our story and structure is. UI ends up being a little bit more about the surface. It's design driven. UX tends to work more with thinking about the user's engagement. It tends to be more driven around the activity of interaction. And while we'll separate UX from UI as a way to get a little bit of focus, it's never truly separated, of course. As we keep saying, they're intrinsically informing each other. So while 
UI ends up being a little bit more tangible and UX ends up being more propositional. We need both of these aspects of design if we want to be a good UI UX designer. But for now, UI is going to take a back seat and we're going to try and look much more at the UX part of the equation. And since we're dealing with a practice that is less tangible and more propositional, it makes sense that we'll start out looking at ideation, articulation, and how to develop an idea. All four of our weeks are connected, and this first week really deals with the thinking phase of the UX process. In the projects for this course, you're going to be working with one idea, so it's worth thinking a little bit about where do ideas come from? Well, a lot of the times out in the real world, they come from a client or employer. As a UI UX designer, you aren't always coming up with your own content, with your own ideas. But in this case, you're going to act as the client, as the employer. You're going to come up with your own idea for an app. And the benefit of this is that it can be whatever you want it to be. You can really use your imagination to come up with a fantastic idea. And your idea, the content and the concept, can be something that really lends itself to visual exploration. It doesn't have to be something that already exists or that conforms to current norms. You're going to have the ability to shape the content of your app and to shape the experience, as well as shaping the idea. You'll really be in control of everything. And that sounds great, but you've still got to come up with a good idea. So again, where do good ideas come from? What makes an app useful or awesome? Well, quite often, good ideas come from good problems. And while that sounds like an oxymoron, all it really means is that it's a real problem, that the app has a real reason to exist. But then once you've started from that, you need a good process. You need to be able to take that problem and solve it with your app in a good way. And that's going to mean figuring out exactly how you solve the problem. You're going to need to be able to focus on exactly what it is within that problem that you can solve with an app, as well as exactly how you're going to solve it. So think about a good problem being one that's a real problem, not an invented, manufactured problem that nobody really needs a solution to, because nobody wants another app that they don't really need. You want a problem that's actually a problem, and one that can be solvable by an app, because not every problem can be solved by an app as well. Sometimes it's okay that there's not an app for that, but when you do have a real problem that can be solved by an app, you can tell its success rate by how users respond to it. If you have an app that's very successful, users really love that app. They have an emotional connection to it. So let's say we come up with a fantastic idea for an app that solves a real problem. It isn't really worth anything unless we can use a process to develop that into something more than just an idea. Ideas are cheap. And the chances are that 50 other people have the same idea as you for an app. What's going to make yours different is your process. You're going to need to do research in order to see what's already out there and figure out what the best solution could be. You're going to need to do testing so that you can make sure that it's really solving the problem for your user base. And you're going to need to be willing to revise and change your app in its form and ideas as you go through this process of development. Think of a good idea as a car that you're driving. Good process is the roadmap that you're going to follow to get to your destination. And your destination is a fantastic app, but you're not going to get there unless you stay focused and don't wander off the track. So there are some tools for focus that you can use along the way. You can clearly articulate your ideas and what you want to do so your goals are clear. You can retain that clarity of intention through every aspect of your process. And you can check to see if your app is really doing what you think it is by testing it with users and getting feedback. So I'm going to try and give you a process and a methodology over the next four weeks for you to develop an app. But what that app is, is going to be entirely up to you. The blank screen is a blank slate and you can fill it with anything that you want to. And there's plenty of nonsensical and idiotic stuff out there. Not to mention a lot of badly designed and dysfunctional apps. For the next four weeks, you're going to work on developing an app of your own. And you'll be the one who's going to define what the problem is, as well as what your solution is. 
You'll have control over all aspects of your app. You'll be able to define what the content is as well as how your app works. You'll be inventing your app so this project is imaginary on the one hand but you'll also be treating it in a very real way. You'll be branding and naming your app, mapping out all the different screens and how it works and testing your app as well. And at the end we'll make a digital prototype of your app. But to start with you have to figure out what it is. What's the idea? The blank piece of paper is always terrifying. When you can do anything, sometimes you do nothing. So let's try and think how you can invent a concept for your app. Let's think of a framework that gives you a few constraints. Let's start out by trying to provide a simple service that users actually desire. So maybe you can think of something that would improve your own life, something that you would really like to have as an app. I might be tired of going to the gas station, so I'd like somebody to come to my house to fill my car full of gas. Or I might just want 24 hour ice cream. I might have lost a pet one time and wished that I'd had a service that could help me find my lost pet. Or perhaps I want to figure out how to use all the groceries left in my kitchen to make a new recipe. Your app could pretty much do anything you want it to, and it can have whatever attitude you want it to as well. It might be very serious and solve a real problem, or it might be fun, it might be fantastic for an invention that doesn't even exist yet. We're going to use this as an exercise for you to learn about UI UX, so don't worry about this being real, but think of an app that you would want in your life. Try and make it be interesting rather than real. And also, if you think of an app that you personally would want in your life, that solves a problem for you as an individual, you're not only going to be the perfect user, but you're going to be the expert from the start. But spend a little time thinking about your idea, because it's something that we're going to use as the content for this process over the next four weeks. So while you'll be learning lots of different things in the course, you're going to actually apply that knowledge to the vehicle of your app. You don't have to decide until the end of this week, but start to think about it now. So. We're starting out at the very beginning of our project. Let's talk about ideas and goals. You've been asked to come up with an idea for an app that solves a problem for you. And this initial idea is really up to you. It can be whatever you're interested in. I can't give you that initial idea, but what I can do is give you a way to test whether your app idea is really going to work. And it's okay if a similar app already exists for your idea, because you're going to deal with it in a different way. So let's say my initial idea for my app is one that gives me recipes for food that I have already in my kitchen. Like all beginning ideas, it's very broad and it could go in many different directions. So first of all, try and be as specific as you can. Try and articulate your idea as clearly as you can. So on the one hand, you want to really expand your idea. You want to try and explore all the different possibilities that it could have. But you also want to look at those possibilities and decide which ones you're going to use, which ones are really relevant. These two activities seem like they're almost in opposition to each other, but when you put them together, you have a process. And that process helps you develop your idea. It's a simple strategy in a lot of ways. It's figuring out what questions to ask and then answering those questions. Let's look at my leftover food app and see what kind of questions we might want to ask about that. My starting questions could be quite broad and gradually get more and more focused as I define what my app really is. So I could start out by asking, what does it do and how does it work? Quite simple and broad questions. I could also think about the audience, who's going to benefit from my app and why would somebody use this in the first place? So while these questions are broad, I'm going to have to come up with more specific answers and those specific answers are going to help me define more specifically what my app is. And this is going to make it be different from all the other apps that do the same thing. I'm going to take it in a slightly different direction. So let's first of all ask, what does my app do? Well, it creates recipes that use only existing food from your kitchen. But it could do other things too, so let's explore some of those. It could suggest additional food to purchase for recipes. It could also keep track of my tastes 
so that it could customize recipes for me. It could store and share my recipes and maybe let me see the recipes of others. So if your app is going to do more than one thing, it's useful to create a hierarchy of the function of your app. So which of these things is the most important? I would say that the primary goal is the first one that I came up with, to create recipes using existing food. But perhaps I might need just one more ingredient or two to make a really great recipe. So I'd have to go to the store and get those. So suggesting additional food to purchase for those recipes would probably be my second most important idea. I think the storing and sharing of recipes is also pretty important. It would help create a community and it would also make me use the app more than one time. And finally, tracking my tastes and customizing recipes just for me would probably be the lowest thing in my hierarchy of functionality. So let's take the four things that our app is going to do and organize them to visually represent their importance. So we've got a hierarchy of functionality and it's really important that we remember this and stick to it. We don't want to get sidetracked and make something minor be the focus of our app. Our hierarchy of function is also a hierarchy of ideas. We're going to spend a little more time articulating that big idea, but all of our other ideas won't go away. They're just hiding behind the big idea. They're still there and they're going to provide a supporting role, but they're a little less important than our main idea. So let's spend some time focusing on that first. If we're clear on that big idea, it's easier to convey to somebody else what our app is really all about. And one of the ways to do this is to come up with a really tight and accurate one-line description. You could use the prefix my app dot 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 and then think about how to fill the rest of that sentence in. So you could think about how you use language and tone to describe your app, but also just the words themselves, having no wasteful or extraneous language there. Think about the specifics of each word. So my app now suggests delicious recipes. It doesn't create the recipes, it suggests them. And notice that the recipes are now delicious, they're not regular recipes anymore. Let's go back to the four big questions that I asked you earlier about your app. We're going to turn each of these into a class to try and help you to answer these questions. So our first question, what does it do, we've already looked at in this class, and we've answered that by using a strategy that involves ideation and articulation. We've now got a clear one-line description of our app and a bunch of supporting ideas to go along with that. Our next question is going to be how does it work? And I don't mean how does it work technically, I mean how does the app achieve its goal? And the goal should be clear in your initial statement. In my case, it's about suggesting delicious recipes and using up ingredients that are already in your kitchen. So I'm going to need to do some research into my content and into my competition. I want to know if something similar exists, and if it does, I want to solve that problem in a better or more engaging way. We're going to look more closely at who benefits from our app, not just the audience, but perhaps the client as well. Why are we even making this app in the first place? Is it for fun? Is it for social good? Or is it to make money? And lastly, we're going to examine a little more deeply why would someone use our app in the first place? We're going to figure out our goals and our outcomes, what we want the user to have achieved in going through our app. And we're going to make sure that those goals and outcomes are achieved, because if they're not, we're going to have to go back and reevaluate all of the other questions we've asked ourselves. To be clear, we're engaged in a process here, and it's not always a linear one. Quite often, it's going to involve some back and forth and even some modification to your ideas as you develop them and refine them. In this section, we're going to look at research and development of our idea. We've got four main questions about our idea that we're trying to answer, and we've got four areas that we're going to investigate in order to answer those questions. So let's look at what kind of research we should do, and let's look at how we might develop our idea a little bit further. Chances are that if you have a good idea for an app, several other people have also had that same good idea. So one of the first things that you can do is check out the competition. 
it might help you to categorize what other kinds of apps you're going to look at. The most obvious place to start is apps that do exactly the same thing as the idea that you have. There are millions of apps out there, so the chances are that there is something doing the same thing as your app, but it might not be very visible. Even if there's not an app doing exactly the same thing, I'm willing to bet that there are plenty of apps that do something similar. And these might contain important information about what to do or what not to do with your app. These first two categories are very strongly related to your idea, but let's see what happens when you move your circle of search out a little bit further. You could look at what kind of apps are adjacent to yours, what apps might have the same broader subject matter but not have the same specific subject as yours. And then you could also look at apps that are totally unrelated to your content and your idea. These could be very interesting structural, technical, or even aesthetic models that you might be interested in influencing your design. By looking in all these areas, you'll get obvious, predictable research, but also tangential, unexpected research. Let's take my leftover food app and look at some apps that do exactly the same thing. Let's say that I find three examples from each of these categories. I can search in the App Store, but I can also go online and see how many people are using these apps and what their feedback is. It's quite easy for me to gather visual research as well. I can take screenshots to have a record of the designs, but I also need to download all of the apps and go through them and actually experience them. So what other apps might do something similar to mine? I can find a lot of apps to do with recipes and cooking and ingredients, and some of these might have some smaller section that deals with using leftover ingredients. But their main focus isn't going to be exactly the same as my app. But all of this research is still very useful, and that might be to do with the structure, it might be to do with the design. I could be looking at these sites and noting similarities that I might want to repeat myself or that I might want to avoid and do something totally different. If I broaden my circle of investigation, the next stage that I'm going to look at are apps that are content adjacent. In my case, this is going to be apps that might deal with food or something to do with food, but don't really deal with recipes or ingredients necessarily. They might deal with buying or delivering food, or they might have a more conceptual connection. For instance, Food for All has a social agenda that I could see as having a connection to the agenda of my app, whereas Yelp might be a much more useful model for thinking about how a food community is built online. Finally, I could look at unrelated apps, apps not related to my content, but that might inform my idea or my structure in some other way. Lifehacks, for instance, seems to have a DIY resource using philosophy that matches mine. Or I could find some design or conceptual ideas that are useful in sites that deal with reusing or repurposing things that seem to be trash but really aren't. I like having these broader influences because it stops your research becoming too predictable. So we've looked at a range of different connected apps ones that are very specific and relate to our idea and our content, and ones that are further away from our idea and our content. So now let's try and use some of that research and figure out how we might develop our idea a little bit further. I'm going to talk about this process in very broad terms, the process of developing your idea. We're going to do it without really talking about content. So maybe you can think about your idea and put it into this example. Think about your idea as being amorphous. Think about it as being a blob or an amoeba that can change its shape. Your idea shouldn't be rigid. It can be manifested in a lot of different forms and a lot of different structures. It's still your idea, but the shape of your idea can be very, very different. In other words, how someone sees and experiences your idea. One way to decide on what shape your idea should have is to ask yourself a series of what-if questions. What if my app was entirely image-based? What if my app connected to a food delivery service? What if my app allowed people to donate food to charity? You can always say no to any of these ideas that you come up with. 
But what's important is that you test out your idea and you come up with a bunch of different options. Ideas are pretty much free. They just take your time and a pencil and a piece of paper. So it's worth mapping out all the possibilities, all the different ways that your idea could be manifested. And it's worth doing that now to find out what the right direction is. Because right now, your ideas are free, but your idea can take whatever shape you want it to. As we just saw, there's many different shapes the same idea could have. By thinking like this, you're exploring your options and you're trying to discover what is special about your app and what is original about your app. I always find a good way to do that is to empty your brain, to map out all of the possibilities that you can think of, even the ones that you don't think are great. And I do that by listing everything that my app could do. I like to do that on a giant piece of paper so that I can see all my thoughts on the paper and react to them. It also means I can come back to them and decide whether they're really good ideas or bad ideas. And if I can't decide that for myself, I can very easily test the waters for my ideas by talking to somebody else, by bouncing my ideas off another person. In a way, even at this beginning stage, you're getting user feedback. It's the same strategy we've already seen of being broad and being focused at the same time. The broadness comes from you extending the parameters of your thought, trying to open your mind to ideas that you might not initially have thought of, and trying to widen your scope of what you thought was a good solution to the problem. Because once you've laid out all the possibilities, every single way that your app could be represented and everything that it could do, then you can examine all of that material, all of those ideas, and decide precisely which of those ideas is the best, which of those you're going to pursue, and in what kind of order or hierarchy you're going to engage with those ideas. So we've started to develop and also focus our idea. Even at this early stage, it's worth us thinking about our audience and our rationale for our app, because that might have some overarching consequences for what our app does and how our app works. So all four of our questions have an effect on one another. And right now, we're going to focus on audience and rationale. We're going to ask, who benefits from my app? In order to figure that out, we have to figure out who's the audience for my app. And it's no good saying everybody. Even if everybody does end up using your app, it's going to start out from an initial hardcore user group. So it's worth defining what your target audience or your target user group is. So I'm going to take a stab at describing some of the traits I think my users might have. I think they'd definitely be people who wanted to waste less food. There could be a few reasons for this, but I think the most important reason is probably going to be that they're also people who want to save money. There's an unexpected and creative aspect to making these new recipes, so I think my user base could also be people that are inventive. And if I think about some of the functions in my app, my audience might also be people who want to shop accurately for just the things they need. Again, we're going to go from the general to the more specific. So if I look at people who want to waste less, I could describe them in more detailed terms as being eco-conscious, being into recycling, perhaps being proactive in their lifestyle. The people who want to save money could be described as being thrifty, perhaps they're on a budget, or perhaps they're living in a communal or shared living situation. For the inventive or creative part, I could describe my target users as being people who like to cook. They probably have a wide taste, and they might be quite adventurous since they don't know what they're going to get. And the people who want to shop accurately for missing ingredients could be wanting to do that because they want to save space in their kitchen, or save time going to the supermarket, or more likely, save money. So now, I've got four much more detailed areas that describe some of my users. And I could divide these into categories, or if you like, into personality traits to try and define the user even more closely. So the first set feel like they're much more political considerations, whereas the second set feels like they're much more financial. They're all to do with budget. The third set could loosely be described as being social, to do with the activities around cooking and eating, whereas the fourth set feels very pragmatic 
It feels like it's dealing with issues that are very functional. So we've got a little bit more specific in terms of our descriptions and we've also started to categorize how those descriptions work. We could take that a stage further and we could think about how we could use these directions and these traits to actually invent some mythical users. We could invent profiles of what we think typical or ideal users would be. And much as our one-line description summed up accurately our app, these one-line user profiles might accurately describe who's using our app. They can be useful in terms of explaining our ideas to other people, but they can also be really useful in terms of role-playing, especially when it comes to testing. If we have a specific description of somebody using our app, it somehow makes it feel more real. It's useful to have this one person stand in for a whole section of users. We're creating an archetype or stereotype that everybody can understand. So let's invent a user profile for my app. My first user is called James, and he's from San Diego. I'm going to make him be young, 22 years old. And I'm going to say that he's a student as well. Let's say he's studying economics. He lives in a shared house with some of his other fellow students. He's pretty active. He likes hiking, and he's really into CrossFit. And his active lifestyle is reflected in that he's a vegetarian. So why is James a good user for my app? Well, he fits many of my categories. He lives in a shared house. He's 22 years old and a student, so he probably doesn't have much money. He's got a health-conscious lifestyle as well. He's a vegetarian and an economic student, so I think some of our politics might line up too. He's a good match for all four of our categories. Let's invent another sample user who also fits into our four categories, but is very different from James. Here's Tracy from New York. She's a 35-year-old mother, She's a freelance editor, and she lives in a third-floor apartment. Her hobbies include cycling and fencing, and when she has free time, she likes to host dinner parties. She might seem very different from James, but there's also some similarities. They're both quite active, they're both quite social, and they both might be on a budget as well. I can imagine them both using my app, but in very different ways. Their emphasis within my four categories isn't going to be the same. Let's try and use this same structure that helped us define our user target group and think about how it might help define the rationale behind why someone would use my app. Our larger descriptions of the personality traits of our user will probably stay the same, and so will our categories, political, financial, social, and functional. But let's look at rationale or motivation in our user. Their political motivation might be to make a difference, to be green. Whereas the financial motivation would be as simple as saving money, to be thrifty. The social motivation might be a little bit more tricky. It might be about being creative, but it might also be about community, discovering and sharing recipes. The functional motivation is relatively easy, to save time and to save space. By following this process, we've managed to obtain a much more detailed description of our audience and of our rationale. We've been inventing our users, but we've also been inventing our users' concerns. And if we just stick with their interests, we're going to design something that is entirely user-centric in its design. And that's just one part of the equation that we have to consider as UI UX designers. We also have to consider our own knowledge as designers and how we're going to create design-centered design. But there's a third aspect that we don't always think about and that's about the client. They're also going to have a set of goals and a set of intentions that we're going to have to figure out how to deal with. In this section we're going to look at some of the goals and outcomes that we want to have for our app. We've asked our four main questions and now we're looking at why would someone use my app? In the last section, we looked a lot at our app through the perspective of the user and tried to define what the user's role was. But now we're going to turn it on its head. And instead of asking, why do I want people to use my app? We're going to ask, what are my goals? My goals as the client and as the designer. So we're changing focus from the people that are using the app to the people that are making the app.
and sometimes those sets of goals align. So let's look at my goals for making the app. First of all, I'd really like to reduce food wastage in the world. I feel like that's pretty important as a social agenda. But I'd also quite like to make some money out of my app, so I'm not doing it entirely for free. It would be great if I could build a community that was interested in the same issues as I am. We could share knowledge and information and all contribute to reducing food wastage together. And in general, I'd like to provide a useful app, something that people thought really had value in their lives. I could take all of my concerns and put them into the same categories that we've already looked at. My goals as the maker aren't that different from the user's goals. They still fit into political, financial, social and functional categories. And all of my goals are interconnected and interdependent upon each other. If my app ends up being popular, then it could really reduce food wastage at a really high level. And the more successful it is, and the more people involved, the more my chances are of making money. And I could use that money to funnel back into reducing food wastage. As my app grows, the better chance I have of building a community around it. And with the expansion of that community, I could provide a much more useful app, and I could reduce food wastage even further. So my goals are all interconnected to each other, and all interdependent. And I might view them as all being fairly even, fairly proportionate in terms of what I'm interested in achieving. But that's because I'm acting as the client here, when a lot of the time I wouldn't get to choose my client. I'd just be the designer. So what if my client was a large and greedy bank? What kind of goals might that bank have in these four categories? Let's make some up just for fun. Politically, I might want to promote home ownership. Financially, I'd want to make money. Socially, I might choose to build a community, and functionally, the same reason, I'd want a useful app. And that doesn't sound too bad. My bank doesn't sound too greedy at all. Wait a minute though, most of the bank's focus is going to be on making money, 80%. It's quite interested in promoting home ownership still, because it makes money from that. It's not that interested in providing a useful app, and it might have no interest at all in building a community, because there's no financial gain for the bank in that. And this is an extreme and unrealistic model. Our digital world doesn't work like that because everything is connected. Each of these aspects has an effect on the other one. So even if the main focus of a greedy bank is making money, it might only put 40% of its energy there. If you ignore the social and functional aspects of your app, you're going to be in trouble you need to actually spread everything around a little bit more evenly. Let's see what happens at the other end of the spectrum. Instead of a large and greedy bank, let's see what would happen if we were making an app for a small and rather nice charity. In the broadest sense, some of the goals of the small and nice charity might be the same as the large and greedy bank, and some be different. So financially, for instance, the charity still needs to make money, it still wants to build community and provide a useful app. The biggest difference might be its goal politically, in this case, to feed the homeless. And it might be less concerned with providing a useful app and more concerned with providing an engaging app for its audience. If we think about where the emphasis of the charity might be, it might be much more towards its goal, its political goal of feeding the homeless. It would probably have quite a high interest in building a community but maybe less interest in making money, because it's small, it might not need much money to keep going, and it might choose to not put much emphasis on creating an engaging app. But just like our previous example, everything is interrelated here. Our political, financial, social and functional aspects of the app. Because everything's interrelated, the app might actually want to make lots of money so that the money can be used to feed the homeless. And if the app builds a larger community, it'll probably make more money, which again will let it feed more people. You could even make an argument that everything is so interrelated that the percentages of the focus of the app should all be even. If the app wasn't engaging, it would dramatically adversely affect the other areas, for instance. So in some cases, you might end up with everything being divided pretty equally. But it's going to be different from app to app, from content and subject to content and subject. So you're going to have to figure out 
where the emphasis of your app lies because that's going to have a lot of knock-on effects in terms of how your content is structured and how you want to shape the user's experience as they travel through your app. It's important to remember that all of the goals and outcomes in your app are all tied to each other and all affect each other. So far, I've come up with an idea for my app. I've developed that idea and I've thought about an audience. And now I've got to give it a name. In my Visual Elements of User Interface class, I tried to map out many of the areas where UI UX takes place. The naming and identity part of the process is highly specialized. In our diagram, it lives over to the left-hand side, where we're developing content, ideas, and thinking about marketing. And while we might call it branding and identity, we're really looking at something more specific here, because we're just looking at how to use language, how to use words. So we're not branding in terms of a visual identity, but we're branding with language. So let's look at three different places where we can use words as a branding tool. The most obvious is in the name of our app. We're going to have to name our app something. But we might also need a tagline and a mission statement. So let's look at how these three things differ. Your name is the smallest thing that you're going to have to deal with. It's normally only a word or two. Your tagline is often a short sentence, whereas your mission statement can be a few lines or a paragraph. As well as being different in scale, these three pieces of language are also different in terms of their goals. You want your name to be memorable, original, appropriate, to have the right kind of tone or mood, and to have the right kind of sound to it. Apart from a logo, your name is going to be the most succinct thing that's going to brand your app and you're going to need it if you're going to make a logo type as well. While you want your name to be memorable and original, most importantly, it's got to be a good fit for your product. Your tagline is an expansion of that, where you want it to be catchy, succinct, to be a summary of what your app does, but like your name, you want it to have the right kind of tone or mood. It offers you more language to work with than just your name, a soundbite rather than just a single word or two. Your tagline could be a clever description of what you do, or a phrase that sums up your philosophy. Your mission statement is longer still, a few lines or a paragraph, and it gives you a chance to get much more descriptive about what your app does. You could talk about the ambitions or the achievements of your app, but like the other two items we're looking at, you still need to have the right tone and the right mood. And that's what all three of these things have in common. They need to work as a set. They need to all be related to each other, not just in terms of their content, but in terms of their philosophy and how they use language. Again, tone is very important. We can take our familiar strategy of simultaneous focus and expansion. We could make a mind map to get all the language out of our head, but then we'd need to pick out what are the relevant key words from all of those things that we've got in front of us? Like everything else, it's part of a process. In general, the language that we use for our naming might be much more creative and much more connotative, whereas the language we use for our mission might be much more factual, much more descriptive. This kind of process and using language in this way is very common in graphic design, particularly for branding and identity projects. Here's an example from my graphic design course on Coursera, where you had to invent a company and create an identity for it. I invented a startup company that had a food truck selling snails. I made up a whole backstory, but to get to grips with the language that I might use in my naming process, I made a mind map that explored all of the possible areas connected to my backstory. I looked at French culture and French cuisine. I looked at the 1968 Paris student protests. I looked at French automobile design and French architecture. And from this web of words, I came up with three adjectives that I thought would describe my company. Having a clear set of criteria that you want to communicate can be really helpful when you're making an identity design or when you're naming something. If your adjectives are successful and accurate, then you can use them as a sounding board to test any name that you come up with against them, but you need to have a name first in order to test it. So let's look at some strategies for naming. We've already decided that naming our app 
is much more of a creative process than writing our mission statement, which is more descriptive. So it makes sense that we would take slightly different strategies for both of these. Our naming might take strategies like using mythology, thinking what a contemporary way of using language is. Perhaps something comes from science or history or fiction. Whereas our mission statement would be much more concise, much more descriptive and pragmatic. So let's go through these naming strategies one by one and look at some real world solutions. We're going to use both app names and company names as our examples. If I asked you to think about a branding example that uses mythology for its name, I wonder what you'd come up with. I'm pretty sure you'd come up with the same example as me. Nike, the Greek goddess of victory, and well-known Oregon shoemaker. There's also Pandora, who received many gifts from the gods, including the gift of music. Although there's also the negative connotation of the evils stored in Pandora's box. You could look at contemporary language and contemporary phrases and think about how to combine those. You could use slang, misspellings and colloquialisms to create a new word that has some contemporary cultural meaning. And that might make it young and fun. Or you could take a more scientific approach and have something that's more mathematical or more serious. Google manages both by being a misspelling of Google. You could take pieces of the language, like Microsoft, who are developing software for microprocessors. Although, as technology advances, your name might get left behind. You could also take a historical approach to naming. Is Apple Computers a homage to Apple Records? Or does it relate to Isaac Newton's revelations about gravity? Or most likely that it was just the fact that Steve Jobs visited an apple orchard. Historically speaking, bands once rehearsed in garages. It's funny that the digital software they use to make music now is on a computer and not in the garage anymore. Or your name could be totally fictional, totally invented. What does Spotify actually mean? The connotative meaning of words and the sound of them, the poetics of the actual language, can be very powerful. And if you make your name up, it doesn't come with any baggage. There are lots and lots of different approaches you can take to naming. You could think about how to combine a couple of these together, or just use them singly. We could look at combinations of different words. We could look at very descriptive or didactic strategies, names that are nonsense, or names that just have a really great sound to them. Combining two shorter words into a longer one is a very common strategy. It allows you to reference two known and stable things and put them together to suggest the third thing, which is precisely what your app or company does. So we have Grub, Hub, Net, Flix, and of course, Facebook, better known as Grubhub, Netflix, and Facebook. But sometimes the two words might already exist as a pairing together and have a more didactic meaning. So while Open Table, for example, works with our combination strategy, it's also a very didactic expression of what that app does. But a didactic name is often not the most exciting one. Sometimes we go in the opposite direction and try and think of a nonsense name or invent a word out of nowhere. Or we could think much more about how a word sounds in relationship to what it represents. To me, Twitter actually sounds like the noise made by a million people sending short messages in texts. So there's a wide range of things that you could do to help you come up with some ideas for your name. On the other side of our diagram is our mission statement. And the way that we use language here is very different. We're really looking at something that's much more concise, descriptive, and pragmatic. We're not going to look at this so closely because it doesn't really affect your app so much, but it can help you to write a fake mission statement as a kind of backstory. You can use it as a tool to help you figure out what your app might be called. Traditionally, mission statements look at the history, function, benefits, and goals of a company. Mission statements are a condensed and precise description of what a company wants to do, but could easily be applied to what an app wants to do as well. So here's Coursera's mission statement, for example, and it makes it very clear what their goals are, who they work with, and what they offer. Their description fulfills our criteria of being concise, descriptive, and pragmatic. 
Earlier, we talked about our name, tagline, and mission statement being connected together, and we also looked at how the three things are different. In terms of scale and in terms of tone, the tagline falls somewhere in the middle of the spectrum. It has to be longer and have more content than your name, but not be as long and dry as your mission statement. The tagline is the thing that advertises your name, advertises your brand. It succinctly gets at the heart of what your company or your app does, whether that's thinking differently in the case of Apple, or outsmarting traffic together in the case of Waze, or broadcasting yourself in the case of YouTube. And as before, it's always a good idea to check out the competition. So if I look at my app for using up my ingredients in my kitchen, I can see what other people have done already. I can see how other people have named their apps. Looking at the competition can be really useful because you don't want to come up with a name that's very similar to something that already exists. But you might also find some strategies you hadn't thought of that you can use with your own language and come up with your own original name. If you're stuck, there's another option available to you and that's to use automated generators. And some of these are free online where you can enter topics or parameters or words and they'll automatically generate a number of different combinations of words for you. Most of the time, they're pretty useless and I'd advise you to try and outsmart the automated. But every now and then, they might come up with something really great. Here are some automated names for my leftover food app. And while I'm not sure any of them are 100% right, they might give me some ideas that form the basis of the name that I do choose. Or they might help me figure out my mood and tone. Cuisinely is pretty serious, whereas Popgut is pretty fun. This week, we're going to continue to develop, plan, and test your app idea. We'll be sketching out more extensive content and mapping it into a structure. We'll be thinking about what your app does and how it delivers an experience to the user. To test what aspects of your app are working, we'll look at how to create a non-visual paper prototype, and we'll carry out some limited non-visual user tests. While you're developing the logic of your app, you'll also begin to develop the look and feel of it the visual development process. We'll also look at creating a sitemap and begin to visualize the scope and structure of the entire app. The sitemap and interaction flowchart that we'll create will give you a skeleton structure that will allow you to begin to imagine how your app is going to function and what the experience of your app is going to be. In this second week of UX Design Fundamentals, we're going to focus on mapping, testing, and envisioning. We're taking our design idea and moving it further along in our process. So let's look at where we are right now. By now, you should have an idea for your app that you've developed and articulated so that you have a name, a user profile for an ideal user, a set of goals that you want the app to achieve, and a tagline and a description that work with your name to accurately describe your app. And so all of that was our ideation and articulation stage. And that just forms one part of our entire process. We're going to have to take those ideas and somehow envision them, start to give them form, start to map and plan them out. And when we've got that stage right, we'll be able to start to develop the visual language even further and build a working digital prototype. These three stages in our process roughly translate as being non-visual, semi-visual and then visual. In our ideas phase we were really just using words to describe everything that we were thinking about. Our middle stage will still use words but it'll also use other devices like maps, sketches and diagrams. In our visual stage we'll be developing the user interface and using it to create final designs to put into a working digital prototype. But this week we're going to be all about this semi-visual stage, the stage of envisioning. So we'll be trying to expand and represent our ideas using a set of tools other than just words. But we'll also be careful not to dive straight into trying to create a fully finished user interface design with finished elements. We don't want to invest the time in doing that 
until we've got this second stage of our process really resolved and sorted out. In a lot of ways, this middle stage is a stepping stone between coming up with the idea and making the idea. We're really developing it and mapping everything out right now, and that development can be a mapping of the content of our app, where we're trying to figure out exactly what is in our app, but it can also be developing our ideas as well. We're constantly going to be evaluating and trying to improve upon our app and our initial idea. To help us develop our ideas and content, we're going to be carrying out some preliminary prototyping in a very, very simple way, just to try and see if things work the way we think they're going to work. We'll also start to look at the beginning of visual development for our user interface. We'll be looking at beginning design directions, thinking about the look and feel of our app, rather than the specifics of the user interface. Once we've started to envision our app by developing it in this way, we'll be able to do a second stage of envisioning, where we look much more at wireframing, at the functionality and logic of our website, thinking about how to refine it a little bit more, and making sure that the pieces that we're developing will work together. And we'll be doing that in the third week of our class. So this second week is really the first half of our envisioning process. It's closer to our ideation phase than our prototyping phase. We're still very much developing our ideas and also developing our content. It's important to remember that this is all part of a process and at this stage in our process we still have the ability to try different things out, to test things, to see what works and what doesn't work, to change things if we need to. This is the stage where your ideas get tested and improved upon so it's important that you be open-minded but that you're also analytical about the work that you're making and critical about it to some extent. Try and be responsive and react to the things that work and the things that don't work. What we're really trying to do here is get you to grow your app and develop it into something really substantial and successful. In the next two sections, we're going to look at mapping content and mapping interaction. We're going to break it into two sections and start out by looking at how to map content. This will help you figure out the scope and structure of your app as well as what is going where in terms of your content. UI UX designers make many different kinds of content maps and your content map can look and feel any way that you want it to. There's no industry standard so it's really up to you and you can see many different examples if you do a search online. And while how your content map looks and works is entirely up to you, there are some things that all good maps have in common. Primarily, that your map has to make sense, especially since you might be showing it to other people to explain your app. So let's look at some qualities that your content map should have. Your map should have clarity so that everybody can understand it very quickly. It should have a hierarchy so we know what's important and what's not. It should have modularity, so similar items have similar visual representation, and it should have the potential to grow and expand. So let's make a generic content map with generic content. We've got a blank page to begin with, so we're going to have to decide what's going to go where, what's going to be at the heart of our map. The logical place to start would be with our home page, where a lot of our activity is going to sit. But since we're making an app, we might want some kind of splash page or some kind of ID page that briefly occurs before we get to our home page. Let's say that there's three things that we can do from our home page. These would all be major events or activities and they'd be connected to our home page. So we can use a similar shape to describe them and we can connect them to our home page by a series of lines. We don't know what our events are right now, they're just generic, so we're going to leave them equal in the hierarchy. So we've set up a system to describe our content in words and in boxes and the lines connecting them imply the kind of activity that happens between those boxes or what kind of relationship they have. From the arrow I know that the ID page pushes me onto the home page and from the home page I know that the connecting lines mean that I have three options that I can go to and I can move between those options because they're also connected by a line. It's a very simple visual logic, but one that you need to be consistent with. So here are my sub-events that are much smaller things than the larger events, so I'm going to make those boxes smaller 
and connect them to each of the individual events that I'd have to go through first. So I'm using scale in my geometric shapes, different kinds of shapes, and scale in my typography to create a system. And once I've established the logic of my visual language, I can keep extending it as I add more content. For instance, one of my sub-events might lead me to a much larger event, one that's the same as events 1, 2, and 3. So I can show the connection and how I get to that event, but I can also show its level of importance by using scale. And that larger event in turn might lead me to other sub-events, and again, I can use scale to indicate their position in the hierarchy. Because we're making a generic map, and we're using generic terms to describe our content, it's visually a very flat and even map right now. So even though we know that some things are more important to others by scale, we have no idea about the content and how it might be grouped together. And we can use color as a way to code that content, or to code functionality or types of pages. So let's add some color coding to our content map. Our identity splash page and our home page are pretty individual standalone pages, so they can have their own color to signify that. For the rest of our map, we can group similar content at similar levels of engagement and activity and give those a color coding system to let us see that hierarchy. Again, it's a very simple technique, but we're using color as a coding system to let us see similar kinds of event or content. So if we added pages that took us away from our app, we might want to code those all the same color. We could also think about how we use the lines and arrows between our boxes to signify connections or signify traveling to another space. Because we're designing an app, a lot of our activity might take place on one screen with pop-up menus sitting on top of a background, and we can show that by only using the arrows when we travel to another screen entirely. If we had a website with the same content, it might look the same, but because it's on multiple screens, we'd have a lot more arrows indicating traveling to a lot more screens. We're looking at a simple diagramming system here. It's all to do with mapping and planning and being able to think about your content without actually making any of that content. So far, we've looked at a generic structure with generic content. Let's see what happens when we get rid of the generic content and start to actually map out a real idea for an app. Let's start with our ID page and our home page, but let's use one of the ideas we looked at earlier, which is an app to help you find a lost pet. We're going to use the same structure that we looked at with our generic map, but we're going to shape it and change it to fit this content. So let's say that our app is going to do three main things, three large events or activities. For my lost pet app, those three things might be that I would want to search for a lost pet, that I might want to post information about a pet that I'd lost in the hope that somebody else would see it and find my pet, or that I might want to post information about a pet that I'd found in the hopes that I was going to reunite it with its owner. All of these activities would be happening on one page on my home screen, so I might think about what kind of page should that be. It would make sense to me for that to be a map so that I could look in the area that I wanted to look if I'm searching for something and I could see the area that animals were found or perhaps where animals had been lost as well. So I'm developing my content, organizing my content and shaping my app all at the same time through this process of mapping. As I expand my map, I'm expanding the content. If I wanted to search for my lost pet, I might think about how would I do that? I'd need to enter a name, maybe think about searching by species or by date or by description. Some of my choices might have subcategories, so after I've picked a species, I might need to pick a breed, or I might need to add more information that describes my pet. Just like our generic content map, a lot of this activity would all be happening on one screen, and we've decided that it's going to be based around a map, so we're going to have to come up with another idea for a structure that's going to allow us to float information on top of that map. So we might need a side menu or a separate field to house that extra information. And if we're going to do a search, we're going to need somewhere to see our search results as well. 
So as we're mapping out our content, we're also thinking about structure and we're also developing the functionality of our app. In real life, you might make many different content maps with different emphasis or with different structures or different ways of showing your idea. Once you have a structure that you like and that's working, you can start to add additional information into your content map. So I might add some outside sites that I might go to from my app. I might want to post to Facebook about my lost pet or connect to the city pound perhaps. You can also fill out all the places that content is going to exist. So for every section in your app, you show all the different pieces and options that are going to be in that section. And this will change from section to section, so it'll help you develop your content and develop your structure. So for my app, searching for a pet might have a slightly different structure to how I would post information about a pet that I'd lost, for instance, where I might need a photo and more detailed information. As we're mapping out all of the content for our app, the one thing that we're not doing is thinking about design. We're not really making any design decisions. We're just creating a structure and a framework and making decisions about content. We're looking at what goes where and how it might be organized. And once we've figured that out, we can begin to think about how a user might go through this content and experience this content. We're going to start to think about how to map the user's interaction and that might have an effect on our content map. In the last class, we looked at mapping content. In this class, we're going to shift focus slightly and look at mapping interaction. And there's a lot of overlap between those two kinds of maps. If your app is simple, you might only make one map and show both of these things in one map. But we're going to split them up and look at them separately. The interaction map shows how the user travels through your content. So it's much more like a flowchart in a lot of ways. While there's overlap, it sometimes has a slightly different visual language to its form as well. Just like our content map, your interaction map can look and work however you want, as long as it makes sense. But it needs to share some of the same qualities as your content map as well. Like any map or diagram, it needs to have clarity so you can understand it quite quickly and easily, and it needs to have a hierarchy so that you visually understand which things are important and which things are less important. And it needs to have modularity so that you can repeat the same kind of forms for the same kind of content, or in this case, for the same kind of actions. And it also needs to have the possibility to expand or grow because your app or website might change or grow itself. So let's look at an interaction map that has generic content and generic form. To avoid confusion, let's call it a flowchart of user pathways. And for a simple app like ours, there's going to be a lot of overlap with our content map. So if we go back to our generic content map, we can use that as the basis for our user interaction flowchart. We'd still start out with the home page, but let's put that up at the top and show what our immediate choices are as we travel through this information. A user might choose from event 1, 2, or 3, and then might choose sub-events from any of those main events. We can also show the places we might go off-site from our app, just like we did with our generic content map. But one of the big differences here is that it's very hard for us to create a generic flowchart of interaction. You can't map the user's path with generic content because the user doesn't know what they're making a decision about. We need the content to be in there so the user has something to make a decision about because those decisions are going to determine the path that they're going to take. And that's what we're interested in here, pathways between events, pathways that the user is going to potentially follow. So let's put some content in there. Let's use our lost pet example again. We decided that there would be three main things that our user could do from the home page, and the user probably chooses one of those things to do. And our content map helped us develop the idea that we were going to have an actual GPS map before the user made any of these decisions. So we should put that into our user flowchart to see how it affects the decision making process. We can give that a different kind of form on our flowchart to show that it's working with a different kind of information. It might be reading the user's GPS location, for instance. With the user interaction flowchart, we're asking much more how do you get from step one to step two 
The map might automatically read our location, but you might also need to enter in your zip code or address. We can show this visually in an either-or kind of way. From the location map, we either enter our location to get to our activities, or it reads our location automatically and goes straight to those activities. Once the user chooses a main activity, it's less about showing us what the options are that they can choose from, and more about showing how they travel through those options. If I wanted to post information about my lost animal, I might choose a certain order for the activities and have them follow on, one from the other, so I'd have to visually show that. And at the end of that passage of entering information, there'd be a different kind of interaction. The user would have to either confirm or post that information, so I might need to slightly differentiate visually one activity from another, and I'd need to show where the user's path took them after that. They'd probably head back to the location map, where they could see their own post, or perhaps engage in another activity. Remember, we're mapping the user's interaction with our app here. We're not just mapping the content. So if I didn't want to post what I'd entered, I'd need a way to get back and edit that material. Once again, I'm thinking more about the pathways and traveling through the content than thinking about defining the content itself. So I find it quite useful to have a content map and have a user interaction flowchart. And the two of them do inform each other and have a lot of similarities. So let's make this the same as our content map and add our set of links to outside places. And just like our content map, let's use color to reinforce information within our diagram. We can use color to show different kinds of content in the same way we did before. So light blue here for our main activities and pink for the sites that are away from our app. We can build a relationship between color and shape as well. Here, all of our rectangles are places where the user has to enter information, but the yellow rectangles are places that are much more important. So we've created a similarity, but also a hierarchy within our diagram. And that hierarchy is about the user's interaction, not necessarily about the content. Here, we have three main areas where the user can carry out an activity. Let's see what happens if we flesh those out a little bit more. It's already getting quite complicated. It's starting to get crowded and might not even fit on the page. And this is where the modular or expandable part of our diagram really comes into play. Now I can shrink all of this information down and add other information that's going to feel and look exactly the same. And as I add more information, I also have to adjust my system because I want my logic and my hierarchy to be consistent. So I could think about being consistent with scale, coloring, with position of the elements, with the arrangement of them as well. What my flowchart's really doing here is mapping out all the possible decisions that a user could make, all the possible pathways that they could take. So I'm going to have to lay out quite a lot of information into this one diagram. It's useful to do that in a modular and consistent fashion. So my user flow for posting lost and posting found are very similar right now. So I could start by duplicating them and making them exactly the same, because there's a little visual inconsistency right now. So sometimes even just tidying up what your diagram looks like and how you're representing an interaction can really help your diagram make visual sense. As you're mapping how the user travels through your content, you also have to make sure that you have the right content in the right places. For instance, when I'm searching for my pet, I might not want to enter all of the same information as when I'm posting something, either lost or found. If my app doesn't work with photo recognition, there's no point me uploading a photograph to do my search. The date when I lost my animal might not be so important, and I might not need to put my content information up there yet because I'm just searching. So as you can see, as I'm figuring out my user interaction, it's having an effect on my content. So my content map and my user flowchart are interwoven together and they affect one another, but they show slightly different information. So when I'm searching for a lost pet, for instance, in my flowchart, I want to show how the user goes through that experience, what information they enter and when. So here I want to diagram that they could choose between species name and description, and whichever one they choose 
it would come up with a set of results. So while there's overlap with content, I'm much more concerned with the arrows and the pathways that are connecting these different pieces of content. Again, showing the path that the user might possibly take. You always have to be thinking, what next? What's the next step? So after I've got my results, where would I go next? I'd probably either go back and do another search if I didn't get the results I wanted to, or if I found my pet, I'd want to confirm that somehow and maybe contact someone. To reiterate one more time, what we're really doing here is mapping interaction. We're showing how the user travels through our content in the different paths that they can take. But as with our content map, we're not making any design decisions yet. We could take this framework or structure and develop it in any number of different directions. And while it might look and feel different, its structure would be the same, because while we're mapping out these interactive pathways, we're also mapping out the structure of our site. So, as I mentioned, there are connections between our interaction flowchart and our content map. There are similarities between the two things, but they focus on different kinds of information and experiences, and they don't actually contain the same information. If you think about our attempts, even from early on, to separate UI from UX so we could examine them more closely, we're kind of doing the same thing here. Our user flowchart is trying to envision the experience without any finished visuals. It's focusing more on the UX part of the equation. And while we might not be making any form now, what we are doing is thinking creatively and inventively and shaping the structure that our form is eventually going to take. In this section, we're going to use non-visual paper prototypes to do our very first user tests. In our last section, we looked at mapping out our content and also mapping out the user's interaction. Our content map acted as a diagram showing us where all our content was going to go, whereas our interaction map acted as a flowchart showing us how a user would interact with that content. Both of these maps helped us develop our idea. Our structure, our thinking and our problem solving might all have changed. So far we've used diagrams and geometric elements, but we've mostly been using words as our tool for helping us develop our ideas and our content. In our next stage, we're going to look at real decisions about our app in real time, and we're going to try and use a real user to test it out, but we're still going to use words. And we're doing that because we're still in a preliminary stage where we don't really have a visual design yet, and words are the easiest way for us to express our ideas. We want to try and simulate an interactive experience with a user. We want to test out our content map and our flowchart of user interaction and see if we were right or not. We're going to do this in two stages. First of all, we're going to develop a paper prototype, and then we're going to try and test it on a user. Developing that paper prototype is something that we can do on our own. That's a kind of internal stage. All the work we've done so far in developing our app has been internal. The second stage will be the first time we've taken our app to an external phase to have a user look at it. So let's look at how to develop a paper prototype. We've already figured out a lot of things about our app from the diagrams that we've already made. We already have a map of what we think the user's experience will be that diagrams all of the different decisions that they can make and the places that they can go within our app. For this basic user test, we don't want the user to see the whole of the map and all their options. We want to feed them those options one at a time. We want the user to make decisions one at a time. So we're going to have to take our map apart and dismantle it into single sheets of paper and have each sheet of paper contain just enough information to get the user to the next stage before they have to make a decision. We're breaking down and slowing down the interactive process, the user's interaction with our app. For my test, I took several sheets of paper all the same size and made each represent a decision the user had to make based on the user interaction chart I'd already developed. We're basically taking something very complex apart in order to examine the individual pieces more slowly, and it's a strategy we've used many times in this course. After my branding screen, the user would get to a screen where they have to choose whether to log in, 
use their current location, or enter a location. If they chose the login option, I'd give them another piece of paper where they could enter their name, their password, or perhaps log in with their Google or Facebook ID. If they wanted to enter their location, I'd hand them a piece of paper where they would be entering their street address, the city and town, perhaps the state and the zip as well. If they chose their current location, there would be nothing to enter because the app would already know what that location was. In all three cases, they'd be taken to the next screen. This would be the map screen that forms the main hub of activity for our entire app. For this simple test, I'd ask the user to choose between the three main options. They could choose to search for a lost pet, or they could choose to post information about a lost pet, or post information about a pet that had been found. If they chose to search for a pet, I'd give them another piece of paper. And here, we'd be pretending that they'd be entering information about the species and breed, name, description, or location, if it was different, of the pet that they were looking for. Once they'd given me that information, I'd hand them another piece of paper that would be the results of their search. So they would have a list of three different dogs, in this case, that fitted the parameters of their search. If the user chose any of those dogs, they could get more information about that particular dog. And since there are three different choices here, but with the same kind of information, I could use that as an option to perhaps try some variations I could reorder the list, for example, to see which one the user might respond to better. One of the great things about making a paper prototype like this is that you can change it or add things very, very quickly. You can even respond to user feedback in real time. So here, I might want to add a button that would take me back to the previous list if I wasn't interested in one of these dogs, for instance. Let's go back to our main screen and follow another path. If the user chose to post information about a lost animal, I'd hand them this piece of paper with a number of different pieces of information for them to enter. I could simulate the process by asking the user to answer each of these sections one by one before they could post that information. And this whole process would be verbal and would be pretend. We're really trying to simulate the back and forth between the user and the app. Our third option from the main map screen would be posting information about an animal that we'd found. And this would follow a similar pattern to the series of interactions we had when we were posting about a lost animal. An easy way to get started making your paper prototype is to take your user interaction flowchart and to just map that out on single sheets of paper. You can make one sheet for each stage or decision, and you can actually lay those sheets out in exactly the same structure that you've already mapped out for your user flowchart. I like to do this in a big space where I can move everything around and rearrange it as I want to, but you could also do it in a smaller space with post-it notes. It's helpful to be able to move things around very easily. And it's also helpful to do this in a very rough and ready visual way. It helps make you less attached to each individual piece of paper so you can change things and alter things or rearrange things without worrying about losing things or screwing things up. The other huge benefit of working in this loose style and just using words is that design doesn't get in the way of the content. There's no distractions for you, but more importantly, there's no distractions when you come to test this out on a user. You're trying to focus their attention on decision making with limited information about the content. You don't want design to be a distraction at this point. This is a very simple and preliminary form of user testing, and we have to structure our information for that test in a sympathetic way. So we can't have a lot of information going on on each of these pages. You might want to limit the choices to maybe three things. You might also find that you need to make extra stages in the decision-making process when you're going to try this out with a real person. And again, one of the benefits of working in this rough and ready way is that it's very, very fast for you to make changes or expansions to your map. And we're still primarily just working with language here. I drew an image on my branding screen, but apart from that, the only graphic elements in the other screens are a few boxes to indicate hierarchy and a few dots and lines 
to separate pieces of content. Any graphic elements should be supporting actors, they shouldn't be taking the lead role. Keeping your communication focused on just text allows the user to imagine any visual form they want to, or imagine no visual form at all. What's important is that you keep the user focused on decision making. You want to offer them a series of paths to choose from that aren't visually differentiated. So as you make this series of single sheets, allow things to move around. Don't be afraid if things change from your flowchart that you've already made. You can always make different variations for certain screens and try those out. Nothing is fixed at this stage in the process, so you still have the ability to allow things to change. You have the ability to learn things as you're making. Laying things out like this might make you come up with some new ideas, or it might make you rethink the structure that you already had. In many ways, you are the first user who's going to test your paper prototype. You're the first one to experience it. So you can evaluate your own experience and make changes. And once you've made those revisions, you'll have a set of sheets of paper that you'll be able to take to a user and test your app with a simple paper prototype. You'll be able to get your first user feedback. In this segment, we're going to continue with our non-visual user testing. We already completed the first stage, where we made our paper prototype. So now we're going to move on to the second stage, where we're going to try and test that prototype out on a user. This might be the first time you share your idea with somebody else. It's certainly the first time you'll be getting feedback from an external source. For this simple test, your external source could be family or friends, or if you don't have anyone to act as the user, you could role play and do it yourself, pretending to be your ideal user. This kind of paper prototype testing that we're doing is the simplest kind of testing. And while you might learn a few things from the user, it's also to get you comfortable with testing because you have to play a participatory role in this process. And if you were really developing an app, you'd be testing regularly and you'd be testing often. So you could think of this simple first test as a precursor to more developed user testing that you would carry out later in the development process of your app. And because we're fairly early in the process of developing our app, when we do this kind of testing, we're really trying to figure out if there are large, major problems that we encounter with a user. There may be things that we didn't anticipate as a designer that you only get to see when somebody is experiencing your app and the pathways of your app for the first time. Your familiarity with your own content and your own idea can sometimes blind you to some obvious errors or issues. So having a test user who doesn't really know anything about your app can be really helpful. You can have your user sit across the table from you. You can hand them your sheets of paper one at a time and ask them which option they choose. Depending on what they choose, you can give them the next piece of paper. Remember, we're trying to focus on interaction here. We're trying to see how the user interacts with the app. So having some kind of separation, sitting opposite from the user for instance, can be quite helpful. Also, the user is playing the role of the user, but you're playing the role of the app. So don't give the user additional explanations of everything that's on a sheet of paper. If they get stuck or ask you a question, you can answer them. But for the most part, you're going to learn a lot more by quietly observing the user interacting with the sheets of paper and making decisions. You're playing the role of the app here, so if the user needs to enter data into fields, for instance, you can just do that verbally with them. And it'll only take you a few minutes to go through all the pieces of paper, so you can try and find more than one person to test with you. So let's look a little bit more closely at user testing and look at the relationship between the user and the tester. The tester's job is to act as the app and to give the user a series of options for them to choose from. The user's job is to make decisions about those options and give them back to the tester. So you have a constant loop of exchange between user and tester. While that loop is going on, the tester's job is to observe the user, to see which decisions they make, but also to see how easy or difficult those decisions are. The user's job 
is to make those decisions and to give the tester information when needed or to tell them when there's an issue. Both the user and the tester are trying to figure out how the app works. The user is doing this in an active way by making decisions and telling it to the tester and the tester is doing it in a passive way by observing what the user does. Ideally, the user won't run into any problems and the tester will really be observing just what works. But it's also really useful when the user finds something that doesn't work because then you know it's a problem and you know what you've got to fix. And if you run this preliminary paper test with a few different users and they all have the same issue, they all run into a problem in the same place, then you can be pretty sure that it's actually a genuine problem and you're going to have to change something with your app. In this section, we're going to look at how to develop a more accurate and advanced sitemap. We already built a very simple content map and that was useful in planning and developing our content. We also built a user flowchart and that was useful in showing how the user would travel through our content. Both of these examples were really tools to help us develop our idea and our content. Now we want something more concrete which is our sitemap and we're going to use that sitemap to build wireframes and we'll use those wireframes in user testing. So our sitemap needs to be a little more concrete. We're starting to commit to the shape of our app. Our sitemap is going to follow quite closely our user flowchart. We can build off that and change it. We need to take into account any feedback or ideas that we got from our preliminary paper prototype testing. We're also moving towards creating wireframes, so I'm going to use a graphic of a phone to hold my information. I'm going to use my Lost Pet app as an example to build a sitemap. I'm going to roughly follow the structure of my user flowchart, so the first thing I'm going to need is an identity or splash page. That's going to take me to my map page, but only provided I have an auto login. So if I'm a returning user, for example. If I'm new, I have to sign up or enter my location. So depending what I choose to do on this screen, I'm going to get a different follow-up screen. If I want to sign up or log in, there's a couple of different ways that I could do that. I could enter a name and a password, or I could use Google or Facebook to log in. So for each of these possibilities, no matter how small, I'm going to have to create a separate screen. So I'd need a screen for my Google login and I'd also need a screen for my Facebook login. If I was creating an account, I'd need to add some additional information in there, perhaps address, city, state and zip. So we've already made quite a few different screens and we haven't even really got to our map yet to make any choices about what we want to do with our app. There's a lot of different screens here but the user would actually travel through them very quickly. Like our user flowchart, let's connect the screens to see what the pathways could possibly be. From our identity screen, we could go straight to the map if we automatically log in. If not, we'd need to enter some information. We could type in our name and our password, or we could use Google or Facebook to log into our app. Because our app is primarily going to work with a GPS system and a map, we might ask the user for more information, such as their home address. Collectively, all of these screens are just about the login process. And we could color code those so we know which area of our map all of these screens belong to. Once we've logged in, we're going to want to get to our real map where we can start to use the app. If I was a returning user with auto login, I'd go straight to that map. If I was a returning user without auto login, I could enter my name and password and get to the map. Or if I was signing up for an account, I'd have to enter a little bit more information before I could get to the map. So you can see, as I'm making my app, I'm trying to think through the user's experience. I'm using information that I learned from both my user flowchart and my content map to make this more developed and accurate sitemap. Once I've got to my map-based home screen, I can choose from three different main activities. I can search for a pet or I can post information about a lost pet or a found pet. There might be other things I can do from this home screen but let's concentrate on these three for now. Let's start out by looking at what happens when we search for a lost pet. 
I have three different ways that I can search. I can search by species or breed, by name or by description. Let's presume for now that we're using our automatic location. Whatever information I enter, I then get a series of results. There could be one or two results or more. The user would want to search through these results and probably see more details from any of the results that seemed relevant to them. So that means we'd have to create a different screen and think about what kind of information about the lost pet should appear on that screen. There could be the dog's name, perhaps a photograph of the dog, the date it was found and a description, and probably contact information as well. So you can see, as we're building this sitemap, we're getting a little bit more focused and more detailed with our content and our user flow. We're treating our app idea in a more realistic and pragmatic way. If the user finds their lost animal, they're going to need to contact that person or somehow confirm with the app that the animal belongs to them. They might then want to go back to the main map where their animal might now show up as being claimed. At any stage of this search process, the user should be able to retrace their steps and go back to the previous screen. Collectively, these screens form another section. They're all to do with searching for a lost pet. So we could color code those so we know that they all belong together. And this is going to help with our visual organization as our sitemap becomes more complicated. Let's look at one of the other main activities that we can do from our home screen. Let's investigate what the user might need to do if they wanted to post information about a lost animal. They'd probably want to post as much information as possible in order to get the best results. A user might be following this pathway if they've already searched for their lost animal and haven't found it. It can help your thinking if you put yourself in the position of a user who's actually using the app. Once I've entered all my information, I probably want to check it and then confirm it before I post it. And if something was wrong or I needed to correct it, I'd need to be able to get back quite easily to the previous screen to make that correction. And once I'd posted the information about my lost animal, I'd probably want to go back to the map, which could give me visual confirmation that my posting was successful because I could see my lost animal within the map. Even though there's a lot of user activity in this section, it's only represented by two screens. But again, I could color code them so that I know that it's a different area with a different focus. The last main event from my home screen would be to post information about an animal that I'd found. These screens could follow pretty closely the ones for posting about a lost animal, since it's a lot of the same information and almost the same structure. So I'd have a screen to enter all of my information and then another screen to confirm and post that information. I think the user would also do the same thing that they would return back to the map so they could see that the animal that they'd found had been posted and recorded on the main map interface. We can color code this section as well, and our color coding is especially useful since a lot of these activities might happen in windows that are floating over the top of the map in the background. So far, our sitemap is showing us the main activities of our app. So once we've logged in, we're just looking at the three main activities right now. But there are several secondary or perhaps less important things that our app allows us to do, and all of those are accessed from the home screen as well. So we're going to have to reorganize how that's represented in our sitemap a little bit. Some of the other activities that we looked at were posting to Facebook, maybe contacting a local pound, or perhaps adopting a pet. I could also sign up for alerts, so if my lost pet was found, I'd know straight away. So there's going to be a lot of things happening in my main screen. It also has to act as a background and have other fields or other windows floating on top of it. I'm going to enter my search information and get my search results here, as well as posting information for lost or found pets. This screen is going to be the central hub of my app. It's going to be the trickiest screen to resolve in terms of UI and UX. And that's true of most apps where our activities are centralized around a single home screen. In this section, we're going to shift our focus a little bit. 
we're going to look much more at visual research and look and feel. So far, we've developed our idea, we've began to test our idea, and we've began to map our idea. Now we need to take all of these to the next stage. We need to develop a more definitive site map, we need to develop wireframes that we can use in testing, and we need to develop our visual direction. In the real world, you might be working on all three of these things at the same time, because they're all interrelated. We have a site map, wireframes, and visual direction. Our site map is basically a more developed version of our content map. Our wireframes are generic sketches showing what goes where on each frame, and our visual direction is concerned with the design and aesthetics of our user interface. Developing any one of these areas is going to have an effect on the other two. It's hard to create wireframes without having a sitemap and knowing what it is you're creating, or without having some kind of rough visual direction so you know which elements are going where in your wireframes. I would say the sitemap is the most important, followed by the wireframes, because I really need to have resolved my sitemap before I can start making my wireframes. And with digital tools, you might be developing your sitemap and your wireframes at the same time. Visual direction is often the thing that's left until the end. But because of my graphic design background and my design-centric approach to UI UX, I'm actually going to look at the visual direction first. Partly because I want the visual direction to have more impact on my wireframes and my sitemap and my eventual app. And also because we haven't touched on the area of visual direction yet. Within the process that we've been following, We've done various exercises that have contributed to our sitemap and to our wireframes. Our content map and user flowchart will form the basis of our sitemap. Our user flowchart and our non-visual paper prototype will inform our wireframe design. But there's nothing so far to help inform our visual direction. The only thing we've really done that involved looking at visual direction or UI is to look at our competition so we've seen what other people have done in terms of visual direction, but we haven't really done anything ourselves. And indeed, our visual direction is much more of a UI than a UX problem. And I cover this in much more detail in week two of visual elements of UI design. So let's do a fast recap on how to develop a visual direction. We're not trying to figure out any details to the user interface design here. We're really looking at the big picture we're trying to envision what our overall design direction is, what the overall look and feel of our app is going to be. And we're doing this fairly early in our process. We're doing this before we get into the details of design or before we get into production, but mostly before we commit to a format or a structure for our app. I want the design to help shape our app, even at this early stage. We're doing the same thing with design that we're doing with UX. We're trying to imagine and envision the design and the experience before it actually exists. We're trying to visualize the invisible. And I'm forcing design into the equation here because I'm a firm believer that design can make the difference between a successful and unsuccessful app. So let's quickly run through the example that I used in the UI course. Here, I was working with the idea of a digital microscope for amateur scientists that utilized the camera on your phone. And I wanted to visualize that in two different directions, one that was much more fun and one that was a little bit more serious. It's easy to see that those two different directions would focus on different audiences, but they might also fundamentally affect what the app is and how it works. It could affect the entire structure of the app, so it would affect the sitemap and it would affect the wireframe as well. In developing visual direction, one of the first things that you do is visual research. So you're basically collecting a series of images that reflect the content and the attitude and the look and feel of your app. So I have a digital microscope for amateur scientists and I want it to be fun. So I'd collect images that tried to reflect that. I might want to use illustrations rather than photographs. I'd be looking at both form and content that worked with my idea. I could think about typefaces and a color palette that would work with my idea as well. And I could gather this visual research into a digital space or into an analog space. The next stage 
would be to take my visual references and put them together in some kind of composition that would give me the look and feel of my app. I might not use any of these individual elements in my final design. My goal here is to create the mood of my app. So this mood board looks playful, fun, energetic, and probably for a younger audience. By contrast, my serious direction should obviously look much more scientific, more realistic, because it's for a more serious audience. So while some of the content is the same as my fun direction, it clearly has a very different look and feel, even at the research stage where I'm just pulling images. And again, I'd take my research and compose it into a mood board. And this feels very different from our fun direction. It feels much more scientific for a more mature audience. It's much more photographically based. So it feels functional and real. So how this app functions and how it's structured, the very app itself could be very, very different from our first version. You can see that the design direction can really affect the entire app. At this stage in our process, we're going to take our sitemap, look and feel research, and user testing to the next level in order to get a more accurate static prototype. We'll look at a wireframe of our interface, figure out what goes where and on which pages, utilize our user testing information to figure out the hierarchy and structure of our app. We'll begin to think about the logic and functionality of our interface, how it's actually going to work, and finally, We'll begin to merge our interface design knowledge from the first course with our UX knowledge to create a suite of screens that show both the design and the functionality of your app. At the end of this week, you'll have a set of visual designs that will showcase your app and also your UI UX talent. In this coming week, we're going to focus on making wireframes and developing our user interface. We're going to be taking a giant step towards making our app seem real. We're going to be committing to a structure and a design. So let's look and see where we are in our process so far. If you remember, we broke our process into three sections, and we're in the middle section right now. We've developed our ideas, but we're not quite ready to build a prototype. We've been envisioning our idea and starting to give it a visual form. We've successfully gone through the first stage of our envisioning process, where we looked at visual development, paper prototyping, developing ideas and mapping content. And now we're moving into our second stage. We'll be looking at creating a set of wireframes. We'll be trying to create functionality and logic that's consistent. And we'll be working on our visual refinement and the continuity of our entire app. Our goal here is to create some of the pieces and to prepare us for moving on to the next stage where we're going to create a prototype. In that last stage, we'll be simulating the final experience and creating final designs. The stage we're in right now is geared towards helping us with that final stage. Our project is becoming more refined and more concrete. We're moving out of the development stage and into a stage of refinement. And this means less dramatic change is going to happen with the main ideas in our app. We're going to become slightly less flexible in what we're doing. We've committed to an idea, a structure, and a form for our app. But that doesn't mean we're in production mode yet. You need to stay critical about the work that you're making. There's still the possibility to make small changes and to shape your app to improve it. But those changes will be smaller the further we get in this process. At this stage, it's much more about refinement and resolution as we move towards our final goal of the prototype. Before we start making the form of our wireframes, let's look at some simple theoretical guidelines that might help us. If you look online, many UI UX designers will cite Jakob Nielsen's 10 rules of user interface design. And while they're a little outdated and apply more to interface design for software programs, there's still a lot of really great foundational and fundamental information in there for anyone designing an interface. And if a set of rules has managed to hang around in the shifting digital landscape for nearly 30 years, you know there's got to be some truth in them. 
So let's look at Nielsen's 10 rules and we'll try and unpack them. Number one is the visibility of the system status. All this means is let the user know what's going on. Let the user know that the app is live and working. Number two, match between the system and the real world. And what Nielsen means by this is to use words and forms that the user already understands from the real world. In other words, don't make the user learn a whole new language for the interface. Use symbols and icons that already have meaning attached to them from the real world. Number three, user control and freedom. What this really means is that we all make mistakes. So it's important to make sure that the user can have either undos or redos, or in the case of an app, more likely that they'll need to backtrack to an earlier screen. Number four, consistency and standards. What Nielsen means here is just to use repetition, consistency and similarity to help speed things up within the interface and to help develop intuition in the user so you only have to learn how to work the interface once. After that, the rest of it should make sense. Number five, error prevention. So don't create situations where mistakes happen. And if the user does make a mistake, make sure that you give them an easy way out. You want the user's interaction with the interface to be easy and seamless. Number six, recognition rather than recall. So don't make the interface hard work for the user. The user should be able to see the part of the interface that they're going to interact with and recognize immediately that that's the place, the point or site of interaction. So the user is reacting immediately rather than going through a series of remembered actions. Number seven, flexibility and efficiency of use. Think of your interface like a car. Some users are going to want to drive fast and some are going to want to go slow, but they're both going to want to get to their destination with as little fuss as possible. Number eight, aesthetic and minimalist design. This is a familiar modernist rule. You don't want any unnecessary information distracting you from the necessary information. In interface design, the familiar phrase, less is more, often applies. Number nine, help users recognize, diagnose, and recover from errors. And all this really means is that if there's a problem, provide the best solution for the user quickly and easily. If you solve the problem quickly, it's like it never happened. And finally, number 10, help and documentation. You should provide help for the user, but keep it hidden until they need it. Nobody wants instructions that they don't really need. So let's try and keep these broader interface rules in the back of our mind as we're working on our wireframes. In this segment, we're going to try and answer the question, what goes where in our app? We're going to start to look at how to make wireframes. In the most recent stage in our process, we developed a sitemap, and we'll be using this as a roadmap to create our wireframes, which will then allow us to make a prototype. Our sitemap ended up being a container for everything we'd done before that, our content map, our user flowchart, and our non-visual paper prototype all gave us important information that contributed to our sitemap. Now we're going to take all of that information in our sitemap and put it into a slightly different format, a more developed format, a series of wireframes. Our wireframes are an in-between phase between our sitemap and our prototype. Our wireframes are more visually developed than our sitemap, but their main job is to map what the user does when, to look at a hierarchy of activities, and to map out the user experience flow and logic. In other words, what goes where. Our wireframes are normally functional, minimal, consistent, and user-centric. Our wireframes will point more directly towards a finished form, but they're still not the finished form themselves. Don't get caught up in details in your wireframe. Don't be too fussy or obsess about small elements. Personally, I'd even avoid using a wireframe program at this point. I prefer to draw things myself on the computer, but it's entirely up to you. But you should bear in mind that your wireframes need to be simple and clear. You want to create an accurate blueprint for your prototype. When we last saw our app, it was at the stage of the sitemap. We'd thought through our idea and mapped it out quite accurately, but we'd used words as a way 
to create the interface. And while we might keep a similar structure for our wireframes, how we represent the interface is going to change. We're going to start to visually indicate the interface. We're going to try and show the structure or skeleton of our interface. And you can do that in many different ways. Again, if you search online for wireframes, you'll get a wide range of visual solutions. And you can visually indicate the interface in many different ways. You could sketch it by hand or on the computer. Use a limited palette, so use geometric shapes and lines to represent your interface. Think about how to use scale as hierarchy, and don't get lost in details of any individual interface elements. Using black and white or gray, reducing your color palette can help keep that simplicity. Think about where your elements are going to live on the screen and reuse your elements from screen to screen as well. It can help to use some existing norms of interface design. So you can use simple generic interface elements that the user is already familiar with. And even though our changes aren't going to be so big, remember that we're still developing and refining our app and you might discover things while you make this wireframe that work really well or things that don't work really well and you can still change them at this stage. It's all part of the process of growing and developing your app and your interface. Let's start out by making our easiest screen, the splash or identity screen. I haven't developed my branding yet, so I'm going to make a generic logo type for my company. My final logo type won't look like this, but we can look at this as a generic form and we all know that it's a stand-in logo type. Next, we have our login screen. If we were being logged in automatically, we'd go straight to a map. The app would read your location and display the map straight away. And this is the first time we've given any kind of visual form to our main screen. We can use a generic map, but we might also think about what that map is going to show. Perhaps some indication of lost and found animals. If the user has to log in manually, they'd get taken to another screen where they'd have to type in their name and a password to create an account. And in my notes here, I've identified this as an area to test with users because I'm unsure about it. But even on this simple login screen, I'm starting to create a visual logic. So a live text field is represented by a white rectangle with a thin black outline, whereas a button is represented by a solid gray rectangle with no outline. And once I establish this visual logic, I'm going to have to stick to that same logic throughout my entire wireframe. If I'm asking the user to type in their name and a password in a live text field, I'm going to need a keypad. To match current conventions, my keypad is going to pop up from the bottom, and it's going to look like a standard generic keypad. I don't even need to give it too much detail. There just has to be enough visual information that you recognize it as a keypad. I also want the user to have the option to log in with Google or Facebook, so that should come before they hit the Create Account button. It would also make sense if those two options were separate with a button for each. Even though I'm using generic forms, I'm starting to make UI and UX decisions as I build my wireframe. My next screen is the Create Account screen. This can use my same visual logic from earlier, with certain kinds of boxes indicating certain kinds of interactivity. I could also add a checkbox here to automatically allow my app to access the user's location. This functionality is integral to how my app is going to operate, so I would really encourage the user to have this box checked, so it would come up as automatically being checked straight away, for instance, and may have a warning dialog box if you uncheck it. It's important that you recognize anything that is crucial to the functionality of your app and figure out a way to keep it at the top of your UX hierarchy. That doesn't mean it has to be the largest element, but it should be one that everyone encounters and you encourage everyone to interact with. Let's pretend that we're all logged in now and let's start to look at our home screen. I decided that my app was going to use GPS information and display a map of wherever the user was. So when you open my app, you're going to automatically have a map showing your location. And that map can preempt what the user might want to look for, so it can automatically show them, in this case, pets that are lost and pets that have been found in the area of this particular map. If I put myself in the position of the user, 
this kind of information would be much more useful if I could see what kind of animal was actually lost or found. And if I had lost an animal, one of the first things that I'd want to do would be to get more information to see if the animal that's found on this screen was actually my animal. So I could tap on that icon and get more details about that particular animal. Now I've figured out what the user wants to do, I have to think about how the user does that in my interface a little bit more. Perhaps there's not enough room in this smaller window for me to see an image of my animal or to read all the details. I could have a larger window that comes in from the side, but this takes up a lot of real estate and it blocks a lot of information in my map, so it makes it hard to go between the map and the information. A better solution might be to put those details at the bottom of the screen and that would still allow me an area of the map that was very visible and functional. Once again, I'm developing and refining my app as I'm making. My app is still going to develop even at this wireframe stage and because of that, sometimes it's useful to work in a more reductive kind of way, which could even be a simple computer sketch or a sketch by hand. I like my wireframes to be both generic and to have some connection to what I think the finished form is going to be, but that might depend on the speed of your computer skills. Let's go back to our main menu and look at some other things that might happen on that screen. If I'm not going to engage with what the app automatically feeds me, I'm going to want to make my own decision and choose what the app does next. I need to have my three main options housed somewhere and it makes sense for those to be the main menu and hidden away until I need them. Let's pick one of these three options and see how that works in a wireframe. Let's pretend that we want to search for a lost pet. If we choose that option, we're going to have to enter several different pieces of information. We need to be consistent with the visual language that we've already used. And we also need to think about exactly what we're asking the user to enter. So name, description, species or breed and location all seem pretty solid. We could also have a checkbox to use the current location, which would be useful if you were actively searching in the real world. I'll need a keyboard at the bottom of the screen to enter my information, and that's going to cover up some of the fields, so I'm going to have to figure out a system where they can move up the screen. Once I've submitted the information for my search, the results would come up on the main menu map. And as before, it would be much more useful if I could see the names of the animals. And just like before, I could get details about each animal by tapping on them. And here, I'd want to think about all the conventions that I've already used, where my window is going to appear and what kind of information it's going to contain, because I've been in a very similar situation before when I worked on the home screen initially. My previous solution was to put all of the information in the pop-up window at the bottom of the screen to allow a larger space for the map still to be visible. But since I'm carrying out a slightly different activity here, I might want my interface to look and feel a little bit different. It could be very similar, but also slightly different. These kind of decisions could be driven by looking at how the user might want to behave in these slightly different scenarios. The window on the right might be great if you don't want to look at the map, but you want to flip through several animals quite quickly. I think this is a good example that illustrates how the design is growing and changing and expanding as we're building our wireframe. In this segment, we're going to continue to look at working with wireframes. We're going to focus a little bit more on consistency and details. We've spent quite a lot of time making wireframes, so now we're going to make more wireframes because wireframes are really important. But we'll be making some design decisions too. We'll be trying to make our wireframes consistent, and that consistency is in areas of interaction, navigation, functionality, logic, and design. And these are all areas that we've looked at in previous classes. And we might have to make a number of wireframe screens to be able to compare them before we can get to this kind of consistency. Let's look at some of the wireframe screens that we built in the last class. We had three different options for how our menu might appear over the top of the map. If these windows were all having the same function, searching for a lost pet, 
They'd just be design options. They'd be variations of the same thing. And if that was the case, I'd argue that the middle one was the least functional. It doesn't do a good job of getting out of the way of the map, but it also doesn't do a good job of forming a window where I can flick through different pets. It seems the most dysfunctional, so let's see what happens when we take that away and we change the function of these screens. Let's look at our wireframe design for our home screen and compare that with our search screen. You can see that our home screen is very similar to the search screen on the left, but different from the one on the right. And obviously, we don't need two different designs for a search screen. We have to pick one of them. So how are we going to decide which one is our home screen and which one is our search screen? One way to decide which search screen to use would be to think about how the user is going to use these screens. What is the user's priority going to be? On the left, it feels more like you're searching for a specific pet because you're able to see those pets' names on the map. Whereas on the right, it's more visually driven. The pet's photo is larger and you're more likely to be swiping through a number of different photos. On our home screen, the user's priority is browsing. It's much more of a general multifunctional map. So we have different functions here, but everything looks pretty much the same. So the question is, is it too much the same or is it the right level of consistency? You want your screens to look like they belong to the same family, but you don't want them to look exactly the same. If everything is too consistent, the experience is very flat, and that's a turnoff for the user. If we look at our search for screen and our home screen, they're very, very similar. One could argue that this could create user confusion. The user might not know which part of the app they're operating in. So you may need a graphic device such as coloring or labeling to accentuate that differentiation. If we keep our home screen and pair it with the other search screen design, we can see that these are different enough that they look like they have different functions, but they look related. They work as siblings. And the benefit of this is that the user knows that they're in your app because it has a clear identity, but they also know that they're pursuing a different activity or a different action. So as you're making different screens for different areas of your app, you should try and get the balance between difference and consistency just right. Too different and you'll lose your app's identity. Too much the same and you'll create a flat and boring experience. It's useful to go back to our sitemap and look at how we color-coded different areas or sections. You could think of these sections as being siblings. My section that deals with logging in might look very different from my sections that deal with searching. But my post-lost and post-found sections will be pretty much the same. And I want all of my screens to have some visual continuity so they feel like they all belong together in one app. We've looked a little bit at consistency, so now let's look at details. We're actually looking at detail in exactly the same areas. Interaction, navigation, functionality, logic and design. Just keep in mind that we're not talking about details of the interface design here. We're not quite at the stage where we're going to refine the form of the interface. We'll be doing that soon though. So let's take this same wireframe and render it in an even simpler form. That way, the formal design elements can be ignored a little bit. As we've done many times before, let's break the interface down into all of its pieces. When you do that, you can ask yourself if each aspect of the interface is working to its best potential, from large to small. And because we're working with wireframes and not investing a lot of time in the form of the interface, we can pull those interface elements around quite quickly and easily, and we can make options and then decide which ones are better. We could decide the proportions and size of our bottom menu. We could decide that we don't need arrows to travel through things here because the information is above in the map. We could also decide we don't need to close this particular window. We could just slide it up and down. In our map area up above, we could see what happens if we had icons or symbols for our lost animals. So even though we're not getting caught up in design details, 
we're still making some decisions about design. So when we're looking at consistency and details, we're looking at these two areas in both our wireframe map and in the beginnings of our user interface design. The wireframe map makes it easy to compare screen to screen, whereas if we take any individual screen, we can look at the user interface design and start to develop that a little bit more. When we put both of these things back together, we're heading towards more finished static screens, and these are the screens that we're going to use to build our digital prototype. Here we are at the third and final part of working with wireframes. In this segment, we're going to look at how to make a wireframe map. In our first section, we made some wireframes, and in our second section, we refined those wireframes, and now we're going to take them and we're going to put them into a wireframe map. And we've already got a blueprint for this wireframe map, which is our site map. So this can form the basis for our wireframe map, but some things have probably changed when we were making the wireframes, so it's not going to be an exact replica. So here are some of my more refined wireframe screens. But I'm going to need more than just three. I'm going to have to make a screen of pretty much every interaction that the user has in order to make my wireframe map. So these would range from our identity screen at the beginning to our main navigation screen, login screens, search screens and results screens. It's quite useful to put all your screens side by side before you make the sitemap because you can check for inconsistencies. There might be elements that are missing from certain screens. For instance, I might need a menu on some of my screens so that I could escape them and get back to the previous screen if I needed to. I may not have been thinking about that menu when I designed these earlier screens. I might also have just made some silly mistakes. There's some confusion and inconsistency on these screens about the positioning of the password and address fields. You could also start to think a little bit more about navigation and about how your menus are going to move. How will they appear and disappear, for instance? So I might want my map to be movable in every direction. I'd want my keyboard to pop up from the bottom of the screen and then to go back down and hide at the bottom of the screen as well. When I have too much information, I want that information to be able to slide underneath my menu elements at the top. My smaller menus might reveal themselves with a diagonal movement from the corner. I might also want to swipe through a series of different animals on my lost and found pages. When you feel that your screens are resolved, you have to decide what kind of layout you're going to use. What kind of wireframe layout is going to best represent the way that your app works? Try to organize your screens in a simple and logical fashion, but also take into account your specific content. There might be a special way of organizing your screens that really works for your app. We can look at some structural compositions that might reflect this. Rather than laying out all of your screens in an even-handed fashion, you could create a pyramid structure, for instance. This might imply one single important screen with two layers of interaction following on from it. This layout isolates the home screen but shows us two fairly even areas of interaction, while this layout might represent six areas of interaction, all even and centered around our home screen. When you decide how to lay out your wireframe app, you could use the same areas of organization that you used for your sitemap. For instance, I had a login and sign up section, a number of activities that I could do on my home screen, and then separate areas, my three main categories of activity. And as with our sitemap and user flowchart, we could connect these screens in a way that we think a user is going to travel through them. So we might end up with an organizational structure that is very similar to our sitemap, but it's also a much closer and more accurate representation of both the UX experience and the UI experience. You can keep expanding your wireframe map to show all of the wireframes and all of the sections that you've designed to show the whole functionality of your app. And you can also print out each of these screens and do another round of user testing using your wireframe designs. And this would function in the same way as our earlier paper prototype, 
where the tester would be giving options to the user and the user would be making decisions about how they travel through the app. The tester would be observing what works for the user and also what doesn't work. In reality, this would probably be the stage in your process where you carried out your main phase of paper prototyping. And you'd be doing that with a number of different users. You'd be gathering feedback from all of those users, collating and evaluating that information, making revisions to your wireframes, reworking them, and then putting them back out there for testing, and retesting, and retesting. This testing phase works in a cyclical way, and one that can be repeated many times. And hopefully, each time you test and change, it makes your app better. So you'd be testing your wireframes with sample users, observing their interactions and reactions, evaluating the results, and then implementing whichever of those results you deemed valuable. Then you'd make new wireframes and start this cycle all over again. This part of our app development process is optional here. If you have the time, and if you have access to a willing group of people, family and friends for instance, then try it. Or once more, you could role play and you could act as if you were the ideal user and try and give yourself feedback on your own app. Just like our wireframes are a more developed version of our paper prototype, this round of user testing should be more developed too. So try to simulate the actual experience of your app. Use the frame of a phone printed out with your designs inside those screens at 100% of scale. Try and present the screens to a user one at a time. And while you're making an analog version of a digital experience, the experience part can still be quite similar. But remember, not every individual user is going to give you useful feedback. So evaluate the feedback and see if it's worth implementing. And you don't have to have 50 users to get good results. Tests have shown that five users will give you the same feedback as 50. So while the volume of the feedback changes, the actual feedback doesn't. So if you can find five people to test your wireframe on, that would be fantastic. In this section, we're going to focus on visual direction. We've been looking at wireframes for quite a long time, and now we're going to concentrate on visual development. We're going to start thinking about what the user interface actually looks like. For a short time, we'll be putting more emphasis on UI than UX. But of course, they always remain connected. Let's look at what we've figured out about our app already. We've looked at our audience and defined an ideal user. We've developed our content with a content map. We've got a more finished structure from our wireframe map, and we started to look at some initial visual research. We've basically got a framework and structure for our app that's pretty functional and resolved. We have a skeleton or a foundation, and now we need to build on top of that. And that involves developing the visual side of our user interface. We're going to look at this quite quickly and we're going to do it in three steps. We're going to look at the look and feel or the initial visual direction that we touched on before but specifically for this app. We're going to take those initial designs and try and refine them a little bit to create a more developed and specific user interface design and then we'll work on refining that even more to create our final UI design. If you need a refresher course about visual design and graphic design and the way it works with user interface design, you could revisit visual elements of UI design, our first course. And this will give you a more expanded process than we're going to look at here. So the first thing that we're going to do in creating a visual look and feel is to try and meet these goals. We want to establish a mood, a tone, and a visual experience that's appropriate for our audience but also for the kind of content of our app. So it's going to be different depending on what your app is and who your audience is. Right now, we have wireframe designs for all of our screens. So our interface elements are organized and arranged, but they're quite generic and visually undeveloped. We want to give them a mood and a character and an attitude that works for our app, but we don't want to lose the functionality as well. Let's take one of our wireframe screens and develop it in two different directions for two different potential audiences. We'll use two very simple directions, 
fun and serious. The goal of the fun direction is to be youthful, positive, cartoonish, hip, casual, while the serious version wants to feel utilitarian, practical, believable, authoritative. As we've looked at before, having a set of adjectives to describe your visual goals can be really useful. We can express those adjectives through color, a fairly serious and dull brown, versus a vibrant and fun green. With just one move, we've already created visual difference between our two directions. We could do the same thing with typography as well. On the fun side, we might use novelty or display typefaces with exuberant form. They could be curvy, lively, bouncy, and generally fun. Our typography for our serious side might be much more austere, more regular, more consistent, more about functionality than about playfulness. And we can use that typographic direction to create a logo type for our app or to create a bug, button, or icon. In this case, LP for lost pet in the shape of a tag that a pet might wear. We could do the same with our fun typography. But here, the forms are much more energetic and friendly. I'm also using naming and language to reinforce the mood. Get pet is much more friendly than lost pet. So we have a graphic palette right now of words, typography, and color, but we're also going to need imagery. Our serious images could be very photographic, very realistic. They might represent real individual pets, ones that are lost, or perhaps ones that have been found through our app. But the images feel functional and pragmatic and realistic. In opposition to that, our fun direction might use illustration much more. With illustrations, we can make the animals seem happy and positive and upbeat, and we can do the same for the owners as well. Our illustrations don't have to exist in rectangles, they can be free-floating and energetic. And we could easily use them to create icons or buttons. So now I have a mood board for each of my different directions, each of my different moods, and they look and feel pretty different. So now I've collected all of this information, even though I haven't actually made a design yet, I can start to decide which direction is going to be the best one for my app which direction I want to apply to my wireframes. In this next section, we're going to be developing our user interface design. We're going to do that through a process of decision-making and refinement of trying out designs and seeing which ones work the best with our interface. So let's look at where we are in our process. We made some mood boards to map out our visual direction and now we're going to take elements and themes from that direction and apply it to our wireframes to make a user interface. We looked at two different visual directions for our app. Both of them provide a palette of graphic elements that we can apply to our wireframe. I want my app to appeal to a slightly younger audience and to be more of a light-hearted experience, so I'm going to choose the visual direction on the right. I'm going to take this graphic palette and apply it in a fast and fairly rough way to some sample screens. I'm going to make different design options because I want to test out and also develop my design direction and be able to try it out on the interface. So let's apply our design palette to some of our wireframe screens. Let's start out with our simple branding page. To match my audience and the goals of my app, I probably want something that's a little bit positive and upbeat right at the start. So I'm going to use my name GetPet and the typography that I was looking at earlier. It's fun and bouncy and almost feels like a wagging tail. I might want an image to go with it that reinforces some of those same attributes. But perhaps that looks too youthful now. Perhaps I've gone away from my target audience. I want to keep an illustration, but perhaps a different style and maybe just a pet and not a person. I like this dog because he looks happy, like he's just been found. Let's add some upbeat colors to our screen to try and make it look less like a wireframe. As you're building these screens and applying your design to them, try different things out. They might not always work, but it's important to test out all of your options. If I change my image to a sad dog, it immediately has a very different mood. And all I've changed here is just the expression on the dog's face. All the other elements have stayed the same. 
and the happy dog is much more appropriate for the mood of my app. But I might choose to not use an illustration at all. I might want to reinforce my branding even more with some kind of logo type or bug. And I could think about the scale relationship of my different elements to each other and also to the screen size. I can take my very upbeat color palette and apply it to some of the other elements, like the map for instance. I can use my colors as a background field for pop-up windows. I might want to change the shape of that window. And I definitely want to spend some time rearranging the elements within that space. I can try out some different typography and also some different button designs. And if you take things too far or you just don't like them, you can always make another version. Here I might decide I need more contrast between my background and my floating window. I can also put in real textual information and real images to try and make my interface look more real. Now that I have designs for two screens, I should be able to extend that logic to a third screen and have them work as a set. I can use the same coloring system for my map, and I can also take the bug from the first screen and reuse that. I can use similar typography from my second screen as well. So even with just three screens, I'm already extending and applying my design rather than making three very different screens. I can extend the design due to functionality. Here I might need red and green labels to show lost and found, for instance. I might want to highlight the area that the user is searching in and make that more visible. So I'm negotiating between functionality and aesthetics while trying to keep my design on track for my audience. In my wireframe sketches, I was testing out different ways to show what kind of animal was lost and found, so I'm going to try and do that here by using icons for the different animals. I might want some visual hierarchy to focus on the key animal that's either lost or found, so I might treat that element slightly differently. So in quite a short time, I've managed to take my wireframes and effectively dress them up with my design aesthetic. But design does much more than just act as a skin or a surface. It can really change and alter the function and the structure of your app. In this section, we're going to further refine our user interface design. As well as finessing the design, we'll be looking at continuity and making sure everything works the same across different screens and looking at state changes for some of our interface elements. Let's look at where we are in our UI development process. We created a general direction, we developed that visual direction, and now we're going to finalize it and finesse it. Our goal here is to make a series of refined and fully resolved screens that we can use in our digital prototype. So let's look at the three sample screens that I was designing earlier. We left them in a state where they were fairly resolved but could probably do with another round of refinement. Our branding on our first screen seems much too large for the scale of the screen, so we could reduce that down. We might choose a slightly different color palette as well. So we're really looking at small design moves here across all areas of our interface design. So try and consider all the small details. It might be about the exact curvature of a rounded corner, or how much contrast there is between a floating window and a background, or the exact color or position of a button. And remember, you're striking a balance between how you use design to indicate functionality within the interface and how you create an idiosyncratic identity, a look and feel that's specific to your app. Think about how your systems work across different screens. For instance, I might need one color system in my maps to show lost and found, but another color system to reinforce my branding, and a third one to show interactive elements or buttons. And those kind of decisions might be based purely around functionality, but I'm also trying to create an aesthetic for my app as well. If I shift the color palette in my map, for example, it can have quite a dramatic effect on how my whole app feels. But that difference in contrast can also have an effect on functionality. I might be able to see my buttons more clearly with a different background or a different foreground color. Some moves might create quite a large visual shift, but you should also look at the smaller elements, the details of every aspect of your interface. 
On my last screen, for instance, I might look at the relationship between the icons that I have and the labels that I have. I've got a color coding system for lost and found, I've got an icon system to show a different kind of animal, and I've got a typographic system for showing the animal's name. So even with quite a small aspect of my interface, there's a lot of design decisions to make. As you develop and refine your user interface, it's worth going back to your wireframe map. If you have screens that are similar or use a lot of the same elements, you can develop these together. This will help you maintain consistency and continuity across your screens and across your app. And if you have elements appearing on multiple screens, it can help you create a visual system that's consistent across those screens. In this case, we might want all of our maps to look the same, and all of our icons and labels on those maps to also look the same. But because we've got a slightly different set of information here, we're going to have to come up with some other icons for other animals, so we're extending and testing our visual system at the same time. So rather than showing a letter to say whether an animal is lost or found, I can indicate that with just a color system, the same that I'm doing elsewhere in my app, so I'm being consistent. You might find yourself going back and forth between two different screens in two different areas of your app. And as you're working in different areas, you might discover things where you have to go back and tweak some of your earlier designs. It's not just interface elements that you'll be changing. It might be your typography, it might be the spacing, it might be how things sit within a window. And you want to figure out how to make that consistent, how to have a systematic approach to your design. Because you want all of your screens to feel like they belong together in the same family. If you have the same element appearing on more than one screen, make sure that it's consistent, the same scale and the same place, like your menu items for instance. You can also check to see if you have anything that's redundant in your interface. In my screen on the left, I don't need to have the icon of the animal and the animal's name. And even if you're using stand-in artwork, the way that I am with the map, now might be a good time to find something that's a little closer to how you really want the artwork to look. So I might want my map to look cleaner and crisper and more graphic. And as with all design, one change can have a knock-on effect to other elements. If I change my map color, there's knock-on effects because I'm using it in several different ways. So I have to adjust all the different states and all the different uses of that element. Your refinement happens on a macro and micro level. On the micro level, we might be looking at our icon design. If we look at our icons on the right-hand page, for instance, the cat icon doesn't seem quite right. Even when we shrink it down, it's still too different from our icon system. It's too complex. Let's enlarge a couple of icons and take a look at them quickly. We've made them the same size, but we need more visual continuity than that. The dog is a lot simpler and a lot flatter. So we could make some small moves to the cat icon to try and balance them out. Let's create similarity. Let's make the eyes work in the same way. And let's make the ears work in the same way as well. Now our level of simplicity and of flatness seems to be quite close. So these icons work better as part of a set. So once they're a set, any changes I make to one of them, I should make to all of them. So if I want to make them a little bit larger, for instance, I have to change that to all of the icons. Again, we're looking at refinement, continuity, and consistency. We can take that same logic, not just to our icons, but to the labels sitting beneath them. We can look at the spatial relationship between the type and the label, as well as the relationship between the label and the icon itself. We might even want to try out a different color system to work with our map, but we'd need to do that on a global level. So as you can see with this example, our process of refinement is incremental. It involves a lot of small steps. And even though we're focusing on very small details in each individual screen, we're also going to have to start to think about how the screens work together. An easy way to do that is to take your finished designs and drop them into your wireframe map. This stage of the process feels a little bit like completing a paint by numbers picture. You're going from a framework that's black and white and quite generic 
to something that is much more colourful and visually compelling. If you have the time, you can make a finished design screen for every screen in your wireframe. And this would mean that when you came to make your digital prototype, it's really going to feel just like your finished app. Welcome to the final week of User Experience Fundamentals. This week, we're going to learn how to take our app design and simulate the experience of interactivity by making a simple functioning digital prototype. We'll be using prototyping software to put your static screens into a realistic context and simulating interaction in order to understand how your app feels, to troubleshoot, and to fix any problems. This is the part of the course where all your talents come together. It's the culmination of both your UI and UX skills. Your visual interface design and your user interaction decisions are combined together to simulate an authentic app experience. For me, this is the most exciting part of UI UX development, when it all starts to become real, when you have a believable prototype in your hands. This is the culmination of all your work in this course. Good luck putting it all together. Here we are in the final week of UX Design Fundamentals. In this last week, we're going to look at how to make a semi-functioning digital prototype. We're going to try and make our digital prototype look and feel as real as possible, but without actually programming it. So let's look at where we are in our process. We've completed the first stages in our process, non-visual and semi-visual, and we've completed the first part of our prototyping phase we've made the final screens that we're going to use in our prototype. Our next stage is going to be actually building that prototype, which connects to our final stage, which we're not going to deal with in this class. If this was a real project, there'd be a whole fourth phase where we would be building, programming, beta testing and revising our finished app before its launch. But with this class, we're going to end things in the second phase of our prototyping section. This is the phase where we try and simulate the final experience of our app as closely as possible. We refine our UI and UX, and we create a functioning digital prototype that we could take to another level of user testing if we wanted to. Even though we're not going to use programming to build our prototype, we're going to need some specialized software. But that software is pretty simple to use. In this last phase, you want to use all of the UI and UX skills that you've gained throughout this course. And even though we're in this last phase, you should still keep evaluating your app. If there are small changes that you need to make, that's okay, you should go ahead and make them. The process of refinement is ongoing and continual. It never ends until your app launches, and often it continues way after that with updates. But our job for now is to keep pressing ahead and finish building our digital prototype. We want our digital prototype to feel as real as it possibly can. We want to simulate the finished app as best we can. In order to do that, we need to simulate the platform that the app is going to appear on. We need to simulate the interface, simulate the interaction, and the sum of that is to simulate the experience. Before we get into the practicalities of how to make our prototype, let's look at these different kinds of simulation, some of which we've already talked about. In order to simulate the platform, we need to think about scale, we need to think about physicality, and we need to put these together to make a visual and tactile experience. So our digital prototype needs to be specific to the device that it's going to be used on. Our devices fill up different amounts of space in our fields of vision. They may be vertical or horizontal, and we may be interacting with a hand or with a mouse. For our prototype to feel real, it needs to be on the right-sized screen. Once we've chosen a physical device, we need to think about simulating the interface, and we've already done quite a lot of work on this. We want our user interface design to be polished and believable, and we want the visual and verbal content that we have to be believable as well. Rather than a generic wireframe, we want to have actual content, actual interface design, as close as possible to our finished app. 
And once we have these static pieces at the right size on the right platform, we have to think about how to simulate the interaction that the user will have with our app. And again, we've already done some work on this. We've got a wireframe map that gives us a believable UX experience where we've thought about the paths that the user is going to take and we've thought about how they might interact and respond with individual screens. The logic and flow of our user interaction is already quite resolved. When we add together all of these different kinds of simulation, we should be able to simulate the entire experience of our app. So we need to have believable UI design, believable UX design, a believable platform and context. And we need to have all three of these. So believable UI design means that our prototype needs to be on a screen. Believable UX design means that our prototype needs to be interactive. And a believable platform or context means that our prototype needs to be running on a real physical device. In a lot of ways, we want to trick the user into thinking that our prototype is real and a fully programmed app. But of course, it isn't. And it's worth remembering that we're still in the testing phase here. There's still the possibility for change and improvement because we're in this pre-programming phase. Rather than learning how to program or working with a programmer, we're going to use some simple digital prototyping software to produce our prototype. There's lots of different software to choose from, and some of it's free. I would suggest that you find one that suits your budget, one that's easy to use, and one that does the things that you need. For the sake of the demos in this class, I'm going to use Adobe XD. I like this software because it's easy to use. I'm already familiar with how other Adobe products work. There's a lot of resources in terms of templates and guides. It's quite a flexible tool. I can prototype apps or websites or pretty much anything. There are frequent updates to the software, so it's always getting more and more functionality. It's also heading towards being an industry standard in a lot of design studios. Most of the prototyping software that's out there works in a similar way. So if you don't use XD, the knowledge is still going to be transferable and easy to apply to whatever program you do use. For the demos that we use in this class, we're going to keep it pretty simple. You can probably build a much more complex digital prototype than the one that we're going to build. If you do want to do that, I'd advise you to take a tutorial and check out the UI kits and the wireframe kits that are available for free. And there's a range of different ways that you can build your digital prototype as well. How you do that might depend on your area of interest or your specific skill set. You could use pre-existing components within the software to build a generic wireframe and use that as your prototype. You could also use existing artwork and make invisible interactive areas. Or you could rebuild the whole of your artwork in XD or whatever program you're using. There are pros and cons to all of these three different approaches. The fastest and easiest way to build something might not give the most realistic simulation of your app for the user. And it would be nice if you can utilize the interface screens that you've already designed and spent time on refining. But you might find you have to adjust or rebuild some of your artwork to get the most out of the software. There are pros and cons to each of these prototyping strategies. If you want to use pre-existing components to build a generic wireframe for your prototype, the good news is it's fast to build, it's going to look like a professional wireframe, and it can work in any operating system. It's also going to be great for testing your UX. The bad news is that it's going to look quite generic, and it's only going to function as a wireframe, so you won't get as much information back from the user testing. There's no design involved, there's no UI, so it's kind of bad for testing out your UI. If you were going to build your prototype like this, you'd have a range of pieces that were pre-made that you could choose from in order to make your wireframe. And there are literally hundreds of these pieces, and they're all very generic, but they work together as a set really well. So if you were to make your digital prototype using these pieces, it would look very coherent, very cohesive. And you'd learn a lot about the user's interactions. The interface design basically wouldn't get in the way of the user experience. 
You could also use pre-existing components from a certain operating system, whether it's for Apple or Android. Let's see what some of my screens look like for my Lost Pet app if I try and build them as generic wireframes. First of all, there's a generic map that I can use, so that's pretty useful. There are standardized icons and symbols that I can use, and I can color those whatever I need to. I can scale them up and down and position them wherever I want, so I'm able to shape the design a little bit. My other interface elements would be pretty generic. If I needed menu items, they'd be standard symbols and generic typeface and size. The same would be true of other information in my interface, which would all be standardized in terms of color, shape, and system. The benefit of this is that I know that all of these pieces are going to work in harmony together. So I end up with a functioning map, although it's not very visually compelling. I can use generic elements to make a sign-up screen, and here the size, weight, and color of my typography is predetermined, as well as the spacing between my elements. Each component of my interface is standardized, as long as I make sure my menu items appear in the same place on different screens, there's going to be consistency. So it's not just the elements that are consistent, it's how I'm using them, how I'm structuring my page. So I could take the elements from my first screen and quite easily copy and paste them into exactly the same space. I can even add a keyboard that's already been made for me. So all I've really done is copy and paste these generic elements and I've already got three screens that work together in harmony. This kind of design is great when it's used for the purpose it was intended for, as a wireframe. It's really focusing on the functionality of the interface, the interactions, and not on the design. If you've completed all the steps in this class, you've already moved past this process. Our second option is to use the artwork that we've already built, and we can find some easy ways to make it be interactive. The benefits of this approach are that it's fast to build, it looks like your design, there's very little additional design work to do, and it's going to be good for testing UI and UX. You might find you need to build a few more user interface components to get them to work with this software. You might also find that your designs don't look exactly like whichever operating system world you want them to live in. But this might be the best and easiest approach because it builds on a lot of the work that you've already done. So let's take some of my static screens that I developed earlier for my Lost Pet app and see how those might work in this scenario. I could import my entire screen designs, not one piece at a time, but as one whole image. So straight away, I've got a user interface that looks quite finished and quite specific to my app. But I'd need to fake some kind of interactivity so that I can make a semi-functioning digital prototype. Most prototyping software works in the same way, where you're connecting one page to a target page, and that's basically forming a link, so when the user taps on that page, it'll take them there. It's basically the equivalent of the arrows that we would draw between our screens in our sitemap. So this might help us make a very basic prototype, but there's not really much detail in terms of interaction there. I'm really just traveling from screen to screen. I'm not really interacting with any of the interface elements specifically. Because all of my interface elements are in one image, I'd have to fake that interactivity. I could draw a box over one of my icons, for instance, and set the fill and the line of that box to be invisible. I could then set a target where you would go to if you clicked on that icon. So instead of the whole screen being interactive, it's really just that one icon now. And you could continue that process with a whole series of transparent boxes linking to all the different screens that they might need to go to. With the software I'm using, I have some choices over the kind of transition and the length of transition from screen to screen as well. If I want to be more accurate about the area that's active, I can draw a specific shape that relates to whatever the active area in the background is. So here, I'm drawing a circular area over a circular icon. And I could connect that to any screen that I wanted. Right now, I have three artboards in my file that reflect three different screens. 
but if I was really making this app, I'd have many more. If I want to see whether my connections are working, I can use a preview window to test them out. So if I'm on the first screen, and I move the cursor over the icon where I designated an active area, you can see that the cursor changes. And if I click on that icon, it takes me to my second screen, and it uses whatever transition I chose. In exactly the same way, if I move the cursor over the post button, it'll change to let me know that it's live, and if I click on it, it'll take me to my third screen. And from there, I can click on my active cat icon and get back to the first screen. So we've made a very simple interactive loop between our three artboards here. We could have many interactive areas on one screen, so the dog would take me to a dog screen, the snake to a snake screen, the parrot icon to a parrot screen. So you'd build a network of connections to simulate the interactivity. Let's look at our third option, which involves rebuilding our artwork within the digital prototyping software. The benefits here are that it will look like your design, you could also make it look like whatever operating system it's working with, it's going to be a closer simulation to your finished app, and it's good for testing both UI and UX. In many ways, it's a more refined version of the strategy that we just looked at. But the downside is that it's going to take you a lot longer to build this way. But it is going to give you more control over the interaction in your prototype. Ultimately, it'll make it feel more real. So let's look at how that might work with our lost pet example. I could use some of my existing user interface components, but I'd be redrawing them or importing them one by one into my prototyping software. So I'm not starting from scratch because I've got the components and I've got a blueprint for the layout. One of the things I like about this approach is that I can mix my artwork for my app with the system artwork to make it look a little bit more real. Even though I'm not going to make these system elements work, just the fact that I have them there makes you think that my app is live. I could also use other standardized interface elements, and these are available from free UI kits. So I'm going to mix some of the Apple OS language with my app. So I'm trying to get the believability from the existing OS system, but the personality and originality of my app from my own designs. I could also decide that I don't want to use any of the pre-existing components, and every piece that I put into this prototype is going to be designed by me. But even in that case, some pre-existing familiar visual components can really help the believability of your prototype. If I want my users to sign in with Facebook, Google, or Twitter, it really helps to have recognizable icons there. It makes my app feel more believable and authentic. I think this strategy helps you build the legitimacy and familiarity that you need, so the user believes that your prototype is really a fairly fully functioning app. And the more screens that you build using your own design components, the more the personality of your app is going to come through. So we've looked at three different ways for you to build your prototype. Which way you choose to work might depend on what kind of UI UX designer you really are. So think a little bit about where your focus is. You might want to use pre-existing components if you are a less visual person and more UX focused. If you're more concerned with the user interface, you probably want to rebuild your artwork. And if you're somewhere in between, you probably want to use your existing artwork and work on top of it to create interactive areas. Since I'm from a graphic design background, I'm more visually based, I'm more UI focused, so I'm going to work using the last model, and I'm going to rebuild my artwork inside my prototyping program. In this section, we're going to move one step closer to our finished prototype. We're going to try and make all of our existing screens and import them into our prototyping software. It's going to help us if we organize all of these screens onto one page, and we already have a couple of models for this. We have our site map, and we have our wireframe map. So here are some sample screens that I've built for my app. There's a series of login screens, a series of home screens, a series of searching for pets, and a series of posting for lost pets. Since I'm going to be connecting these screens together, 
in my prototyping program, it's going to be useful for me to use the organizational maps that I've already developed. So I'm going to use my wireframe map. If I take those screens away and just leave the arrows that connected them, I can almost exactly slot my more finished designs into exactly the same places. So I can use my wireframe map as a blueprint for how I'm going to create my prototype within the prototyping software. So here's all of my different artboards, all laid out in XD. I can arrange and group these screens into their thematic sections. I can move them into a space where their visual arrangement makes sense with their content and their function according to the logic of my app. So pretty much the same thing I was doing with a wireframe map. You can figure out whatever layout or logical system works best for your app. I'm going to arrange my app with the login screens at the top, the home screens straight after that, and then the three different main sections, all as equal variations after the home screen. It's a very simple structure that follows the basic primary user flow and the hierarchy levels of my app. And the job of my structure here is for it to make visual sense to me as I lay out these screens because I know that I'm going to add many more screens as I build my prototype. And it could easily get way too complicated visually and way too confusing. So we've got our screens into our prototyping software. Now let's make some simple transitions between those screens to make them feel like they're interactive. From my branding screen, you can pretty much click anywhere to get to the next screen. So I'm going to make the entire page take you to the next screen rather than making one specific area or element be the interactive component. All I have to do is connect those two artboards together. I can make a link between them and choose which artboard I want to connect to. I can also choose what kind of transition I want to have, whether I want it to ease in or ease out to be smoother, and how long I want the transition to last for. For a transition like this, it doesn't really matter so much, so I'm going to pick a pretty simple dissolve, and that'll crossfade between these two images. I'm going to do it quite quickly, because I don't want to make a big deal of the transition, but I want it to be visible enough so the user feels like they're being transported to another screen. And I can use my preview window to test that transition to see if I like it or not. If I don't think it's right, I can go back and change it. The following screen has many more components on it, so I can't make the whole artboard interactive. I need to think about each of the individual elements and what the user might do with them. For now, I'm going to concentrate on the big connections. I'm not going to deal with how someone might fill out the fields when they want to create an account, but I am going to deal with what happens when they click the Go button, because I know where that's going to take them. It's going to take them to the next artboard where they have to confirm that information. Likewise, the next big interaction when I hit the Confirm button is going to take me to the map, to my home page. So I'm basically building these major links between my screens, even though I know I might have to go back and build some intermediate screens. I'm trying to get the shape of my interactive structure here so that I can see what it feels like before I spend the time working with the details of the interactions in each screen. Like the process of most design development, we're making big moves first. I want to include all of the screens that I've designed so far so I can link the parrot icon to the next screen where there's information about the lost parrot. And I can quite easily test my transition by using the preview window. In order to include the last screen that I've designed, I need to create a connection from the parrot window to the dog window. I can isolate the dog icon and make that be the only interactive element, and it's going to take me to the next page the dog page with more information on it. So I've managed to include all of my six screen designs and connect them all together. I haven't made everything interactive or live, I've just made a few connections. And I'm doing this as a preliminary test. I want to see what my prototype feels like, how it's going to work. 
rather than building a prototype with all 20 screens, I can just take a sample of a few screens and try them out to see what needs fixing, to see what works and what doesn't work. Now, in my preview window, I can go from my identity screen to my create an account screen to my confirmation screen. I can click confirm and go to my home screen, my map screen. My cursor tells me that the parrot is the only live element. So I can click on that, get to the parrot detail screen, and from there I can click on the dog and get to the dog detail screen. I've also set it up that I can click back on the parrot to go between these two screens because I want that transition to be quite minimal. I want it to be seamless because it's a small jump for the user. What we've made here is a test version of our digital prototype. And even though it's very limited, we can actually test it on a real device straight away. I can hook my phone up to my computer and have it play my preview on my phone. Seeing the app on a real device, even at this preliminary stage, can be really useful. And even though there's not much interaction and it's not very specific, just the fact that the user is touching the screen to get a response makes the app feel real. I can also flip through all the other screens that I've designed, even though I haven't put links in there yet or connected them. And once I've seen my screens in this simulated mode, I can assess them and evaluate them, figure out which things work, which things don't, and how I'm going to get it to work better when I build my larger prototype. In this segment, we're going to look at some ways to try and make our prototype feel a little bit more realistic. One thing that helps with that, in XD at least, is creating overlays so you can have a window float over the top of a background. I'd encourage you to do whatever moves you can to make your digital prototype seem more realistic. In this case, I want to try and simulate a window popping up over the top of a background and that background staying in the same place. So for the screens that have the floating window, I'm going to delete everything in the background. I'm going to use the same system we already looked at to create a link from the icon to the page. But this time, I'm going to choose overlay rather than transition. And I'm going to choose slide up as the transition option because I want this menu to appear like it's sliding up from the bottom of my screen. I'm going to connect a second icon from my map to an overlay screen. So the dog icon connects to the dog screen. And the same as before, I'm going to make sure it's an overlay and not a transition. And I can tell it's an overlay screen because the background is greyed out. So now in my preview window, I can click on both the dog icon and the parrot icon. And I can have both of those windows slide up over my background map. And that's a much closer simulation of how the app is really going to work when it's finished. You should use any techniques and tricks that you can to make your app feel more real, whether that's in terms of interaction or in terms of menu movement. The closer you can get to the finished thing without any programming, the better. We can use this same kind of technique to create sidebar menus as well. Because the way that these menus move is such a familiar convention, they're quite a useful tool for us to have in creating a digital prototype that feels more real. We're going to use the same technique with overlays that we already looked at. On one artboard, I'm going to delete everything apart from the menu. And then I'm going to make a link to the menu icon that's on my home page, my map page. I'm going to make it an overlay link so that the menu can float over the top of the map. And I'm going to have it slide out to the right so it feels like the menu is coming out of the menu icon, just like with a real app. I can preview it and see if I like it or not. Clicking on the menu makes it go away, so it feels like I have an open and close action that's quite fluid, one that feels quite real. Right now, in my fake menu, I have search for highlighted in bold as if it's active. If I wanted to continue to simulate this interactivity, I could make that be an active link. I can use our technique from earlier of drawing a transparent box over the area that I want to be interactive. And then I can connect that link to my search for screen. 
I have to locate that screen within my layout of all my artboards. As always, I can pick my transition and the timing of my transition. Since the whole screen is going to change, I'm going to have this transition be a fast dissolve. So you can see, we're starting to create quite a complex web of connections, and this is why it's important for you to have your artboards organized within your prototyping software. So let's go back to our main map screen and look at all the different things that we can do from that screen now. As well as having my parrot and dog menu slide up from the bottom, I can also go up to the menu at the top and have my main menu appear. And if I select search for, it'll take me to that screen. Another thing that we can do to create more of the feeling of full interactivity is to create fake fields for data entry. It's quite simple to do this. We just need to create a series of progressive screens where each screen adds the next piece of data. There's no typing involved, but it at least takes the user through the stages of filling the form out. As you click on each successive field, it fills in and then takes you to the next artboard. So you're just adding one piece of data at a time. I can make it feel a little more fulfilling for the user by changing the text in the field from a light gray to black as they enter their data. Once I press the search button, it would take me to a map that would show the results of my search. In this case, it's found my dog. If I click on the icon, I get details about the dog, and I can choose to either close that window or to confirm. If you think back to our user flowchart, we're basically making a screen for every possible decision that the user could make. The big difference is that now we're following these paths through our content through our app with very finished visuals and a very finished user interface. So it feels much more real. So when we get feedback from a user now, it should be much more accurate. And while we're creating this simulated interactivity for our user, we're having to create a lot more screens. We're expanding and refining our user interface design at the same time that we're really getting to grips with how a user is actually going to experience the real app. In this segment, we're going to look at creating some more complete pathways for our digital prototype. So far, we've made a prototype, but it's got fairly limited interactions. The user's experience is quite brief and not very complete. To give the user a more fulfilling and realistic experience of our app, we're going to create some more complete pathways within our prototype. Because I've organized the artboards of my prototype in the same way as my wireframe map, I can clearly see the same groupings where the user is following a different path. Where these paths have been described with text or generic elements before, now they're clearly visually visible and delineated. In order to build out my prototype, I should probably take each of these areas and develop a fixed pathway for the user to travel through so that they experience each of these areas. And of course, we're not going for full functionality here. We really just want the user to travel through and experience a sampling of each area. So we're going to need to make some more screens. And it begs the question, how many screens do you need to have in your prototype? As a general guide, I would create a pathway through each important area or function of your app. There might be some areas that you don't need to build out at all. But the bottom line is, the amount of screens is really going to depend on your app and how your app works, but also how much time you have and what stage of the project you're in. If you feel like everything is working and pretty resolved, you can keep building out your prototype. But remember, we're still in a prototype phase, so you don't have to build everything. You can also keep evaluating and refining the interaction. You might find yourself adding or taking away steps within a pathway, and it's useful to time how long each of those pathways takes the user. It might be much shorter or much longer than you think. If we go back to my Get Pet app, you can see here that I've actually made a lot more screens to get my pathways ready. 
I've got my login screens at the beginning, my home screens, places where I can search for my lost pet, and then two distinct areas where I can post a lost pet or post a found pet. And I've color coded these green and red so you can see quite easily that they're separate sections. So I had to make between 13 and 15 screens to show the pathway through each of these sections. I used the same technique of overlays that we already looked at and I tried to create pathways that loop back to the home page or connect to each other because I want to provide a more complete or contained experience for the user. In the preview window you can see that I'm posting about an animal that I found. I made an extra screen where you can upload an image from your photo album which of course is faked at this point because there's only one image to choose from. But it gives the illusion of my app functioning with the larger operating system. As well as my photo, I can add textual information about the animal that I've found, one line at a time. And even though the keyboard isn't active, I'm going to make the user click on each of the text fields one at a time because I want them to feel as if they're actually entering information and going through that process. As much as anything, I'm trying to simulate the timing of the experience. Once all of the information has been entered, the user can post the animal that they found and then they'll be able to see it on their main map. And this conveniently takes us back to our home page. So we've followed a complete circuit or loop with the one pathway of posting about a found animal. Also now on my map, I can click on the green snake, the animal I found, and I can see my information that I've entered. And this gives the user the feeling that the entries actually worked and the data has been posted. Let's look at another pathway. Let's look at what happens if we want to post for a lost animal. It's pretty much exactly the same process. I can upload my photo from a photo album. I can enter all the information that I have about the pet that I've lost. And the categories for the lost pet are slightly different from the found pet. The most important thing is that I can enter a name for my pet. So when my pet shows up on my app, it's going to show up with that name, in this case, Libby. Whereas the snake that I found showed up on the map as an icon that said, pet you found. Having some visual confirmation of the actions that I've taken as a user like this can really help the app feel real. So now I've built out a pathway for almost all of my main menu options. The one that I've left till last is profile because I feel that's a little bit less important and probably a fairly standard screen. Next, I might think about how these pathways are organized. Do they follow on one from the other so the user has to go through them in a specific order? Or do I allow the user to choose which pathway they want to access and in which order? Well, here we are at our last class of UX design fundamentals. We're at our final phase where we get to publish and test our prototype. But first of all, make sure that all your paths are working properly in your prototyping program. When you've tested everything and it seems good, then we can move on to creating a working digital simulation. So here's my final layout document in my software prototyping program. So you can see that I made nearly 60 screens just for this short prototype. If I want to go through all my links and test them out, I can use the preview window. And I can also make a recording here if I wanted to keep a record of the interactions. I find that this is a good way for me to test my prototype one last time myself before I hand it off to test it with a user that's never seen it before. I can travel through all my pathways making sure that everything works, and also making sure that there's no dead ends. I've arranged my fixed pathways into an order that I think makes sense for the user. After my initial splash screen, they have to create an account before they can get to the home screen and the map. My menu at the top of the screen is active, so I can search for items in that text menu, or I can also click on any of the icons that are on the map and they're all active. I can open and close the information windows and that feels quite realistic. If I spot a found pet 
that I know is mine, I can claim that pet. So here's my lost snake that I'm going to claim, and it takes me out to a separate confirmation screen. And I can use my main menu to easily go back to the map screen again. I'm basically trying to make every possible activity of browsing in my home screen available to the user in terms of testing. When the user has finished exploring the home screen, they can choose one of the three main options from the main menu. I made search for bold in order to force the user down that pathway first. If you look at the overview showing thumbnails of our screens, you can see that we've traveled through the top area and now we're in the lower left area that's blue. This is my search for area, so I've entered information about the animal that I'm searching for and now a match appears on my map. If it's the right animal, I can claim it, and if it's the wrong animal, I can go back to my search and start over again. I'm trying to build the illusion of choice for the user. I'm trying to build the illusion of full interactivity when there's only really two choices. When I've traveled all the way through this path, it's going to take me back to my home page, but the main menu is going to suggest a different option now in bold. I'm basically forcing the user to travel through my three main sections in order. So here we are in the post found section, and you can easily identify this in the overview of thumbnails because I've color coded all of the screens green. So here I can enter information and a photograph of the animal that I found and post it. Once the user does that, an icon will appear back on the home page map showing the animal that's been found. I'm trying to prove to the user here that their interactions with my app actually have results. And of course, the point of that is to try and make it feel more real. Once I've traveled through the post found pathway of my prototype, the menu is going to change once again, and now it will allow me to get to my last section. This is the red section on the right hand side of my thumbnails, and this is where I can post information about an animal that's been lost. The steps here are very similar to the post found section. I'm trying to create continuity and familiarity in both the interface and the experience for the user. I'm also trying to have some slight visual differences so the user knows that they're in a different place participating in a different activity. That can partly be done with words and labeling, but I'm also using a color coding system. I'm hoping that the experience I'm creating is smooth and easy and logical for the user and also engaging. As well as interacting with the interface, I want the user to really engage with the content. So one thing that really helps with that is using real text and using real images. Or creating your text in your images so that they feel real and not repeating the same information twice as well. If you can get the user to engage with the content, that means they're really using and experiencing your interface. You can see from the timer on my preview window where I've been recording that that whole experience was about four and a half minutes to get through 60 screens. When you've tested your prototype yourself and everything seems good, it's time to create your finished working simulation. And you can do this in a number of different ways. As we've just seen, you could create a video playthrough. Your prototyping software might also allow you to publish a link so that anybody can look at it in a web browser. As we've seen previously, you can create an interactive version, a preview of your app, and connect your phone to your computer screen. Or the best option is to create an interactive version that's a standalone, so you can look at it on your phone from anywhere. This option is the one that's going to make your app feel the most real. You'll actually be holding it in your hand on a real device. When you come to test your prototype, it's really useful to test it with a user who's never seen it before. That way, all of their responses to your UI and UX decisions are going to be totally genuine. So here's my final limited functionality working digital prototype. I've been through a lot of stages in my process to get here. If I was working in the real world, I'd probably have condensed that process. But for at least the first time you design an app, it's worth going through 
all of those stages so you experience them. The next time you do this, you'll be able to condense your own process down and choose which parts of the process worked best for you. And if you were working on a larger project, you might not be involved in all of these stages. You might be concentrating on just one part of the process in a lot more detail. I hope that what you've seen as we've gone through this process is how complicated it can be to get to just this stage of making a digital prototype, let alone making a fully functioning app. We've covered a lot of information in this course, and some of it we've gone over quite quickly. There are plenty of areas that we could have investigated much more deeply. But remember, this is just a beginning course. It's to take you through that whole process so you can figure out what you might want to investigate in a more detailed fashion. And there are two more courses that follow on from this one that will help you look at some of these issues in much more detail. I hope this course has been productive for you and I hope that you manage to get to this final stage of producing a digital prototype. Wherever your focus ends up being in the broad field of UI and UX, I wanted to wish you good luck in developing your app and getting your digital prototype finished. Hello and welcome to the course Web Design, Strategy and Information Architecture. My name is Roman Jaster. I'm a web designer, web developer, and instructor in the graphic design program at the California Institute of the Arts. This is the third course in the UI UX specialization on Coursera, and the first half of what I designed as a two-course sequence capping off this specialization. I hope that many of you took the preceding UI UX courses with Michael Worthington and that you are ready for more. In my courses, you will explore and practice every phase of the user experience design process through lessons, exercises, and a large-scale project in which you will design a complex website. In this course, Web Design, Strategy, and Information Architecture, you are going to define your strategy, outline your scope, and draft your sitemap for your project. And in the next course, Web Design, Wireframes to Prototypes, you'll give your website a compelling look and feel when developing wireframes and visual mockups. While the UX concepts that I'm covering will translate to many kinds of interactive media, like apps, digital kiosks, or games, our primary focus will be on designing contemporary responsive websites. By the end of these two courses, you will have created an impressive and comprehensive portfolio piece that showcases UX design skills. To guide you in your explorations, you will be able to peek over the shoulders of two students, Allison and Bradley, who completed the exact same project as you. You'll be able to hear them talk about how they tackled each project phase, and you'll learn from their insights. Now, this first course that you're about to begin is focused on the early UX challenges. We'll talk about research, planning, setting goals, understanding the user, defining requirements and structuring content. You'll even get to watch a few interviews that I conducted with practicing designers who are going to share tips and insights about user experience design. Lastly, a little more about me. I've been working in the industry as a web designer and web developer for almost 20 years. I'm the co-founder of the design studio Ye Brigade, and we work on a lot of web design projects. We often work for educational and nonprofit clients, as well as arts organizations and artists. I also teach web design classes at the California Institute of the Arts, where I got my own design education a little over a decade ago. Fun fact, Michael Worthington was also my teacher in the mid-2000s. A lot has changed in web design since I created my first website way back in 1999. What hasn't changed for me is that I find the web an exciting and challenging medium for designers. I'm so happy that you are interested in learning more about UX design and the web in general. And I hope that you will have a rewarding and fun learning experience. Why peer review is important to a creative practice. Design is rarely a solitary practice. As a designer, you might be working with clients or have a boss you need to report to. You might also be part of a design team or even managing a team of your own. You might be asked to present a project to stakeholders at a company or pitch your services to a new client. Ultimately, 
Your design needs to stand alone, but in the process of making design, you should be testing out your ideas with an audience, getting feedback, and developing your design accordingly. Design is very intertwined with communication, and to be a successful designer, you need to be able to talk about your work, to explain it, and show that you understand how it's working. In different situations, it may be necessary to explain your own work and other people's work in a clear and constructive way. So in this course, you'll be engaging in peer review to evaluate the work of your peers as well as get feedback on your own work. If you're serious about working as a designer or improving your design skills, consider peer review as excellent practice. In peer review, you'll be asked to observe and openly reflect on what is working and not working in a peer's graphic design submission. The goal of this exercise is to help your fellow designers move their work forward and for you to get that same advice in turn. Additionally, it's for you to practice a working vocabulary and discourse around making graphic design, all of which will help you with your future path as a designer. The next video will give you some specific tips for completing peer review within the specialization. Peer review tips. Critique and feedback are essential parts of the design process. They're an essential way to see if your design is communicating what you intended to an audience. So in this video, I'm going to outline a few tips for completing peer review assignments successfully in this class. Participation in peer review thoughtfully and meaningfully will help you practice these indispensable skills. Submitting assignments. Read the instructions carefully. Make sure you take a look at the review criteria so you know how your assignment will be assessed. Review any examples your instructor may have provided and upload exactly what you are asked to do. If something in the instructions isn't clear, post your question in the course forums so staff can assist you. Make it your best work. This is your creation and your creativity and should be an exercise that demonstrates what you can do. Practice assignments should be opportunities to fail, but a final assignment should be something worthy of your professional portfolio. Ask for specific feedback. Clarify what you need from your peers in your review. Where applicable, use the designated comment field to ask for specific feedback on your submission. Submit on time. Refer to the due date for submitting your assignment on the grades page within the course. If you're too early or too late, the peer review process may not work as intended. Reviewing submissions. Take your time with reviewing. Don't rush this. Look at each part of your peer's submission carefully and compare what has been submitted to the expectations set out in the rubric. Be objective. When reviewing, consider your role as a viewer or reader of the work. Focus only on what the rubric asks you to evaluate and try to limit your personal opinions about the work in your comments. Be clear and informative. Generic feedback such as good or okay are unhelpful comments for peer reviews because they don't give your peer any specific information about what was working in their submission. Likewise, it doesn't help to say it doesn't work or I don't like it because it doesn't give your peer enough information to help them reassess their designs. Try to articulate a detailed response that helps to affirm your peer's choices in their submission or guides your peer towards the goal of an assignment if it appears that they are off track. Be constructive. Your feedback should motivate your peer to make adjustments and work towards improvement. If there's a need to correct your peer, be honest, but it's more helpful to include specific recommendations or strategies to help the learner improve. Be generous. Recognize that everyone comes to this course with a different level of experience, as well as a different approach to making work. Honor and value these differences. Bad grammar and spelling shouldn't contribute to a bad grade. Please be generous. Likewise, Please don't penalize students for small mistakes. Flag plagiarism and dishonest behavior. 
These violate Coursera's honor code. If you're asked to review an assignment and it appears to be plagiarized, you can flag it so Coursera learner support are notified. Complete your reviews on time. Refer to the due date for completing the minimum number of peer reviews on the grades page within the course. If you're too early or too late, the peer review process may not work as intended. Consider reviewing more than the minimum number of peers for a given assignment. Not only is this helpful for your fellow peers, but it's also instructive for you to see a greater range of submissions to inform your own work. And the more you practice critique, the better you will get at it, and ultimately the better your own work will be as you integrate your critical abilities into your own design process. How to apply feedback to your assignment. So, your assignment's graded and you have peer feedback. Now what? Remember, the goal of peer review is to help you improve your work as a maker and viewer. Try not to see the feedback you receive as either being positive or negative, or an affirmation that you're doing something absolutely right or wrong. Through peer review, you're inviting other perspectives on your work to see and comment on things that you might not see. By engaging in peer review, you're practicing the skill you'll need in your creative and professional life. It's important to understand how an audience will react to your work. Peer feedback should never feel like a personal attack. If you're discouraged by some feedback, then step back and consider why a peer would react that way to your work. Are you seeing patterns or common themes in the feedback you receive? Is there something you need to address in the work? If you receive peer feedback that isn't constructive to your work, that's okay. It's not ideal, but don't let it discourage you. Remember, the goal of feedback is to help you improve. If you need additional feedback, you can resubmit. At the end of the day, remember, both positive and negative feedback can be useful. Positive feedback can let you know what is working, what to keep as is or alter only slightly in your assignment. Negative feedback might let you know what needs to be changed, developed, or reconsidered. As the designer, you might disagree with the feedback, but it's always worth examining someone else's point of view. An outside perspective can be very useful, especially because designers often get too close to their own work and sometimes can't see when parts of it aren't working or communicating properly. If you receive a low grade, consider why your peers gave you that grade. Have they justified their grading in the comments? Consider their perspectives and try incorporating their suggestions into the assignment and resubmit. To start things off, I will give you a brief overview of the user experience process that I will teach in this course sequence. We will begin by defining the term user experience and then briefly look at the five phases of UX design. Strategy, outline of scope, sitemap, wireframes, and visual mockups. I will also talk about the differences between mobile apps and websites and the differences between waterfall and agile approaches to UX design. Lastly, I will introduce you to the main project that you will be working on in this course sequence. And I'll get you started on your first assignment. Oh, and one more thing. You will meet Allison and Bradley, the two students that are completing the project alongside with you. I think you will learn a lot from them as you'll get to peek over their shoulders and hear them share their thought process. All right, let's get started. So we will be talking a lot about UX in this course. We should start simply by defining the term. This is something Michael already touched upon in the first two courses of this specialization, but it's always good to review such fundamental concepts. So let's get started. Of course, UX stands for user experience, but what does that actually mean? Here's one way to define it the experience a product or service creates for people in the real world. That's a pretty concise definition, just one sentence. 
But let's dig a little deeper. What are the words here that stand out? I would say the following three. Experience, people, real world. Let's talk about each of these briefly. What happens when we have an experience? It leaves an impression on us, some sort of feeling, and often a memory. An experience is usually also accompanied with a qualifying adjective. You could say you had an amazing experience, or a horrible experience. Or the experience could be boring, or delightful, or charming, or confusing, or frustrating. I think most of you can remember interacting with a website or an app that could be described in these kinds of terms. Next, there's the word people. So this is about humans. That's something that one should always remember as a designer, that your creations will affect the lives of actual people. And wouldn't you rather that your work helps and delights them than annoy and frustrate them? And lastly, there's real world. This is to emphasize that we are not talking about theoretical experiences or abstract people. Your work has real world consequences. And if your user experience is positive, the websites or your app's goals are much more likely to be fulfilled. Your users will be happy and more likely to buy something or sign up or spend time on your site they are also more likely to return. Now, here's another thing I want to emphasize. There's a term that often seems to stick to UX like some sort of inseparable partner. I'm talking about UI, which stands, of course, for user interface. You hear about UI UX as a pair a lot. Most job descriptions ask for UI UX skills. The specialization is titled UI UX. It often seems like there isn't even a difference between the terms, but that's actually not the case. The author Golden Krishna has a really great way of talking about the difference between UI and UX. Golden wrote a book called The Best Interface is No Interface. It's actually an inspiring book and I would recommend you all read it. Here's a page from the book. And here's what Golden identifies as UI concerns. Navigation, sub-navigation, drop-downs, buttons, links, windows, rounded corners, shadowing, error messages, alerts, updates, checkboxes, and so on. And then a list of what belongs under UX. People, happiness, solving problems, understanding needs, love, efficiency, entertainment, pleasure, delight, smiles, soul, etc., etc., there's quite a difference between these lists, right? And of course, it's important to design effective navigation menus and beautiful buttons. And the decision whether to use rounded corners or not, or exactly which shade of color to use can have significant implications. But it's most important to remember why we are designing in the first place. To remember that in the end, our work will affect the lives of people. So you can think about user interface design as part of the greater user experience design universe. I would argue that UI is the visual manifestation of UX thinking. And it's important to understand that there are many other concerns that have to be considered to design an effective and successful user experience. And many of these concerns will also be part of this course. We established that user experience design is at its heart user-centric. Your main goal is to make decisions that will benefit your users. That's often easier said than done, and it requires that you know a few things. Who are your users anyway, and what do they need? Two key questions that you will want to answer very early in the design process for every project. And sometimes the goal for your users are in direct opposition to other constraints. What about the client's needs, for example? To illustrate this, think about a website like Facebook. Most people probably use the site to catch up with their friends. Facebook's number one goal as a for-profit company, on the other hand, is to show as many ads as possible in order to generate income. A big challenge for them 
is to show ads without annoying the user, or better yet, figure out a way to show the most relevant ads so that users perceive them as beneficial and not evasive. So when we're talking about user-centric design, we're also talking about the need to understand humans. As user experience designers, we need to take the anatomy, psychology, and behavior of users into account at every step of the design process. Now, some of this goes well beyond the scope of this course. We'll leave it to anthropologists, psychologists, and sociologists to study the human condition. But here are just a few examples to show you how an understanding of these disciplines can help UX designers. How does human anatomy influence the way we interact with technology? Say, if you're holding a mobile phone in your right hand, which areas of the screen are easiest or hardest to reach with your thumb? As you can see here, the bottom right corner is a lot easier to reach than the top left corner. And there is an even more fundamental question. Which hand do most people use to hold their phone? Does it matter if they are right or left-handed? How big does a button need to be in order for us to comfortably click or touch it? How large should text be for a comfortable reading experience? What about people that can't distinguish between certain colors? How many things can we concentrate on at once? Turns out that basic human psychology tells us this number is about seven items. And that fact should have implications on how we design menu systems. Another question, how does color affect our mood? In terms of user behavior, which device are people using at which time of the day? What messages make people more likely to say yes to an offer? Or what makes us want to click on things? Again, these are just a few examples of how an understanding of human abilities and limitations can help us design successful user experiences. So now we have a definition for the term user experience. We also discussed the difference between UX and UI, and we talked about the importance of user-centric design. In the next lesson, we will look at a summary of the UX process that will guide us through the rest of this course sequence. This lesson will provide a brief overview about the entire UX process that we will be following in this course. This is, by the way, also the process that I follow when I work on my own web design projects. So I'm definitely teaching you what I practice every day. I want to start, though, by contemplating what your design process could look like if you just jumped right in without much of a structured methodology. Let's say you have a client who needs a website and you're like, great. I'll just need some content and I'll get started on the homepage design right away. I'll be honest, when I started out as a web designer, this scenario wasn't all that far from what I would be doing. Needless to say, this way of working wasn't ideal, and once I started to implement a more structured process, my projects turned out to be much more successful and I had a much better time working on them. One of the main problems is that things can get out of hand quite quickly. To illustrate this, I'd like to point to an anecdote I found in an article from the website Smashing Magazine. The article is about the importance of an organized planning process. And the author begins this piece with an account of things going bad really quickly. It says, on day one, things are great. You've landed a new job, the client is excited, you're stoked, and the project will be great. First things first, you have to collect the main materials to begin the design. You send the client an email asking for what you need. On day two, you get the following, a TIFF logo and CMYK via email, a set of logo standards that include the RGB values via a separate email, a disk full of photos with meaningless names, a fax that labels the photos according to their file names, an email that lays out the top and second level navigation, a phone call that makes last minute changes to the navigation, an email with a doc attachment full of text. And on day three, you get an email that makes half of the junk you got yesterday obsolete. You're only three days in, and the project is already no fun. Clearly, no one likes working this way. You as the designer need a saner methodology so you can be productive and do great work. And quite frankly, the client deserves a saner process also. 
I actually believe that when clients seemingly do crazy things or they're being difficult, it's often because the designer has not properly educated the client to do the right thing. It's quite possible that your client has never been involved in a website design project before. They're looking for you as the expert to offer guidance and make the process productive and positive. So to summarize, here's why we need a structured, predefined process that we can follow for each web design project. You'll know exactly what to do next instead of just winging it. And you'll have a formalized methodology you can employ for every project in the future. And you can adjust it to fit your needs as you gain more experience. You keep the client involved and accountable. You'll also ensure that the project stays on track and on deadline. Your design choices are based on predefined goals and target audiences. This is in contrast to making decisions based solely on intuition. You'll figure out what you're building and what not. The second part is just as important as the first. So for example, knowing that your e-commerce size will not include payment processing because you want to launch quickly and payment processing can be quite complex, allows you to move forward with clarity and you can look for alternatives. So you might, for example, decide to use PayPal to accept payments. And lastly, you have a greater chance to stay sane and have fun. And I think that we all do better work when we have a positive working experience and when we have fun. Okay, now that I have hopefully convinced you that a structured process is important, it's finally time to talk about what that process actually looks like. The UX process as I follow it in my own practice and as I will teach it to you in this course sequence follows five main phases. Here they are, strategy, outline of scope, sitemap, wireframes, and visual mockups. We will cover each of these phases in detail, roughly one phase per week. And you will gain experience and a deeper understanding of each phase by practicing what you learn while working on a project that will span the duration of this course. I will introduce the project at the end of this week's lectures. For now, let me give you a quick overview of each phase. I will illustrate the deliveries for each phase with examples from a web design project that I have worked on. A few years ago, my company, Ye Brigade, was tasked to redesign the website for the Pasadena Conservatory of Music. And I'll use this project's process as an example. One last note though. I have to give some credit to an influential book called The Elements of User Experience by Jesse James Garrett. I was exposed to a lot of the concepts that I'm teaching in this course for the first time while reading this book many years ago. In fact, the book has been one of the top influential texts for the web design community. Our process starts with a strategy phase. Here, we are asking a lot of fundamental questions, like what are our goals? Who are our users? What are their needs? Here are some pages from a large strategy document that we prepared for the Pasadena Conservatory. You see that we defined objectives for the site and determined who our users are. We also performed an exercise to figure out what voice our website would use if it was a human being. The strategy phase also includes visual research. So we look closely at a lot of websites of other music schools and educational and nonprofit organizations. The next phase is to create an outline of scope. This is basically a list of content and functionality that needs to be included in the site to fulfill the goals set up in the strategy phase. Next up is the sitemap. Here the content and functionality from the previous phase is structured into a cohesive whole. Here we also determine the navigational structure of the site and we'll make sure to use precise labels for the navigation categories. Speaking of labeling things, for the Pasadena Conservatory side, we spent a lot of time discussing the terms for children and for adults. We knew that it was important to have separate landing pages for younger and older students, but we also realized that using the term children is not ideal for teenagers. But we didn't want to create three different landing pages for children, teens, and adults. Another solution we contemplated was to name the first section for children and teens, but that seemed too clunky. In the end, we decided to stick with children and adults, which, though not perfect, seemed to be the best compromise. The fourth phase is about creating wireframes. Here our focus shifts from the site as a whole to individual web pages. 
Wireframes are simple sketches of the structural makeup of a web page. You can see here, for example, wireframes for the home page on the left and the for children landing page on the right. And each of these pages was marked up to address small and large screens. Here are wireframes to show how we imagine the navigation menus to work on big and small screens. You'll notice that higher level concerns such as which typefaces we will use and which images and which colors are not addressed here at all. You can think about wireframes kind of like architectural blueprints. They show what goes where without getting hung up on finer design details. And then lastly, we have the visual mockup phase. Now it's finally time to determine the visual identity of the website. For graphic designers, this is obviously the funnest part of the process. You get to think about colors and typefaces, you'll figure out how images are treated, Maybe you create textures or icons or illustrations. You can see here that we worked on the visual mockups for the Pasadena Conservatory in Adobe Illustrator. I like that tool since it's easy to create multiple artboards to investigate different design options. Other designers like the application Sketch, or others use Photoshop or Adobe XD. So that's it. These five steps will form the structure of our process in this course sequence. You will learn about these steps in the following weeks, and you will use them for the class project I will assign soon. And hopefully, you will use these tools in your web design work after you complete the course. There are a few additional things I want to point out in conjunction with these five UX phases. I think that it's helpful to realize that the concerns you're addressing in each of these steps shift over time. At first, you're dealing with very abstract matters, and along the way, things become more and more concrete. You could also say that in the beginning phases, you're not at all concerned about the final shape of the site. When you contemplate your goals and your users and the strategy phase, it doesn't really matter yet what kind of grid your pages will eventually have or if your background color will be yellow, or if you will employ a sans serif versus a serif typeface. Such decisions, which very much determine the final shape of the site, are addressed in later phases of the UX design process. By the way, one realization in the initial strategy phase might be that you shouldn't be building a website at all. Maybe you realize that a printed piece or a video are much better suited to fulfill the goals of the project. Again, in the beginning of the project, the shape of the final product is wide open. Also, you'll notice that so far, I've been talking about this process in a very linear fashion. In this diagram, one project phase neatly flows into the next. The reality, however, is often a little bit more messy. In fact, it's often important to reevaluate decisions made earlier as new realities become clear to you. There should be flexibility to change decisions made during an earlier phase that later turn out to be untenable. That doesn't mean that you should change your target audience or your main goals at the very end of the project. That would probably mean that the process has failed you. But you might, for example, realize that your wireframes need some adjusting as you work on the visual mockups. So the last question that you might wonder is what happens after the visual mockup phase? Well, then it's time to actually build the website, which means coding it that it can be displayed in a web browser. Or if you're working on an app, it needs to be coded so it can work on a mobile device. In a later class, I will be talking about the coding languages that make websites work, namely HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And I will address the question if it's important as a web designer to know how to code. I myself have a deep background in coding and after the visual mockups are completed, I will myself start coding the website I designed. But you might collaborate with a programmer who will code the site. In any event, after the development, there would be a testing phase, and after that, the site would launch. So to complete the story of the Pasadena Conservatory of Music website, here is how the site launched a few years ago. And this is what the website looks like today as I'm recording this video. Let me speak quickly about two terms that you might have heard about. Or if you haven't, you'll probably hear about them soon as you deepen your knowledge of user experience design. 
The terms are waterfall and agile, and they represent two different approaches to UX. There's actually quite a bit of discussion, argument, and controversy about these terms. There are factions and turf wars, and it's all pretty fascinating. And once you've had a bit of experience as a UX designer, you'll probably want to join a side of the argument yourself. So what do these terms actually mean? The waterfall approach is a more traditional way of developing websites and apps. Remember all the phases we talked about in the previous lesson? I explained how each phase is built upon the previous one. And although there can and should be some overlap, it's still a fairly sequential process. One phase follows the next, and in the end, there's a big launch. It's just like a waterfall, where the water starts at the top and plunges down in a rather linear fashion. Hence the name. For many smaller websites, this process makes a lot of sense. You complete the UX process, then you develop, test, and launch. There might be smaller changes here and there, but the development of the project is completed. Using such a process for big and complex projects, however, can be treacherous. It's tempting to want to get everything completely right before showing your site or app to the world. Working with a waterfall process can mean years of development before your project sees the light of day. And since nothing is tested until late in the process, chances are pretty high that the project went down the wrong path and the final product has serious flaws that cannot be easily corrected. And by now, lots of time and money has already been spent. That's where an agile process offers an advantage. To stay with the water metaphor, you can think of agile more like the wheel of a water mill. The agile process is circular and iterative. Instead of planning for one big launch at the very end of a long process, there will be many launches along the way. The goal is not to get everything exactly right the first time, but to get something in front of a user as quickly as possible. This way, ideas can be tested by getting actual user feedback and the product can be shaped over time. With the Agile process, the product is never really done. Instead, there is an ever-evolving process that includes cycles of user experience design, development, testing, and launch. In Silicon Valley speak, people often talk about MVP. And no, this has nothing to do with the most valuable player, in the UX world, this acronym stands for Minimum Viable Product. And it means that companies should focus on all the aspects of a product that are absolutely vital. Everything else is secondary and can be added later, after the initial launch. To be sure, a lot of startup companies pride themselves using an agile development process. And for many apps and web apps, that makes absolute sense. Think about Gmail or Facebook or Instagram, for example, or Uber or Airbnb or Amazon. These sites and services are constantly being developed and they constantly change. They are on a never-ending development cycle and they are never really completed. And their current incarnation compared to what they were when they first launched is quite different. So where does this leave us and this course? Well, we'll be looking at things through more of a waterfall -y lens. Since many of you will be confronted with the UX process for the very first time, we'll talk about each phase one at a time sequentially, roughly one per week. Once you complete this course sequence, however, you should have enough background in UX methodology that you will be able to join an Agile team without problems. Remember, there will always be more to learn. For now, you should just know these terms, waterfall and Agile and keep your ears sharpened when you hear other people voice their opinions about the pros and cons of each. Websites and apps seem at the surface quite similar to each other, and they do have a lot in common. Each is an interactive medium that is accessed on a digital device. They also share many fundamental usability patterns such as scrolling and the ability to click or tap on things to navigate. Yet differences between apps and websites do exist and I find that people often have a hard time understanding what these differences are. And for you as a UX designer, it's important to understand the advantages and disadvantages of these mediums. You will likely encounter clients that want to know your opinion whether they should develop an app or a website. Just to be clear, you understand what I mean when I say website and app. 
A website is accessed through a browser via a website address or URL. An app, on the other hand, is downloaded and installed onto a device. If you have an iPhone or an iPad, you would use the Apple App Store. If you are on an Android device, you would download apps from Google Play. What other differences are there between websites and apps? Websites, at least if they are coded correctly as a responsive website, are malleable enough to work on any operating system, any device, any screen size, and any browser. So you can easily go to, let's say, www.google.com, no matter if you are on a Mac computer or a Windows PC, or you can be on an iPhone or an Android phone, even a Kindle comes through the web browser. And it doesn't matter if you have a really small screen like a phone or a medium screen like a tablet or a giant desktop computer screen. And it doesn't really matter if you use Google Chrome as your browser or Safari or Firefox or Microsoft Edge. Now, apps are quite the opposites. Apps are native to the specific device they are running on. So if you are developing an app, you must create one version for iPhones and another version for Android phones and yet another version for Windows phones and so on. I would also argue that the web is a very democratic medium. Its open source nature allows users to have a lot of control over what to do with the content of websites they visit. They can highlight text and copy it, for example. They can download images from a website. They can even install a browser extension to change the way a website appears and functions. For example, you can use an ad blocker to remove advertisements automatically from a website. The functionality of apps, on the other hand, is mostly restricted to what the app designer intended. I'm personally very excited about the medium of the web because it is such an open and democratic medium. I also enjoy the challenge of designing websites that work well on any screen size. Still, there are pros and cons for each, so let's go through some of them. Here is the case for apps. Apps can have a much better integration into the operating system. An app on your phone can have access to any special device capabilities like the camera flash, for example, or the microphone, or the peer-to-peer -peer Bluetooth connectivity. For security reasons, access for websites to many of these advanced tools is limited. Also, for apps, no extra UI from the browser gets in the way. Think about the back and forward buttons that a web browser constantly displays. Apps are not handicapped by certain browser limitations either. App developers can sometimes create certain user interface solutions that are just not possible in web browsers. If the goal for your project is to create revenue, apps can have an advantage. You can sell your app through an app store. They don't have to be free. Also, in-app purchases are quite easy and streamlined because smartphone users will already have entered their credit card information when they set up their phone. And there's prestige. Apps can be perceived as cooler and sexier than websites. But there is a case against apps as well. Users need to download and install an app in the first place. That's a lot to ask from a user. It doesn't make sense, for example, to install an app for a cafe, let's say, just to find out what their opening times are. There are gatekeepers, the Apples, Googles, and Microsofts of this world, it can even happen that your app is not approved. Apps are also quite expensive to develop. And remember that you'll need a separate app for each device and operating system. So websites have a few things going for them. For one, they are easy to access. You just enter a web address in your browser and the site loads. There's no need to install anything. We already talked about websites working across all devices, platforms, and screen sizes. Since the web is built upon the idea of addresses and links, you can easily bookmark a web page or send it to a friend. For content that needs to be found in a search engine, a website is a better way to go. Websites are also more economical to develop. HTML and CSS are pretty easy to learn and all you need is a hosting account and a website address, which are easy to obtain. And here are some drawbacks. 
Capabilities of websites are directly related to the capabilities of web browsers. So our websites will only be as good as the browsers that display them. Websites are also harder to monetize. Their open nature just makes it hard to control content, and there's a certain sense that web content just wants to be free, so users can seem reluctant to pay for it. Lastly, there can be security issues. Since there aren't any gatekeepers for the web, it's much more of a wild west place with some pretty dark corners. I want to share a curious historical footnote. This is a Wired magazine cover from 2010. The web is dead, it boldly proclaims. At the time, it seemed like apps would replace websites entirely. That of course has not happened, and with better browsers and better web standards, the web has had quite a resurgence since then. The question of apps versus web is probably not even an either-or proposition these days. You'll notice that many companies have a website and an app. But the bottom line might be this. Everyone needs a website, not everyone needs an app. I have already mentioned that in this course, we are primarily looking at user experience design through the prism of designing websites. But rest assured that many of the tools and techniques you will learn here are applicable for designing apps as well. Alison? Bradley? Hello. You are here to talk about your project that the Coursera students will also complete. You've already completed it and we'll talk about every single project step that you've gone through and get some insight into your thought process, what you've learned along the way so that the students can learn from you. Cool. Alison, cool. tell us about your project idea. Okay, so my restaurant idea uh, was peachy pasta and it was going to be a fresh take on Italian classics for office parties and business meetings uh, and it would be a sophisticated catering experience for uh, employees uh, and their clients. So my main target audience uh, was catering for businesses and offices in Santa Clarita, California. And Santa Clarita is right around here where CalArts is. Yeah. yeah. Suburban. Yeah. So you know the area. Yeah. yeah. I, I've been here for four years, so I kind of <laughs> get the lay of the land and uh, what the culture is like up here. Uh, and so it would be more of an upscale catering service for these offices and businesses. Since it was customizable pasta, I wanted to do uh, customizable salads, uh, pastas, and wine and drinks. Those are the customization options. Yes. Yeah. Pichy pasta? What about the name? It's uh, cute. <laughs> I thought it was a nice alliteration. Uh, peachy is a type of pasta um, that we would cater to mm -hmm. them. Uh, and I thought it rolls off the tongue nicely. Yeah. It does. It's good. It does, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Other ideas that you didn't go with? What were those? Um, so before I was thinking about doing uh, affordable, customizable salads for senior citizens in Toledo, Washington. But I had never been there, and I wouldn't know the audience too well for yeah. that. It's a nice challenge, right? How do you do something for rather old people? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you felt like it was a little bit too far from your comfort yeah. zone? I felt like I didn't really know the context of the situation. And then my other idea was to do customizable smoothies for uh, Los Angeles Silver Lake parents. Kind um, of a hip area in Los Angeles. Yeah, yeah like very a like cool a hipster, parents. cool yeah. the vibe. Uh, but I think it would have been less challenging and less interesting for me to take on as like in, instead of doing like a corporate yeah. pasta project. Which is challenging because corporate isn't necessarily, doesn't come with fun and cool baked in, right? You're going to yeah. have to figure out. Yeah. You know, like, yeah, office vibe. Yeah. yeah. But you're planning to make it cool still and cool and fun. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's the challenge. Cool. All right, Bradley. Yeah, I did a, a poke, mm -hmm. poke ordering system called Poke Fresh. So it would take place, or it would be in Westwood, California, which is around UCLA. And my urban, little, urban environment. Urban environment, yeah. And my little elevator pitch is inspired by authentic Hawaiian poke. We bring authentic, high quality, and affordable poke to Westwood Village. We're only open from sunset to sunrise. So yeah, since it's only open from sunset to sunrise. I was thinking the target audience would be like either late night party goers or like people that stay up late to study. So mm -hmm. like two different groups of people that go to college. And also I know the area well. I have like a lot of friends that went there. So yeah. I know that they would probably use it for sure. 
Um, so yeah, it's like customization based. You would have your base, which would be like white rice, brown rice, salad, or like a mix. You'd have your protein, so you know, poke has fish. It's kind of like a sushi salad almost from Hawaii. So you'd have your tuna, albacore, all that kind of stuff. Like a sauce, like a ponzu, sides, so your crab meat, seaweed, and then toppings like onion or uh, carrot. And, and, ginger. Yeah. and your customers would be able to go through it and yeah, choose they, exactly what they wanted on their bowl. Yeah, they could customize it however they want. So, My other ideas earlier were like either a bento box place in Hong Kong for like latchkey kids. So kids that are home a lot and their parents are gone. Um, but I'm not familiar with that lifestyle at all. Like I don't know anything about that. But you had a fun name. Be yeah, bento bib would be yeah, the name. Nice. But also I thought of like uh, an ice cream parlor in Ann Arbor, Michigan called Hastings. I thought it sounded like it could actually be a real place, but I think the logistics of how you deliver ice cream would be kind of difficult. Yeah, how do you get it to yeah, people it might melt melting. on the way there. Yeah, yeah, it's <laughs> kind of humid in Michigan too, so um, <laughs> you never know. And then also a pizza place in Williamsburg. Um, That's in New York? Yeah, Brooklyn, New York. Um, like a hip place called like Bodai Za, so it'd be kind of like a vegan, pricey, like, you know, vegan cool. pizza thing vegan yeah pizza. but there's already too many places that deliver pizza yeah you know, had so you been to I, before? I, yeah i've been there okay. but i think like it's just it's too expected almost but in general i guess we could say for the casera students to pick something that you're familiar with is helpful yeah yeah and i guess it was helpful for you guys westwood so it was in the area you know santa clarita suburban and you yours is just what a half an hour away from yeah, here no, and you've yeah. been there but since you have to put yourself into the shoes of the clients, because mm -hmm. you're not working with a you know, third party that can tell you, you know, mm -hmm. what's going on in, in Hong Kong or in, in Ann Arbor, Michigan, right. um, it's helpful to know the area for this project. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, to get like the vibe too, you yeah. know, like what who you're, you know, catering to. Yeah. 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 Cool. Seems like exciting project. So. Sweet. Cool. Let's see what happens. <laughs> cool. Welcome back, everyone. I hope that you all came up with exciting ideas for your projects. This week is all about strategy. We will talk about how to conduct research in the beginning of a project, and I will tell you about the importance of defining a target audience for your website. We'll also discuss how to determine user needs and client needs. The strategy that you develop in this first step of the UX process will influence all decisions you make further down the line. That's why it's so important to take the time and think about what you want to accomplish, what the goals are, and how they might be measured when the project launches. As a bonus, you'll get to watch my interview with Craig Cook, founder and CEO of the digital marketing agency Rhythm. Craig was actually my web design teacher way back in the year 2000, and he hired me for my first job as a designer. Our conversation is centered around the importance of strategy as part of the UX process. In the previous week, we established the centrality of the user in our design process. In this video, I want to discuss a few research tools that can help you figuring out how your users think and behave. Now, with big stakes and big budgets come a lot of fancy tools to research user behavior. Imagine, for example, the effort of creating a new version of the Mac OS or Windows operating systems. The fact that both of these systems combined probably touch almost everyone in the world makes the stakes for such projects quite high. It can be assumed that Apple and Microsoft spend a lot of resources on scientifically studying how users interact with their software. Another high-stakes example is the website healthcare.gov, which sees millions of users trying to sign up for health insurance. Here's an example of eye-tracking experiments that were conducted for this website. On the left, you can see a heat map of where users' eyes spend the most amount of time. And on the right, you'll see the pathway a user's eyes traveled between different areas of focus. Now, I think this is really fascinating, but such tools are expensive and probably not available to you right now. As a matter of fact, they're not available for most smaller scale projects. But here's the thing you can still do some lower tech versions of user research yourself. Here are a few ideas. You can always start by using yourself as a test subject. 
and monitor your reactions to a website or app closely. Or ask a friend to visit a website and look over their shoulder. Interview a friend or a family member. Create a questionnaire and send it to a few people you know. Or use a third-party application. Later on in this course, I will show you a tool called TreeJack that offers a great way to test a navigational structure on actual users. You will explore some of these methods in more detail as the course progresses. The bottom line is that it's often helpful to ask actual users for their opinions and feedback. There are many complex and expensive ways to go about this, but with a little ingenuity and by tapping your network, you can get pretty far by yourself. In the beginning of a project, it is helpful to take some time to look around at what already exists in this world. That's an essential step in every designer's process. If you're designing a new logo, you look at other logos. If you're designing a new magazine, you go to a bookstore and look at a bunch of magazines. And if you're designing a new website, well, you should look at a lot of other websites. It's definitely helpful to look at the direct competition of whatever project you're working on. When my design studio worked on the new site for the Pasadena Conservatory of Music, we looked at the websites of a lot of other music schools. But we also looked more generally at schools and universities and nonprofits. When we started designing the site for the Marciano Art Foundation, a new art museum in Los Angeles, we looked at the websites of all art museums in Los Angeles and also comparable institutions nationwide. At the beginning of a project, it's also useful to ask your client what websites they like and why. You don't necessarily want to get into a position where you are asked to copy something that already exists, but it's good to have an understanding of what your client gravitates to and what they absolutely dislike. They will, after all, sign off on what you eventually design. Now, you might find that looking just at your direct competition isn't always all that inspiring. I would suggest that you also get inspiration by looking at the very best website design out there. And even more important, as a web designer, you should make it a point to be aware of what is happening in the web design industry at large. What are the most and recent cool and innovative websites? What are the trends? Who are the interesting makers and thinkers in our community? What technological innovations are happening? Here are a few recommendations of how to stay in the know. There are many showcase websites that collect the most outstanding examples of web design. The site Awards, and note what they're doing there with the three W's, is a great resource. It's a crowdsourced platform where users vote on designs submitted. The projects that get the highest scores get awarded honorable mentions, or site of the day, site of the month, or site of the year. You can browse the archives to find a lot of cool stuff. And I would even encourage you to create your own account and start judging some of the entries yourself. This will force you to look at a website critically to determine what scores for design, usability, creativity, and content you would give. Plus, it's kind of fun. Other showcase sites you should check out are Site Inspire, One Page Love, HTTP Stir, and the Webby Awards. There's really a whole lot of them, and these are just some suggestions. Another great way to stay informed is to follow the leaders of the web design industry and read what they have to say. You know, the people that write books or important blog posts or talk at conferences. Here are a few of the people that I really like and their Twitter handles. There are a few blogs that are tremendously helpful, inspiring, and influential. A List Apart, by the way, is one of the oldest web design blogs around. It just celebrated its 20th birthday. I find it super informative and an amazing resource. In fact, you will notice quite a few references to articles on this site in this course sequence. I also find it quite helpful to sign up for weekly web design email newsletters. Here are three great ones that distill the most current happenings in the web design world into a weekly digest. And if you're into podcasts, here are two that I really enjoy. The bottom line is this. 
There is a lot of information out there and much of it is free. You just have to go and get it. The sheer volume of all the resources can actually be quite overwhelming. It takes time and energy to keep up with a fast-moving industry, but it pays dividends to take the time to learn from other people. Of course, I probably don't have to preach this so hard to you. You are, after all, taking this course eager to learn. One of the best ways to get insight into user behavior is with actual data. If you are redesigning an existing site, chances are that you have access to visitor stats of the current site that can tell you an awful lot about your current users. The most common tool used to track user data is Google Analytics. It's enabled by placing a tiny bit of code onto every page of your site, which then captures user activity data for you to evaluate later. This allows you to find answers to questions like, how many people visit the site each day? As I mentioned, having actual hard data can be very powerful, but any data analyst will tell you that it's important to interpret data correctly. Otherwise, it can be a little bit like reading tea leaves. For example, if you found out that your site had 1,000 daily visitors, is that a lot or not? Does it mean the site is successful or not? If your goal for the site was to grow the amount of visitors to 100,000, it would be quite a failure. On the other hand, if your site only had 100 daily visitors in the past, this would present a tenfold increase. I think that website stats are best approached with specific questions in mind before you look at the data. Here are some example questions that are more specific. What percentage of my users visit the site on a mobile device? Or we ran a Facebook ad last week. Did this increase the amount of visitors? How many users still use Internet Explorer? Are my users mostly local or is there a sizable worldwide audience? Let's take a quick tour of Google Analytics so you can get an idea of how the interface works. We'll use as an example a website that my business partner Nicole and I created to showcase our favorite albums of the year. You can take a look at the website at favoritealbums2017.yebrigade.com. We worked hard to make it a fun, interactive experience. Now, when I log on to Google Analytics, I can find out a lot about the visitors of this site. I can see how many users are currently on this site. Right now there is just one, so that must be me. In fact, here you can see that the visitor is from Los Angeles. So yeah, it's me. You can also see how many visitors came to the site over time. Here are the stats for the last week. Or I can look at the last 30 days. Or a custom time period. You can see the site launched in late December. You can also see the total amount of visitors and how long they stayed on the site. I'd say the average interaction with the site of almost two minutes is pretty good. If it was only a few seconds, I would be worried that the site is not really working at all. So what are some specific questions I could ask? Here's one. We entered the site in some design competitions. Did this make a difference? Let's go to acquisition. You see that about three quarters of visitors came to the site by clicking a link on another site. We can explore this further. Now you see a list of the top referral sources. I can switch to a pie chart view. And it's obvious that over 92% of these referrals came from two sites, awards and one page love, exactly the sites whose competitions we entered. So to answer my question, Yes, it did make a difference that we entered the site in design competitions. That's helpful information for the future. Here's another question. I know that because of the experimental nature of the site, it works best on a desktop computer with a mouse and not so well on a mobile device. So the question is, do we have a lot of mobile viewers? Should we spend the resources to make the mobile experience better? I can click on Audience, Mobile, and I find out that almost 95% of all visitors were on a desktop computer. So we probably don't have to worry too much about this issue. You probably agree that Google Analytics is a really powerful and complex tool. 
It would probably take an entire course all by itself if you wanted to learn all of its capabilities. In fact, Google offers detailed free courses to learn more about their products. But finding out a few fundamental facts about your site's visitors isn't too difficult. Just remember, having a lot of data is worth very little if you don't interpret them correctly. And in order to interpret data, you need to start with specific questions that you'd like to be answered. What are your site's user needs and client needs? These are two fundamental questions to ask and answer in order to base your design decisions on a solid foundation. So ask yourself, what does the user need from the site? And what are the needs and goals of the client? If you think about it, if we don't know the answers to these questions, we don't really know what to build in the first place. All other decisions we make from here on out will be determined by these requirements. By the way, let me make sure that everyone understands what I mean when I say user and client. Users are the people that will access the sites. You can also think about them as visitors or customers or the target audience. And if it's helpful, you can think of their needs as visitor needs or customer needs or target audience needs. The client is the business owner or the director of an organization. It's the person in charge, the one who hired you to design their website. The client might be your customer, but they are not the customer of the website you will create. You can also think of the client needs as business needs or, more generally, website needs. Of course, you might not be working with the boss directly. That really depends on the size of the business or organization. Your primary day-to-day -day contact might be an assistant or the marketing department. By the way, an added difficulty for students at this point is that student projects often don't have an actual client. It's true that for the project in this course sequence, I gave you a general project brief, but you came up with a specific idea for your project, so you yourself had to play the part of the client. That can make certain aspects a little easier. You don't have to deal with a client who might disagree with your decisions. But it takes away some of the real-world complications projects inevitably have. But that's okay. If you in fact become a web designer, you will have lots of opportunities to gain real-world experience in working with actual clients. But now back to our discussion of user needs and client needs. What's important at this point is that these needs are stated clearly and in detail so that there's no room for confusion or ambiguity for you or the client. Everyone needs to be on the same page. That's why you will summarize your findings in a written strategy document at the end of this project phase. Also, stay away from overly broad statements. Making money as a client need is nice, but it's way too vague. A more specific rephrasing could be, investigate how to use ads in order to grow revenue, or implement search engine optimization so that more people will find the site and purchase products, or Communicate the advantages of the pro plan better so that more users will become paying members. Prevent using tired cliches. Every user wants a site that is easy to navigate, for example, so it's not really a distinguishing need. By the same token, don't identify needs that are too narrow. Your client might love yellow backgrounds, but at this point it's way too early for such decisions. A need could be for the site to create a feeling of urgency and energy. Later on, you might then decide that a vibrant yellow background fulfills this need. But again, that is a decision for a later phase. In general, at this point in the process, you should simply identify all the needs without having to come up with solutions. Keep things open and loose. Even though the client might tell you with utmost urgency, we definitely need a blog, your job is to probe such statements a little deeper by asking why. Maybe the client's goal is to have a place for news on their site, or they are looking for an outlet to share their professional writing, or the site's search engine ranking needs to be improved. All these could be good reasons for a blog, but again, you can decide on that later. Plus, you might actually discover that the client simply likes the idea of a blog, everyone else has one, right? And that they're not aware of the amount of work it will take to constantly create new blog content. Now, most of the time, user needs will align nicely with client needs. 
For example, take a site that sells books. Users of that site obviously want to buy books and the client who owns the site wants to increase the amount of orders. Same with a website that offers online classes. Users come to the site to learn and the client wants to enroll as many students as possible. And a news website, let's say, is visited by users looking for interesting and informative writing while the client wants to have as many page hits as possible. But there are instances when user and client needs don't line up so neatly, when they are in fact opposing one another. Here are a few examples. A reader of an online newspaper wants to read articles in peace, but the client, the owner of the newspaper, needs to show ads for their business model to be sustainable. There's a tension between these needs as ads can get in the way of a pleasant reading experience. Or isn't it nice when websites offer the option to check out as a guest? It's more simple for the user. They don't need to think of yet another password, but the client might have specific reasons for user accounts to be mandatory. Here's another big one. Users often want the option to talk to a human being to have their questions answered and issues resolved. So their need is to find a phone number on the website. It's in the client's interest, however, to limit the amount of time support staff spends on the phone. They will save money this way. So their opposing need is to design a website that answers customer questions without them having to pick up the phone. When you're working on a real world project with an actual client, it's likely that the client will be very eager to communicate their needs to you. But it's the actual user of the site that is sometimes forgotten along the way. It's your job as a designer to be an advocate for them and to remind your client that an effective user experience must be centered around an understanding of user needs. So let's finish up the segment with an example. Here are the user and client needs that we identified while working with the Pasadena Conservatory on their site. I invite you to pause the video for a moment and to read through the lists in detail. In the last video, we established that you can simply have a discussion with your client in order to uncover the client's needs. In order to understand your user's needs, however, you must determine who they are. Who are the people that will eventually use your website? You have to define your target audience. In UX speak, this is also called user segmentation, and there are different ways to categorize your users into separate groups. I will introduce four methods in this video. We will discuss segmentation by user roles, demographics, psychographics, and experience. When you define your target audience by roles, you are isolating specific groups of people that share similar goals. So on a job side, one user role would be that of the job seeker. And these people who are looking for jobs share specific user needs that must be addressed. For example, they probably need a search function with an advanced set of filters to find jobs based on their skill sets. And there would be a whole other group, that of the job lister, with their own needs. They, for example, need an interface to be able to add jobs to the site. Or think about any social media website like Facebook, LinkedIn, or Twitter. There's a big difference in user needs between those who have already signed up and those who don't have an account yet. And for a school or university website, let's say, you will have a natural segmentation of users into the roles of parents, students, and faculty. And users of each of these groups, again, will have specific needs that must be addressed. Another way of defining your target audience is to look at basic statistical data, such as gender, age, education, marital status, income, and location. Depending on the specific projects you are working on, some of these demographic properties can be more important than others. Gender might often not matter that much, unless you're working on a dating site, let's say, or a site for beauty products, or a fashion site. Age might be an important distinction if your site is for a preschool, then you'd probably be targeting parents between, say, 25 and 45. And if your site sells hearing aids, 
chances are that you will have a sizable audience of older folks. Let's look at what a demographic example could look like. Your site could target middle-aged single females who are well-educated with a middle-class income and who live in an urban metropolis. Or a very different target audience for a different website would be this one. Teenage boys who dropped out of high school, have limited financial means, and live in a rural environment in the American Midwest. I'm sure it's not a big stretch to imagine that the decisions you make later on in the process, such as what content and features to include, what language to use, and what visual identity to design, would be quite different depending on which of these two example audiences your site targets. While demographics define basic objective facts, there's another way of segmenting users which addresses personal values and interests. These are called psychographics. Think about people's personalities and attitudes and lifestyles and hobbies. Let's look at examples of two specific psychographic profiles. Let's say the first is politically liberal, vegetarian, environmentally conscious and politically active. They are likely to have a flock of backyard chickens and they are very interested in do-it-yourself projects. Another group seems to be quite the opposite. They are politically conservative, drive gas-guzzling cars, and they own guns for hunting. But this group also owns chickens, and they are interested in DIY projects. I have actually worked on a website that counts both of these possible user groups, as different as they might seem, as part of their target audience. I'm talking about the blog Root Simple, written by Kelly Coyne and Eric Knudsen, who provide their readers with a lot of instructions on DIY homestead projects, like building chicken coops and baking bread and growing vegetables. One thing to point out is that while demographics certainly influence psychographics, they do not predefine them. So while it's pretty likely that you will find more vegetarian liberals in urban areas on the west coast of the United States, and more gun-toting conservatives in rural Texas, there are definitely exceptions. Lastly, you can also segment your users by their level of experience with your site's subject matter. Let's say you're working on a site that will display financial information about the stock market. Now, is your target audience seasoned stock market pros or people that are just starting out to invest? In other words, is your site for experts or newbies? Or do you intend to target both groups? Or you might design a site that advocates for a political cause. Some of your users might be diehard supporters already. Others might be persuadable to become supporters. These two different audiences will have different needs. Let's finish again with an example. Here are the target audiences we defined for the Pasadena Conservatory, separated into user roles, demographics, and their experience. Under user roles, we identified students, parents, concert goers, funders, and faculty. The demographic segmentation was mostly concentrated on age and location, so we have children, teenagers, and adults. And since the school is located in Pasadena, the target audience lives there or in the greater Los Angeles area. And for experience, there is a difference between prospective students and those students that are already enrolled. Note that we didn't create a separate psychographic profile, as we didn't see that as a necessity for this project. Remember, there's no reason to include things that don't provide you with meaningful information. Before we wrap up this video, I'll briefly mention another tool that can assist you with keeping your focus on the target audience throughout the design process. User personas are short imaginary biographies of people who embody representative members of your target audience. You basically make up fictional characters, who will be used as stand-ins for a larger user group. You give them a name and even a portrait photo. This allows you to breathe life into dull statistics. And you are able to refer to your target audience by name when you are trying to decide something. You can ask, I wonder what Mike would think of this, or would Jen do this or something else? There's a reading included in this lesson that will explain user personas in greater detail. In the end of the strategy phase, you should summarize all your findings in a strategy document and share it with your client and your team. You will have figured out the needs of your users and your clients, and you will have a deeper understanding about your target audience. 
The strategy document is also a good place to note other research that you have conducted, such as a roundup of similar and inspirational websites and any insight from analytics data. With all of this in place, you'll be in a good position to move on to the next phase, when this strategic information is translated into requirements for content and functionality. All right, we're back talking about strategy this week. So we'll talk about target audience, personas, client needs, and user needs. Alison, let's start, let's start with you. Uh, you are doing an upscale Italian food catering business, uh, catering for businesses too, in suburban Santa Clarita. Tell us a little bit more about your target audience. Yeah, so for the roles that I was thinking of uh, that would encounter with my uh, catering business were office assistants who would place the order, uh, executive positions that would be the decision maker and would see the website, uh, and business owners who would uh, might be doing both of those things. Uh, placing the order directly. Placing the order directly. But also being able to make the decision. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and so I was thinking for demographics, uh, it might be somewhat more women than men. Um, education would probably be college education or higher. Um, the occupations would be office managers, secretaries, administrators, and small business owners. Uh, and I was thinking that this would, the target age range would be somewhere from early 30s to upper 60s. The people that are working, maybe not like right out of college, but yeah. you know, someone that's gotten up the ranks a little bit. Seasoned in their careers. Uh, and the location was a suburban Santa Clarita area. Right. In terms of your psychographics? Um, so in terms of psychographics, uh, for personality and attitudes, I was thinking professional, classy, and attention to detail. Uh, and their values will probably be moderately conservative. Why is that? Uh, just based <laughs> on the political demographics of this area, and yeah, I think also sure. possibly the age range. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they probably value safety and also team building. Uh, and in terms of lifestyles, probably very family oriented, probably the type of people that would want to take their family on vacations and go to Dodgers games in <laughs> LA. Yeah. So some of this is, um, you know, you're assuming some yeah. things, right? And there would probably be people that are liberal uh, and, you know, Definitely. maybe really young and, you know, yeah, they absolutely. don't like, they don't have a family, but it doesn't, you know, mean that, that is, you know, your core audience kind of can be described in those terms. Yeah. Cool. Let's, yeah, let's go on to the uh, user personas. We have them here. Yeah, so in terms of user personas, I tried to get, match it up with the roles that I set in my target audience. Uh, so Rachel Hernandez is an office manager. Uh, and she loves throwing holiday parties for the office and treats her coworkers like a second family. Uh, and then I had Ethan Pang, who was a business owner for uh, a small marketing startup here in Santa Clarita. So the office would probably be around like 20, 20 ish uh, workers. Uh, and I imagine that he would like to impress uh, the bigger clients during meetings uh, and accounts and to do uh, grand project wrap ups just to kind of like impress his clients. And then my third person was Michelle Sage, who is a nonprofit communications director. Um, and she organizes and plans events to raise money and donations for nonprofits in San Clarita during the holiday season. And again, these people don't exist, do they? No, these are all people you made that them I up. made up. Uh, but based around research that I did about yeah. San Clarita. Yeah, like the area and stuff. Yeah. yeah. And you went into some of them quite in detail, right? And, um, you know, so a bachelor in communications from CSUN, like very specific, mm -hmm. but you just kind of gave them a life of their own so that you, they're believable. Yeah, I wanted to flush them out so I could imagine seeing them actually clicking through the yeah. website and how they would maybe react. Yeah. And who are these, who are these people in the pictures? Uh, these are people that I found online on uh, Unsplash. Yeah, let's look at that a little bit because uh, that might be a question for many pictures, right? For, yeah. for students on Coursera, how do I get pictures that I'm able to um, use? So there's a website called Unsplash. Tell us a little bit about that. 
Yeah, so Unsplash is all uh, copyright free images that you can use on projects and you can just search up any like keywords or terms. So like I looked up like office manager. So, yeah. Yeah, it's also or like, business. It's also like good quality photos too. Yeah, and they're like all like curated. Is it? Yeah, yeah it they're seems, all curated. Yeah. So here are some office managers. Yeah. Or I don't know, images that are tagged as such. He's like having fun. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and they're Inside all free strategy. to use. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and they oh, oftentimes yeah. not, I mean, you know, granted, for office managers, you get some stocky uh, photography, but some of it is actually quite, doesn't feel like so stock photography. Yeah, like pretty yeah. usable, pretty good quality. Yeah. Cool. Good side, good side. Yeah. Let's move on to your, your user needs and client needs. So f yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so for my user needs, um, the website uh, needs to enable users to find out if the restaurant delivers to the area, um, order online, uh, if they can customize the catering for the event, schedule their event weeks in advance, uh, estimate how much it will cost for the event. Uh, and I thought it'd be helpful for them to see past order histories in order to help them plan for future events. Mm -hmm. uh, and also be able to contact someone with questions or issues about the order. Yeah, because that's, you know, this is, um it's not a, a business or a business model that you have for your website where you do one order and it's just and for lunch. It. it comes in half an hour and that's it. It's like something that you're planning for and the stakes are pretty high. Yeah. All right. So asking someone with questions, that's pretty important for something that you're throwing for your entire office. Mm -hmm. um, also the scheduling orders weeks in advance, I guess you're never going to schedule a catering order for this afternoon, right? So it's yeah. always, assembly time. And in terms of client needs? Yeah, and in terms of client needs, uh, it should be able to sell food online that will be delivered, uh, provide a system for order customization, appear professional and sophisticated, uh, communicate reliability and upscale. Sophistication, reliability, upscale. Let's yeah. Move on to you. So back to Poke Fresh, the Hawaiian poke restaurant in Westwood, California. Uh, so for target audience, you know, again, like late night partiers and late night. Because it's studiers. only open at night. Yeah. That's yes. your twist. Yeah, the twist. And also it's kind of the tension between partier and like the studious people at, on campus. Um, also poke lovers who are looking for affordable poke in the city. And also people who have never even eaten it before and are open to trying new foods. Uh, I would say those are kind of Because not everyone has eaten raw fish or poke True. before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind of yeah, it's like an intro to it. And as far as demographics go, yeah, 18 to 30 year olds, you know, a pretty young crowd, yeah. young area. Um, college students, also single people don't have to be, you know, just anyone Mostly. who's like living in the city in like yeah. kind of an urban environment. I mean, they might be married, but yeah. most of yeah. them aren't because they're still in college. Yeah, still so in college. we kind of know that. Yeah, limited income, it's like, you know, on the cheaper side and you know, in the city, yeah. basically. Right. And as far as psychographics go, probably adventurous, youthful, snarky, kind of like- What do you college. mean by snarky? I don't know, it's like college, you know, add it to like some tood, you know, possibly. <laughs> tood? Yeah. Um, and as far as like values go, you know, liberal, more open-minded people, you know, you know yeah. <laughs> I guess like unopen-minded people, it's kind of like, you know, yeah. maybe not exactly. It seems like there's like a, yeah. like a <laughs> yin and yang going, it's like young people, old people, yeah. liberal. Yeah, okay. it was just, um, and as far as interests go and like lifestyle, active people, people that like to hang out, you know, with friends and the studious and the partiers. Which can be on opposite sides of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But sometimes. But don't sometimes have to they're be. both. Yeah, sometimes not everyone's both. always, there's not that tension all the time. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so yeah, do you have some fun with your personas? I did. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking about, you know, who, who would go to UCLA and like, who are the two example students as far as the studious and the partier goes? So I was thinking of like Chad Glover, kind of like a 18 year old jock kind of guy, likes to party, you know, came to you know, UCLA because it's in California, kind of by the beach versus Jenna Sawyer, who's more studious. Stays up late studying versus Chad, who likes to party, has perfect GPA, um, likes to work hard. And then Arshia Zadeh, who's a foreign student, who's at UCLA for aerospace engineering, who's, you know, open to trying new things. Because he's never had poke. He's never had poke before versus Chad and Jetta, who may have, you know. 
Cool. So a wide range of yeah. students. So in, in general, like looking at your personas, they exemplify your you know main target audience. So for you, it made sense. You have these two like studio. Well, in, in a way, three, right? Someone yeah. who's never tried it, then someone who's kind of the partier, and someone who's the studious um, student. Um, yeah. So those are the ones you picked. Makes yeah. a lot of sense. Yeah. And now, going forward, you can say, like, what would Jenna say, you know? Yeah, exactly. Mysterious person. Yeah. If it ever comes up, a decision that is, you know, needs to be made, you can go back to these um, personas that are fake, but enable you to talk about your target audience in a specific way rather than a nebulous. Yeah, and yeah. I also feel like I know these people, too, you know, yeah. like knowing the, like, demographic. <laughs> yeah, <Chad. laughs> I definitely know a couple chads. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, also going on the strategy, user needs. I think the website would have to enable the user to find out if the restaurant delivers to their area. Definitely super important. Ordering food online, also pretty integral. Um, finding out if the restaurant is open. Customize the order or pick up from a list of favorite bowls. Be functional for the inebriated, so like big buttons, you know, easy yeah. to navigate. Because they know. might have been partying yeah, too hard. Yeah, who knows. Um, <laughs> Provide a solid mobile experience if most people access site from mobile device. So that's also really important. You know, you're on your phone, you know. Because this is not something you plan. It's like, yeah. it's two o'clock in the morning, I'm hungry, I want my food now. Right. Yeah. yeah. Different from Allison, yeah. where it's like, oh, in two months, yeah. it's Christmas. Yeah. You need to get some pasta for the crew. <laughs> yeah, it's super like on, the, you know, on time. Um, following the order after it's been placed, you can like watch your order since it's local. Because it's coming from Westwood yeah. Village to like UCLA. You and you want to know how much longer. Yeah, yeah, you want to know like where also to pick it up and stuff too. Um, and as far as the client needs goes, I think really the website needs to enable the client to sell the food online to be delivered. And also to provide a system for order customization, yeah. since that's such an important aspect. Uh, communicate fast service, definitely also important. Um, affordability and also to communicate freshness since we're talking, you know, raw fish. It needs to be right. pretty fresh. But That's also, like, concern. cool, fresh, too. Yeah, it needs to be okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and also, yeah, to explain what poke is to people who've never eaten it, since people might, right. might not be familiar. I think that's, you know, all those are pretty important things, so. And some of them are different from Allison's concerns, right? Yours, like, the question, is the restaurant open, the user need, is the restaurant open? You were scheduling it to, you know, months in advance, weeks in advance. For mm -hmm. you, it's like, is it open right now? Yeah. Right. And it, the question, and it's not open all the time. It's only open at night. At night yeah. mm -hmm. um, and then your the mobile experience. It could be said that maybe not that many people are going to do a catering order online uh, on, 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 on a mobile, mobile device. Not that it shouldn't yeah. work, but it's not the target technology. Yeah. yeah it's like like they'll be pure. they'll be at their office yeah. on a on an actual desktop computer. Um, cool. Yeah, whereas yours will be out yeah, about, like, uh, or like have an essay out on their laptop and they need to order on their yeah. phone. Yeah. So, question like, how do you come up with this information? Like, you know, the, you know, we, these these user needs, mm -hmm. these clients needs. What what's the strategy that you that you employ to get to this list? Like, why can you talk about that? Yeah, I mean, you kind of have to like think in the shoes of the client and then also as a person that might be using it, you know. And I think being familiar with the area is also important, like knowing the psychographics and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and So being, you know the kind of yeah. people, right, that would use it. Yeah, exactly. Like being familiar with the personas that you created and to think how they would probably think and break it down into very specific uh, steps. Mm -hmm. for so it's a lot of common sense in a way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, these are students. What are students like? Oh, students study, students party. That makes sense for my, and then you kind of go down the road and you then create, oh, if a student parties, then maybe they drink alcohol. So my website should probably work really well, even though you might be drunk. Yeah. yeah. So it's like a co co cause and effect. Yeah, there's certain right. challenges with certain people, you know, I guess. So on this question about how do you, you know, create these, um, these strategy um, properties, uh, looking, at your, looking at your target audience, there are certain properties that will directly translate into a need. So Bradley, for you, um, we were just talking about the um, the date like partier might might be drunk and then you have the need of you know you have to have a very clear mm -hmm. uh, simple navigation for people that might not be 
uh, that might might have drunk too much. But there are other things here on your list that say, uh, you know, they're single. Also, mm -hmm. does that translate into a specific need? Maybe, yeah. maybe not, yeah. right? And that's okay. Um, so I guess something to, to mention for the Coursera students is that not every um, piece that you write down for your target audience will necessarily translate into a user or a client need, but they might come in um, into play later down uh, right. in, the, in the process. It might influence something visual um, or they might influence the way the language works. On the on on the website, uh, what language to employ? You know, yours is actually snarky and youthful. Your your personality and attitude that yeah, comes so that in. Inform yeah, that informs decisions. some of the you know graphical language uh, later on in the project. Uh, and then lastly, there were a few client needs and user needs that you had, Bradley, that you uh, that we took out. Right. Right, there was one uh, you said to provide a clean, clean and easy access to website content, and we took that out, or you took that out because yeah, it just it seems like the inversion of that. It's like why would you even choose to do that? Yeah. You know, like a messy. Right, the inversion would be we want it to be messy and hard. Yeah. So like, which doesn't make sense for this yeah. prompt, you know? Yeah. Um, and then a user need you had had to have an easily viewable menu. It's the same, same, same thing. thing, yeah. Why, yeah. why would you make it not easily viewable? So yeah. you don't, in a way, you know, some things go without mm. saying. Without saying. Yeah. Yeah. Although when you're working with real clients, sometimes you know, they keep talking about, like, I want it to be easy, I want it to be easy, so maybe you put it on the list, you know, yeah. that they're happy, and it's like, oh, you know. But like most, I mean, I, I, there are not many uh, examples of websites where people go like, oh, I wanted to make really hard for the, for the, yeah, like an for the viewer. Menu or something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it doesn't come uh, across projects that much because I mean, that's what user experience design is about. It's like taking out the friction and making yeah. it easy for the user. It's kind of at the heart of the, the discipline. Yeah. All right. Hey everyone, I hope all is well and that your strategy explorations for your projects prove to be fruitful. By now you should have a pretty clear idea what your project will be about and who your target audience is. This week we will talk about how to take your user and client needs that you established and create a set of content and functionality requirements from them. In other words, you're transforming your overarching goals from last week into specific requirements for your site. As a bonus, you'll see my interview with Melissa Kuo, who is an interaction designer at Google. Melissa was my student at CalArts a few years back, and we'll talk about how she ended up at working at Google, the way Google approaches UX challenges, and about new trends in UX software tools. After learning how to define strategy in the lessons last week, our focus now shifts to determining the scope of our site. So that's the second step of the UX process. And remember the distinction of moving from very abstract concerns to more and more concrete concerns. I mentioned before that in the beginning of the process, we're not at all concerned with the final shape of the site. We're dealing with much more higher level questions instead. You could even argue that at this point in our process, at the beginning of the scope phase, we could be working on a brochure or a book or a video as our final deliverable instead of a website. In fact, one result of the previous strategy phase might be the realization that a website is not the right answer for the problems we're trying to solve. Be that as it may, this course is about website design, and the further we get along the UX process, the more we will be concerned with the final shape of our website. So, Let's jump into talking about scope. Here's a fancy way of expressing what this step is all about. Strategy becomes scope when user needs and client needs are translated into specific requirements for content and functionality. Here's a more diagrammatic view of what's happening. You see that the idea here is that the user needs and the client needs that we established earlier directly inform the content and functionality requirements of the site. In the strategy phase, we mostly answered the question of why are we creating something? 
Now, the outline of scope phase is using the insights gained to answer the question, what are we building? If you're, let's say, working with filmmakers who just finished a movie, the why of the strategy phase could be summarized in a very simplified way as promoting the new movie. Now, the what are we building question would be answered with specific requirements for content and functionality. Something like a website that includes information about the movie, the cast, screenings, press articles, the trailer, and lets people sign up for a mailing list. At the end of the outline of scope phase, the specific requirements will be simply listed in two columns, one list for content and one list for functionality. We'll talk more about the difference of these two categories in a second. But let me reiterate why it's important to define requirements in the first place. Sure, it's good to know what you are building, but equally important is the question of what you are not building. There are many constraints on a project, like the timeline and the budget and technology constraints. Knowing what the site will not be will help you focus your energy on what you are actually building. And there shouldn't be any unpleasant surprises in the end when your client might realize that a complex component they were hoping for is not part of the site. Defining your specific requirements for content and functionality in detail early on will ensure that everyone's on the same page about what to expect. So, what are the differences between content and functionality? Why do we need two separate lists? Well, websites as a medium work in two different ways. On the one hand, a website is an information delivery platform. It lets you access written text, images, recordings, movies, and files. Those are fairly straightforward and passive ways of interacting with a site. You're mainly consuming information. But that's not all websites can do. Users can also interact with them to perform complex tasks, like doing their taxes, or managing their to-do lists, or buying cars. You even have websites that let you create other websites. This is what I'm talking about when I say functionality. I mean task-based systems that let the user get things done, not just access information like a description or image of a product, but completing tasks like customizing the product and purchasing it. So the reason why we are making two separate lists for our requirements are that content and functionality requirements are fundamentally different. Content is less complex. Sure, text will need to be written and photos will need to be taken and videos will need to be edited. But for the web designer, these pieces of content are merely assets to be incorporated into the site. Functionality is more complex. It needs to be planned and it needs to be built. It's a lot easier to make an About Us page with a few images and some text than to create a shopping cart or a checkout system. Okay, now that we talked about the differences between content and functionality, let's discuss how the needs we discovered in the previous strategy phase help us determine what to include in our website. Let's assume that one of the user needs was to get questions answered. What content requirements could fulfill this particular user need? Well, if you want to have your user speak to a real-life person, you could list a phone number. So that becomes a content requirement. It's a simple one for sure, but the decision whether to list a phone number or not in the first place might not be so simple. Does your client have the capacity to answer phone calls all day long? Do they have an automated phone system? There are companies, and I'm looking at you, Facebook, that purposely do not list any phone numbers on their sites. Anyway, you might also give your users the ability to send an email if you want to give out your email address, that is. Or they could contact you through social media if you are monitoring these channels closely. If your website is for a large institution, it might be helpful to list a directory of all employees so that your users can contact the most appropriate person with their questions. And finally, you might add a frequently asked questions section to the site, which has answers to the most commonly asked questions. Okay, all of these are content requirements that fulfill this particular user need. Again, if you were working on a static medium like a brochure, your requirements wouldn't be all that different up until now. But we are working on a website, so what functionality can we build to allow people to have questions answered? We could provide a contact form. 
That's similar to listing an email address, but it allows users to ask questions without leaving your site. It also allows you to ask your users a few additional specific questions that they might not address when writing a freeform email. Another functionality could be a live chat feature. It obviously requires the client to have people answering the chats, but it's a great way for customers to get answers quickly. Or how about a community forum where questions are answered by other users? Or keeping with the idea of crowdsourced content, on a shopping site, you could add the functionality for users to leave product reviews. All of these solutions would require you to plan and build systems that enable the specific functionality. Let's look at one more example quickly. Let's say we determine that a user will want to know how much shipping will cost. That's a reasonable user need. A way to answer this need with content is to simply provide a description of your shipping policies. If you have a very simple site, maybe you only sell one product, or if you have a very simple shipping policy, maybe shipping is always free, then this is all you might need. Just some text explaining how shipping charges are calculated. But on bigger e-commerce sites, shipping charges are often quite complex. So you could build a shipping calculator that abstracts your complex shipping formulas into something intuitive. Maybe a form with a few questions for the user to fill out. The hard work of calculating shipping rates is then done by the site, and your users will be much happier. So, to reiterate, for each piece of content and functionality that you add to your requirements, you should ask, does this fulfill a client need? And, does this fulfill a user need? Most importantly, you must constantly refer back to your strategy documents. That's where, after all, you establish the client needs and user needs for the site. Other questions that will influence your decisions are about the feasibility of a specific requirement. Is it feasible, technologically, time-wise, and budget-wise? In our previous example, we talked about the shipping calculator. That sounds like a great idea, but only if the client has a budget and can afford this feature. And only if there's enough time to build it before the site's launch. Sometimes you might come up with requirements that are just not feasible due to technical constraints. You might want to add a full-page background video to your homepage to fulfill the client goal of creating a surprising and immersive user experience. But if you determine that a lot of your users don't have access to high-speed internet, then this technological constraint, a slow internet connection, makes the requirement of a large background video unfeasible. Before I wrap up this video, here's a free-flowing list of all kinds of example content requirements that give you an idea of the kinds of things that could belong in the content category. Most websites will probably need a logo and contact information and some information about the company. An e-commerce site could also use product images and product descriptions, featured products, pricing info, shipping info, customer reviews, and frequently asked questions. A movie site would probably include the movie trailer, a press kit, headshots, and bios. A restaurant would list the food menu, ingredients, opening times, directions, maybe the company history. A school needs class descriptions, the academic calendar, event info, employee directory, annual report PDFs, and maybe blog posts. A podcast website could post their podcast audio files and show notes. And a portfolio website would include an image gallery and case studies and our clients section. And some sites are required to disclose their privacy policy and list site credits. Note that all of these examples have to do with text, images, audio, video, and files. And here's a list of example functionality requirements. Some of these are pretty common, like sorting and filtering and searching. Others you will find on many e-commerce sites like a shopping cart and a checkout system and an order history. There are some functionalities that require others to be implemented as well. Once you have user authorization, you need to think about how people will create an account and recover a lost password. Once you have user comments, you need to think about the need to police these comments. Other items in this list are less common, like color correcting images, PDF creation, and location based content. But what all of these items have in common is that they don't simply describe content, 
but complex systems that allow users to complete certain tasks. Let's take another look at the Pasadena Conservatory project for a real-world example. Here again is the list of user and client needs that came out of the strategy phase. Let me highlight a few of them to explain how these needs were translated into requirements for content and functionality. The user need to know who's on the faculty can be simply answered with a list of all faculty members, and having bios for each teacher will be helpful too. But since the list is rather long, we decided to also implement filtering functionality. The user can filter all faculty members by the instrument they teach. We also made the list searchable via a search function. Another user need was the question, what instruments are available? Content that addresses this would include a list of all instruments that are being taught and information for each. We decided that we would also design a set of icons for each instrument to make the site more unique. On the functionality side, one could imagine a fun quiz that asks the user a series of questions and in the end suggests what instrument they should learn. This would be especially appropriate if our strategy also determined that many parents are unsure what instruments their children should study. Alas, this is not something we actually built. Remember the feasibility constraints one also needs to consider. Building such a tool would be quite involved and would take additional time and resources. One of the client needs was to promote events. So for content, we'll obviously need information about the events. But we also need a way for people to order tickets. That goes into the functionality column. But a ticket ordering system represents quite some complexity. You'll need to build a shopping cart, process payments, facilitate account creation, login functionality, and password recovery. So we decided we would use an external service for ticket purchases, a service like Eventbrite or Brown Paper Tickets. The downside of using an external service is, of course, that you are taking the user away from your site and you're interrupting the seamless flow of their experience. But the upside is that you will rely on someone having figured out all the complexities of selling tickets. It's a compromise for sure, and in this case we determined that it made sense to use an external service. The client also wanted to employ photography prominently throughout the site. Well, obviously, then we'll need great photography. At this point, it's important to remind the client that if such photography doesn't already exist, it's high time to hire a photographer. Later on, when we're designing the visual appearance of the site, we'll need these images. Another need of the client was to demonstrate community. Well, as content, we'll need images and stories that talk about how the conservatory fosters community. And as functionality, we determined that a blog would be a good way to provide users access to these stories. A blog requires many additional functionality considerations. We decided that we would have the ability to filter the blog posts by categories. As a side note, that meant that we would have to eventually choose a list of appropriate categories, but this is best addressed in the next phase, the sitemap phase. We also decided that the posts would always be sorted by date in descending order so that the latest blog posts would show up first. And we discussed the possibility of giving users the ability to leave comments. But comments bring up another host of questions to resolve. Would users be able to leave comments anonymously? Or would they have to be logged in? The latter would require us to build a way for users to create accounts. Also, who would check the comments for their appropriateness in terms of language and content? How do we prevent trolls or advertising spam? On the opposite end of the problem spectrum was this question. Would people even want to leave comments in the first place? A blog with no comments at all is a very sad place. So ultimately, we decided against implementing comments. Lastly, I want to point out that you'll encounter needs that cannot be easily fulfilled by content or functionality. Take for example the client need of creating an attractive and memorable website. This need will be most fully answered in the last phase, the visual mockup phase. So in the end, you will list all content and functionality requirements in two lists. This represents your outline of scope. All right, it's time to talk about outline of scope. Um, we'll go through each of your projects again. 
ask them remind out, remind us what you're doing, and then let's talk about the requirements for content and functionality that you will have your uh, that are necessary for your website. Yeah, so my project is an upscale Italian food catering service for businesses and offices in suburban Santa Clarita. And your content requirements that you came up with? Yeah, so for my content requirements, um, which would be like text images and videos that the user will need or will be looking for, are uh, a food menu that, ha that showcases the pasta, appetizers, and, the drinks. and drinks. Um, images of past catered events, uh, copy or text that stresses uh, that the delivery service is only for the Santa Clarita area, uh, an About Us page, uh, a section about testimonials and reviews of the service, uh, a contact and information uh, page, and also a frequently asked question. Yeah, and for your functionality requirements, what are those to begin with? Uh, so functionality requirements are parts of the system of the website that will help the user accomplish tasks, whereas the content requirement is more of uh, communicating like what yeah. it says. Static or, information. Yeah, and static information. Um, so what do you got for functionality? So for functionality, I decided to include a live chat feature for mm -hmm. customers to get help right away uh, and to be able to customize the catering order. Um, so a function that will indicate a uh, date and time of delivery and allow uh, the user to indicate the amount of people uh, and also to pick, pick options for the salad, main mm -hmm. courses, and drinks and indicate uh, the ratio of how much they want for each order. So first you need to say, well, I have 20 people that come to this party. Then I want to say like maybe two main courses. What are, what are some main courses that you offer? Uh, remember? So all the main courses are pasta, so yeah. it would be uh, three pasta options that they could choose from and they can just uh, scale the amount that right. they want. So they could say, I want all three, but I want 30% of this one, 20% of that one, 50% of the last one. Exactly, yeah. And that's, um, yeah, that's important for when you plan an event, right? Because you yeah. might not want equal. You don't want 100% marinara. That, true, but you also don't want, like, if you don't want, like, you know, equal um, amounts. You yeah. know, maybe there's only a few vegetarians, so the vegetarian option is only 10% of your order. Yeah. And also for placing the order, um, a place that you can put in contact information, delivery information, which is, like, the address, uh, and, of course, like, make the payment and have order confirmation. Mm -hmm. Uh, but for functionality, I also felt like it was important that the user should be able to make changes or cancel the catering service after the order's in place in case like the event gets canceled or more people are coming or less people are coming. Right. Uh, they might want to go back in and adjust for mm -hmm. that. Uh, and to do that, I also thought that they should be able to create an account to see all the orders that they placed. They have to authenticate and, themselves. Makes sense. Yeah, yeah, to have that security it's of like their own information. Yeah. yeah. And also be able to log in um, just to like have the security yeah, for their profile and account and also mm -hmm. like their card. So one thing to do at this point is to look back at your strategy. I mean, most of these um, requirements come from the strategy anyway. And I think that's something to stress again um, for the Coursera students is to use this process to your advantage, there's a reason why we wrote down our user needs and client needs, and the reason is that they will inform our content requirement, our functionality requirements. I think I see that often with students, or you know, even when working on real projects, where you do your strategy and then you forget about it, right? Mm -hmm. And then you kind of, you know, figuring out your your content functionality requirements. Um, without remembering and going back to you know your your strategy, so having your strategy printed out next to you when you're when you're working on this yeah. is obviously helpful in like referring back to it. So let's go through this list real quick and see um, each of your user needs and client needs how you answered them by by or you know if possible answered them by having a content requirement or functionality requirement. Uh, so the first one here is like find out if a restaurant delivers to their area. How are you doing that? 
Yeah, so I had both a content requirement for that. Uh, I would have, like, text that would uh, say that they only deliver to Santa Clarita, but I also made it a function um, in, or in the catering order that they would have to put in their address, and it would calculate if, that they, if they could deliver to the area. Or you would get an error message. If yeah, you or you get an error message if it doesn't go through. Yeah, cool. Ordering online is a user need. Well, it's kind of, you know, you have a customization and, you know, Yeah, it all is that a stuff. whole complete functional right. requirement. Right. Um, customizing the catering for event is kind of the same thing. It's a functionality yeah. requirement that you've listed. And also scheduling for orders is also yeah. a functionality requirement. Part of the customization process. Mm -hmm. um, talk about estimating the price of an event. How are you doing that? So for... Uh, estimating the price of the event, uh, I remember we tried, we went over some ideas and we landed on the idea of having a fixed rate uh, per guest. Uh, so you would indicate how many people are coming and it would just be like $25 a person and the amount that it would cost would just depend on how many people show up or how many people yeah. you're ordering for instead so, of by item or yeah. by menu item. So in a way you kind of simplified your business operations in a way. And this is possible, you can do that because you are basically the client, right? Mm -hmm. If you're working for quote unquote real project with a real client, then they might have constraints where that isn't possible to make it so simple, $25 a person, because then you might have to have a much more um, complex system. Like the caviar is more expensive, and yeah. the shrimps and maybe the well, chicken is cheaper, etc. but you made it kind of a flat and dealt with it, which is fine. And I think, um, you know, works to your advantage. Because one could imagine a functionality required of a requirement of a um, cost estimation cal uh, calculator, mm -hmm. right? That could be a functionality requirement, which you don't need if you make your, your um, idea in a way or your pricing scheme really simple. Um, going on, then uh, see past order history and plan to plan for future events. Where uh, is that? That was a functionality requirement uh, in creating an account um, to hold that information for the user. And being able to see those past orders. Mm -hmm. And then contacting someone with questions. Uh, and that's also a functionality requirement. Uh, I put it, I decided to use a live chat feature so that. Uh, they could get the response right away, but it's also a content requirement um, and that I have a contact page and also a frequently asked questions page. And uh, right, so it's both yeah. content and, and the functionality requirement, that's kind of nice, right? Because it's such a high stakes, um, or the stakes are high, let's say. You're planning an office party for you know tons of people, so it'd be nice to chat with someone if you have questions. So I guess you don't have to deal with the business operations, that there actually has to be a human being on the other end. Yeah. Uh, or a chatbot, I don't know, maybe <laughs> just a chatbot. Um, but that's, it, it, it seems to make a lot of sense for your, um, for your particular needs. And then quickly, let's review the client needs. You, uh, there, there's to sell food online that will be delivered. Well, right? have a lot of that, talk <laughs> about that. Same with the provider system for order customization. But then you have appear professional and sophisticated, communicate reliability and communicate upscale. How are you doing those three things? Yeah, so for uh, appearance of professional and professionalism and sophistication, uh, I figured that that would all just come through the visual design and language and aesthetic that I would use for it. It kind of doesn't fit into either necessarily the content requirement or the functionality requirement. Um, it's about maybe the colors you yeah, choose. It's the color the, palette or the logo yeah, or the images. The typefaces. Yeah, the typefaces. Yeah. But for communicating reliability, I cho chose to add the testimonial page so that mm. the user can read about um, past experiences with the client. Um, and also to communicate upscale is again kind of like in the visual design. Yeah, it's an aesthetic choice. Yeah. 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 Possibly you know, what images do you choose? Mm -hmm. yeah. How do you communicate with language? Mm -hmm. um, so no, it's, it's, it, it, it straddles a little bit the content requirements, but it's not like a very obvious one, with, you know, where some other ones, like the reliability, that's a nice one, right? Like how do you showcase that, uh, you know, you're reliable? Well, you do that by 
showing the experience from other people. Um, one other, what you don't have here, and that's fine, but what you could have is some kind of star rating, right? I guess that's, you know, or some, some user comments, right? Mm -hmm. You want to curate them, which, yeah, that makes sense. Also, um, cool. All right, Bradley, cool. let's talk about yours. Yeah, so again, I'm doing affordable poke for college students in Westwood, open late night. So just start by going through my content requirements. Yeah. The user would be looking for, you know, the opening times, delivery radius, only the Westwood zip code, only delivering to Westwood. Delivery speed, like we deliver within the hour, you know, a fast delivery. The prices, food menu, images of the menu items, an about us page, about poke page, contact and like an FAQ where you go over like, you know, is the fish fresh? Like questions people might have about poke mm -hmm. since it might be something that's not familiar. To yeah. People. Yeah. And then functionality requirements. Systems that would allow the user to accomplish tasks, so the user would be able to choose from a list of pre-made poke bowls, create or customize poke bowls, so you have your base, protein, sauce, sides, toppings, add items to the shopping cart, a checkout page where you enter your payment info and address, and you can see real-time order, you know, delivery, like the status of where it is in Westwood. Yeah, which is kind of nice. You see a map and you see where yeah. your poke is. Yeah. currently and how much further it has to travel right i think that's important yeah. for you know yeah. my mm -hmm. restaurant definitely and nice for the for the for the users yeah. something you don't have that allison has is an account right yeah i didn't think it was as important for this since it's kind of like more of a one-time thing possibly you know yeah. fast order so and it's going to be there in an hour and then that's it you eat it and you move on yeah whereas mm -hmm. as you said allison for you you might plan it weeks in advance, mm -hmm. in advance, and it changes over mm -hmm. time. And uh, you might want to refer back to previous orders because you do annual things or something. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Um, plus, there's also, you know, if you were working on a real project, this idea of phasing it. So it's like do just the most important stuff now. Maybe you add an account to your website. You yeah. know, after it's been launched for right. half a year. Yeah, yeah. yeah like you have like not, loyal customers. Yeah, loyal, not, reliable yeah. customers. And it's yeah. not, but it's not the core functionality. Right, yeah. yeah, it's not the most important to the, the most integral to the project, definitely. So let's go through your user needs and client needs real quick and see if you've, um, you know, hit all the, yeah. hit all the marks here. Uh, finding out if the restaurant delivers to your area, how are you doing that? Yeah, we have a description of delivery radius and also under the FAQ, like, you know. Yeah, and it's it's really the zip code, right? So yeah. if you're in that specific zip code, ordering food online, um, yeah, we you know have the menu and right how this to order. Yeah, an order like, system checkout yeah. that stuff. Yeah. Uh, finding out if the restaurant is open. Yeah, again, uh, we have an about us and about uh, poke page, as well as like an FAQ where you can see. Right hours and stuff because we're only open at night so and presumably you'd also yeah. mention that on your you know like, straight on the home page yeah, the home page would have you know, some language um customizing the order and picking up from favorite bowls okay we have yeah. we have that under functionality requirement yeah. be functional for the inebriated is that a yeah. content requirement a functionality requirement probably more functional yeah or yeah. right but 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 where is it here in the list right I would actually say it's more of a visual design. Like visual, yeah, yeah like and structure, like keeping things. Yeah, you could say that not having to create an account is mm -hmm. part of that because so who wants to think of a password? Yeah, yeah. It's like a <laughs> cool see straight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So in a way, it's a it's a functionality requirement that wasn't listed, right? It was like right, a negative right. functionality. Requirement. Sort of, yeah, yeah. It's more of just how the it's presented visually. And Same then, with the providing a yeah. solid mobile experience. Right, yeah. it's not really an outline of scope concern. Yeah. No, definitely. And then yeah, following the order after it's placed. I mean, you have a real time status on a map right. after you order, so that's definitely an important part of it. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's it's taken care of quickly. The client needs, uh, you know, selling food online. Obviously, that's there. Providing a system for ordering customization we have, but you want to communicate fast service, affordability, and freshness. Yeah. How do you do that? And again, those are all like aesthetic choices, you know. So far on the website, 
how it looks and how it's presented to communicate. Yeah, it. especially yeah. the freshness, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah like color palette and stuff. Yeah, I guess the fast service that might need some text, which you have, right? right. We deliver in the hour. Yeah. Affordability, I assume that is also communicated by just showing the prices. The prices yeah, of it, and the yeah. content. Yeah, definitely. And then explaining what pokey is to people who have never eaten it. Yeah, we have an about pokey page. Yeah, so. that would be a latch all. Yeah. So something else in that I wanted to mention about yours is that you have a very complicated functionality requirement with the user having to indicate how much of each options that they order mm -hmm. um, to, um, to allocate. Mm -hmm. uh, but something to remember when you're working at the outline of scope is that you don't have to find the answers yet, right? You're just basically um, indicating the problems and then the, the, the needs and the requirements right here and you can figure out how to exactly do that through some user interface in, in, in future steps. So one doesn't need to yet get hung up on, on those things. Yeah, we're just more trying to lay out um, the things that we'll need to address exactly. later on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is in a way liberating. You can just like write down, well, I need this system, I need that system. Uh, I don't have to think about um, how to address that quite yet. We'll tackle that later. Yeah. Um, Cool. Thank you. Hello, web designers. You've almost made it through the first course in this course sequence. Welcome to week four. With your outline of scope in hand, you will now learn how to transform the content and functionality requirement determined last week into a navigable structure. This structure will be visualized by something called a sitemap. I'll tell you all about sitemaps and how to create them. Along the way, we will also define the term information architecture, and I will introduce you to a tool called TreeJack, which will enable you to test your sitemap on actual users. Here again is our roadmap. We've arrived right in the middle of the UX process, ready to tackle the sitemap. This, of course, means that we are getting more and more concrete with the shaping of our final site. In the sitemap phase, we are very much concerned with the structure of information. If the last phase, the outline of scope phase, was all about defining our requirements, now we are figuring out how the pieces of content and functionality fit together as a logical whole that the user can navigate. At its heart, it's really about defining hierarchy and sequences. We're taking all this stuff and structuring it so it can be accessed in an optimal way. And this step isn't even all that unique to websites if you think about it. Graphic designers deal with structure and hierarchy of information all the time. I mean, if you're designing a poster, you have to create hierarchy for the elements that are on the poster. And if you're designing a book, you'll create a table of contents that guides the structure of the entire book. The sitemap, in a way, represents the table of contents for our website. It's an information flow diagram that includes a bunch of boxes that are connected with lines and arrows. We'll cover the different components of a sitemap in detail later in this lesson. And we'll also look at specific examples of sitemaps. But let me stress one thing right away. As the table of contents for our site, the sitemap will show us what to include for the main navigation. To illustrate this, let's quickly add some example content into this sitemap sketch. Here, you see that everything starts with the home page, and there are four first-level pages, products, about, cart, contact. Well, if this is our sitemap, then we will want to use these four links for our main navigation bar. We'll deal with this much more in our next phase, during wireframing, but I wanted to mention that when we're thinking about the sitemap, we're already laying a lot of groundwork for the navigation menu of the website. Let me introduce one more term before we really get into the sitemap business. A lot of what we're doing during the sitemap phase is often described as information architecture. You might have heard about this term before. There's even a job description called information architect. And although it's been formalized as a term more recently, the field of information architecture is quite old. As long as people had to communicate information, they had to make certain choices on how to structure that information. I was just talking about that, 
Even the medieval scribes working on their illuminated manuscripts had to think about how to structure the writing. In the context of a website, you can define information architecture as categorizing, organizing, and labeling information to allow users to move through a website effectively. The writer Christina Watke has another way of putting it that I quite like. She says that information architecture is deciding what the choices are, what they are called, and where they take you when you click. So let's discuss a few specific concerns that you'll have to deal with when you, the information architect, creates the sitemap for your site. Let's talk about the number of clicks a user must perform before they get to content, and how clicking compares to scrolling. And we'll also talk about how many choices to offer and what to call them. When I started out as a web designer in the early 2000s, there was this rule I heard a lot about. And that was that a user should be able to access every piece of content on a site with just two clicks. Less clicking can obviously benefit the user experience. They get things done much more quickly. And remember, in those days, websites tended to load quite slowly, so every extra page that had to be loaded slowed the user down. But we shouldn't conclude that a lot of clicking is always a bad user experience. Sometimes it might be wise to present a series of well-structured pages instead of one very complex page. To illustrate this, think about a site with many levels of information. A navigation with drop-down menus that go several layers deep allows your users to get around your site with very few clicks. And for some sites, that might be the most appropriate. But sometimes it might be better to simply provide a main-level navigation which links to individual landing pages for each primary section. There, you can present the subsections with text describing what the user can expect. Which of these options to choose could depend on your user's level of familiarity with the content, or how often they need to access a specific piece of information that's located deep in your site's architecture. If they have to click five times every time they access an important page, they will hope that they had some shortcut to get there. But a giant drop-down menu, as indicated on the left, can quickly overwhelm users that are less familiar with your site's content. Another example is designing a complex form. This could be presented all on one page, no clicking required. You just fill out the form and send it off. Another way to structure forms is to ask a few questions at a time. Look at the sketch on the right. Doesn't this seem a lot more inviting than the onslaught of form fields on the left? Let's say we're developing a website to help people with their taxes. We could ask our user all questions on one page. Everything from their name and their occupation and how much money they made and how many kids they have, on and on, all on a single page. That would be similar to how such forms work on paper. But a form like this could be quite overwhelming for most users. And since we're working on a website, we could easily split up the form into many different screens and start simply by asking, what's your name? It might take the user 20 or 30 screens to complete the form, but each screen is now quite manageable. But let's say you are a tax expert and you know exactly which form field you need to change. Then it could get quite cumbersome to click through dozens of pages to find a specific field. So to reiterate, having the user do a bunch of clicking isn't necessarily bad if you allow them to access information in a very structured way. It's only bad if it's cumbersome and repetitive. Clicking versus scrolling is a similar concern. There are some simple sites where everything can just be on one page. There's actually a whole category of websites called one-page websites. On those sites, you don't click much at all. They often work more like a narrative scrolling experience. And let me stress at this point that there's absolutely nothing wrong with scrolling. The web's foundation is based on the idea that pages scroll. So you don't have to be afraid of scrolling. You might still encounter clients who are concerned about this. They might tell you that they know for a fact that users hate scrolling. It's up to you to educate your clients. Think about the most popular websites, Facebook, Amazon, Google Search. There is a lot of scrolling involved in navigating those sites. In fact, often it's easier to scroll than to click, especially on a laptop with a trackpad or on touchscreen devices. Think about a slideshow of images. 
If you build the interface around having to click little arrows to advance the slides, that's actually more difficult for the user than just presenting all images on one page and let the user scroll. That's probably the reason that Facebook and Instagram use the latter option to let users navigate through their friends' posts. Let's continue with the question of how many choices to present to the user. Here's something that I have mentioned before. This idea that the human brain can hold about seven plus minus two items in short-term memory. Once you add more items to a list, 10, 11, 12, we'll have forgotten what the first items were and we can't make an easy decision. So what does that mean for our information architecture? We should limit the amount of choices we present at one time to five to nine items. This is a nice rule for designing a main navigation. Don't include 15 items. Five to nine items is a good limit. If you have more content, your challenge will be how to categorize these items into subcategories that fit into a smaller amount of main categories. Here's a nice example of information overload. Look at the website of Chafee College. It's completely overwhelming to make a decision here. There's just so much going on. On the right, in contrast, is the website for Columbia College. There's a much more limited set of options to choose from here. And there is a sense of clarity and sanity. Lastly, we have the question about what to call the choices. It's important to create clear and unambiguous labels that your target audience understands. A user doesn't want to guess what might happen when they click on a navigation item. You want them to click with confidence that they will find what they are looking for in this particular section of the site. However, a competing goal is often that you want to choose labels that are unique and not that generic. That can create friction if clarity suffers. Let's look at a few examples. Let's say we're including a blog on our site. We could just call it blog and be done with it. It's a pretty well-known term and users will expect it to be that part of the site where regular updates, writing, and images are posted. But it's also a pretty broad label. Maybe you want to use something more unique and specific. Here are some other options. News, stories, what's happening, the latest. There's a website called Slate.com and their blog is called The Slatest. Pretty clever, right? The blog for CalArts, the college I'm teaching at, is called 24700, which is part of the address of the school. And if you're working on a snotty punk rock website, maybe their blog is called WTF. That's not appropriate for most websites, but it could be quite appropriate for others. Again, much depends on your target audience. So we are lucky that we already figured out who our users are at this point. Here's another one, shopping cart. That's a pretty standard term, but it's not the only one. What about simply cart or bag or bin or basket, bucket, box or wallet? Again, it depends on the context of the project you're working on. How about the About Us page? Here are some other options. It could be shortened to just About, or be more precise as in About Our Company. Long labels, though, will be more difficult to deal with when you're designing the navigation bar. You could be super brief and just call the section Us, or depending on the type of site, it could be Team, or Behind the Scenes, Our Crew, Homies. You get the idea. Lastly, Here's a question about which pronoun to use on your labels. One option is not to use a pronoun at all, as in simply account. But that's not all that friendly or specific, is it? So do we call the section your account? Or is it my account? I'll let you spend a little bit more time with this interesting conundrum. I found a great post about just this question that I'd like you to read next. Let me walk through an example sitemap process so I can explain how to get from a list of content and functionality, remember the requirements we determined in the outline of scope phase, to a sitemap. So here we have a bunch of content items. Let's say this is for an e-commerce site. The first step would be to sort these items into sections of related content. Now we have things that belong to products and the shopping experience on the left. Items that belong to information about the company is collected in the middle. And information about contacting and visiting the company is on the right. 
and we have a few other things like FAQs and the blog as standalone sections. Next, let's find some umbrella terms that can describe these content buckets that we created. Here, we have shop, FAQ, shopping cart, about, blog, and contact. These labels will form the main navigation of the site. You know, the links that you'll find on top of every page. Note that we don't have a section that the credits and the privacy policy fit into. Well, these are pages that, while they're important to be included, don't need to be accessed from the main navigation. So let's decide to link to them in the footer of every page. Let's take another look at the contact section. The last two items, directions and opening times, could fit here. Visiting a store can be somewhat described as a form of contact, but it's not very precise, is it? Let's be more explicit and create another category. Now we added a section called Visit, which will contain information for directions and opening times. This new section will also stress that this online store also has a physical location. Users will see the word Visit right in the primary navigation. Okay, now let's look a little closer at all the content items we have and decide if we need actual pages for each. Here I isolated all of the content nodes that do not need their own page. The product description and images and customer reviews will live on the product pages. The about text will go on the about landing page. The employee directory will fit nicely on the our team page. Contact info and social media links can be listed combined on the contact page. And we don't need subpages for the visit page. We can list directions and opening times on just one page. Okay, we cleaned up quite a bit by now. We are ready to build out the sitemap. We'll start with the main level items. They go across the top. But what about the order here? The order should make logical sense and also indicate importance. Having the shop first makes sense. But you might determine that it's more important to list the visit section next and to move the about section towards the end. Also, the FAQ are a little more important than the blog, so we'll switch those. And it's somewhat of a convention to list the shopping cart last. Speaking of the shopping cart, it's the only navigation link that has two words. Let's be consistent and rename it to just cart. There we go, our final main level navigation. And now we add all of our secondary content we determined earlier. Here's everything that goes into the shop category. Note that the featured products and the products sections both link to product details. And the icon for product details looks a little different. It's a page stack to indicate that there will be many different product detail pages. The same happens with the blog posts. There are many different blog posts that all link from the blog landing page. Here are all the pages that need to go under the About section. And here are all the different steps that the user will need to complete during the checkout process. Note that instead of using simple lines, we have arrows to indicate the sequential order of these items. A user won't be able to advance to the billing info, let's say, before they entered their shipping info. The arrows indicate that. Also, there is a horizontal bar on the last arrow to indicate that once you reach the order confirmation page, you can't go back to the confirm order page. We also have to account for the two items that we're adding to the footer. Since they will be on every single page, we just list them separately on the bottom of our sitemap. Okay, we're almost done. There's only one little detail missing. In fact, it's actually not so little. We're missing an important page. Can you spot which one? It's the page that most people will land on when they visit the site. The home page. And we'll indicate with lines that the home page links to all the other primary navigation items. So there you have it, a beautifully organized sitemap. Remember where we started? With a wild list of requirements. It took a little work to pare this down into a meaningful, logical, and cohesive whole. In the next video, I will talk a little bit more about the different elements that make up a sitemap.
Let's quickly spend a little bit of time talking about the symbols that we can use to create a sitemap. In the last video, you were already introduced to most of them. In fact, the sitemap vocabulary that we will use in this course is pretty limited. A simple rectangle represents a page on your site. You're probably familiar with the idea of a web page. Just think about an about page or the contact page you will find on many sites. Usually, there will be a unique URL link for each page. But for some sites, the idea of a page can seem a little outdated. It stems from the early days of the web when we were navigating from one static page to another. So today, the term view or content node might be more appropriate for sites that rely heavily on dynamic content being loaded. Think about Google Maps, for example. It's hard to think about that site as having individual pages. But there are certainly a number of distinct views that could be visualized with a simple rectangle on a sitemap. A page stack is indicated with three overlapping rectangles. You will use a page stack to account for multiple pages of similar content. Think about product detail pages, news items, or blog posts. These pages will often also share a common visual template. Usually, there will be a landing page that will link to these detail pages, symbolized as a page stack. We saw that in our previous example, where the blog landing page linked to blog detail pages. Sometimes it can be helpful to indicate special content in your sitemap. Are you including a link to a file, maybe a PDF or a zip file? Then use the shape on the left to indicate file content. You might even put a little icon inside to indicate what kind of file it is. If you include a form, use a special icon that communicates this. Connectors tell us which pages are connected and how we get from one page to another. Here we see that there will be a link on the home page to the About Us page. You can also use arrows to indicate a sequence of pages that must be completed in order. In this example, the user must go from the shopping cart to the billing info before being able to go to the shipping info. There's also a connector that indicates that navigating back to the previous page is no longer possible. You simply add a vertical line perpendicular to the connector. You can use a dotted line to indicate that a connection is based on a specific condition. Here, for example, a user can only navigate to the My Account page if they are logged in. And lastly, there's a more complex structure to indicate decision points. This can be a helpful tool when you're trying to account for paths in the user's journey that depend on certain yes-no conditions. The example here is for a login routine. You'll see that there is a login page with a login form. And from there, we have a decision point. If the user's credentials are entered correctly, the user proceeds to the My Account page. Otherwise, an error page is displayed, and the user can navigate back to the login page to try again. I'll finish this lesson with an example sitemap, again from the Pasadena Conservatory of Music project. Let's look at a few things here in a little more detail. You see that everything starts with the home page, and that there are a bunch of pages that are linked from the home page. We decided to separate these pages into two main groups a primary group along the top, about, for children, for adults, etc., and a more secondary one on the bottom, support us, watch and listen, contact us, etc. The reason we did this was that we knew that these groups of links would be displayed with different hierarchies in the navigation bar. And from these main navigation items flow many secondary and some tertiary pages. You'll also notice that you can annotate a sitemap with as much information as you deem necessary. For the homepage, for example, we added a list of content items that we wanted to include here. The same is true for the overview page in the About section. You can see we employed a page stack a few times. For example, the faculty page links to many detail pages, one for each faculty member. And you can spot a few forms too. In general, I'd like to emphasize that there isn't one right way to design a sitemap. This is just one example how I deal with this in my work. What's most important is that your sitemap is visually clean 
and easily understandable. Add as much info as necessary to communicate the structure of the site and account for the content that will have to be included. One final question you might have is what software to use for creating sitemaps. Again, there's no rule here, I'll leave it up to you. As you can see, any software that will let you easily draw a bunch of rectangles and lines will do. The sitemap you're looking at was created in Adobe Illustrator, and I definitely recommend this tool. But InDesign would work too, I suppose. Photoshop, on the other hand, probably not. You could even use pencil and paper if you have good drafting skills. In fact, you might want to start out by sketching your sitemap by hand before creating the final version on the computer. So, by now we know what a sitemap is and why it's an important part of the user experience process. I've also talked about how we get from a loose collection of content and functionality requirements to a structured sitemap diagram. In this lesson, I want to introduce a tool that lets you test your sitemap's information architecture and solicit feedback from actual users. The tool is called TreeJack. It's developed by the company Optimal Workshop out of New Zealand. They actually make a few other helpful tools for UX designers, such as a first-click testing tool and tools for card sorting, surveys, and questionnaires. TreeJack is a tree testing tool, or put another way, an information architecture validation software. It basically allows you to test if your users will be able to find certain content on your site easily. In a moment, you'll have the opportunity to test drive TreeJack yourself, and you'll also get to test your sitemap that you're creating for the course project. But let me first talk about a project where we used TreeJack. In 2017, my studio, Ye Brigade, launched the website for a new art museum in Los Angeles called the Marciano Art Foundation. If you are ever in Los Angeles or if you live close, you should definitely check out this place. It has a cutting-edge contemporary art collection, and it's located in a renovated Masonic temple. The mysterious architecture alone is worth a visit. Anyway, here's the homepage of the website that we created. It's online at marcianoartfoundation.org. And of course, we created a sitemap as part of our design process. You can see that the primary navigation contains sections for about, visit, exhibitions, events, etc., and there are subpages for each of these primary links. And some other links will be listed in the footer of every page. Now at this point, we thought it would be a good idea to not just rely on our intuition and expertise. We wanted to put this structure in front of living, breathing human beings to test if what we created would actually work for our users. That's where TreeJack came in. You can find the tool at optimalworkshop.com slash treejack. Treejack allows you to input all the information of your sitemap and then create a survey with specific user prompts. And then you can invite people to complete the survey. We send it out to our network, friends and colleagues, and also to a few of my students at CalArts. Here's the email we sent. Note that we were upfront about the time it would take to complete the survey. We were asking people for a favor, so we wanted to let them know it would only take five minutes of their time. Okay, now that you have a little bit of background, I'd like you to take the same TreeJack survey that we sent out back when we were still developing the Marciano website. This will give you a pretty good idea how TreeJack works. And then, in the next video, I will share some of the results we received. So now that you had a chance to take that tree jack study yourself, let me show what we actually presented to the client after we had people take the test, um, our findings, so to say. Uh, we presented that in an in-person meeting and we had a little deck of results that we shared with our clients. We showed the tasks that we asked people to fulfill. And notice here that that's kind of the smart thing that TreeJack allows you to do. It's one thing to look at a sitemap and say, is it good? Is it working? And another to approach a sitemap with motivations and minds. I hope that when you did the survey, you realized once you have a clear motivation, you can actually test a site structure much more easily. Like when is the museum open? Well, let me see, what would I click on? Oh, there's a visit section. 
that's probably it, etc. So we listed our tasks. We uh, showed, you know, the navigation that uh, people clicked on just so our client got an idea of how this tree check tool works. We included this age demographic question. It's not completely necessary, but it's nice to know what the ages were. You can see that there weren't even that many people. It's 35 people, I, I believe. But that gives you a pretty good idea of seeing where problems lie. Overall results were 80% successful. Uh, so out of all these people taking the the survey, 80% answered questions correctly. The directness is how direct were the people when they clicked on things. So if they first clicked on something that led them down the wrong path, and then they backtracked to find a, a successful answer, that would be indirect success. So the directness was 76% and the success was 80%. Pretty decent, I think. Uh, but still, there's 20% of people that somehow got stuck with one of these questions. So which tasks were the problematic ones? Here is an overview. You can see that the second, the third, and the fifth question were less successful. There is a lot of red, right? All the green means people were able to find the right uh, results, and the red means they chose a wrong answer. So let's go through these three problematic questions one at a time. The first one dealt with the teacher trying to schedule a trip to the museum with a class. You can see here that 49% got this question completely wrong, so that isn't very good if half your audience can't find the information. So where did they click instead? So here is a view of alternate paths, and you can see that the visit section was one section where a lot of people headed first, and some of them got stuck there, right? You, know, you see that in the education section, request a visit for your class, that is the right answer according to our sitemap anyway. So what did we learn here? Well, we should put a link in the visit section that refers to the education section. One possible solution would be to move the request a visit for your class form entirely into the visit section. We didn't want to do that because, you know, it's an education related item, but having a cross link from the visit section to the education section would solve our problem. The next question that a lot of people got wrong was, how do you reserve tickets? Here, 77% got it right, but still, that's a quarter of all people that did not get it right. So where did they get hung up? A lot of people went to events. And here we realized that the problem might not be with our sitemap, but with the way we asked this particular question. So how do you reserve tickets, we asked, that could lead some people to think, oh, tickets to events. Well, those reserve under the event section. We meant, how do you reserve tickets for a regular visit? Those would be found in the visit section. So we actually didn't do anything here and just learned that how you phrase questions will obviously affect the way people answer them. So you have to be less ambiguous and very precise. The last question that a lot of people had problem with is the question about finding the permanent art collection. The right answer was the about section and then the item, the collection. A lot of people got that wrong. 51% never made it to the right answer. Where did they go instead? They went to exhibitions. And if you think about it, oh, it's the permanent art collection that might be on exhibit somewhere in the museum. I go to exhibition and uh, expect to find the permanent art collection there. Since we are more talking about this is the collection that the museum has, not necessarily on view, but these are all the things that they are collecting. This is the history of the collection, et cetera, et cetera. It made sense for us to put it into the about section and we left it there. But again, we have a cross link. When someone now goes to the site under exhibitions, they see a small reference to the permanent art collection, which lives inside of the about section. So I hope that this gives you a little bit of insight how TreeJack data can be used to interrogate your sitemap and to test it with actual user data. And I invite you to try out the tool yourself on the sitemap for your project. All right, we're ready to talk about sitemaps.
Bradley, let's start with you. Just remind uh, everyone your website is about affordable poke. Right. For college students. Yeah. Westwood Village, urban area of Los Angeles. And they only open at night. Mm -hmm. Quick delivery, late night parties and study years. Exactly. Here's your site map. Take it away. What did you do? Okay, so we have like a home. And on that home page, we have a poke button, contact, about, and a questions page. So that's your main navigation main right navigation. there. Yeah. Which um, makes sense because they're all related to the home page. Right. These lines. Okay. Yeah. And then from poke, you have a decision point whether to pick customization or faves, which are kind of already made bowls for you. And from custom, you can pick your base protein, sauce, sides, toppings. Um, with faves, there's like a list of, you know, different poke bowls that are already pre-made. They're specials. Specials, yeah. So you don't have to decide anything. Exactly. And then from there, you go to add cart, check out, and then you can see your order process of it coming to you. Why the separation between custom and faves? On um, the sitemap is because there are two different options you can pick, so it's like a decision point. So there'd be a button that says, you know, custom and then faves. And from either place, it takes you to a different one into cart. And I guess that's also something you developed early on in the strategy, right? Where mm -hmm. you wanted to give people the option of being able to completely customize it or just pick one that's already existing. Right. And some people, you know, the people that are not able to customize anymore because they were partying so hard, they yeah. might want to go. <laughs> just they might faves. go for the, yeah. yeah. One button. Yeah, exactly. And then about us, you know, is in the about page and also about what Poke is. I think that would make sense in the yeah. navigation. And Which could have been two things, right? right? It could have been about us as a main navigation, about Poke as a main navigation. Then you would have five, but right. you wanted to keep it condensed. Condensed, yeah. And under questions, there's also like, is the fish fresh? You know, just questions that the, the user would have. Um, is yeah. there a minimum order? And also, yeah, again, what is poke? You know, another quick answer. And like, ew, is raw fish safe? Yeah, might right. be a question. So People might not know. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And then also an important one is like, who can I contact for questions? I want to talk about the word faves. Yeah. Um, well, back earlier, I talked about, you know, kind of like an attitude for the website. Yeah. And I think that just kind of plays off, you know, the college, the college thing. So it's the voice of the site. The voice of the, voice the website. Of the and also just kind of shortened since it's... Oh, and we navigation. were going to look at... We were, yeah. Oh, wait, where was it? Um, Here we go. Yeah, this guy, Chad. right? Yeah. He yeah, I think that face. personifies Chad. Yeah. I mean, just the character that I kind of created, I think that is something that he would say. So that's a really clear indication of like what we would... the language we have on the website. And it wouldn't work for Alison's no. target yeah, audience necessarily. Yeah, because they have a different voice and a yeah. different target audience. More conservative, mm -hmm. less hip, mm -hmm. less casual. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then also, what struck me here was that you um, one of your menu points was um, was poke, um, mm. poke. poke. Uh, what what else could that be? Could be order you or know, menu. Menu, yeah. But here it's you know very straightforward that you know that's what you sell, yeah. so you made that into a. Yeah, if that's what you want. Yeah. You know, it's that's what more you're here direct. For. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then you also have, um, you know, this is something that uh, we'll see even more with Allison's right. sitemap. One is able to annotate. You don't just um, have to stick to just the pages. You can mm. annotate it with, okay, on the about, uh, about page, you have these two items about us and about Poke and the questions you're listing here. So you kind of, you don't, I guess you could get away without that, mm. but it's kind of a nice um, gesture to kind of you know, list all the content items or many of the content items that, that are going to be on these pages. Yeah, that will be there. Yeah. It's good to have it. Allison, let's jump over to yours. Yeah. What's your project about? Uh, so just to a remind reminder, uh, my project is an upscale Italian food catering service for uh, businesses and offices in suburban Santa Clarita. Yeah. And your sitemap is a bit more complicated. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a little longer. Um, yeah. So, I mean, like Bradley, I have a homepage and then I have and main navigation. So on your homepage, maybe I can zoom in here for a little, yeah. 
what's but happening there? I decided to go in a little bit more about specifically what I would have on the homepage, um, a kind of a, like the content requirements. So like uh, catering photos and information explaining what this website is about and like how to order um, and a statement for saying that it's for businesses in Santa Clarita. Mm -hmm. And then your primary navigation. And then my primary navigation, um, I have catering, uh, our story, which is my about page, um, testimonials, an FAQ, uh, contact page, um, and then an account um, function. Uh, and then I guess going into the catering, um, that's when you start going through the functionality of it. Uh, and it starts with location. And then you have a decision point here. Yeah, and the decision point is, is location in Santa Clarita. And so what you would do is you'd input your address and then if it fits the uh, location requirement, then you can continue on into the process. But if it doesn't, then it'll go to like a uh, error or like a sorry, a sorry page. Mm -hmm. sorry. Yeah. yeah. And then from location, uh, it goes into number of people estimation, and then you get to do the menu uh, customization point uh, and allocations for how much food you want. And then it goes into scheduling when the event's going to take place, and then you get to review your order one last time before you hit to check out. Although there's another decision point here too. Oh yeah, and then after you review your order, there's another decision point uh, for if you have an account. Uh, and at this point, you can either make up, make your account, or you can log in if you already mm -hmm. have one. Then you, after that, you get to check out. And then uh, I have a thank you page. Yeah. And just to um, talk about the number of people, you made a decision that there's a minimum of 10 and a maximum of 100. Yeah, I, I created that uh, page to have kind of like a sliding scale uh, function. Um, where I would need like a minimum and maximum capacity point oh. um, that you can choose from. And again, the, the UI, we, we don't know what yeah. that's going to be yet. We, we, maybe you have a hunch that, oh, it could be a slider, mm -hmm. but it could be a drop down. Yeah. Could be a text field where you enter a number, right? We can figure that out yeah. in the next step. But right now, it's you know, just important that that's a constraint. And yeah, you, I wanted you added to give that, to that constraint. Yeah. yeah. Cool. And then um, talk about our story. That could have been about, right? Yeah. You could have called it that. I chose to use our story because I felt like that fit the more mature and familial tone of my website rather than just saying like about us. I felt like our story um, is like it has language that carries more of like an Italian family feeling rather than yeah. just the normal typical like, about. A little more inviting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We have talked about the testimonials being important mm -hmm. during the um, the scope phase. They're here. You frequently ask questions. Contact us. And then the account. There is a little bit of uh, complexity here. Yeah. So for the account uh, page, there's another decision point for if you're logged in or not. Um, if you are. Uh, then it'll just go straight to your order history and account settings. But if you're not, then you have to go to another page that'll allow you to log yeah. in. And one thing to mention here is um, the login, this, this login functionality would probably have to be a little more complex because once mm -hmm. you have a login, you also have a lost password function most yeah. of the time, I forgot password function. So if this was a real site, um, we probably have to amend that, but for our purposes, you know, it's probably okay um, to to just say say login. Oh yeah, and then the dotted line. Oh yeah, that's... that <laughs> kind of scrolls down all the way on my sitemap uh, is just to represent the live chat feature that is at the bottom of every page throughout my whole website. Because that's going to be on every single page, mm -hmm. right? So you, you're indicating like that. There might be other ways to do it too. You could just say, you know, in the footer, you know, live chat feature here. But I, I kind of like what you did with the dotted line because it does mm -hmm. indicate the kind of relationship to everything else. Um, it sort of like hovers, you know, mm -hmm. with everything. Yeah. So um, I said that before in the uh, during my lectures that, you know, there you can be creative with the sitemaps. There's, you know, there's some... 
you know, if this works visually, if it indicates it, then, uh, you know, that's great. Just like, you know, you added a lot of uh, supplemental information here to, to actually say, well, what, is, what are the frequently asked questions and what's on the contact us page, etc. Great. All right. Hello and welcome to the course Web Design Wireframes to Prototypes. My name is Roman Jaster. I'm a web designer, web developer, and instructor in the graphic design program at the California Institute of the Arts. This course is the fourth and final course in the UI UX specialization on Coursera, and a continuation of the previous course, Web Design, Strategy, and Information Architecture. In the previous course, we worked on the first part of a large-scale website project. You should have your strategy, outline of scope, and sitemap completed. This course will focus on the application of that early UX thinking into actual user interfaces, the creation of wireframes, high-fidelity mockups, and clickable prototypes. Along the way, we will also discuss responsive web design and mobile web challenges, navigation design, web typography, the relationship between design and programming and whether it's important to know how to code, and I will give you a brief introduction to the different technologies that make the web work, namely HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. By the end of this course, you will have completed your website project and should have a pretty sizable piece to add to your portfolio. Of course, Allison and Bradley, the two students featured in the previous course, will be back to continue to walk us through their thinking behind the projects they created. So, let's get started. Why peer review is important to a creative practice. Design is rarely a solitary practice. As a designer, you might be working with clients or have a boss you need to report to. You might also be part of a design team or even managing a team of your own. You might be asked to present a project to stakeholders at a company or pitch your services to a new client. Ultimately, your design needs to stand alone, but in the process of making design, you should be testing out your ideas with an audience, getting feedback, and developing your design accordingly. Design is very intertwined with communication, and to be a successful designer, you need to be able to talk about your work, to explain it, and show that you understand how it's working. In different situations, it may be necessary to explain your own work and other people's work in a clear and constructive way. So in this course, you'll be engaging in peer review to evaluate the work of your peers as well as get feedback on your own work. If you're serious about working as a designer or improving your design skills, consider peer review as excellent practice. In peer review, you'll be asked to observe and openly reflect on what is working and not working in a peer's graphic design submission. The goal of this exercise is to help your fellow designers move their work forward and for you to get that same advice in turn. Additionally, it's for you to practice a working vocabulary and discourse around making graphic design, all of which will help you with your future path as a designer. The next video will give you some specific tips for completing peer review within the specialization. Peer review tips. Critique and feedback are essential parts of the design process. They're an essential way to see if your design is communicating what you intended to an audience. So in this video, I'm going to outline a few tips for completing peer review assignments successfully in this class. Participation in peer review thoughtfully and meaningfully will help you practice these indispensable skills. Submitting assignments. Read the instructions carefully. Make sure you take a look at the review criteria so you know how your assignment will be assessed. Review any examples your instructor may have provided and upload exactly what you are asked to do. If something in the instructions isn't clear, post your question in the course forums so staff can assist you. Make it your best work. This is your creation and your creativity and should be an exercise that demonstrates what you can do. Practice assignments should be opportunities to fail, but a final assignment should be something worthy of your professional portfolio. 
Ask for specific feedback. Clarify what you need from your peers in your review. Where applicable, use the designated comment field to ask for specific feedback on your submission. Submit on time. Refer to the due date for submitting your assignment on the grades page within the course. If you're too early or too late, the peer review process may not work as intended. Reviewing submissions. Take your time with reviewing. Don't rush this. Look at each part of your peer's submission carefully and compare what has been submitted to the expectations set out in the rubric. Be objective. When reviewing, consider your role as a viewer or reader of the work. Focus only on what the rubric asks you to evaluate and try to limit your personal opinions about the work in your comments. Be clear and informative. Generic feedback such as good or okay are unhelpful comments for peer reviews because they don't give a your peer any specific information about what was working in their submission. Likewise, it doesn't help to say it doesn't work or I don't like it because it doesn't give your peer enough information to help them reassess their designs. Try to articulate a detailed response that helps to affirm your peer's choices in their submission or guides your peer towards the goal of an assignment if it appears that they are off track. Be constructive. Your feedback should motivate your peer to make adjustments and work towards improvement. If there's a need to correct your peer, be honest, but it's more helpful to include specific recommendations or strategies to help the learner improve. Be generous. Recognize that everyone comes to this course with a different level of experience, as well as a different approach to making work. Honor and value these differences. Bad grammar and spelling shouldn't contribute to a bad grade. Please be generous. Likewise, please don't penalize students for small mistakes. Flag plagiarism and dishonest behavior. These violate Coursera's honor code. If you're asked to review an assignment and it appears to be plagiarized, you can flag it so Coursera Learner Support are notified. Complete your reviews on time. Refer to the due date for completing the minimum number of peer reviews on the grades page within the course. If you're too early or too late, the peer review process may not work as intended. Consider reviewing more than the minimum number of peers for a given assignment. Not only is this helpful for your fellow peers, but it's also instructive for you to see a greater range of submissions to inform your own work. And the more you practice critique, the better you will get at it, and ultimately the better your own work will be as you integrate your critical abilities into your own design process. How to apply feedback to your assignment. So, your assignment's graded, and you have peer feedback, now what? Remember, the goal of peer review is to help you improve your work as a maker and viewer. Try not to see the feedback you receive as either being positive or negative, or an affirmation that you're doing something absolutely right or wrong. Through peer review, you're inviting other perspectives on your work to see and comment on things that you might not see. By engaging in peer review, you're practicing the skill you'll need in your creative and professional life. It's important to understand how an audience will react to your work. Peer feedback should never feel like a personal attack. If you're discouraged by some feedback, then step back and consider why a peer would react that way to your work. Are you seeing patterns or common themes in the feedback you receive? Is there something you need to address in the work? If you receive peer feedback that isn't constructive to your work, that's okay. It's not ideal, but don't let it discourage you. Remember, the goal of feedback is to help you improve. If you need additional feedback, you can resubmit. At the end of the day, remember, both positive and negative feedback can be useful. Positive feedback can let you know what is working, what to keep as is or alter only slightly in your assignment. Negative feedback might let you know what needs to be changed, developed, or reconsidered. 
As the designer, you might disagree with the feedback, but it's always worth examining someone else's point of view. An outside perspective can be very useful, especially because designers often get too close to their own work and sometimes can't see when parts of it aren't working or communicating properly. If you receive a low grade, consider why your peers gave you that grade. Have they justified their grading in the comments? Consider their perspectives and try incorporating their suggestions into the assignment and resubmit. This week is all about wireframes. This is the first time in the process that we will address the screen. In the previous course, much of what we talked about was quite abstract and somewhat theoretical. Now things are going to get much more concrete as we're starting to actually lay out elements for the user interface. This week, you will learn why working on wireframes first before designing high-fidelity mockups is a helpful intermediate step. I'll also talk about responsive design, navigation systems, wayfinding, common design patterns, and strategies for homepage design. And we'll discuss which tools are most appropriate for creating wireframes, because creating those will be your next homework assignment. As you can see, there's a lot to cover, so let's jump right in. We have arrived at phase four in our journey along the user experience process. That means we are ready for wireframes. And that also means that we are starting to focus on individual pages of our site. So as a quick reminder, in the previous course, we established our goals in the strategy phase and then defined requirements to meet these goals in the outline of scope. And finally, we answered the question of how the pieces fit together to create a cohesive, logical structure to the information of our site. Now, during wireframing, we are asking the question, how are the pieces presented on the screen? So we're dealing with the design of actual screens. In fact, it's the first time in our design process that we are explicitly thinking about the UI, the user interface. Everything up to this point has been much more big picture thinking. To strain a few metaphors, up until now, we've been hovering high in the air, looking at overarching questions of strategy, requirements, and structure. Now we are ready to enter the trenches and work on the interface that the user will actually interact with. But we are not ready to design the final appearance of the interface. Instead, wireframes are low fidelity mockups. And low fidelity is a bit of a funny word. It means simplified or low detail. So wireframes are simplified versions of our user interface. Here you can see an example. It's from a website project for the Mac Center in Los Angeles, which I worked on a few years ago. You can see that wireframes involve a lot of rectangular gray boxes and fairly uninspiring typography. It's a bit drab, I agree, but that's by design. Wireframes are not meant to be visually exciting. We're purposely limiting the amount of detail we are concerned with so that we don't get sidetracked by having to think about colors or typefaces or precise scale relationships or which particular images we'll use. We're mainly deciding which elements go where on the page. Where's the logo? Where's the navigation? Where's the page title? How many columns do we need? And what goes inside the footer? These kinds of questions. The term low fidelity is the opposite of high fidelity, a word you might be more familiar with in the context of sound quality. When we say high fidelity or hi-fi, we mean high detail, something that's very similar to the original. In the context of user interface design, a high fidelity mockup includes all those details that we're omitting during wireframing, such as colors and typeface choices. You might ask, do we even need this intermediate step of creating wireframes? Why not jump straight away to designing high fidelity mockups? The reason is that wireframes give us the opportunity to focus on more fundamental questions about the layout of our pages without getting caught up in a lot of details. It's maybe a little bit like making a pencil sketch before painting an oil painting. Or you can think of wireframes a little bit like an architectural blueprint. 
In this side-by-side -side comparison of the wireframe and the visual mockup of a homepage, take a look at the main headline, where it says Mac Center for Art and Architecture Los Angeles. In the wireframe on the left, we can tell that the headline is placed below a large image. That's, by the way, what the boxes with the big X's represent. They are placeholders for the images. And we know that the headline will be visually more prominent because in the wireframe, it's bigger. And that's all we need to decide for now. We don't yet have to hunt for the perfect typeface or the exact shade of red or the exact type size. Those are important concerns eventually, but also things that can derail our design process. Maybe you've been in this situation before. You're trying to quickly sketch out a few ideas on the computer, and all of a sudden you realize that you've been spending the last hour looking for just the right typeface. That's where wireframes help you out. The fact that they are so restrictive visually means that you can focus on the big picture decisions. And as abstract and simplified as the wireframe on the left is, there are tons of big picture decisions that have been made. We know, for example, that the logo will be on the top left, and there will be a horizontal main navigation next to it, and a more secondary utility navigation in the top right corner. There will be three text columns with images giving a brief overview of the main mission of the Mac Center, each with a button that will lead the user to the respective section of the site. On the right, you see how these structural decisions are reflected in the visual mockup. Here, all visual design decisions have been made. I'll leave you with one more metaphor to distinguish wireframes and visual mockups. Wireframes are a bit like x-rays of the final page designs. They represent the underlying skeleton of each page, while the visual mockups represent a beautiful skin. We'll talk all about visual mockups in the next week. For now, let's discuss in detail all the things we have to figure out during wireframing. Here's one question that looms large now that we are addressing the layout of the screen during the wireframing phase. What is the size of our screen? What is the size of our canvas that we are working on? If you think about other media, the size is often the first thing that is decided. For printed pieces like books and magazines and posters, we often get the dimensions as part of the design brief. Even videos have a predefined size. Now, for websites, this topic is a whole lot more complicated. And I don't think it's too much of a spoiler to get right to the point. Websites do not have one specific size, since they must work on a variety of screen sizes and devices. Websites should be designed to fluidly respond to any viewport size and look and function well no matter if you're on a tiny smartphone or a giant desktop computer screen. Instead of one size, we have to deal with many, many sizes. As a small side note, it's interesting to mention that before the internet, there was one medium that routinely had to deal with the issue of multiple canvas sizes, album covers. For a while, new music came out on different formats and album cover art had to work for vinyl, CDs, and for tapes. And designers had to find graphical solutions for these different dimensions. In a funny way, we are looking at some early responsive design in these examples. But even then, there were only a handful of music packaging sizes that had to be addressed. For websites, we are dealing with a bottomless and ever-expanding list of devices and sizes. So the idea that websites have to work in so many different size contexts is today fully at the heart of what it means to design websites. You could call that a limitation. Designers can certainly be frustrated by the absence of a concrete canvas size. It makes designing websites much more complicated. But it's also what makes the web so unique and interesting. And instead of thinking about it as a limitation, think about it as an advantage. You can start reading a blog article on your desktop computer at work, then continue it on your smartphone on the train, and then finish it on your tablet device at home before going to bed, all while accessing the same website each time. That's pretty cool. And speaking of limitations, try reading a printed newspaper in a crowded bus or subway, and you'll appreciate the fact that the website version of the newspaper will gracefully morph to fit the palm-sized device you can easily hold in a tight space. And yet, 
dealing with many different screen sizes makes designing websites more complicated these days. And it used to be much simpler. For a long time, we would access websites from desktop computers and laptops. And that was it. And for quite a while, the convention was to use 960 pixels for the width of websites. That was the lowest common denominator and worked for most monitors out there. For those screens that were bigger, there would be empty space on the left and the right, with the site's content sitting in the middle of the browser. If the browser window got smaller, the website would be cut off and you would have to scroll horizontally. But again, most screens were big enough to show at least 960 pixels across. So designers used that as the standard. There were even whole frameworks and templates for the 960 grid. When designers started a new website, they knew how wide to make their canvas. But then this happened. In 2007, Apple released the first iPhone. And this phone was in part so successful because it had a web browser that did a pretty good job allowing users to serve websites that were designed for the desktop. And you would see the website displayed very small at first so it would fit on the screen. And then you could pinch and zoom to be able to read a certain section of a page. But it was far from an optimal user experience. And users quickly saw how native apps were so much easier to use than websites with a defined width. A few years after, Ethan McCod wrote his very influential article entitled Responsive Web Design, in which he laid out a philosophical and technical case for making websites that work well no matter the size of the screen. And the term that Ethan McCod coined in the piece is what we use today to describe websites that are optimized to work on any screen size, responsive web design. The blog post is still online, by the way, on the website A List Apart, and I would urge you to read it. Not only is it still a meaningful manifesto for web designers, but it's also an interesting and important historical document for the field of web design. For a while, responsive design was an add-on service that web designers offered for clients that cared enough to create an optimized mobile experience. But nowadays, it's really the default way of creating websites. Contemporary websites adjust seamlessly to whatever width they are confronted with. But what does all of this mean for our wireframes? If we don't know the screen size of our users, which size should we mark up? My recommendation is to create two sizes, one small one for the mobile phone experience and one bigger one that describes what the site will look like on desktop browsers. For the mobile size, I recommend a width of 320 pixels, which is about the width of the smallest smartphone. And for the desktop version, use a width of around 1000 pixels. If you are concerned about how specific design elements will behave on intermediate sizes or on really big sizes, think about giant desktop screens, for example, then you can mark up additional sizes. But don't think that you must somehow mark up every conceivable screen size. That would prove to be a fool's errand. There are just too many possible sizes. Okay, we've been talking a lot about the width of websites so far. You might ask, what about the height? How tall should I make my wireframes? The answer is simple. Make them as tall as necessary to fit all the content of the page you are designing. We don't know the height of the user's viewport either. But remember, websites come with the assumption that they are to be scrolled vertically. So when you are looking at a wireframe like this, it's assumed that the user will only ever see part of the page design at a time and that they will scroll vertically through the page. Don't be afraid of designing websites that are long and need to be scrolled. One last issue I want to address is the question of which size, mobile or desktop, to mark up first. There are different opinions about this, and to be honest, for me and my own work, it depends on the project I'm working on. But there are many who advocate strongly for an approach that is called mobile first. Their argument is quite persuasive. If you focus on the smallest screen first, you will necessarily have to focus on the most essential content and functionality because the available space is so restricted. One thing is for sure. Don't think about the mobile experience as something optional or novel. 
Stats tell us that mobile web visitors nowadays often outnumber those that are on traditional desktop computers. And this trend is likely to continue. If you'd like to read more about the thinking behind a mobile-first approach to web design, I recommend reading an excellent primer on the topic by Luke Roblevsky. Let's talk a little bit about different navigation systems. After all, getting around your site efficiently is one of the most important criteria for a successful site. We already laid a lot of the groundwork for navigation in the sitemap phase. Here we were mostly concerned with the question of how the user would get from one point to another. Now during the wireframing phase, we have to answer the question of how navigation elements relate to each other and to the current page. And this brings up other questions. Are some links more important than others? How are the links grouped? What other options are available based on the current task or goals? And a very fundamental question for every user, where am I? This last question we will consider in more detail in the next video. For now, let's discuss how different navigation systems can help us design pages that make sense for your users and that let them accomplish the tasks they need to accomplish. In this video, we will talk about primary navigation, secondary navigation, utility navigation, and navigation to related content. We'll also discuss inline links, something called an index, and search. Along the way, I'll be referring to three websites as examples for these different navigation systems. They are sites for the Pasadena Conservatory, the Marciano Art Foundation, and the Mac Center. As you probably know by now, I was involved in the conception design and development of all of them, so I have a pretty good insight of why things were done a certain way. And I'll also use a fictitious wireframe example to discuss navigational concepts in detail. Okay, let's get started. The first one to talk about is the primary navigation. You're probably already familiar with the term. It's the main navigation of the site, showcasing all top-level sections of the website. Looking at a sitemap, which as you remember was the final outcome of the previous phase, determining which sections make up the primary navigation should be pretty easy. It's the items that are directly attached to the home page. Well, maybe not all of them. It does get a little more complicated. Let's leave cart and account aside for the moment. They could be part of the primary navigation, but since they are somewhat different from the rest of the main content of the site, we'll deal with them separately in a moment. So here you can see the main navigation implemented into a wireframe, presumably for the homepage of a site. Again, we are not indicating that the links will be designed as gray buttons in a rather goofy typeface. This is simply a sketch. But while it doesn't tell us much about the look and feel, it does tell us the order of the links in the primary navigation and that it will be laid out horizontally across the screen next to the logo, in the desktop version of the site at least. I'll mainly focus on talking about desktop here for the sake of simplicity. If you study a lot of websites, you'll notice that placing the primary navigation to run horizontally across the top of the page has become quite the convention. Most sites do exactly that. Though another option would be to put the primary navigation running vertically on the left. And you'll find sites that do this as well. And there's nothing inherently wrong with that. It always depends on the project you're working on. If you, for example, have a large number of primary links or if the labels of the links are really long, this vertical version might work better for you. But you're also allocating a pretty large area of the screen an entire left column only to the navigation. So if you have a lot of other content to display on your pages, you'll probably want to stick to a horizontal primary menu. In our three example sites, each one displays the primary navigation menus horizontally in the desktop version. Here's the Pasadena Conservatory of Music site. It has about for children, for adults, new students, current students, events, and blog as part of the main level navigation. The Marciano Art Foundation includes about, exhibitions, education, visit, events, and the building. And the Mac Center website has visit, sites, programming, Rudolf M. Schindler, residency program, bookstore, and support. The next navigation system to talk about is the secondary navigation. This represents the subsections of our site. 
Now, some sites are so simple and small that they get away without any subsections and secondary navigation, but most sites do have them. And again, you can look at your sitemap and see pretty clearly which pages belong to the secondary navigation. In this example, the shop and about sections have subpages that will need a secondary navigation. And how could this look in our wireframe? Well, we could have a drop-down menu when the user hovers over a primary menu item. This would allow the user to get to the secondary pages without having to visit a primary landing page first. On the secondary pages, we could also have a secondary menu. In this case, I added it to the left side of the screen going down vertically. This would allow the user to quickly navigate between different secondary pages. And it also provides a quick overview of what other pages exist in this section. The Marciano Art Foundation does not employ drop-down menus. The user clicks on one of the primary menu links and any secondary pages are listed here. And at the bottom of each secondary page is a list of other secondary pages that are part of this section. The Mac Center site makes use of simple drop-down menus. An advantage here is that the user can get to any of the secondary pages very quickly, and they also get an overview of all the secondary content by just hovering over the primary links. There are two sections, Visit and Bookstore, that don't have subpages, so these don't have a drop-down menu. The secondary navigation on the secondary pages is handled horizontally across the top. And the Pasadena Conservatory site employs something that we at the time christened fat menus. When you click on a primary menu, you get a very large dropdown that not only includes links, but also images, buttons, and small text blurbs. We liked how we could employ typographic hierarchy and create visual excitement. Of course, these fat menus are not tenable on mobile devices. There's just not enough room for them on a small screen. Here we have a more straightforward text-only menu. Let's quickly also look how the other two sites deal with the mobile size. On the Marciano side, the navigation collapses and we get a menu link that opens up the navigation. On the Mac Center website, the navigation is also hidden at first and can be opened with the hamburger menu icon. And you can also open and close the secondary navigation items by tapping on the main links. The ones that have secondary items indicate this via a small triangle on the right. So besides the primary and secondary navigation, we also have something called utility navigation. There is no strict rule of what to place inside a utility menu or whether you even need one. But often important parts of the site that are not directly part of the site's main content will be grouped here. So that could be the help section or the shopping cart or the login or account links or the social media links. In our fictitious example here, we could argue that the cart and account links, while important options, are somewhat different from the site's main content. They are utilitarian in nature. So these would be good candidates for the utility navigation. This navigation is often placed in the top right corner beside and above the primary navigation. The other two links we'll include here are links to our social media, Instagram and Facebook in this case. They will be available on every single screen, but they are pretty discreet and do not get in the way of the content. Let's check in how the three example sites deal with the utility navigation. Well, on the Marciano side, the links bookstore, mailing list, and contact are treated differently. They are smaller. They almost look like a utility menu. And the reason we treated them differently here was that they were somewhat less important and we wanted the other six main links to stand out more. We basically created different visual hierarchies for two sets of navigational items. The same for the Pasadena Conservatory site. Here, contact, mailing list, and donate are treated differently than the primary navigation links below. And we also have links to Facebook and the RSS feed here. On the Mac Center side, the menu items about contact, links, press, and mailing list are part of the utility navigation. If you count all the links in the header here, you'll get to 12. That's more than the rule we discussed in a previous week of not having more than five to nine choices at a time. And if you imagine the orange primary navigation here to have a total of 12 items, that would be visually really overwhelming, 
and it wouldn't even fit horizontally. Instead, we have two menus, one with seven options, one with five. The different visual hierarchy for the two sets of links makes the scanning of those choices much easier for the user. The next navigation system to talk about is the related content navigation. You can think about this navigation in terms of Amazon's customers who bought this product also like the following option. So these are shortcuts to other content that are dependent on the current context. So it might be links to other products that are related to the product that the user is currently looking at. On the Mac Center website, you will find this sort of navigation when looking at an exhibition under programming. You'll often find related programming in the right column. And this makes a lot of sense for the user, right? Also notice the social media share buttons here. They are also navigation that is based on the current context. They allow you to share the current page on Facebook, Twitter, or via email. Inline links are simply links embedded in the content itself. That's what made the web so famous in the first place. The ability to hyperlink a word to any other page in the entire World Wide Web. Just one piece of advice though, don't add too many links to your writing. As you might have noticed before when reading Wikipedia articles or certain blog posts, it can make the text pretty distracting and difficult to read. Okay, only two more navigational systems to cover. An index is simply a list of items, sorted in some way. Most of the time, the sorting is done alphabetically or chronologically. Whenever you have a long list of options, let's say a list of employees or a list of blog posts or a list of states, it makes sense to display them as an index. Here's an example of links to previously placed orders that are presented as a list sorted by date. A good example of an index is on the Pasadena Conservatory side. When you go to About and Faculty, you get an alphabetized list of all faculty members. While the order is a little more complicated, at first we have a small list of faculty who are artist teachers. Their order is alphabetical, but they are first. Then comes an alphabetical list of everyone else. Notice too that you can use a filter and search function here to narrow down the list. That comes in handy if you're looking for a specific name or a specific department. On the Mac Center website, you can look at all past programming, which is presented as an index sorted by date with the more recent events and exhibitions first. That list, by the way, is so long that it is paginated. And here too, you have a few filters that allow you to narrow down the list. And then lastly, we have search. This is for users that want to circumvent the navigation altogether because they are looking for very specific content via a keyword. The question whether a site needs a search or not should have been answered in the outline of scope phase. Very small sites, generally, can get away without a search. For other sites, think about Amazon or Netflix, the search is the primary method for users to find any content. So in our wireframe example here, let's add the search functionality as an option to the utility navigation. That's usually a great spot for it. And for most sites, it's appropriate to have an icon, often a magnifying glass, that will bring up a search field after being clicked. Of course, if your site relies on search as a primary way of navigation, then you probably want to display the search field at all times as part of your header design. That way, a user doesn't have to perform an extra click to reveal the search field. But on sites where the search is merely a supplemental navigation tool, it's best to remove the search field until it is needed. That makes for a less busy design. And that's what's happening in our three example sites. Each of them uses the magnifying glass symbol located in the utility menu, which then reveals a large search field for input. Okay, we covered quite a few different navigation systems and talked about how they can help you to structure the navigation choices for your users so that they will find their way to your content. Next up, let's talk about answering the user's question, where am I? One of the more fundamental psychological fears that most humans share is the fear of being lost. Getting lost on a freeway or inside an airport or inside the woods is not the idea of fun for most people. 
And we probably all have a story of getting lost as children and the terror that inflicted on us, not to mention on our parents. When we are designing websites, we should make sure that people don't get lost in them. Because if they do get lost, or even if they are just a little confused of where they are, it will trigger a pretty potent negative reaction and the usability of our site suffers. So what are some tools and techniques for us web designers to answer the user's question, where am I, and prevent them from feeling lost? In this video, I will talk about the following. Site identification, page titles, you are here indicators, breadcrumbs, links back to the homepage, and consistency. As an example, we'll use one of the wireframes from the last video. It's a fairly simple page about the employees of a company. It's a secondary page located in the About section. Now, by site identification, I mean that the user should be able to tell at all times simply what site they are on. And one of the best ways to communicate this is to have the site's logo or the site's title in the header on every page. The convention is to have it in the upper left corner, and I would recommend that location as a starting point for your design investigations. We'll use the three example websites we looked at in the last video again. Here you can see that there aren't any surprises. The logos of the organizations are placed safe and securely in the upper left corner. Sometimes no surprises is a good thing. It grounds the user's experience when they know where they are at all times. Another important wayfinding element is the page title. Let the user know what page they are on. Here in this wireframe, we can see the page title Our Team is presented clearly in large type towards the top of the page. The Mac Center website does a good job of prominently displaying the title of a page as you can see here on the Visit page. The Marciano Art Foundation and Pasadena Conservatory websites often use a different mechanism to let the user know what page they are on. More on that in a second. But here on an upcoming events page, the title of the page stands out clearly. And this blog post here also displays the title very prominently. When you're looking at a map in a shopping center, let's say, one of the most useful things is to know your current location in relation to this map. You are looking for the you are here symbol. Websites can really benefit from such indicators as well. In your navigation, you should highlight the link of the section that the visitor is currently on. In this wireframe, you can see that we are currently in the about section, since that link in the primary navigation is highlighted. Furthermore, you also see that we are on the Our Team page in the secondary menu, since that link is also differently formatted from the rest. Let me quickly emphasize an important point. You might argue that a user will have clicked the About link just a few moments before, so how could they already have forgotten what section they are in? Well, let's assume two other scenarios. One, they did a Google search and landed on the About page as the first page they ever visited on your site, it's helpful for them to see right away where they landed. Scenario number two, they went to your site, clicked on about, and were distracted by an incoming email or chat. Then after half an hour, they got back to their browser and have naturally forgotten where they were. Again, nice to help them out by highlighting the place they are at. Here are ways that our example sites deal with this. By having a background color behind the active link, or by lowering the opacity of all links except for the active link, or by having the active link move down slightly to make it different from the rest. I can only imagine that the word breadcrumbs was inspired by the original Grimm's fairy tale of Hansel and Gretel. In the story, when the siblings were left alone in the woods, they tried to find their way home by looking for the breadcrumbs they had strewn along their path earlier. That didn't work out so well for them, damn those birds who ate the bread, but breadcrumbs for websites are a super helpful tool for your users. They indicate the path that the user has traveled along the information architecture of your site. Or if a user landed on this page some other way, breadcrumbs communicate how this page fits in with the content hierarchy. In this example, the breadcrumb situates the Our Team page as part of the About section, which in turn can be accessed from the home page and a user can click on any of the links in the trail to get back to a prior page. So far we've only looked at sites that had a secondary level, maybe a tertiary level. But you can probably imagine content structures that go a lot deeper. 
the deeper your content structure, the more helpful breadcrumbs become. It's a good idea to give your users an easy way to get back to the homepage. Now, it's a convention that the logo of this site will link back home. And on many sites, that's the only link back to the homepage. If you want to be more explicit about how to get back to the homepage, you could add that as a link to the primary navigation. But as I said, most sites get away without doing this. Plus, if you have breadcrumbs, you already have another way pointing back home. Finally, one overarching strategy of helping your users to orient themselves is to be consistent. Have your logo on every page of your site in the same location. Have your page title look consistent. Use a consistent way of indicating which link is currently active. Don't move or unexpectedly change your primary navigation from page to page. Have breadcrumbs on every page. And allow users to link back home by clicking your logo on every page. I'll leave you with a little fun excursion to a website that showcases the exact opposite of all the things we just discussed. The site is Yvette's Bridal. It's kind of a piece of art, actually. A crazy wonderland of late 90s inspired web design, but no clear navigational hierarchy. Or no hierarchy whatsoever. A user can all but feel lost here. Now, I'm not saying that this isn't intriguing or interesting. It does bring a smile to my face but more in a this is so bad, it's really good sort of way. As a piece of user experience, let's say you're actually trying to buy a wedding gown, it's an utter failure and can make us appreciate a well-designed, usable website. So I want to talk about some common web design patterns. And this is going to be a free-flowing survey of some common design elements that are frequently found on websites. Uh, and I'll include a lot of examples from existing sites as illustrations. But let me explain what I mean by the word design pattern. One definition of pattern is a repeated decorative design. That's not what I mean here. I mean the other definition for the word pattern, and that is a design used as a guide. So a design pattern is basically an agreed upon structure for certain design tasks. So if you look at this kind of generic wireframe of a site, you see some patterns here. Uh, you see there's a header with a you know logo and some navigation. You have a content area on the right. You have a sidebar on the left, and you have a footer on the bottom. A header, content, sidebar, and footer, you can think about them as design patterns. And I'm going to talk about a lot of them in this video. So let's start with the header. That usually includes a logo and navigation, maybe a search and something we haven't talked about, which are site alerts. And I'll give you an example in a second. So let's look at a few websites. Here is the site for the Institute of Domestic Technology. And the header here includes many of the elements I just mentioned. There is a logo, the navigation right here, a utility navigation on the top right, and a search that when clicked opens up a search bar. What's interesting about this site is that when you look at it on a mobile device, you actually don't get the pattern, again, a pattern of a hamburger, right? That we see on a lot of other sites. A hamburger, basically uh, three lines standing in for a menu button that then opens the menu. On this side, the menu is so small that we didn't need to hide the navigation on small screens because it always just fits. That is usually not true for other sites, but this one is a fairly small site. Uh, another example here is a site for an organization called Cell Dogs. And what we have here is drop downs, an easy way to get to secondary pages straight from the home page. If you look at this in the mobile device, we have the mobile menu. It's not a hamburger, it's not three lines, it's the word menu. When you click it, you get a list of all the links, kind of just in one row. This example is from the UCLA Lab School. And what's interesting here is that the menu, when you first get to the home page, obviously there's a lot of fun animations going on in the top half of the screen, but the menu is on the bottom when you first get there. And it also has a drop down menu, but since the menu is on the bottom, it's kind of a drop up menu in a way. So the secondary links go to the top. But if you scroll down, the drop down menus function in a more normal way. The other thing that happens here is if you scroll further down the page, the navigation, the entire header 
is sticky. So that's a design pattern that lets the user access the navigation at all times, no matter how long they've scrolled down. On you know many sites, you scroll down, you lose the navigation, you have to scroll back up if you want to go somewhere else. On this side, we decided to keep them around. So again, a pro for a sticky navigation menu is that the links will always be around and accessible. A reason not to do it might be that it's a little distracting if you want a user to focus solely on the content of each page. It also takes a little strip away from the screen real estate, right? The browser window is not as tall as it could be for the content of your site. Uh, it kind of depends on the project, what pattern to implement. Another site we've been looking at a lot the Pasadena Conservatory of Music. Here we implemented something that at the time we coined fat menus. So if you click on a main menu, you get this giant drop down with some text, images, and the links. At the time, we kind of like the energy that is created here and that you have a lot of space to present a lot of information in these drop downs. What's interesting though is that just in the last few weeks, we worked with the client to overhaul the website. And the website that's up currently as we speak actually lost these fat menus. So now we have much more regular drop down menus. And they also, it was part of an overhaul that also changed the main level navigation quite a bit. Um, and you know, that had been a few years, the needs of the clients changed. So we redesigned this site and the fat menus are no longer here. Let's look at one more example of a header. This website we designed for an environmental organization in Los Angeles, and it's somewhat of a publication. They wrote a climate action framework, and this website presents this writing. And if you scroll down, you get an introduction to the content. In the top right corner, you have a hamburger menu. So basically what happens here is that the main navigation is always hidden behind a menu. Most of the time, this only happens on mobile devices when there isn't enough space to display the navigation. But here we decided that we didn't want to overwhelm the viewer right away. So they have to do this extra click. Usually I'm not a big fan to make the user have to click on a menu link to see any kind of navigation. But here on this side, in this particular instance, it seemed appropriate. Let's talk quickly about a site alert. That's a design pattern for breaking news or something very important. And it's usually a strip that appears right above the header. Here is the Pasadena Conservatory of Music website and something that they had at the end of the year to ask people to donate for their end of the year giving. And this will pop up on every single page of the entire site until you close it. The user has the option to either click on the button or to close it. And once you close it, it will not show on other pages. So again, a site alert, something every user should see when they get to any page of the site. Now let's move on to the footer. We already talked about it a little bit. It's the area on the bottom of all pages, and it's a great place to include a copyright statement, repeat some navigation links. Sometimes an entire sitemap is included here. You know, you can repeat the logo and also display the social media links. Let's look at a few examples. Here's the Marciano Art Foundation website. If we scroll all the way to the bottom, you'll see the navigation from the header is basically repeated with a couple of extra items, including the social media links, the address, terms and conditions, credits, and a copyright line. Here's the site for the Root Simple blog. And what's interesting is that the footer here includes information that can only be found in the footer. So about us, press resources, and so on. Those links are only in the footer. They don't even appear in the header, mainly because this is a blog, right? This is about the blog posts primarily. So the navigation in the header just relates to that. Uh, any kind of secondary information is stuck into the footer, including a little blurb about what road simple is in the first place. If we look at Amazon, we see a giant footer and something that is often called a fat footer. Right? It takes up basically an entire screen and just has a bunch of links to areas in the website. So when you get to the bottom of the page and you haven't found what you're looking for, maybe these links will help you. I want to show something from my studio's website where we use the footer to create a bit of a fun 
experience and an Easter egg for the viewer, you can see that there is a cat that eventually starts walking across the screen on the very bottom, followed by a mouse. And when the cat passes the copyright symbol, it skews it a little bit. And when the mouse passes by on the return trip, it writes it. So we added this as a little joyful moment and some clients see it, others don't, but you know, for those who see it, they hopefully are a little bit delighted. And it shows you how you can use the bottom of a page to create a bit of a surprise, which reminds me on the Marciano website on the bottom too, you have this little bit of a sliver that peaks to a background image. And if you click on it, you actually see a big image that is hiding in the background, which is an alternate view of the inside of the museum. Again, it's a little Easter egg that we built into this side. Those who find it, I hope, get joy from it. But if you don't find it, then, you know, you're not missing something important either. So onto the sidebar. That's usually an area on the left or the right side of the screen that has some secondary content, like the navigation or ads will be displayed there. Sidebars used to be more popular, and I'm wondering if the rise of responsive design and the fact that on mobile phones you don't have a sidebar because there's just not enough space to have something next to the content. So a lot of designers got used to designing on mobile without sidebars and that maybe trickled back into the desktop experience. But let's look at a few examples of sidebars. Here back at the Root Simple website, we have a sidebar that has an introduction to Root Simple, links to social media, books that the authors have written, and then eventually there's a space for advertisements that can be displayed here. And here's an example from Amazon. Uh, I searched for something and then on the left side you could call that a sidebar and it basically has somewhat of a secondary navigation and a way to refine your search results and to add some filters. So that is all included in a sidebar. And then another example from the Washington Post, I'm looking at a specific article here. And in the sidebar on the right, you can see that we are presented with suggested articles, the most read stories in the lifestyle section, uh, a little ad to entice us to become a paying member. And then something that I find quite interesting, things that you would usually find in the footer, like the copyright symbol, a couple of very secondary menus like help and contact us, policies and terms of service, etc. That is all in the sidebar here. And it kind of makes sense because the pages on the Washington Post are quite long. So if someone is looking for that information that you usually would find in a footer, it's kind of cool to put it into the sidebar so a user gets to it quite easily. Um, one thing we should also point out here, if you look on the left, there's a sticky sidebar that provides all kinds of social media sharing options. So that is displayed at all times. So if a user feels that after reading or while reading a story, they really need to share this with their friends, they can do that at all times. So let's move on to the content section of a web page and the design patterns I want to talk about here are the hero slider, accordions, tabs, and something that I call 255025. But let's start with the hero slider. And that is simply a big slideshow that is often included on the home page or on the top of a page that provides a graphical overview either of the site or the page. And it usually includes images, sometimes it includes text, and sometimes it includes quite a bit of animation. So let's look at a few examples. On the Cell Dogs website, you have a few images that are cycled through automatically. So what happens is there's a new image comes in, it kind of dims with a gradient, and then some text is overlaid, explaining to us the story of this organization. Oftentimes for slideshow, there's this design pattern that shows us how many slides there are. Usually it's circles. And you can see here that there is four circles. One is filled at a time, which indicates the current slide. And it kind of cycles through and we see which one is currently active. And we can even click on them and get to a particular slide. Okay, and back to the UCLA Lab School, that very involved animation on the top of the homepage you can also call a hero slider, somewhat of a slideshow. And obviously there's a lot more going on. Text slides in, elements build, elements float in and animate, 
And basically what happens here, though, is that the story of the UCLA Lab School is being told. You know, what are they about? What makes them special and unique? And it's all told in this very graphic, engaging animation. The Pasadena Conservatory of Music also has a slideshow on the top of their homepage. And again, this is pretty much a palette cleanser. It basically introduces us to the site graphically. And we see musicians in their teens, older folks playing music together, young children playing music, and everything is very colorful and there are circles around and it kind of sets the tone for the rest of the site. On to accordions. That's a design pattern that, as the name suggests, lets the user open and close certain elements on your page. And what it's really great for is when you have a lot of content and you want to first present an overview of all the content. So when the accordions are closed, you see maybe the headline for that section and a user can then decide to open that section if they're interesting. But they see an overview of all the headlines first instead of a giant long document. So let's look at a few examples here. On the guitar page, for example, you get to a section where it describes the programs for the guitar department. And there are four separate programs and you can see the name of each program here. And on the right is an error indicating that there is more information. And if I click on a section, it opens up and shows more information. I can open all of the sections and they can also be closed, but compare when they are all open, what the user experience is now, instead of seeing all four programs, I only see one, right? And I have to scroll down to get an overview. It's much nicer to first see all four programs at once and then being able to choose the one that I am interested in. Another example is on the Wikipedia side, but here it's actually the mobile side that employs the accordion. On the desktop side, you see all the information is listed normally, but if we switch to the mobile view, because you have such a smaller viewport and scrolling down through a long article would take a long time, after an introduction, you actually have this accordion pattern where you see the headlines of each section and the section is collapsed, but if I click or tap on it, it opens up and lets me read it. So you basically see the document outline for this article first and are then able to click on the section that you want to read about more. A little similar to accordions are tabs. They're also a good design pattern to handle a lot of information where you need to show a user all the information that's available without actually showing it all because there isn't enough space. And it takes a cue from the physical world from file folders right, that have little tabs on the side uh, so you can file documents into them. That idea is carried out graphically. So you have tabs going across and it should be very obvious which one is the current one and the user can click on another tab to select it and then the information of that tab is being shown. As an example, we can look at the Mac Center website where the secondary navigation is actually presented in a tapped pattern. Here we are in the site section and there are four subsections, Overview, Schindler House, Mackey Apartments, and so on. And those are presented as tabs. So if I click on a subsection, that tab becomes active and shows us the content of that section. Here's another example from a site called Moo.com. They offer printing services and I'm in the flyer section and there are tabs going across here. So I can look at the pricing and the design guidelines and I can look at small flyers, square flyers, long flyers, and so on. The tab that I click on gets highlighted and the content underneath changes. Again, it's a way to design a lot of information in a way that it is very accessible for a user. And lastly, here is a design pattern that I call 25-50-25. And this refers to a way of splitting up your content area into percentages. Um, and I've seen this done on a lot of sites, especially sites that have a lot of text content. And I find it very interesting. So I want to talk about it a little bit. So as you can see here, you have basically three columns. One is 25%, one's 50%, and another one is 25%. And that allows you to do quite a bit of interesting 
layout decisions for content, for images, text, captions, pull quotes, etc. As you can see here, right? Some images are in the on the side. Some images are in the middle. There's text that goes in the middle column, but then there's smaller bits of text that go on either side. And the image on the bottom is actually spanning one column and the center column. The way this actually works in the wild, let's look at a really nicely designed blog called The Great Discontent. They publish a lot of interviews with creative people. And here is an example. And as you can see, it starts with a big giant image of the interview subjects. Then you have a headline and some introduction. But then when you get to this lighter area, this 25, 50, 25 pattern, as I call it, really emerges. You have three columns. The center column is bigger, about 50%. And then you have a column on the left and the right. And the main text goes down the center. And the right and the left is taking up with secondary information. So a pull quote or a little ad for a printed magazine. And as we scroll down, you see that one image here spans the left column and the center column and the right column is filled up with a caption. Then there's a giant pull quote that spans all three columns. Then it goes back into just the middle column being used for the main text, another pull quote and so on. What I like about this is that it provides a nice structure to deal with a lot of text and images in a way that still ends up being surprising and interesting for the reader. You can create a lot of hierarchy with just these three columns and a lot of different layouts. If you want to learn a lot more about design patterns and discover even more patterns, I've only touched on a few here, I would point you to the site uipatterns.com. The website is ui-patterns.com and there's a section for design patterns and it has a lot of them. Some of them that I've covered like tabs and menus and slideshows, but there's a lot more here to look at. So I invite you to go to this website and do a little bit of further reading. I want to talk a little bit about common form elements that you might find on a website. Forms are obviously a way to gather user input and let's take a look at what kind of form fields are possible. We'll start with checkboxes and radio buttons. These design patterns are really great when you want the user to select something from a list of predefined options. And checkboxes enable the user to select multiple options from a list. It's basically an and selection. Select so this and this and this. So in this example, apples and oranges are selected. And for radio buttons, you can only select one option. So it's an or selection. Select this or this or this. In the example, apples is selected. And if the user were to click on oranges, apples would be unselected and oranges would be selected. And the default visual cue for separating these two patterns is that checkboxes are rectangular and radio buttons are round. That doesn't have to be like this in the final UI, but if you have HTML, for example, without any styling attached, then it would look very similar to these wireframe examples. Now, a drop down list is another design pattern for a form, and it's quite similar to radio buttons. It also allows you to choose one option from a list, but the options are presented in a more compact space. This is actually quite similar to an accordion. You kind of see a headline in this instance, select fruit, and you don't see anything else. But when you click on it, you see the options and you can make a selection. So drop down lists are really great for instances where you have lots and lots of options. Uh, let's compare them real quick to radio buttons, right? Which one should you choose if you have a list of options and you want the user to select one of them? Well, radio buttons have the advantage that the user is able to see all the options at once without having to do anything. You know, they don't have to do an extra click. The options are just presented and the user can make a decision. But the advantage of a drop down list is that if you have a lot of options, you save some screen real estate and you make things less busy. So imagine asking the user to select the state that they live in. Well, a drop down list is pretty great here because the answer is fairly simple, right? I know which state to look for. It's not a difficult decision for me. And there are so many states. There's 50 in the United States. So a drop down list is a more appropriate design pattern to use. 
Next up, uh, text fields, and those are pretty straightforward. It allows the user to type in something into a field uh, for freeform answers. And they come in two flavors, though. There's a single line field that allows the user to type in a short amount of information. But then sometimes you uh, want the user to type quite a bit. There is something called a text area that allows for multi-line text input. One question you might ask yourself when you're designing a form is what you're going to do with the data. Uh, how are you going to process it? Uh, text fields are great if you don't know what kind of answer the user might give. Uh, you know, they can type whatever, but if you want to use the data in a more structured way, so, you know, in our fruit example, if we want to build a graph and see which fruit is the most popular, it's actually easier if you have a predefined list because you can process the data much more easily. Because when people type data into a text field, you don't know what you're going to get. You don't even know in this instance if they're going to write in a fruit or just something random. So that's something to uh, keep in mind. Next up, we have a number stepper that's pretty straightforward. It's a user interface element that allows people to choose a whole number. You can have minimum and maximum numbers. Uh, so you could say, well, you know, the minimum is two, the maximum is nine, and then people wouldn't be able to click above and below that number. And then we have a slider, which can be somewhat similar to a number stepper, but it doesn't have to be numbers. A slider is also really great for information where you want to select between two extremes like speed and sour, and the user can indicate, well, what do they like? Do they like it all the way to one side, all the way to the other, or somewhere in the middle? A date picker enables users to select a date in the context of a calendar, right? If you need a date to be input by the user, let's say they want to indicate what day they want to fly somewhere or what day they want to rent a vacation rental. First thing they need to do is select the date. That is oftentimes easier when you have a calendar in front of you. You can ask people to just type in numbers, but the data validation also gets a little tricky, right? Do you type in the month first or the date first? That depends which country you're in. What if people type in a date that doesn't exist, like November 31st, for example? So it's nice when people can just click on the calendar icon and see an entire calendar. And you have the days of the week and you can cycle through each month and it's much easier to pick a date. And data validation is kind of taken care for you. So once they select the date, that gets filled in to the text box. On off buttons are really great for binary choices. So you'll see those a lot in menus where people set options. You know, do you want to receive emails from us, for example? And there would be a choice of yes or no on and off. And a little toggle switch is a great design pattern for that. And then lastly, we have buttons. So those can be clicked on and they trigger an action after some information has been provided via other form elements. It's often the kind of submit this form buttons, I am done, or go to the next screen. They can be different shapes, they can have icons to make them a little bit more clear, or they can even have arrows in the example of getting to the next screen or going to the previous screen. So those are a few common form elements. Of course, there are more advanced elements or hybrids that uh, you will find across websites that get quite a bit more complex. Uh, so I just wanted to show one form element that is a little bit more complex from a project that I've worked on. A few years ago, I created a website that lists every single student that has studied at the CalArts design program. And the website has a big search field. So that's basically a text input field. But what happens if you click and start typing, you get a list of suggestions. So that marries a text field with a drop down menu. And once you see the name that you're looking for, you can just select it. So it's a lot easier for the user. Once you select the name, the name actually becomes part of that search field. So it's almost like a checkbox pattern. This name is now checked. I can remove it by clicking the X or I can add a new name. Um, but you can see it seems like it's just a text box, but then it does all these other more advanced and complex things that are a hybrid of other form elements. Let's talk a little bit about home pages. A home page is often the very first page that your users will land on as they visit your website. So it's a pretty crucial page. And it makes sense to spend a little bit of time asking ourselves, what is the job of the home page? How can the home page help you achieve your goals? 
And what should you include here in terms of content? Here are a few things that, in my opinion, a homepage needs to deliver on. First, it should communicate the voice or the brand of your website. That is mostly achieved with visual design, so with colors and images and textures, etc. We'll have to wait until next week when we start the visual design phase to get to that. But remember that language also plays a big part of communicating a brand. And you can set the tone right on the homepage. Is your language friendly or snotty or reserved or authoritative or funny or irreverent? Do you use a lot of words or only a few? These are important questions to ponder during the wireframing phase. Second, the homepage should provide navigation options that take your users to the content of your site. The homepage is also a great place to introduce your products or your mission to people that are visiting for the first time. They might be completely unfamiliar with your site, so ask yourself, what do they need to know right away? Sometimes you only have a few seconds to convince a user to stay and explore further. Your homepage should answer the basic questions of, what is this? What can I do here? Where do I start? And lastly, you can use the homepage to show some real content. That might be the latest blog post, or a featured product, or an upcoming event, or a video explaining your service, a download button, or a sign-up form. Something that provides value to your users right away. Okay, so let's talk about what elements should be included on a homepage. I would argue that for the vast majority of sites, you will definitely want to include a logo, or at least the title or name of the website. Remember we talked about the user's question of where am I as a fundamental concern in the wayfinding lesson. You'll also want to include some sort of navigation. Both of these items usually end up in the header of the page. Then there are things that most sites will include on the homepage, like a tagline. That's a short and precise sentence that summarizes the mission of the website. A call to action is also often appropriate. What is the most important thing you want your users to do? Pick up the phone and call you? Well, then provide a phone number right on your homepage. Sign up for a free trial? Then have a sign up form. Or do you want your users to find out more about your featured product? Then display a learn more button. Most sites will also have a footer with secondary information, such as address, additional links, and copyright and privacy statements. Social media links are also often included, and most likely will find a place in the header or at the footer. And then there are a few elements that are maybes. A hero image, for example. That's a term for a big, often dramatic, image that sets the mood for your site and shows off its products or services. Sometimes there are several hero images that are displayed in a slideshow. Some sites have a search function, and as I already mentioned, it's often helpful to show some actual content right away. Let's check in with the Apple site for an example. Here we can see most of the elements I just talked about being employed right on the homepage. The logo, the navigation, a search function, a featured product with a hero image, and a tagline and very prominent calls to action, learn more or buy. There are a couple more featured products as you scroll down, and then there's quite an extensive footer with additional links, phone numbers, and legal information. The one thing that I can't find on this page are any links to social media. Okay, so let's look at a lot of other homepage examples. Since we've already talked about navigation and footers in other lessons, I want to specifically focus here on the content area of the homepage. What goes here? I have found in my own work that sometimes it's fairly easy to figure out what content should be included on the homepage, but at other times, it can almost feel that a site doesn't even need a homepage at all. So let's talk about specific strategies you can employ. Looking around the web, I have discovered that there are certain distinct approaches that can be categorized as follows. Table of contents, featured contents, palette cleanser, call to action, narrative, fork in the roads, and fusion. By the way, these labels aren't an official agreed upon list or anything. I simply made them up, although I think they are pretty descriptive. And it's entirely possible that there are additional categories. In fact, I invite you to think about other strategies that you would add here. Let's talk about each item in this list while looking at actual websites as examples. Some of these websites that I'll show are sites that I have worked on myself. So, table of contents. 
This is a strategy where the home page consists of a list of links that point to the content contained in the site. It's a bit like a table of contents in a printed magazine or a book. Let's take a look at the pioneering women of American architecture site for an example. This website is mainly a collection of two dozen essays about women architects that made an important contribution to the field of architecture. The homepage simply lists the names of all women. When you click on a name, you get a detail page for the architect. You can also look at this list sorted chronologically based on the women's lifespans. And there's a pictorial view where the list is represented by an image. But again, this homepage acts like a table of contents. You see a list of everything that's contained in the side, and you can make a selection. The Marciano Art Foundation website doesn't actually list all content on the homepage, but it introduces important sections and acts as a jumping off point to the content. A user basically has two ways to navigate. They can click on something in the main navigation right away, or they can scroll down and get an overview of the site's content. Which path a user chooses probably depends on how experienced they are with the museum or if they came to the site with a very specific question. People coming here for the first time might want to get a little bit of context about the museum first. These users can scroll down and get an overview of the most important things. What's on view? What are the upcoming events? What is the Marciano Art Foundation in the first place? On the other hand, someone coming to the site wanting to know the opening times of the bookstore, well, they will probably click on bookstore in the navigation and get straight to the content they need. Here's another good example, the IRS site. And for full disclosure, this is not a site that I had any hand in designing. But we can see here the table of content strategy really well. The most important common user scenarios and tasks are addressed right on the homepage. If I'm looking to find out about my refund status, well, there's a big link right here. And if I want to apply for an EIN, well, there it is. Same thing if I'm looking for a specific form. I would imagine that the IRS uses actual analytics data in deciding which topics will appear on the homepage. And these might change seasonally. Right before April 15th, when taxes are due in the US, the site might draw special attention to information about filing taxes. Right after April 15th, maybe there's a link about filing for an extension for any stragglers who didn't file on time. I'll show you one more website that utilizes a table of content strategy, but not in a very imaginative way. Alas, it's one of the first sites I ever designed and it's still up on the internet. It's a tribute site for the painter Edward Munch. And besides an obvious late 90s inspired web design, you can see here that I didn't really know what to do with the homepage. I mean, there's a photograph of the artist and one of his paintings, but then I simply added the main navigation as a free flowing list of links. Granted, the hover effects are kind of fun, but I now realize that what doesn't work so well is the fact that the main navigation isn't introduced in the same way it will be displayed on the secondary pages. There's a disconnect between the homepage and the other pages in terms of navigation layouts, and it creates some disorientation for the user. Let's move on to the next strategy, featured content. Here, the homepage is used to display some actual content right away. This is great for e-commerce sites and blogs where you'll want to showcase either featured content or the latest contents. So for a site like the Washington Post, a news site, it makes absolute sense to show the very latest and most important news stories right on the homepage. It's pretty similar to how a traditional newspaper front page works. On Amazon's homepage, you see some featured products and product categories, and you'll see what's most popular. Or if you happen to be logged in to your account, you get specific recommendations just for you based on previous searches and purchases. Here's the blog Root Simple that I designed a few years ago. And as expected, the latest blog post shows up first so that readers can get to it right on the homepage. And after that post, they get the second latest post and so on. Lastly, here's the site for the CalArts poster archive that my studio developed in collaboration with Michael Worthington and a few grad students. Here, the homepage gets to the point right away. There's a collection of posters in an orderly grid. The user can filter this list by year or subject matter and they can search for something specific. And of course, they can click on a poster for more information and a bigger image. But much of the action happens right on the homepage. Onto the next strategy, the palette cleanser. 
Here the homepage is used to set a tone or a mood. It provides the user a moment of pause before delving into the content of the site. It's a little bit like the cover of a book perhaps. It lets you establish an iconic visual introduction to your site. Here's the Schindler Lab website as an example, another site my studio designed. It's an online publication for a cultural institution and we decided to make a bold visual statement to set the tone. There's some introduction text as you scroll down and you can access the table of contents via a link, but the homepage acts like a book cover for this publication. Here's a site for the construction company Braunstruction. There are four links in the main navigation, about, projects, press, and contact, that will take you to the actual content of the site. The homepage, though, uses much of the real estate for a beautiful image of a project that Braunstruction has worked on. This image, by the way, changes randomly every time the homepage is loaded. And one more, the website for Dosa, a clothing design company. Here we have a simple list of navigation items to the left, and on the right side, you have a beautiful mood image. I think there's a place for the palette cleanser, but keep in mind that this homepage strategy can make a website feel a bit static. If you want to communicate that your site is always up to date and not stale, then you might employ strategies that ensure that your homepage doesn't look the same all the time. But again, it depends on the project. In a little bit, we'll see how you can employ the palette cleanser strategy in conjunction with other strategies. The call to action is a singular action that you want the user to do before leaving the site. That might be creating an account, or calling a phone number, or downloading a file, starting a chat, or purchasing a product or service. Here are a few examples. Monday is a productivity tool, and on their homepage, it is very clear what they want you to do next. Enter your email and sign up for a free account. In fact, most homepages for online services will have this in common. Get a new user to sign up or existing users to log in. Google.com is a curious case of a call to action website. Well, there's one singular thing to do here, search for something. Note that compared to other search engines, those that are still around and those that are not, Google doesn't show you any secondary content like the most popular websites or the latest news or anything else that gets in between you and your search results. That's pretty great UX, right? And in my opinion, it's probably one big reason why Google Search took over the world, even though it was one of the later search engines to enter the market. Here's another fun example. Donate your tab. This service uses your computer's processing power to temporarily mine bitcoins with the proceeds being donated to an important cause. And here's a ginormous call to action, a toggle button to turn on the mining. Then we have the narrative as a strategy for the homepage. Here, the homepage is used to explain or introduce the site's mission. This often involves scrolling or a slideshow. Here are a few examples. The Burden of Genius site is for a documentary film about the physician who performed the first successful liver transplant. At first, the homepage seems a bit like a palate cleanser, a big iconic photo and a title. But as you scroll down, you get a bit of a narrative in the form of captions and images. And at the end of this sequence, there's a call to action to watch the trailer. Here is the HostGator homepage. As you scroll down, you get an introduction to their hosting services and they tell you how they're different, how to get started and what other people have said in praise of their company. And the fun animations bring a bit of surprise and joy to the experience. I often call what is happening here narrative scrolling. As you scroll down the page, a narrative unfolds in words, images, and animations. I'm a big fan of it, actually. And sometimes this is pushed to an extreme. Consider the website Every Last Drop. This site seems to be a marriage of a comic book and a movie, only that your scrolling controls the action. As you scroll down here and you can see the scroll bar moving down on the right, the character in the story wakes up and starts his day. He gets dressed, eats breakfast, commutes, and goes to work, evidently as an astronaut, no less. Along the way, there are stats that tell us about the importance of clean water and conservation. All right, two more strategies to cover. 
The fork in the road strategy is great for sites that need to immediately send users onto different paths depending on what user group they belong to. For example, the website for Napster, which is a music streaming service, bifurcates the homepage into two different sections for two different user groups, businesses and personal accounts. You must make this decision as the very first thing before being able to move on. Here's the homepage for Coca-Cola. It doesn't really provide us with much information, but instead we are asked to choose the country we live in. Each country then has a unique Coca-Cola website all of its own. And on the website for capital investing, you get to choose what kind of investor you are, if you'd like to work with an advisor or invest on your own. Each one of these options leads to a separate section of the site tailor-made for the specific audience. And finally, a homepage strategy I call Fusion. That's simply a combination of multiple strategies. In fact, most websites will employ more than one of the strategies that I covered here. Let's look at two examples. On the Airbnb side, we can find palette cleanser, call to action, and featured content. And on the site for Paymo, a project management service, we have call to action, fork in the road, and a narrative. Here's the homepage for Airbnb. The large images in the background are what I would call a palette cleanser. They set the tone for the sides by showcasing beautiful vacation locations. The call to action is also very prominent, a big search box. And as you scroll down, you get some featured content, including featured homes around the world. By the way, they also implemented an interesting functionality here. No matter how much I scroll down, there's always more content that loads automatically. That's called an infinite scroll, by the way. On the Paymo side, we get a big call to action. Start a free trial. As you scroll down, there's also a fork in the roads. You can choose between being part of a team or being a freelancer. And then as you scroll further, there's a narrative explaining the service that Paymo provides, including nice illustrations, a list of problems that the software solves, user testimonials, key features, and so on. And then when you reach the end of the page, just in case, there's another call to action. All right, we have made it through our investigation of homepage strategies. This should give you a good foundation and some inspiration for the homepage of your project that you're designing in this course. So what tools might you use to create your wireframes? Of course, there is pen and paper. You can always use that. And sometimes I think it's a good idea to start there you know, just get your thoughts out there, do something nimbly with your hands. Uh, it's kind of nice to start design processes with your hands instead of the computer. However, eventually I would suggest that wireframes should end up in the computer, if only that it allows you to revise them more easily. You know, oftentimes you go through multiple phases when working with a client and presenting a first set of wireframes will oftentimes lead to changes that need to be implemented. And if you're working by hand, you just have to start over, right? Or you erase and everything gets kind of smudgy. So I like working on the computer for final wireframes. So Illustrator is another fine option for a tool to create wireframes. It allows you to create boxes and text and lines, and that's kind of all we need for wireframes, right? So the example here is a wireframe I created in Illustrator for an architecture studio. And what you're seeing here is the wireframe for the landing page. Where Illustrator can get tricky is that it allows you to do kind of too much, right? You put down a piece of type, you actually have to choose the typeface and you might get into this rabbit hole of, you know, hunting for the best typeface for your wireframes, where, as I said before, it's not the time to make those kind of decisions. So instead, there are some designated wireframe tools out there. And the one that I really like is called Balsamic. It's made with the sole purpose to allow you to create wireframes. They have an app that you can download and install on your computer, but they also have a cloud-based tool that works in your browser. And the nice thing is that they actually give you a 30-day free trial to try out their software. So I would really encourage you to create your wireframes for this class in Balsamic. And I think you'll find the software quite intuitive and easy to learn. I'm just going to give you a quick tour so you will get an idea of how the software works. So here I am logged into Balsamic Cloud and you can have multiple projects here. And you see there's already one that I created 
which is for a previous lecture, right? I created all the form UI elements that I showed in a previous lecture here in Balsamic. And you'll see these patterns come with Balsamic. You don't have to create them on your own. So if I wanted to add another checkbox item here, I can double click. There's a specific easy to learn syntax. So if I wanted to add another checkbox item that isn't selected, I can do that. And there it is in my wireframe. So let me create a quick wireframe from scratch. I can create a new wireframe that's completely blank and add a few elements. And I find the best way to work with Balsamic is to use the quick add function. You just type in what you need. So uh, first thing I'll need is a browser window. I now type in browser and here in the list, the UI element actually shows up. I click on it and there it is. All right. So now I can make it bigger. Um, I can double click on it. There are some options, All right? My site. Uh, site.com these two things now show up in the browser window and since i don't want to inadvertently select this browser window i can lock it by right clicking on it and saying lock all right so what else are we going to add here maybe a logo for that i usually just use an icon and a label pattern there it is some text underneath just an empty empty icon. If I click on it, I can label it and I can also add some links. So there's a button bar pattern. I can have a comma separated list here. Let's just say about us, our products and contact. Then we'll add a title for the page title. And maybe this about us page just has a video player and a caption. So I can search for video, add a player here. You know, resize it however I want. And then let's say there's a caption to the left of it, just describing what this video will show us. If I search for block, I'll get this pattern called a block of text. Maybe we don't know what that caption will say. We just know it'll say something, right? So instead of having to write it at this point, we'll just indicate, oh, there's going to be some text there. At this point, I should also show you that there's actually two flavors of this wireframing skin that Balsamic comes with. If you go to the project info, there is a skin option right here on the bottom. And right now I'm using the sketch skin, which has quite a bit of a hand drawing feel to it. But there's also a more streamlined wireframe skin that looks a little bit cleaner, right? So it kind of depends what you prefer. So let's quickly create a second wireframe for the Our Products page. I can just go to the page here on the left and click on Duplicate. And then I have a copy of the previous wireframes. I can delete the elements I don't need. This title becomes products. Here, when I click on the button bar, I can change which link is actually active. So now our navigation reflects the page that we're on. And here, maybe we just have some thumbnail images. So image, that's just a box with an X, make that a certain size, and I can hit command D to duplicate it. And now I have four products that presumably when we click on them, go to a detail page, right? So my second wireframe is already done in this very simple example. Anyway, um, the last thing I'll show is you can use this tool also to make a clickable prototype. Let's actually name our wireframes here. So this is about this one is our products. So now when I click on the button bar on the about us page, there are links. The Our Products link goes to the Our Products page. And then on the Our Products page, the About Us links to About. Then I can use Balsamic to actually have a click through. So I do that by going into the presentation mode with the link on the top right corner, full screen presentation. And now I can click on About Us, go to the About Us page, click on Our Products, or toggle back and forth. And it seems like I'm navigating this website and you can kind of see how this can become fairly complex. I got to say, I don't use Balsamic all that often in that way. I usually just print things out or make PDFs and send it to a client and then have a discussion about them. But since this is cloud-based, you could actually send a link to a client, have them navigate through your wireframes. Hello. Welcome back. Hey. hey. Ready to talk about wireframes. Um, we already talked about strategy. Outline of scope, sitemap. And now we're starting to actually put things on to a visual. Visual, yeah. Starting with some visuals. Right. A little sad still. <laughs> Great. That's a box of axis. But important in the 
sequence of user experience, mm -hmm. allowing us to make some preliminary decisions uh, without getting caught up in colors, typefaces, that kind yeah. of stuff. Bradley, we'll start with you. Um, cool. Again, your your project is about affordable affordable poke in Westwood. Yeah, yeah. Right. targeted to college students, college students. and yeah, urban environment. Only open at night. Only open at night. Quick delivery. Right. Partiers and students. Yeah. Main target Late audience. Night, you know, studiers yeah. as well. So here's your homepage, um, the wireframe, uh, and you gotta mention you focus most of your um, investigations on mobile because you had yeah. determined early on that your target audience would mostly be using it on a, on a mobile phone. Yeah. Right. And why? Uh, I think it's just more quick and it's more easier. I think, you know, people in college typically are on their phone anyway, so yeah. it makes more sense. And also if you're like out and about, like you yeah. won't be with a desktop computer. Yeah. Most, most likely. likely. Yeah. yeah. More and more. Or even in your dorm room. Yeah. That's the case more and more often yeah. now, I think. Yeah. Cool. And one thing, we should actually also look at your sitemap here mm -hmm. for a second. Some uh, things that have changed. Yeah. There's two things that have changed here in the in the back. You see the the um, main navigation and something has changed. You want to talk about that? Yeah. So if you notice, there's actually a question mark instead of the word questions. And I think that was really just to like save space. You know, it's just like a quicker read. And then also... So you exchanged the word questions for just the mark. Yeah. I think that was a lot quicker. And but also, it, also, it also makes a little bit of a... I don't know, with your voice of being yeah. a little bit edgy, it just kind of reduces things. and Exactly. Little sn I don't know if that's... It's, it's just a little, um, yeah, a little more edgy. Maybe. Yeah, right. And also, if you notice, I have order instead of poke, because I think that would be a little redundant to have poke fresh up in the top left corner and then also have poke right under it. Mm -hmm. I think we know, seeing the logo and you know, the logo type, that it's a poke restaurant. Yeah, you know, so to have poke on there twice just seems like would right. Because earlier you thought that would be kind of cool to explain in your menu um, that this is all about poke. Yeah, and if you let's say your your website was called Fresh Fair or something, mm -hmm. right? It would probably make sense to have your first menu item be poke. Mm -hmm. But since it is called Poke Fresh, that's it's yeah, redundant. Yeah. But you didn't really know it at the sitemap stage. It was a realization that happened when we were looking at the right. layout. Yeah, which is fine, and, and something to stress and remember that these are not set in stones. These decisions, there are often realizations that come in later. Yeah, so certain things will change as you go. Yeah, yeah. and that's fine, right. and encouraged, right. and important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, all right, so let's yeah. walk through go uh, back. some of these. Yeah, so I guess on the home page, it's really just the most important stuff. Like you have the price. The delivery radius of so serving the nine zero zero two four. It's the West that's the, code. Air, uh, the yeah. Code, yeah. So it's just everything's immediately there, and we deliver within the hour. So it says you know price area delivery time. Yeah, exactly. And, and what's that? Call the to action. Order button. Yeah, so you can just click and order immediately once you're on the home page for quick, quick read. And what's the big X? Oh, that would be where an image would go. So some kind of gradient or an image would go in the background. Yeah. That's to be decided. To be decided because this, you know, at this stage, it's forgoing mm -hmm. all of that and it's kind of, you know. Yeah, you're just laying it all out. Yeah. Important to stress. Like, yeah, exactly. Not of concern right now. If you knew exactly what image, I guess you could, you know, put it even in your wireframe. But it's it's totally fine not to know that right now. That's that's why we do wireframes, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That we can make the important decisions and leave the visual decisions for later. Yeah. Same thing. We don't know what this logo really looks like. like we don't know what this typeface is. Yeah. We don't know what this button will be like. It's all in place it's, for now. Yeah. yeah. So let's walk looks through some others. So this is once you click on order, order now. now. Yeah, it take you to the decision page. So yeah, again, super simple, just two big buttons. You have faves, which was uh, in the language of, our, of the project, and custom. And it's, it's supposed to be easy to use when drunk, basically, yeah. you know, or just kind of in your face, kind of snarky. A little snarky, right? A little bit. Just yeah, not like, over the top. It's just. Well, know. we're not gonna, you know, it's not gonna. We're not gonna have pretty language around it, or you yeah. know, it's just like two big buttons, kind yeah. of a little, yeah, almost somewhat funny. Maybe. Yeah, a cartoon. There's a sense of humor to it for yeah. sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, then we click on click on faves. Yeah. We get here. Yeah, and like again, these are in place for 
um, images, the big boxes. And again, staying with like the big buttons, you can buy. Yeah. Also, yeah, a creating little bit a, of a description. Yeah, a little description, like playing with like the language of the site again, just kind of like fun names for the items. Mm -hmm. Tiki Tuna. Yeah. And then let's say we're clicking on buy for one of these. Yeah. This happens. Yeah, and then you can either click out of it or stay so, in So it. this is the, the shopping cart, right? Exactly, yeah. And it slides in from the right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you can check out from there. And the nice thing about it sliding in from the right is that you stay in place, that you're not going to another, another page. You kind of don't lose your page. So you could easily X out of it. And add more. And add more. Right. Or you can click on checkout. Yeah. But let's say we are going to, I guess we'll go to... Yeah, this would be the customization page. Yeah. So from that other decision point page with faves and custom, this would be the custom page. So yeah, again, you see there's like little boxes that would represent images or like symbols for each menu item. Not really sure at this point yet, but those are just in place for that. So you would click, you know, onto each menu item and it would, you know, allow you to customize. It would be selected. Selected yeah. and like it would show you what's selected as you right. go down through the page. So it's really a long scroll. It's a long scroll. Which yeah. I guess there are other ways to do it. You could do tabs and you click next. Um, you know, there's five different customization options, I think, right? Five. Mm -hmm. um, you could list them in the top. Um, but I guess, you know, for a mobile phone especially, it's so easy to scroll. Yeah. It's like unfussy. Sense. It's just mm -hmm. like, it's probably the quickest way to do it, right? You just yeah. go choose your options. Yeah, and if there comment. are comments. And yeah. if there's comments, there's a little comment section. Exactly. And then you click add to cart. And then the checkout, you know, it's meant to be super quick. Um, no account is really necessary at all. Delivery info and credit card info. Yeah. That's really nice. Yep. And then you click on purchase. Yeah. And it takes you to a thank you page and shows you where your order is according to where you are. Cool. Yeah. I guess you did, um, do I have that? Um, you did a desktop wireframe. I did too. do a quick desktop wireframe as well. And, you know, things just expand. The image gets bigger, I guess, yeah. on the background. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, <laughs> the buttons. buttons get even bigger. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's really just an expanded version, you know, horizontally, basically. Of yeah. Instead of vertically. Yeah, because, yeah. you know, it's, it stays to the screen. Cool. All right. Yeah, some quick mock-ups. Yeah. That's good. Allison, onto your wireframes. But first, let's talk a little bit about your software that you use to create these wireframes. I have a Bradley's here on the left and Allison's on the right. Bradley used a, wire, uh, a wireframe tool called Balsamic. Right. right. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, Balsamic is uh, either cloud-based or you can download it onto your desktop. What I really liked about it was instead of like trying to decide what typeface to use and stuff, it has preset typefaces and like images and symbols to use. So if you see like Pokefresh versus Peachy Pasta, that's the typeface that comes with Balsamic. That's it, one yeah. typeface. One typeface, so you don't have to worry about it. So it's really easy just to like do it and not think about you know the visuals as much. And there's some other yeah. symbols like buttons, Images like the boxes with the X's. Yeah. Some symbols just all out of the box. Yeah, it's a super useful tool. Yeah. Yeah. And it's made just for wireframes. Yeah, exactly. Actually, we could go to the website here. Yeah. So, so you have a web app, um, a desktop app, and also a Google Drive add on. Here's some examples. Yeah. I did the sketch skin, but there's also a wireframe skin, which is more like. A little cleaner. Cleaner, right? and the sketch is a little more like as if I'd done it by hand. I kind of like that yeah. a little bit more personally. That's, uh, you know, that's what I like about it as well, that it looks like someone almost drew it. So yeah. when you present it to a client, it's not like, wait a minute, uh, why does it look so weird? Like, my website shouldn't look like that. Well, that's the point. Like, everyone right. understands it's really just a, a drawing of a... Um, of a skeleton of a site. Yeah, um, but also the fact that it looks drawn, I guess for me, it's like if I had actually drawn it, it would look a lot crazier. So it still re retains yeah. some, right. you know. Plus having it in digital form makes it easier to uh, edit. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And yeah. 
develop it over time. It is not free though, right? There's a trial, mm-hmm. um, free trial, but yeah. you have to pay uh, some money either monthly or uh, for the desktop app a one-time fee. So, if you already have Illustrator, there is a re- you know if you don't want to um, you know buy, buy another subscription or software, yeah, then you can just use software. Illustrator. And that's what yeah. that's what you did. Yeah. Uh, and you, I guess, uh, here in, in, in your wireframe, you kind of drew a browser around it. You just made that up, right? Mm-hmm. And obviously, Illustrator is good at drawing circles and, you know, has a type tool and lines. I mean, it's not... In a way, it's uh, you can certainly use uh, Illustrator just fine. But the restrictions of balsamic and the fact that it's made to... Um, do wireframes. Do wireframes. Yeah, makes sense. Kind of has an advantage. Uh, but um, let's look at yours, Alison. Let's walk through... Pichy pasta. Yeah, so this was uh, yeah, this is my this is my final wireframe that uh, we came up with. Um, it includes some of the original elements that I had described, having like where the black boxes are would be photos and pictures, um, and it has like the final copy that I will use uh, in the visual mock-up. Um, Instead of using an infographic, I just set up um, some some simple steps leading up to the button that'll lead you to the rest of the site, and then the live uh, live chat support is at the bottom. Yeah. So, and and you have a very strong you know catering delicious Italian mm-hmm. cuisine to Santa Clarita businesses. Bam, there it is. Yeah. Right? That's your you know the one the, the the major thing you want to communicate right away, and I suppose that's going to be over some kind of image. That's mm-hmm. what's indicated here. Mm-hmm. Uh, some more image, uh, maybe some more text, uh, and then you know the three steps of plan your meal, we craft your meal, we deliver to you, and a call to action, cater with us. Yes. Cool. Um, okay. This is. This is the next page after you click on the button, the call to action, uh, to start your catering order. Uh, this is the location. Um, input that we discussed uh, in the site map so you can put in your address there and see uh, if if uh, peachy can deliver to your area and you also indicate here the live chat support yeah uh, when someone clicks on it then friendly voice marco (laughs) (laughs) um cool um yeah so then i just kind of mocked up what it would look like if uh you can. You're, yeah, if you can, yeah. if your address works to continue. And then, um, yeah, the next button. I guess there's also a, a page here where what happens when... Mm. Yeah, so this is kind of like the other uh, outcome of the decision point if your address doesn't fit the area. Yeah, so you don't, you don't cater to San Francisco. No. <laughs> but if we do ca- cater here to Valencia, then the next, the next one is the guest estimate. Yeah, so the guest estimate, um, I ended up deciding on using kind of like a sliding scale function. Um, and then also uh, the information that it's uh, $25 a guest, so that mm-hmm. the client doesn't have to worry about calculating all the extra costs. Yeah. The Except for champagne. Except That's for champagne. champagne. Yeah. And this is a sliding yeah. uh, a slider a pa- a design pattern where you can take this little black dot and you move it to the left and the right mm-hmm. to indicate. And it, and it has people. the constraints of... 10 to 100 yeah. uh, guests. All right. Yeah, so once we continue following the breadcrumb trail, uh, then we get to actual customizing your menu. Um, and so uh, we decided, or I decided on using the checkbox function so that if you can choose which options that you want and also uncheck it if you change your mind uh, and the amount, and, and the foods that you choose will show up on the chart on the right hand side. Yeah. So here when there's only Caesar salad checked, uh, obviously the entire order is Caesar, is Caesar salad. salad. But if you check these two as well, you have that in the next one, then you are able to and, and this is this was somewhat of a you know, we talked at the time we talked about it for a while, a breakthrough of figuring out, well, you know, you might not want a third of Caesar's or a third of Capri's and a third of Greek. You might want a little bit more of, of the Caesar salad. And how do you do that? And you, you were, um, you were figured out that we have this, this, this pie chart would be interactive. So you can draw, you know, you can drag, can drag. the ed- edges and, and, and modify them. Do we have a 
we don't have a markup of that, but you know, you could basically, and that that would change the uh, percentage mm -hmm. in increments of ten percent. Yes, the so allocations in ten percent. Yeah. You choose your salads, pastas, and wine. Uh, so if you go on to the pastas, you have three options. And also, I think, for the wine. Yeah. So here you only have two chosen, so those show up in the pie chart. Mm -hmm. 2006 vintage, Tom Paragon, too. Yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> All right, and then... Um, I guess there are these these next buttons always on the on the bottom. So when you click that, you go to the schedule. Yeah, and here you can select the date and time of your event, um, either in drop down or uh, you can just type it in. Then you get to a screen where you confirm everything. Mm -hmm. Or change your order if you want and to go back and. So this fix would get it. back to customizing your menu. You also at all these details again the number of guests date time location and the total cost and then after that you get to the sign up page where you can either create an account or log into your pre-existing one um, which just leads then to check out right. and here you get to input the billing information mm -hmm. okay cool and then after you submit the order you get a thank you page mm -hmm. Very nice. Oh, and then I think you mocked up one more on yeah, detail page. Yeah, then I mocked up a page for testimonials. So where the black boxes are would probably be photos of like catered events. Um, and then I just had some quotes from different uh, institutions and uh, schools around San Clarita area to give reviews to yeah. the site. Cool. All right. Okay, Allison, let's talk about some developments that happened during your wireframing, some, some versioning, you know, something you started, something a little bit different and contemplated um, it a bit and, and then, then uh, made some changes, All right? So let's go through some of those. Yeah, so on my original homepage in the first version, I thought that I would do an infographic about the order process. Right here. Um, uh, but then I kind of realized that I didn't have as much information as I thought that I would need to convey for the order process. So I simplified it down into more of like a three-step thing instead of a an elaborate like infographic. And I, I suppose you also try to add some add some fun graphical elements. Mm -hmm. And I, I know that you even went with this, and we'll see that in a future video, you went into that. Um, in the visual mock-up phase even, right? Uh, you did, did some explorations, but then eventually you realized it wasn't really adding that much value. Yeah. Because yeah. there wasn't that much information. So just, you know, mentioning the three steps and having the words was enough. Yeah. I also think it's more refined to just have the three steps and the yeah. words. It, like, cleared up the information. Yeah. And then you also changed the menu order a little bit, especially... Login and sign up was second in the original wireframe. Yeah, yeah and, and then I moved it to the uh, far right on my final um, because I think it's more like accessible that way and what you're usually used to when you're yeah. doing Yeah, somewhat of a convention to yeah. have the login or the account information towards the right. And also uh, you took out the sign up because I guess if you click on login, you get the you login get box sign. and you'll also be able to sign up. You know, yeah. At that point, it'd be a little redundant to yeah. say it twice. Mm. Right. And I guess you had also forgotten the testimonials, which yeah, then I brought that back in. Yeah. yeah. Cool. All right. Uh, second one is the order sequence. So it's on the second page here. So that's looking quite different from your original idea. Yeah, I think uh, my original idea, I had started out immediately with customizing the menu and taking you to like the food page, but I realized later on that mm -hmm. uh, in the order process that that comes further down the line after. Because you need to know how many guests in exactly. order for those pie charts, yeah. um, UI elements to work. Mm -hmm. right? So, so you went from customizing the menu to guest estimates to schedule to check out four steps, and you actually draw, drew this out, um, and, and it became location, guest estimate, customized menu, schedule, order confirmation, sign up, and check out. 
Yeah, I think before I was trying to hard to condense all the information into like a few pages, but in doing that, it confused a lot of the information. So I think spreading it out into each individual step would be clearer mm -hmm. for the user. And I guess it's it's worth to mention that takes some time to go through that, right? It's hard to sit down in front of a blank piece of paper and come up with, you know, this is the one on the right is your final, come out with that out of the box, right? You have mm -hmm. to put something down, think about it, um, contemplate and, and revise it. And then that's why we're doing this on a wireframe basis because, you know, again, your colors, your images, your typefaces, all that stuff doesn't get in the way yet. You can really just think about structural decisions that have to be made mm -hmm. at this point. Talk about the check boxes here. Yeah, in my second iteration of the wireframe, I still had an add button for the food, but I had no way of subtracting if you didn't want it. So uh, I opted out for check boxes so that you can choose and change your mind if you need to for yeah. the certain menu items. So here on the left, if you clicked, I, so presumably you already clicked on add. Mm -hmm. I guess it could change to subtract. Right, automatically, I guess that could be an option. But the checkbox is just so much clearer, right? Yeah. You either check it, then it, it, it shows up on the right, and you can uncheck it as well. And I also um, made the pie chart more clear um, and separate from the menu items so that it doesn't get pushed yeah. down as far. Just graphically, right? It didn't really, on the left here, it didn't really have a place to go, or it was just floating. It was just floating. And yeah. now here on the right, it takes up the uh, right side of the page. Um, the other thing that's happening here, if, you, if we compare the left and the right, you decided, I mean, if we study the left, it's quite, it's, it's a lot, right? There seems to be no clear hierarchy of yeah. what's going on. Yeah, <laughs> there's like, about like three so, levels of yeah, the menu. Yeah, there's a primary on the top, then the secondary, then the salads, pasta, drinks, um, is a tertiary menu, and it's all quite complicated. So you decided actually that as soon as you order, or you enter the ordering process, the catering process, that mm -hmm. section, you actually lose the primary navigation. Yeah. Which is a nice choice because at that point, you know, your task is to customize your order. You don't need to go to testimonials or about us or or frequently asked questions. Or if you wanted to, you'd have to go back to the home page, which or you could you do. Can also uh, there's okay. the live chat support. That's true. So if you're going through it and you need to have ask questions, yeah. that's also there. So, if, but if, to, if we, you know, look at this, this is your primary menu, mm -hmm. catering, our store, et cetera, that once you enter the customization process, this just goes away. You can, yeah, go back to it by clicking on the logo, I suppose, mm -hmm. to the home page. Um, so, you know, it's, it's in a way maybe a little unconventional because you're taking options away that the user might be looking for, but it also, I think in this case, um, it has a real advantage because you're, you're, you're condensing the information you put on the screen. And it's not, I mean, again, on the left, it's, it's quite a circus. <laughs> <laughs> and it was cleaned up. And also the other thing that you did was that it's a real linear progression, these little arrows that, mm -hmm. you know, so location and there's an arrow to guess estimate. It really communicates that this is a linear process. You go one step at a time, whereas on the left, uh, that information is presented almost as if you could click on anything at any point. Mm -hmm. So it's quite a bit better. Great. And then there's one more, the thank you page. What happened here? Yeah, so I, in the first version, I think I it was very plain about it, and I kept it very simple. But um, in the final version, I tried to introduce more of like using Italian to carry the voice Grazie. of the website more. Mm -hmm. Um, and have a nicer um, thank you message to make it feel more like welcomed and elegant. Well, also more personal. Yeah, yeah. more personal. Yeah. It yeah. says the name. Yeah. Right? The name of mm -hmm. order. That's really nice. Yeah, it's funny on the on the left it uh, says so boldly, just like a homepage. <laughs> yeah, it's like, but there's also no reason. I think that's something we discussed at the time. You know, you're done. You don't have to go back to the homepage necessarily. If anything, it says here, contact us anytime for questions. So the contact us might be a link mm -hmm. um, that gets you to the contact page. Um, 